Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Powder River, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and untamed from Cheyenne to Calgary, from Dodge City to Poker Flat. These are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of freedom. Frontier Town! Frontier town, huh? Yes, I guess that's what most folks would call Dos Rios. A frontier town. Loud and lusty. Tough and tumbling like a score of other frontier towns. El Paso, Cheyenne, Tombstone. The only difference probably is the name of the town. Dos Rios, that's Spanish for two rivers. My name is Remington, Chad Remington. Born in Dos Rios 20-odd years ago. Reared there until I went upstate to school to study law. And I wouldn't have come back, I guess, if I hadn't gotten word that my father was found murdered. Murdered in cold blood. So I threw a few things into a carpet bag. Took the first stagecoach out of Denver. And then stretched my long legs by walking the familiar rutted street past the stores with false fronts. Half dozen saloons. Over to the white Dobie house that belongs to Judge Fillmore and his daughter Libby. I thought Father should have written you a letter, Chad. Still think it would have been easier on you since there was nothing you could do about it anymore. You always wanted to let me down easy, Libby. The judge was right telegraphing me. I was sure that's the way you'd feel about it, my boy. Uh, exactly what happened? They found your father face down in the corral. With an arrow between his shoulder blades. Arrow? It was an arrow, all right, Chad. Regular engine arrow. Minute I heard, I rode right out to his ranch myself. No Indians around Dos Rios. No bad Indians. Folks around here don't think so. They blamed it on John Tallfeather, the Indian who used to work for your father. John Tallfeather was as fond of my father as... Well, as I am. What's more, John was a Choctaw. And Choctaws haven't used arrows since the Mexican Wars. Where is John? I'm going out and tell him I don't believe all that loose mouth gossip. John Tallfeather's dead, Chad. They strung him up the same night your father was found. Strung him up? Who strung him up? A mob. A mob headed by your father's own neighbors, Rafe and Breck Kincaid. Kincaid, sir. Oh, I should have known. This is no backwoods we're living in any longer. It may be the frontier, but it's the frontier of civilization. 
I've heard you make that speech before, my boy. For all the good it does. This country will never be anything but a lawless wilderness until men learn to respect the due processes of law. Why do they think I left the ranch and went off to school? We know, Chad. We agree with you. But while there are people around like the Kincaids, what are you going to do? I'm going to do something, and you can bet on that. Now, don't go flying off the handle, young man. The Kincaids are gunfighters, both of them. A lot worse than that if they lynch poor John Tallfeather. And if there's any law in this country at all, they're going to pay for it. If you and Libby will excuse me, Judge, I'll leave my bags here. Of course, Chad, but where are you going? To start with, down to the livery stable. I'm renting myself a horse. <laughs> Not only can you have a horse and the best horse the livery stable provides, but you can have money in a bottle. What am I saying? <laughs> and the shirt right off my back. <laughs> oh, Cherokee, you haven't changed one bit. You sound just the way you did when, when I met you for the first time, peddling genuine Cherokee rattlesnake oil off the back of that big wagon. <laughs> yes, Chad, you remember, don't you? Yes, sir. Now, if you just gather around closer, friends, I want to call your attention to this little preparation I hold here in my hand. <laughs> this little bottle is sold regularly for three dollars everywhere. Now, you want to know what this little article does, and I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. It removes warts, blemishes, bunions, and freckles. Cures colds, rheumatism, Whoa, and whoa, that. there, you old horse thief. Horsey? For your honor, I'll amend my complaint. I'll just make it Dr. Cherokee O'Bannon. Thank you, counsel. Objection to stay. <laughs> Come on, I'll get you a horse. Yes, indeed. One of the quietest, gentlest, broken-down hay burners have got for a fancy pants city lawyer. <laughs> if you know what's good for you, Bannon, you won't call me fancy pants. Don't worry, Chad. I've seen you ride. I've got a good nag for you. But do you mind, my boy, if, uh... Well, if, uh... If what? I'd like to ride along with you, if it's all right with you. Well, come along, Cherokee. I'd enjoy having your company. Now, if you'll just get the horses, I'd like to be on my way. Well, Chad, there's your ranch. You can see it right through them aspens. It hasn't changed much, has it? No, not a bit. There's the creek and the cottonwoods where I used to swim when I played hooky from... Oh, oh boy, hold it. What's up? What's up? What's stop for? Uh, unless I'm mistaken, and I don't think I am, someone's moved our wire. Our fence used to run along the other side of the creek up to that saddle rock. Sure it used to. But it doesn't anymore. I thought you knew. Knew what? Well, last spring there was a big rock slide right over there. Fill the old creek bottom with rocks and change the course of the stream. So your father sold that little strip to Kim K. Are you sure, Cherokee? Because without water, there's a quarter of a section over here wouldn't raise gophers. Now, the way I heard it, on the count of you moving upstate to be a lawyer, your father was selling off his cattle. Didn't care about the water. Selling off? Well, that's ridiculous. It wasn't a month ago he wrote me to go over to the stock show at the Capitol and see if I couldn't find him a new Hereford breeding bull. Wow. Well, I'll be a squaring Jim's off ox. He sure wouldn't be buying any bull if he was giving up ranching now, would he? Don't think he would. Come on, Cherokee. Turn that pony around. We're riding over and paying a call on Rafe and Breck Kincaid. Get around there, you long-legged, loose-jointed shuffle gussy. Come on, let's be off. Neither Rafe nor Breck seemed surprised to see me. But they did seem a little shocked when I started to ask questions about this strip of land Cherokee said my father had sold them. Well, maybe shocked isn't the right word at that. They were indignant. Indignant and downright hostile. You mean to say you think I'm lying, Remington? I'm not meaning to say anything, Rafe. I just asked you and Breck a very simple question. What do you mean, simple question? You asked us to show you the deed your old man signed when we bought that property from him. I know what I ask, Breck, but I still have to see the deed. Why, you... I got a good mind... If you really had a good mind, Rafe, you wouldn't go reaching for your gun. I'm not wearing one. Yeah, I forgot. You're the holier-than-thou gent who didn't like the way your neighbors ran your hometown. You went away to college. Sure, he was too good for us. <laughs> 
I can force you to produce that deed, you know. Oh, you can. Well, you wouldn't like to try it, would you? I don't mean beat it out of you. Although I believe I still could. He believes he still could, Rafe. Whether you two realize it or not, we have a court in this county. And I could make you produce the deed in court. I just didn't think that'd be a friendly thing to do. You're not getting no place trying to butter us up with that friendly talk. Ah, let it go, Brick. The deed's over in the table drawer. Get it and show it to Mr. High and Mighty. I'd appreciate it very much if you would. Your father would turn over in his grave. He knew what a duty he had for his son. The less you two have to say about my father, the better off we'll be. All of us. Here. Look for yourself. That's the deed. That's the deed, all right. Well, now are you satisfied? Yeah. I'm satisfied. This signature's a forgery. Why, you low down mealy Go on, mouth. Rafe. Squeeze trigger if you want to. I don't think even you would want to go into court for gunning down an unarmed man. Yeah? Well, who's to say you weren't packing a gun? Now, Rafe's right. He's got me as a witness. <laughs> You're a lawyer. You know what witnesses are, don't you? Chad, you called me a liar. You said I forged that deed. Nobody calls me them names and goes on living. And I imagine you've killed men for a lot less, too. Well, if you got the salt to shoot while I'm standing in front of you... Hey, what's... Drop that gun, Rafe! Rafe, it's Cherokee. Chad must have left him outside. Yeah, I'd forgotten I had, but... Well, Rafe? You gonna let that shooting iron go or not? <laughs> the next one won't be just a warning. And even my Cherokee Indian rail snake ever... Oh, I'll never cured one from five bullet holes. Go on, Rafe. Cherokee's got the drop on you. That's better. Come on, Chad. It's time you were leaving. You're right, Cherokee. Go on, Slope. And the next time you come up here, I'm shooting you for trespassing. Thanks for your advice, Rafe. And for your help, too. But I'll be seeing you again. Sue. Remington, next time I see you, you better be packing a gun. Because I will, and I'll be looking for you. I intend to be looking for you, too. Both of you. Adios. Doggone it, Rafe. If he goes around town and shooting off that big mouth of Shut his... Shut up, Brick. Huh? I ain't afraid of no man who's scared to pack a gun. He had his chance while he was here, and he throwed it. Yes, sir. I always knowed it. That one's yellow. Yellow clean through. We'll return to the dramatic climax of Frontier Town in just about one minute. Frontier Town. Well, when we left the Kincaid's ranch, I was pretty firmly convinced that my father's signature had been forged on the deed under which the Kincaid's claimed title to the creek and that strip of land around it. Cherokee and I pounded leather and left a trail of dust all the way from the Kincaid's to Judge Fillmore's house in Dos Rios. But, Chad, are you sure? 
Why, Miss Libby, Chad sure about this, and I am that my Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil is an absolute and positive cure for 89 ailments of man. <laughs> All the way from double pneumonia to hangnails. I'm even surer than that. I'm as sure as anyone can be. Why, even seeing the deed for the few seconds I did, you couldn't miss the even pressure of the pen on the paper. And no one writing normally writes that way. You mean to say it was traced? Well, it was traced or copied or... I just know that my father didn't write it there himself. I hate to sound like a judge, my boy, but do you think you're going to be able to prove it? Well, judge, I hate to sound like a lawyer, but I've either got to prove that or leave town. Now, of course, I'm a doctor. Pardon the expression. <laughs> Not a lawyer, but it seems reasonable and sensible to me, Chad. My boy, that we go down and have a little talk with the warden. I, I mean, the marshal. <laughs> it isn't often that I can agree with someone in Dr. O'Bannon's profession, but this time I think he's right. Well, Chad, if you'd like, we'll all go along with you. Chad, the marshal must be in. That's his horse tied off in front. Good, because I'm in no mood to waste any time. You know what he means by that, Miss Libby? He's aiming on getting back upstate, not staying here. Oh, Chad, not really. I'm afraid so, Libby. This lynching, these threats from the Kincaids, nothing's changed here. It's still the same boisterous, belligerent frontier town. Well, now, Chad, it's not as bad as all that. Here, let me open the door for you. And uh, if you don't mind, I'll wait for you here outside. I always feel a little strange when the door closes behind me in a marshal's office. <laughs> With what's on your conscience, I'm not surprised. After you, Libby. Well, Chad Remington, I was expecting you'd come back to Dos Rios, but I'm downright sorry that it had to be under these circumstances. Oh, howdy, Judge, Miss Libby. Hello, Marshal. Marshal, uh, Chad would like to ask you a few questions. About his father's death. My father's murder? You're sure right about that, son. That low-code engine hit him smack between the shoulder blades, like a target was painted there. I suppose you know that Chuck Dawes gave up bow and arrow fighting years ago, Marshal. Of course they did. John Tallfeather reckoned that knowing it, we wouldn't blame it on him. But when I found that bow hidden under his bunk, I had him dead to rights. You found the bow? Well, I got it right here. There. That's the thing that done in your father. Oh, thanks. You know, it takes a mighty strong man to bend this bow. <coughs> John Tallfeather not only was old, but he'd been sick for years. Uh, well, he had enough strength left to pull it once. Marshal, how is it since you found this evidence you didn't arrest John and bring him in here? Uh, well, they... Uh... Well, there was uh, three or four boys with me when I rode out to your father's place, and then the Kincaid brother joined us. And, well, I reckon there's no reasoning with a bunch of angry men, especially when right's on their side. In other words, you just stood aside, let him take your suspect and string him up? Suspect nothing. I tell you, we had him dead to rights. Well, you wouldn't have had him dead to rights in my court without more proof than that. Oh, no use getting excited about it now, Judge. Did you find anything else that day, Marshal? No, I can't say that. I... By sinners, I did bring something else in that you probably want. Your dad's belt, holster, and gun. I got him right here in the desk. Yes, Marshal. I'd like to have his gun. Well, here you are, son. And I hope you understand. Yes, I'm starting to understand. A lot. I'll see you again soon, Marshal. Come on, Libby. Chad, I almost went in to get you. Guess who just rode into town? Never mind, I'll tell you. Rafe and Breck Kincaid. Were they looking for me? Could be, could be. That's good. Very good. Chad, you don't mean that you're going down. Make a target of myself for him, Libby? No. But I am going to strap this on. Oh, now, now, don't look at me as though your eyes are going to pop out of your head, Libby. I'm fully grown now. I'm reasonably able to take care of myself. Chad... You'll be careful. I'm being doubly careful. I'm taking a bodyguard with me. If Cherokee and I find what I hope we'll find, you can get out your law books, Judge, because we'll be having a case for you to try in your court mighty soon. <laughs> with 
With the Kincaid brothers in town, it certainly seemed safe to go back out to their ranch. When we got there, I headed straight for the desk where the so-called deed was kept while Cherokee started to ransack the rest of the house. Suddenly, I could hear Cherokee's heavy boots come pounding toward me from another room. Chad! Hey, Chad, you certainly played the right hunch. Look here. Where'd you find those, Cherokee? In a bedroll in the back room. This was only a few of them. There must be 20, 30 arrowheads back there. So John Tallfeather murdered my father, hmm? Those filthy, cold-blooded swine. Sure, the Kincaid's done. Hey, what's that you got there? That paper. Enough with those arrowheads to put the noose around the Kincaid's necks. Here, see, they bought some land from my father, all right, but not the piece down by the creek. Here's the deed for ten acres up on the north side next to their grove of jack pines. All they did was to copy his signature off this deed and trace it on the other. Yeah. Even I can see the difference when they're side by side. Well, Chad, I suppose now you're going back into town and call them out, eh? No, Cherokee, I'm not. I'm taking this evidence into the marshal and swearing out a warrant for their arrest. Huh? Well, you sound like you've been drinking rattlesnake oil. Why, them two would never let their cells be arrested? Oh, have they got everybody bluffed around here? Come on, Cherokee. We're getting back to town. Come on, Cherokee. There are only two places we haven't been to, and... Well, there are the Kincaid's horses tied up in front of the Lucky Seven Casino. You see the brands, K Bar O? You're darn right I do. Why, the bushwhacking buzzards? Go fetch the marshal. I'm waiting here to make sure they don't get away. You can see them both from here, Marshal, at the faro table. Well, doggone it, Chad. This ain't no time to try to haul them to jail. They've been drinking. And, well, them two is ornery enough cold sober. I'm sorry you don't like your job, Marshal. But maybe if you liked it a little better, it wouldn't be necessary to do things like this here in Dos Rios. No, you see here, Chad Remington. I don't take lip like that from no man. You'll be taking a lot more than that if you don't get busy. Now, come on, we're going inside. Well... But mark my words, we're not having no shooting scrapes. Marshal, if I were you, I'd start moving. Come on. Just keep walking, Marshal. (laughs) I'm betting another hundred. And if the house will take off the limit, I'll... Sorry to interrupt your game, Rafe, but your luck's just run out anyhow. Remember what I told you this morning? I said next time I saw you, I was going to... Rafe, I'm warning you, don't try scratching leather. Well, look who's here. The dude brought the law with him. You want something, Marshal? Well, Chad here sent for me. Says he's got some kind of proof... You killed his father. So he thinks I killed his father, does he? Well, if I thought someone shot my father, I wouldn't need any lawman to take care of him. (laughs) We've got laws to handle things like that. They're plenty good enough for me. Marshal, I got an idea. I just bet he has. I just bet he has. Since Chad wants us arrested, why don't you deputize him? Then being the law he thinks so high of, he can take us down to the calaboose. If he thinks he can. Rafe, now, I didn't come in here looking for trouble, and you being on the prod ain't helping me none. Marshal, are you going to arrest the Kincaids? Hey, uh, sure, sure. But if uh, they ain't going to come peaceful, then, well, I'm going back and get me a couple of deputies. All right, Marshal. I don't intend to tell you how to run your job. Go on. I'm going to stay here and wait for you. Okay, Chad, but don't you go stirring up no trouble while I'm gone. Him? Stir up trouble? <laughs> don't make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> that marshal's a card, ain't he? Real brave hombre. Couldn't wait to run out. I didn't run out. Remington, 
This morning you called me a liar and a crook. Now you come in here calling me a murderer. That's right, Rafe. I called you a liar, a crook, and a murderer. And we haven't even started yet. Mister, I got only one thing to tell you. Go for your gun. Sorry. That's one piece of advice I can't take. <laughs> You're right, Rafe. This Jasper's yellow. Sure he is. Yellow. Clean through. You're going to find out, Rafe, if I am or not. Yeah? How? You, you going to hit me with a wet handkerchief or something? You ain't got the salt to clear your holster. The only time I draw a gun is in self-defense. I don't know why you don't fill your hand. Why should I? Well, because I called you a liar. I've called you a crook, and I'm calling you a cold-blooded, sneaking murderer. Well, even I wouldn't let a man call me that to my face. Go on. You got quite a reputation for slinging guns. What's stopping you now? Blast you. Get out of here before I blow you out. To blow me out, you'll have to draw. And I'm waiting. Rafe, I knew you were everything miserable a man could be, but I never thought you were spineless as a gutless coward. Why, you dirty... Hey, you let him go out first. You still the meat into it. Tad, duck, break behind you. Throw so down behind me, will you? Break it. Drop that gun. Break it. Oh, Drop it before I have to break you. All right, Break. Now we don't need the marshal. The one Kincaid that's left is going to jail anyhow. Well, Chad? Well, Libby? It's just that... Well, I hate saying goodbye. I hate saying goodbye to, uh, everyone? Well, you will write, won't you? Well, I might. Not that it'll do much good, I'm afraid, Libby. Not that it'll do... Chad, what do you mean? Well, I always heard women knew everything by intuition. You mean that... That there's someone else upstate? Someone you're going to marry? Upstate? Now, who mentioned upstate? But now, with Rafe dead and Brett Kincaid sentenced, you're leaving town again, aren't you? Well, yes. I'm going about 12 miles out of town, Libby. I'm moving into my father's ranch. Oh, Chad, you're not. I sure am. Now, I guess there's enough trouble around Dos Rios for another good lawyer. Yep, Libby, I, I've come home. <gasps> well, he ain't never going to get home if he don't get started, you say, <laughs> Trust Romeo. How about inviting me for dinner tomorrow night, huh? Oh, Chad, Chad, of course. Well, then, we'll, we'll be seeing you, Libby. Uh, get started, Cherokee. we got miles to cover. Uh, up there, boy. Make tracks. And don't forget, Libby, my weakness is apple pie. Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler, came to you from Hollywood. The series is directed by Paul Franklin and supervised by Joel Murcott. The music is composed and played by Bob Mitchell. Be sure to be with us again, this time one week from today, for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. Frontier Town is a Bruce Ells production. <laughs>
Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Powder River, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! If you're ever in Dos Rios and need a lawyer, you might look me up. In a cow town, a frontier town, I don't need much of an office. But if you really want to find me, my one-room suite is upstairs over Cherokee O'Bannon's livery stable. And there's a sign out on the side alley with my name on it, Chad Remington. Now, I don't want you to think there's not much for a country lawyer to do in Dos Rios, because with the type of people who settle the frontier... And whose places sprawl over it, we got all kinds. From the good and meek to the loud and leathery. Take just last week, for instance. Not only did I get a client, but I earned myself plenty of trouble. Came close to being shot to death. I guess the best place to start is when I was over at Judge Fillmore's house, chatting with the judge and enjoying a few understanding smiles and looks from his daughter Libby. Chad, no matter what you and I and Libby think about it, we've got about as much real law out here on the prairie as a porcupine has pin feathers. Well, you know, I don't always agree with my father, judge or not, but this time I must. Well, Libby, I, I don't disagree with you two film wars, but I feel we can't just accept the facts because they're facts. We've got to do everything we can to rid ourselves of gun law and substitute legal law. That's exactly the point I was making when I was up to the state capitol last week. Oh? The governor, as you remember, is not only a political associate of mine, but one of my oldest friends. Don't be surprised if Daniel B. Fillmore drops the judge from his name next election and substitutes lieutenant governor. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I suppose the daughter of the lieutenant governor would consider herself slumming if she went out with a cow town lawyer. Oh. <laughs> that is, if he asked her. Now, don't forget, Chad. As good a friend of mine as the governor may be, your father was the closest friend I ever had. It sounds like an explosion. It don't sound like shots. Judge! Judge, so someone just held up the bank. Great day in the morning. The bank. Libby, you wait here. Come on, Chad. Let's get down there fast. Stand still there, you pussomaneous, pussy foot and pole cat. Or this time I'll beat your brains out for fair. Oh, Cherokee, you mean to stand there and tell me you captured this gunman inside the bank single-handed? My boy, don't ever let it be said that old Bannon single-handed. It takes just one old Bannon to care for one row. But for a rebellion, it might take two. Stand still there, you varmint. Uh, then stop twisting my arm. Stand back, everybody. Here comes the sheriff. Out of my way now. Out of my way. Move back. Move back there. Good thing you got here, sheriff. But there's no hurry anymore. <laughs> One man army O'Bannon caught your man for you. Well, so you thought you could get away with holding up the bank all by yourself, did you? Well, I wasn't asking just to hear myself talk. Maybe he's not answering on advice of counsel, Sheriff. What's your name? Uh, Smith. Uh, John Smith. Huh. Why don't you just make it John Doe? Well, Smith, or whatever your name is, I'm hauling you down to the calaboose. And maybe by the time we get through with you down there, we'll find out who you are, where you came from, and your right name. So we can make it legal when we change your name to a number. Now, come on. <laughs> Well, 
Cherokee and I helped the sheriff down to jail, then waited in the outside office while the sheriff tried to get a slightly better identification in the convenient name of John Smith. While we were there, knowing Cherokee, I took occasion to do a little investigating of my own. I, the memory of my sainted mother, Chad, I am telling you the truth, the whole truth. And very little of the truth. Now, Cherokee, I'm not saying you didn't catch the rascal. I'm not saying you're not a hero. All I'm saying is, since you didn't have a bottle of your Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil with you, what did you drink to give you that much Dutch courage? Pawn my honor, Chad, I was cold sober. Well, cold anyhow. But, uh... Yeah, yeah, uh, what? I must admit that, uh, I was just passing by the bank when that thief and no good buzzard smith backed out and tripped over me, and when I landed on top of him, it knocked all his wind out. Oh, well, now we're getting places. And since we've gotten the true facts, counsel will excuse witness for... Oh, uh, well, Sheriff, uh, what did you find out? Well, nothing. All he'll say is his name is John Smith. Hmm. But there's a label in his shirt from a store in Houston. Hey, I thought I might telegraph down there with a description of him and see if we can't be identified. Well, say, that's a good idea. A fellow like that's probably wanted on 30 charges in 30 states. Might even be a little reward money. Reward money? This is getting to look like the brightest day of my ill-favored life. Think I'll get down and send that telegram to Houston myself? Oh, Yo, no, you don't, Cherokee. As the man who caught the prisoner, you're staying right here and answering a lot of questions for me. <laughs> there you see, Cherokee, the wages of heroism is work. Now, I'll tell you what. I'll stop by the Western Union office and send the telegram for you myself. Oh, Harry, the sheriff asked me to stop by and send a telegram for him. Why, sure, Chad, sure. What's it about? The fellow tried to hold up the bank? Well, you dabbed your rope right on it. I... What was that again, Chad? Oh, I forgot you've been out here in the cattle country for only a few years, Harry. To dab your rope on something is a cowboy's way of saying you hit the bullseye. Oh, <laughs> I guess I'll never get used to the way you west... Well, oh. here comes my wife with my lunch. <laughs> Hi there, Mrs. Cummings. You bring enough lunch for the two of us? Oh, hello, Mr. Remington. No, but I'll be glad to go home and get some more. Hello, darling. Hello, Martha. Bring me something good? Well, there's a piece of that pumpkin pie we had last night and some cold fried chicken. Uh, no, I, I don't mean to interrupt the menu, but I think so. I don't impede the wheels of justice. I'd better send this telegram to Houston and, and get along. Uh, to, to where, Chad? To Houston. Oh, maybe coming from Schenectady, you don't know that Houston's in Texas. Yes. Yes, we know Houston's in Texas. Hey, well, what's going on here? The minute I mentioned Houston, you both started to look as if you'd lost your last friend. Oh, no. No, there's nothing wrong. It's just that, well, there seems to be some trouble on the line to Houston lately. Oh, now, mind you, Harry, I'm not calling you a liar, but that's really a little flimsy. Harry, what's the use? Mr. Remington knows you're lying. Tell him the truth. Uh, now, Martha, you keep out of this. I'm not going to. We've had this thing hanging over our heads for years now, and I'm tired of it. Some nights uh, I can't even sleep. Afraid of my own shadow. Well, I'm willing to listen. What's the trouble with or in Houston? Go on, Harry. Well, nine years ago I got thrown in jail in Houston. I was working for the railroad then as telegrapher. There was a holdup, and they felt Harry was mixed up in it. You weren't? Well, not mixed up the way they meant. I recognized Martha's kid brother, and, well... I could have stopped him, but I didn't. Uh-huh. And then what happened? Well, they sentenced me to seven years. After a year, I... I broke out. I see. But I still don't understand your reluctance to telegraph. Well, I... I don't know if you know much about us telegraph operators, but... Well, we all have a certain touch. Another telegrapher can recognize a man's fist just the way you can recognize someone's voice. You see, Mr. Remington... About ten days ago, when Harry was sending a message to Houston, the man on the other end thought he recognized him and asked him if his name wasn't Harry Cheeseborough. Cheeseborough's our real name. Chad, I'm scared. I served a year I shouldn't have served. They're not going to put me back. Believe me, they're not. Now, look, Harry, as a lawyer and as a friend, the best possible thing you can do is turn yourself over to the sheriff. What? Listen to him, Harry. I don't want a red cent. I'll handle your case, and I'm as sure as a man can be that I'll get you off. Harry, do what Mr. Remington says. 
Living like this is just like living in purgatory. Now, come on, Harry. You and I are going down to jail. <laughs> Harry didn't like the idea, but once the sheriff reassured him that his chances of getting off were pretty good, he seemed to feel better. With our little jail full, the sheriff put him in the same cell he put the bank bandit Smith a little earlier. With my client now in jail, I went down to see the judge. Chad, I'm afraid you don't realize what you're asking me to do. Just because the governor happens to be an old friend of oh, mine... Oh, sir, as a judge, I know you're interested in justice. And the ends of justice wouldn't be served by having that man extradited. Chad's right, Father. Why, Harry and Martha Cummings are good people. There hasn't been a Sunday they haven't been to church, and they've never done anything wrong in all their lives. I'm no judge of that. All I know is that someone did find him guilty and send him to jail. Besides, to be very frank about it, I don't especially like Chad's suggestion that I impose on a friendship. Oh, I didn't say anything about your friendship with the governor. I appeal to you as a judge and as an honest and upright citizen to have the governor quash any extradition proceedings should they ever be brought. Please, Father. Well, I'll see what I can do. But believe me, it's not entirely voluntary. Uh, believe me, Mrs. Cummings. Please, not Mrs. A friend like you've been can certainly call me Martha. All right, Martha. Now, if you just lean on my arm, I think we can make the two blocks to the sheriff's office in no time. I just can't wait to see the look on Harry's face when he sees this telegram you've gotten from the governor. Mm, me too. From now on, neither you nor Harry's going to have to worry about Houston or any other town on the face of it. Chad, those shots! Yeah, Martha, come on. Those shots are coming from the jail. All I can see is some horses tearing out of town. Uh, Sheriff! Hey, Sheriff, what happened? Oh, nothing, nothing happened. Hmm? Nothing at all. That bank crook, John Smith, Cherokee caught just busted out of jail. Well, stop huffing and puffing. You'll catch him again. That's not too bad. Well, maybe that's not too bad, but Harry Cummings busted out with him. What? Harry? Harry broke out of jail? Well, he sure did, man. Oh. Well, well, this serves me right. I get the man practically pardoned by the governor, and then what does he do? Breaks jail, makes a real outlaw of himself. Well, now there's no question about it. Harry Cummings is actually a fugitive from justice. <laughs> we'll return to the stirring climax of Frontier Town in just about one minute. And now, Frontier Town. I'm not asking for sympathy. I'm just asking you to try and understand. As far as everyone was concerned, and that includes me, Chad Remington, everything I'd done had been wrong. Not only had I induced Harry Cummings to give himself up and go to jail, but when, because of it, he broke out again, the sheriff was against me. Harry's wife was against me, and most of all, Judge Fillmore and Libby were against me. Chad, how could you? How could I? Wasn't it enough that you came here first and talked Father into helping you? Did you have to come back now? Now that it's too late? I'm only trying to explain to I'm you I'm afraid both that... that explanations are no longer in order. In fact, I'm afraid any explanations that are due will be mine, trying to explain to the governor the meaning of this, this utterly ridiculous situation. I thought if anyone around us three would understand and have a little sympathy, it'd be you two. Oh, so now you're going to try to turn things around and blame them on Father and me. The less said about this, the better off we'll all be. In other words, without a trial, without any suitable evidence, 
You're going to convict a man that just yesterday you agreed was decent and honest to the best of your knowledge. Chad, I resent your tone of voice, and I certainly resent your speaking that way to my father. Just a moment, Libby. I'm quite capable of taking care of myself. Mr. Remington seems to feel that this is a courtroom, and that as the attorney for the poor, downtrodden, misunderstood defendant, he's going to make an impassioned, oratorical ballyhoo on behalf of his client. I'm not trying to do Young anything... Young man, you could at least have the decency to wait until I finish. Yes, sir. I was just going to add that since this is not a courtroom, and since your client is not on trial here, but since this is the parlor of my home... I'd appreciate your leaving. Oh, Father. Oh, let it go, Libby. This is your father's home. And I'm certain he's not going to be any happier or any more satisfied until I've proved that Harry Cummings... Harry Cheeseboro. I'll accept the correction, Your Honor. Until I've proved that Harry Cheeseboro either was forced to break jail or was completely out of his head. You're not going to prove anything standing here. You're quite right, Judge. When I've proved something, I'll be seeing you, Libby. I hope. Huh. Cherokee, I appreciate you trying to buck me up, but it's a waste of breath. Now, just a minute, my fine, upstanding friend. Right here in my hand, I hold this little bottle of absolutely genuine Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil. You say you want to know what this little article does? Well, I'm going to tell you. This astounding preparation not only cures dandruff and heaves in your favorite horse, but is sold with a money-back guarantee to cure morning after collywobbles. <laughs> Blues that are bluer than the sky over the... All right, Dr. O'Bannon. I certainly can't give a testimonial for your universal panacea, but I'm ready and willing to admit that... Even without your rattlesnake oil, you can cure a case of blues, depression, and save a man from suicide. Now, Sonny Boy, you're talking. So let's analyze your problem. You wouldn't have a trouble in the world if we could find Harry Cummings and clear this thing up. Just as simple as all that, is it? Even simpler. Now look at it this way. He broke out of jail with that John Smith character. Mm -hmm. Who caught John Smith in the first place? Well, Never mind, I'll tell you I did. And if I could do it once, I could do it again. Well, if you think I'm going to wait until the two of them stumble over your legs this time, you're greatly mistaken. But if you really want to help, throw a couple of saddles on two of those broken-down nags you rent here, and let's deputize ourselves a two-man posse to find them and bring them back. Find them? How do you propose to do that? I may be a lawyer now, Cherokee, but don't forget I was born on a ranch and brought up on a ranch. I can still read, sign, and cut trail. Now go on, get me a good horse and let's be going. If you only could find him. I just know that Harry never, never broke out of jail himself. Well, ma'am, he certainly broke out. Me and Chan ain't going to find him at all unless we get locomoting. <laughs> if that's the word. Martha, believe me, I'll do everything a man possibly can. Don't forget, you and Harry aren't the only ones involved in this thing now. Oh, God bless you, Chad. God bless you. All right, Cherokee. Get that horse turned around and let's get going. Ever look for a needle in a haystack? Well, that's what we were doing. To make it worse, the weather had turned as black as my mood. The cold wind had frozen the ground hard, showing about as much sign as a piece of smooth carved granite. But with Martha Cummings on my mind and Libby Fillmore in my heart, Cherokee and I pushed stubbornly ahead. Now I'm no man to complain, Chad. But this is one wild goose chase where I'm starting to feel like the goose. You look like a Don Gosling. Well, there is a goose involved in this, all right. Several geese, in fact. Harry's, Martha's, and not the least of them, my own. Knowing the fair sex like they do, I can promise you Libby will get over it. And knowing the judge like I do, I can promise you he... Ho, oh, oh, ho, brain up. What in twisted up turn are you stopping out here for? Want to freeze to death? No, but I sure want to look at that briar bush over there. Briar bush? Hey, hey, Cherokee, look. Look what was snagged off on that briar. Looks like a little piece of 
black cloth. Black alpaca cloth. And if I'm not mistaken, the same black alpaca Harry Cummings' sleeve guards are made of. Cherokee, I think we've found the trail. Now braid my hair and call me Pocahontas. You mean to say you spotted that little patch of black cloth out here in the middle of no place? And that it means something? Sure does mean something. It means we're turning our horses and riding through that briar patch. But there ain't nothing beyond the briar. That is nothing but rocks. Nothing but rocks. And I hope a trail that'll lead us to that bank bandit and Harry Cummings. <laughs> Cherokee. Right here. Whoa, now. Oh, boy. Whoa, you elegant equine. So, nothing up here but rocks, huh? What does that look like? Looks like the entrance to a deserted mine. Except I don't know how deserted it is right now. Well, if those two are down there and we go in after them with the light coming from behind us, we'd make two of the prettiest targets you ever saw. Yeah, you're right about that. Sure wish there was some way of finding out if there's anybody down there and what's going on. Smith, I tell you, we'll starve down here. We'd have been better off staying in jail. Why did you dry up? I should have left you in that jail to rot. Maybe I'd been better off rotting there than down here. We only had some air. You keep that up and you'll get air, all right. I'll ventilate you proper. Ah, you're just the kind of wood, too. If I'd had any salt in me at all, I wouldn't let you take me with you. Why, you... No! Now, keep that trap of yours shut. Look, the air down here's so bad. Why don't you let me see if I can't dig a little hole up toward the top? Just a little one. Just enough to get some fresh air. Yeah, all right. Gonna keep you amused like you would a kid. Can I... Can I use one of your spurs to dig with? Yeah, yeah, you can use anything. Only just shut up. Here. Thanks. Well, maybe we can get some air. Sounds like someone digging inside the mine. Yeah, it's not just digging. It isn't steady enough. Sounds more like... Like dots and dashes. Like like telegraph code. You mean it's Harry sending us a message? What is he saying? I don't know. They didn't teach telegraphy at law school. It convinces me of one thing. Harry didn't voluntarily escape, and he's risking his neck now in the hope that somebody will hear this and capture them. Yeah, fine chance, just the two of us. The entrance to this place, a regular shooting gallery. Cherokee, if you got the salt to try something, I've got an idea that may work. Well, it's got to work, and none of us are going to get out of here alive. If I hadn't wanted to save Harry, it would have been easy enough. We could have shot through the entrance to the mine and blasted them out of there. But a shot might have killed Harry. So I had Cherokee climb on top of the entrance and hang there like a possum by its tail. Then I gathered up some dry brush, trusting to the wind to carry the smoke inside, set fire. And with the smoke blowing inside the place, I just waited. And then after minutes, it seemed hours. <coughs> All right. All right, you got us. We're coming out. And keep your hands where we can see him. Now watch you, Cherokee. I don't trust that smith as far as you can throw a buffalo by its tail. I got you, Chad. Fell on him once and I can do it again. All right, come on. Shake a leg or you'll both end up in there barbecued. <laughs> All right, mister. You got us out of there. But you haven't got me yet. Oh, what a yellow-spined varmint you are, Smith. Using Harry as a shield. Don't mind me, Chad. Get him. Oh, I'm afraid, Harry, that just talks easy. Come on. If you want horses, ours are over there. All right, mister. Get moving. All right, Cherokee, jump. Why, you... Oh. <laughs> 
That's it, Cherokee. Now, hold on to it. Well, Cherokee, that's one way of getting business. Getting business? <laughs> you bet. I can't think of a better customer now for your Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil than Mr. John Smith. You might even do a wholesale business with him when he's up in his permanent home, the state penitentiary. I can't ever tell you how much both Harry and I owe you. You don't owe me a thing. Anything you might owe, you owe the judge for his influence with the government. Oh, stuff and nonsense. I'd say the real thanks are due to Cherokee. He's the man who knocked the wind out of Smith twice. Now, just a minute. Nobody could have done anything if Harry hadn't tapped out that message. So we'd know he was down there. <laughs> what would you have done if your life was at stake? No, sir. I'm passing the medal right back to Chad. Well, Libby, let's let them all stay here making their speeches. I think you and I ought to take a little walk. We have a few things to talk over. I haven't much to say, Chad, but if you think you have, I can be an awfully good listener. <laughs> <laughs> Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler, is a Bruce Ells production. Supervision by Joel Murcott. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again this time one week from today for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Powder River, Tombstone. Frontier Town. adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! I'm Chad Remington. <laughs> never heard of me? Well, a lot of folks have never even heard of the town I come from. Dos Rios. Means two rivers. And if Dos Rios sounds peaceful, well, 
It's no more peaceful than any other frontier town. Good folks and bad, God-fearing and evil. And I know, because not only am I a rancher, but I'm also the town's only lawyer. Now, take the other day, I was perched on a keg of horseshoe nails, swapping yarns with Cherokee O'Bannon out in front of his livery stable, and ragging him about the time he used to be a medicine man. Doggone it, Chad. No good lawyer would say a thing like that. No, sir. That there is slander, libel, and mayhem. Oh, go on. That genuine Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil you used to peddle couldn't cure a hop toad of warts. My friend, and I'm giving you the best of it, my rattlesnake oil was an absolute and positive cure for 376 diseases of men and bees. <laughs> and guaranteed. Guaranteed, he says. Well, if my father hadn't saved you from that necktie party, the... What's wrong, Chad? What are you staring at? That rider heading this way, you notice how he's slumped over in the saddle? Tan my hide and call me buckscared. What do you think's wrong with him? If I'm any good at guessing, he's been shot. Come on. Yeah, six inches lower, mister, and that lead would have gone through your heart. I guess this is my lucky day. Yes, sir, bub. You were playing in real luck. Not only that Chad spotted you, but that I just happened to have a bottle of my genuine Cherokee rattlesnake oil. Here, take another little swallow. Oh, no, wait a minute, Cherokee. It was all right pouring it down his mouth when he fainted, but no conscious man's going to drink that stuff. I'll have you know it's very tasty stuff. Besides, I wasn't going to charge him for it, Chad. I'll say you were not with me here. Now, uh, what was that you were saying outside about filing for a piece of land? Yeah, that's why I rode over here to the county seat. You see, I've been prospecting over at Big Strike. Uh -huh. Struck a fine, rich claim. But I guess Rocky Carew found out about my strike, too. Rocky Carew? Now, who would all got get out as Rocky Carew? Not only don't we know who this Mr. Carew is, but we don't even know your name. Uh, maybe we better start from the beginning. This is Cherokee O'Bannon, and my handle's Chad Remington. I'm supposed to be sort of a lawyer. A lawyer? Gosh, then maybe I am lucky. My name is Ford, Todd Ford. Mm -hmm. And if you can help me straighten this out and get my claim filed, I'll pay you any fee you want. Yeah, I'd be more than glad to help you, Todd, but I'm not that hard up for fees. Uh, who's this fellow Carew you mentioned? A black-hearted buzzard who moved into Big Strike about a month after they struck gold. Let's see. <clears throat> he claims to be a miner. The only thing I've ever seen him do is hang around the town saloon. The Bonanza Bar. Spending money and living like a lord. Mm. Well, you can't knock that to me. That crew character sounds like he's plenty smart. <laughs> I'll say he's smart. Never working, never prospecting. But he owns six or seven of the richest claims over there. It's mighty funny the way certain prospectors have either vanished or have been found with their toes pointing up in the air. Well, I thought we'd seen the last of claim jumpers. You think Carew's responsible for that bandage we just put on your shoulder? Of course. Why, it's as plain as a nose on my face. And just about as red. It's an open and shut case. Cherokee, you stick to your doctor and leave the law business to me. Well, how about it, Todd? Do you think Carew tried to bushwhack you? Carew or one of his gunslingers? Why, I'll mow him down. I'll drill him so full of holes that when he stoops over, he'll wheeze like an accordion. I'll fill him now, so just full a of... minute, Cherokee. You may get your chance later. But not till we first try to settle this under the few processes of law that we enjoy out here. First thing I suggest doing, if Todd's able to walk, is to escort him down the street to the recorder's office and doggone well file his claim. office is two dusty blocks down Dos Rios' only street from where Cherokee keeps his livery stable. With Todd Ford's shoulder bandage, we walk slowly past the familiar stores with the false fronts, the half-dozen saloons, which even in the early afternoon were going full blast. We just passed Ben Minton's Lucky Horseshoe Cafe when I felt Todd's arm stiffen under my hand and was holding it. His steps, which were slow to start with, suddenly faltered to a halt. Hold it, Chad. Hmm? Wait a minute. Now, if you're getting weak, son, it just happens that I brought along a bottle of my famous Cherokee rattlesnake oil. No, it ain't that. You see that big fella just tying off that black horse? Yeah. He's from over my way. Name's Big Jake. 
hangs out with Rocky Carew. Yeah, from the sweat on that horse, I'd say he'd been pounding leather to get over here. To get over here in a hurry. Well, like you say, I'm not a barrister. But if there are only four shells left in that six gun of his, he's the vulture who plugged Todd Ford. I bet he is. I just know it. Well, we're not getting any place standing here gawking at him. Let's walk. When Todd spotted Big Jake, we were about a hundred yards away from the land office. Walking slowly gave me time to size him up as he knotted his lines around the hitch rack. Big Jake was a big man, all right. Big and with a chest on him like a hog's head. Big and as mean-looking a gent as any I'd ever seen. He spotted us coming and turned quickly and started for the land office. I let go of Todd's arm and trotted toward him, getting between him and the door before he could open it. You, uh... Wanting something? Yeah, I was. You mind if I look at that gun you're wearing? I, think... well, I sure do. It'll save some trouble. Uh, I ain't got no troubles. But I have. You see, I'm a lawyer here in Dos Rios. I was just retained by that young fellow with a bandage on his shoulder. Oh. Well, counselor, since I'm no man to argue with a lawyer... Sure. Here. Here's my gun. Uh, see you in court, counselor. Maybe. Like I said, Jake was a big man. And I had a lump on the top of my head the size of a mallard's egg where he'd hit me with the butt of the gun I'd been fool enough to ask to see. By the time Todd and Cherokee ran up and I came to, Mr. Carew's gun hand had had enough time to get into the land office, record his claim, and out the back door. The land office registrar was sympathetic enough for all the good it did. Well, I believe you're right enough, Chad, but as a lawyer, you ought to know that the first fellow to get in is a fellow whose claim we got to recognize. Of course, but like all other rules, there are exceptions to that one, too. Exceptions, my eye. Where Rocky Carew is concerned, this way of getting claims is a rule. Eh? What's that name again, young fella? Carew, Rocky Carew. Yeah, that ain't the name he filed in. No, it's the name of, uh, wait a minute, let me see here. Yeah, the claim's filed in the name, uh, Jake Hunbright. Sure, that's his name. Big Jake Hunbright. You'll have to excuse me batting my long eyelashes like this, but it sure seems like this polecat Carew gets out of this as free as a lark on the wing. He might, but not if Jake sells Carew the claim later. That's legal, good and legal. Well, if that's legal, and Cherokee's right. Carew gets out scot-free. Carew gets out scot-free if and providing we're unable to prove that he hired Jake to dry gulch you on the way over from Big Strike and instructed him to file on the claim you'd discovered. And that, believe me, ain't going to prove easy. No, sir, it ain't going to prove easy at all. Well, you're right about that. Since we can't prove anything here in Dos Rios, I think we'd better be... Chad, I... I sure appreciate you wanting to help. But I reckon it's just a waste of time. I guess mine is just another claim Carew and his gang got to jump on. No, my interest in this isn't entirely unselfish, no. When Big Jake clubbed me with his gun, he didn't raise just a bump on my head. He brought out my bump of curiosity. Now, come on, we're going back over to the livery stable and pounding up dust on the trail to Big Strike. <laughs> Now, for that bad shoulder, Todd, if we're going too fast for you, just sing out. No, I'm all right. And the way I feel, I don't feel like singing, out or otherwise. My little songbird, you listen to Dr. O'Bannon. If you found one gold claim, you probably find another. Where there's one, there's got to be more. That's not what I mean about the gold. As we were riding along, it suddenly dawned on me how Carew happened to find out about that claim. What do you mean? I'll give you three guesses. A woman. A woman? Yeah. And I thought she was on the square with me. Eh, live and learn. Live and learn, I always say. You always say something, Cherokee. Uh, who is she, Todd? The only reason I ask is it just might help in cleaning this up. Her name's Althea. Uh-huh. Thea's what I call her, and she works over in Big Strike. Oh. I, I guess you'd call her a an entertainer. It works in the Bonanza Bar place where Carew hangs out. When the good Lord made this world, he made 97 kinds of poison. 96 of them can absolutely be cured by my genuine Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil. 
But the 97th is the one poison that no one has ever found a cure for. And that's female women. I'll grub stake you on that one, Cherokee. Uh, were you, uh, were you in love with this Althea? If I was, it's over. But I'll bet what poke I've got left, the only reason she played up to me at all was to tip off Carew. Well, one of the things a lawyer is forced to handle from time to time is misunderstandings between men and women. A good lawyer tries to prevent divorce. Suppose we just let the whole thing drop. Fair enough. Suppose we rattle up these ponies, huh? The sun's starting to set. It's going to be dark by the time we get the big strike. It was dark, all right, by the time we got the big strike. But the lights from the Bonanza Bar slanted out over the batwing doors and stabbed through the gloom like smoky yellow sabers. Inside, we stood by the doors, blinking in the unaccustomed light while Todd Ford tried to pick out Carew for me. But before he was able, a small figure in a stiff, spangled skirt pushed through the crowd and ran up to Todd. Oh, Todd! Todd! Oh, Todd! Todd, I'm so glad you... Oh, what's the matter? What happened? Todd, your shoulder's bandaged. Don't look so surprised. Or maybe you are surprised because he missed. Because he missed? I'm not aiming to intrude, but Todd's had a couple of shocks today. I'll say I have. And one I'm not forgetting either. But Todd, what's the matter? You're looking at me as if, as if you never saw me before. I don't know about that. But I never want to see you again. That much I'm sure of. Uh, miss, if you leave Todd alone right now, I think it better. That's him. That's Carew walking this way now. So that's Carew. Yeah, it looks more like a rattlesnake on legs. I'll see you. Come on over to my table and I'll buy you a... Well, what happened to you, Ford? Get mixed up in a gun scrape? If he did, it was a little one-sided. I beg your pardon? I don't believe we've met. And we have now. I'm Chad Remington, lawyer from Dos Rios. I rode all the way over here just to talk to you, Mr. Carew. I don't need a lawyer. Well, that, my friend, is a matter of opinion. However, as far as you're concerned, in this particular action, my services have already been spoken for by Mr. Ford. From the way he looks, he don't need a lawyer. He needs a bodyguard. Now, you probably know more about that than I do. All I can tell you is we got a few laws in this state to protect honest men from claim jumpers. Remington, if I were in your boots, I'd turn them around toward the door and I'd walk out. But I wouldn't stop until I was back in those reels. Why, that loud mouth hypocritical... Our Cherokee, Todd, no. In this case, I think his advice is pretty good. Come on. Todd, Todd, please. You can't go without explaining what's happened. Get your dirty little hands off oh, of me. No. Okay, Chad, let's go. Todd! Wait a sec. Back against the wall. Chad, who flanked that shot? A lawyer had called him a couple of death warrants. The two men, see him? One's in the shadows between the alley and the saloon. The other one's in that doorway across the street. Chad, what are we going to do? What can we do? We can try shooting it out. But my best guess is we've all got a pretty good chance of spending the rest of our lives right here in Big Strike. Up on the shady side of Boot Hill. <laughs> We'll return to the stirring climax of Frontier Town in just about one minute. Frontier Town. Well, the night wasn't cold, but with those gunmen blocking our paths, I don't mind admitting I was frozen. Frozen stiff. If we moved a scant few inches, the lights from the Bonanza Bar behind us would make us perfect targets. 
I could almost hear Cherokee's knuckles as his fingers closed over his gun butt. Todd Ford drew his. Finally, I drew mine. Can you move a few inches there, Chad? This hog leg of mine kicks like an overgrown Missouri mule. The first one of us who moves gets killed. We just can't stand here. Now, take it easy, kid. The longer we make them wait, the more nervous they're... What's the matter? Someone's coming. Coming from behind us. I told you what I'd do, Remington, if I were in your boots. But I figured maybe you needed a little lesson. Rocky, what are you doing here? I didn't think I'd have to tell you again. But I just came out to make sure you knew what would happen to the three of you if you thought you might want to hang around Big Strike talking about claim jumpers. Carew, your demonstration's even more convincing than my friend here used to give selling his rattlesnake oil. Thanks. But on the other hand, I never bought any of Cherokee's rattlesnake oil. That's for you to decide. All I have to do now is walk back inside the saloon. A couple of seconds later, you'll be dead. Awful dead. Go on, then. Go on back to Thea. Let's leave Thea out of this, Todd. No. No, let's talk about her. She's pretty, well put together, and uh, I imagine she's got a very affectionate nature. Why, you... Tom, keep my gun down there. Yeah. So, you're a gentleman and a lawyer, huh? Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, Remington. Since you rode all the way over here from Dos Rios, your horses are probably beat. You're safe in Big Strike until tomorrow. But I don't expect to see you here after the sun sets. That's a very gracious offer, Carew. I'm accepting it. Good. Okay, boys. Let them through. Good night, gentlemen. Oh, uh, and Todd, I'll be sure to tell Thea just how much you think of her. The high court, the criminal court, granting us a stay of execution. The three of us rode back up to Todd's diggings. It was hard and cold on the ground, but I slept like a baby. I slept until shortly after dawn. Then I heard voices. I rolled over a little on one elbow and listened. I know, I know. But, Todd, I didn't come here to argue. Believe me, I didn't. I'm not arguing, Thea. I'm just telling you to clear out of here. Clear out and stay out of my life. If your gentleman friend leaves me with a life... He's not my gentleman friend. He's nothing to me. He's just a customer down at the bar. And a mighty good customer, I'll bet. Oh, Todd, you can't stay here now. Carew will kill you or have you killed like he has everyone else who's gotten in his way. Let's go away. Let's go someplace else together. I told you to get out of here before. Now, go on. You're not making a fool of me again. Oh, Todd, please. I'm going over and wake up Chad and Cherokee. When I get back over here, you'd better be gone. Don't be a fool. I don't care what you think of me. But just get out of Big Strike before they kill you. Yeah? Maybe I will get out. But not before we found Jake Hunbright and made him talk. And we'll find him if we have to ride around this country all week. How long are we going to ride around looking for Big G? I'm so sad and sore now, my legs feel like I've been playing a second-hand cello. Well, cello or not, if we ever find Jake, what we've got to say to him isn't going to make music. Chad! Yeah? Just riding through them quakies. That's Jake now. Darting into that grove of trees, he must have spotted us. Yeah, we better knock on these... The shots came right from those aspens. Yeah, right where Big Jake rode. Come on! Do it! Oh, oh, boy. Yeah, Cherokee, come on. Help me turn him over. You bet. That's Big Jake. I hate to correct you, Todd, but that was Big Jake. Three of those four shots went plumb through him. From the angles of the shots, he must have had him surrounded. Just like they did us last night. Well, Counselor, there goes your case. Higher than a kite. Maybe. Huh? 
What do you mean, maybe? With Jake dead, you'll never prove nothing. And for my part, I, I think I'm taking Carew's advice and moving on. Now, wait. There's no doubt in my mind that Carew got Jake for fear that we might get to him first. But how he knew what we were up to is beyond me. It ain't beyond me. His girlfriend wormed it out of me for him. You'd make a pretty poor judge, Todd. You'd have everyone convicted before they ever got into court. Well, how in tarnation would Carew have found out that we were looking well, for Jake? let's find that out when the time comes. For now, let's find out what we can right here. Billy Blue Blazes, you believe in ghosts or something, Chad? What are you going to find out from a dead man? I don't know. Yet. But we may find out enough not only to get back Todd's claim, but to have Carew swinging from a gallows for murder. <laughs> Being a lawyer, I don't usually play hunches, but this time my hunch was right. There in Big Jake's inside shirt pocket was a map and description of Todd's claim in handwriting, which Todd admitted was undoubtedly Carew's. He'd seen Carew's markers in a couple of faro games. It wasn't much to go on, but it was enough to send us back to the Bonanza Bar for a little further checking up. I'd invite you all to sit down, but I know you three gents are leaving town in a few minutes. Soon going to be sunset. It soon is at that, Carew. I made a suggestion to Todd that he wants to talk to you about it. Yeah? Well, I better be quick. It'll be quick, all right. You jumped my claim and we know it. The sun's setting right now. Maybe my eyes ain't so good. But two minutes from now, it's going to look dark again. If you know what I mean. Your eyes were good enough to see Big Jake's back out in that grove. That'll aspect. be enough, Todd. Todd, Todd, please don't be crazy. Get out. Get out while you have a chance. I'm not telling you again. Keep out of this, Thea. There's less than two minutes left now. Now, look, let me do the talking. Whatever money Todd had, he used up prospecting for the clay claim that Jake Hunbright filed on. Yeah. So I suggest to save further trouble and to get enough money to move on, that Todd writes you out a quit claim contract giving you all rights to the claim for which you give him $100. Here, I even drew up the papers. All you got to do, Carew, is sign your name to it. Okay. That's a deal. Oh, thank God. Just what? sign your name here. All right. There you are. Now, I'll get you the 100 Never mind the 100 now. This paper's all we want. What? That signature is the same handwriting we got here on this paper we took off Big Jake's body. Why, you blast You fool, let that gun alone. Let me go! Why, that fool female, she stepped right into that shot. Cherokee, grab him, quick. Better drop that gun, Carew, or I'll drop it after. Why, that blame fool, he just about committed suicide. Pulled the trigger just as I pushed the gun barrel up by his neck. Todd, is the... I'm afraid she's... she's... Come on, Cherokee. Let's have a look at her while somebody goes out and finds a doctor. Well, Todd... Not only have Cherokee and I got business back in Dos Rios, but I... Well, I guess we're a little awkward in a lady's bedroom. Oh, this won't be a lady's bedroom for long. My little pigeon, I'm afraid you're going to have to explain that. Even to me. <laughs> I just mean that as soon as the doctor says I'm able, this lady's bedroom's going to be out at Todd's diggings. <laughs> well, <laughs> they say that marriage is a maid in heaven. Yours certainly comes as close to proving it as any. Sawbones told me that if Carew's shot at Thea stopped, it'd been a half inch further to the left that, well... Well, even my Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil couldn't have done any good for her. <laughs> <laughs> and now, don't forget, you two. Cherokee and I are expecting a piece of the wedding cake to put under our pillars. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Ah, those pleasant dreams. Wedding cake, part of good old Kentucky bourbon under my pillow. And uh, let this be a lesson to you, Todd. The most important thing that glitters doesn't have to be a nugget. It's usually a woman with a heart of gold.
Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler, is a Bruce Ells production. Story and supervision by Joel Murcott. Direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again this time one week from today for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Powder River, Tombstone. Frontier Town. adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! You folks ever hear of a town called Dos Rios? Like as not, you haven't. But being that I'm a town's lawyer, I'd like to tell you about Dos Rios. A sprawling, lusty, and raw-boned frontier town. All kinds of folks here. Although some of them aren't all bad, there are some of them who aren't all good. Take my last case. Cherokee O'Bannon, ex-medicine man and now owner of the town livery stable, was with me, just jogging along the west bank of El Toro Creek, flapping his jaws like he most always does. Listen to me, my junior Blackstone. In court, you're dull and unromantic. But outside of a courtroom, with your back humped for trouble and your fists flying, then, my boy, (laughs) there isn't a woman of the opposite sex who doesn't sigh her heart out to be crushed in those two manly arms. (laughs) Doggone you, Cherokee. Don't let me hear you saying anything that even sounds like that where Libby Fillmore can hear you. Oh, of course not, Chad. I'm as close-mouthed as a sphinx. Uh, uh, famous statue, you know. Good enough. But if Libby has agreed to become Mrs. Remington, would you kindly explain just why you're riding along with your roving eye riveted on that bit of feminine fluff and pulchritude? Driving that one or shay on the other side of the creek? Well, so you noticed her too, huh? And at your age. You know, you're really a good advertisement for your Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil. Certainly. It's guaranteed to build red blood. Well, the young lady yonder has nothing to do with... Right those platitudes, Chad. Someone's shooting at that girl. And those shots have spooked the girl's horse. He's running away. My goodness. That damsel's not merely in distress, Chad. She's in trouble. Come on! Cherokee, I'll take care of the damsel. You light out after that sneak and drag, don't you? Now go on. Pound up that dust. I'm taking out after that runaway rig. Oh. Oh, now. Slow down. Please slow down. Hey, hey, watch hey. out. You're heading that buggy straight for the creek. What? Oh, oh, there. What did you say? Don't. Don't try and jump. I'll get alongside and grab the bridle. Hurry. He'll drown me. Hey, slow. Uh, easy there. Uh, stand by. Stand by. Stand by. Oh, my goodness. This is awful. Oh, I don't know what I should have done if you hadn't come along. <laughs> You're probably gone swimming, I guess. 
Huh, you any idea, miss, who fired those shots at you? Uh, none. None at all. Hmm. You have anything with you that a road agent might want? I mean, money or valuables, anything like that? No, but... <laughs> you sound as if you might be a marshal or sheriff or something with all those questions. Hey, you're pretty close. I'm a lawyer. Dos Rios only lawyer. Lawyer? Then you must be the man I was driving over to see. You're Chad Remington. <laughs> I guess there's nothing to say but guilty as charged, Your Honor. Chad Remington at your service. Mr. Remington, I'm Marie Hoxie. Miss Marie Hoxie. Mm -hmm. When can I see you? Well, it seems to me you're seeing me right now. Although I don't usually conduct my law business standing in a creek next to a rig <laughs> with three bullet holes through the dashboard. <laughs> And uh, never having talked to a lawyer before, I really wouldn't know. <laughs> but if you wouldn't mind lifting me out of here, carrying me back to the bank. Oh, really, I'm... Hey, Miss Hoxie, ease up a little, will you? Your, your arms are choking me. Hey, let go of my neck. Oh, oh I'm... I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Look, I'll tell you what. I sent Cherokee up in those rocks to Cherokee? see... Cherokee? Yeah, Cherokee O'Bannon, he owns a livery stable in town. If you don't mind, you can take his horse and he can patch his carriage together and bring it back to his stable. I certainly. Anything you say. Oh, good. Since you're soaked from the splash and you've had when we get back to Dos Rios, you better get a hotel room and change your clothes. You're the most thoughtful man. Oh, thanks, Miss Hoxie. Are lawyers all so formal? My friends call me Marie, Chad. Well, what would you have done? I lifted uh, Marie out of that battered rig and carried her back up to the road. Whatever scent she was wearing smelled like... Well, I guess it had a French name and cost $25 an ounce. Effective. Very effective. With Marie wet and the air cold, I didn't do much talking on the way to Dos Rios. She took a room in the hotel and said she'd meet me at my office within an hour. That hour gave me a chance to do a little thing. Great Jupiter's ghosts and sundry sepulchers, Chad. If you refuse help, Marie Hoxie, you're just cutting off your nose to spite her face. Her pretty little face. I don't know, Cherokee. Something about this sounds a little fishy. Did you notice the dash of that buggy, the holes the slugs made? Oh, I can't say that I did, my bucolic barrister. Why? Well, the splinters are all outside. Outside? My boy, why waste time looking at the outside of a splinter when you can be regaling your optics on the outside of Miss Huxley? What grace, what charm, what curves, what... what curves? And besides, those holes look mighty small. Those aren't holes, Chad. Those things are called pores. <laughs> Look, you old reprobate. I'm talking about the dashboard of that buggy, and you're talking about something entirely different. Indeed I am. Indeed I am. And something else. It's almost two hours since she said she'd be here in one hour. Well, no, sir, Cherokee, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to walk down to that hotel and tell Marie Hoxie I'm not interested in her or her case. <laughs> Oh, believe me, Miss, uh, Marie, I, I'm not at all put out about you being a little late. I, I just came down to the hotel to see if, well, if there was anything I could do to help you. There's a lot you can do to help. You're so tall and so strong-looking that, well, here, sit down. Yeah, no, uh... oh, no, over here. <clears throat> because... What I have to tell you is in complete confidence, and I don't want anybody outside to hear it. Outside? You saw that man shooting at me today, didn't you? Well, I did hear the shots. Chad, believe me, I won't be safe until I get back the map to the Lost Continent Mine. A map to the... Well, now, look, Marie, if I'm going to be of any help to you at all, you'd better start from the beginning. You will forgive me, but I just seem to be all at loose ends. Well, my... Father, Dan Hox, he's a mining engineer. I see. After three years of looking, he finally relocated the Lost Continent Mine. Mapped it. Went back to Leadville where I was waiting for him. Well, how did he lose the map? It was stolen. And we know who stole it. Well, if you know who stole the map, why did you come here to Dos Rios to see me? We had the man arrested and he's in jail now, but we never did find the map. 
And you want me to go back to Leadville and play detective? Oh, no, Chad, of course not. But the man who stole it has a brother living here in Dos Rios, and we're as sure as sure can be that he sent that map down here to him. Uh, who's this brother? From what we heard, he's a professional gambler. Name of Folsom. Pharaoh Jack? Why do you look surprised? Don't you believe me? Marie, I, I hate to disappoint you, but as much as I sympathize with your problem, yours is scarcely a case for a cow town lawyer. I'm sorry. Chad, I... Don't go yet, I... Bill? Don't you see? Don't you understand? There's no one I can turn to. You're making it a little difficult. Chad, please. Please don't walk out on me now. You've got to help me. You can have everything and anything you want. You better sit down. Yeah. I suppose I had... Do you have any ideas how I can get that paper for you? It's worth $5,000 to us, if you do. Marie, I've got to admit I can't do any thinking at all that close to your perfume, so you take off that negative whatever you call it and put on a dress, and by the time you're through, I'll be back here with my answer. No, no, I'll be seeing you, Marie. Later. As I asked before, what would you have done? I headed for the street where Cherokee was waiting anxiously to get that perfume out of my head, or blood, some fresh air into my lungs. We were walking along just leaving the hotel, and Cherokee was voicing his disgust with me loud and volubly. I'm starting to believe that you're a fair prospect for the booby hatch. If you consider turning her down, $5,000 in that. That radiant rap... Hey... Chad, that shot just missed me. It didn't miss me. Huh? I don't notice any punctures in your epidermis. No, I mean that one little shot just made me decide to try and locate the map of the Lost Continent Mine. Well, I never believed in looking a gift horse in the teeth. But would you mind explaining to me why you've undergone this change of mind? Or could it be change of heart? That little lead slug convinced me that there's more to this than is exposed to the eye. And now, if you look who just came out of the hotel, you'll have the rest of your answer. Out of the... Well, that's... That's Farrell Jack, the gambler. Say, isn't he the one you said, Marie? He's the one, all right. And believe me, Mr. O'Bannon, we're finding that map if we have to tear Dos Rios apart plank by plank and dobe brick by dobe brick. We'll return to the exciting second act of our Frontier Town adventure in just about one minute. Now, Frontier Town. Well, with that shot from the general direction of the hotel going past my ear a little too close for comfort, and then seeing Pharaoh Jack Folsom leaving the hotel, I decided the better part of valor would be to get off the street before the sheriff and a crowd collected. So I went back to the hotel, leaving Cherokee to wait for me down the corridor a few feet. Once again, I knocked on the lovely Marie's door. You. Why, were you expecting someone else? I thought you were a stranger in Dos Rios, Marie. I am. It's just that I... Well, I didn't expect you back this soon. May I come in? Certainly. Young lady, I've decided to take your case. Oh, that's wonderful, Chad. Wonderful. Well, $5,000 is a lot of money, so I also decided I'd take part of that. Now. I... Now? I'm taking you at your own word. You said anything and everything. I'm asking for some money. Down. Well, you didn't expect me to have the $5,000 with me. I'll take what I can get. Oh. Well, if that's the way it is, that's the way it'll have to be, I suppose. And you suppose correctly. Well, if the 
Money's all you're interested in. The way this case may turn out, I need to put a little aside to assure myself a proper funeral. Now, you better go open that purse of yours, Marie, before I change my mind again. Although Miss Hoxie's pocketbook was fat and bulging, she only managed to produce a hundred dollars. While the bag was open, I did manage to peek inside, and what I saw in there satisfied me that this was my kind of case. As soon as I left Marie's room, I beckoned to Cherokee, and we took advantage of being in the hotel by easing ourselves into Folsom's room. I don't mind saying that I was more than a bit surprised when, tucked inside one of his frilly shirts, I found the map to the Lost Continent mine. Careless of him, wasn't it? But then I guess gamblers always do take chances. And then instead of turning the map over to my client and demanding the rest of the fee, I grabbed Cherokee and hurried back to my office. Mr. Remington, I am by nature a very patient man. But with that gorgeous creature waiting to hand you the best part of $5,000, why in the name of Gil Hooley's goats don't you give her the map and collect the long green folding wherewithal? I don't know yet. Exactly. All I know for sure is that in the bottom of her little pocketbook, I spotted a twenty-five caliber handgun. Twenty-five caliber? Twenty-five caliber, a little gun. A gun which shoots small slugs and make little holes. Holes that I think will match those in the dashboard of the buggy she was driving. You mean to stand there with your mouth hanging out trying to say that she shot at herself? I'm just meaning to say that for the time being, I'm going to make what seems to be an exact copy of this map and put it back where we found the original one. Before sneaking back upstairs to Folsom's room, I left Cherokee downstairs in the dinky little lobby under strict orders to stall Folsom should he return by every legal means. And then, just as I had the altered copy of the map safely stowed away in Folsom's shirt, I heard a commotion starting down in the lobby. I closed Folsom's door and raced down the steps two at a time. I thought you forget it. Oh, Bannon, I've given you three to get your hands off of me. Do you understand? But, Pharaoh, I'm positively guaranteeing the two bottles of my genuine One. Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil will not only change two. the luck, but will absolutely positively... Three, all right, I warn you. Now, just a minute, Folsom. Why don't you pick on someone your own size and age? You better keep out of this, Remington. I should? Why? Because if you don't, I'm going to knock your teeth back down your throat. What was that again about wanting to perform a little dental work on me? You heard me. Told you to keep out of this. Well, I'm in it, and I'm staying in. Unless you think you can knock me out of it. Why, you loud mouth. Well, Pharaoh, you, you rattled my teeth, but that's all. What you meant was something more like this. Chad, my boy, I'm as proud of you as a new head of hair. <laughs> he won't wake up for a week. Oh, won't I? We'll soon see you, Bob. Ah, Pharaoh, you're a glutton for punishment. You think so? Come on, Cherokee. Help me straighten up this lobby and then we'll... Chad, look out. He's got his gun. Oh, you double deal. Just for that, Folsom, I'm taking your gun with me. If you ever want it again, you know where to find me, up at my office. If you'll only listen a minute, Cherokee, I'll explain as much as I can to you. You mean if you're able to? <laughs> Actually precipitating a fight Right in a public hotel <laughs> You used the right word when you said precipitate Because now I'm sure that Marie Hoxie knows I'm working on her case <laughs> well, Didn't you see her watching from up at the head of the stairs? You mean you did that to impress her? No, oh, I did it in the hope that now she'll have to make her next move Which she just did Just did? She just did You hadn't been so busy talking You might have seen her go over into the Western Union office and unless I miss my guest, Cherokee, we'll be having visitors. Some mighty interesting visitors before very long. Chad, whether you like it or not, I've got to have a libation. Practically locked up in this office with you for six hours, just waiting, has taxed my nerves beyond the bounds of even... Shh, shh, quiet, Cherokee. Someone coming up the stairs. Someone coming? By the ever-living George, so there is. Come in. Chad, I do hope you don't mind my coming here this time of night. My dear young lady, you not alone deprecate our perspicacity, but you do yourself a great injustice. Here, let me get you a chair. 
You, uh, you're right about Folsom having that map. Oh, is that so? I thought you'd be more surprised. You've got the map I wanted. I just told you that Folsom had it. I'm telling you I don't believe it. You're smarter than I thought you were, Marie. You happen to notice the map you found in his room isn't complete? I... I don't know what you're talking about. I know what you were talking about when you said anything and everything, I think. Perhaps you've done too much thinking, Mr. Remington. Say now, please, don't leave so soon. <laughs> Why, this barren little barrister's office hasn't smelled so good since it's opened. Let me stay with you now. Oh, I'm not leaving. But fortunately, my uh, father arrived in town, and perhaps he'd better talk to you. Father, come on in. Yeah. I was hoping we wouldn't have any trouble. But now, you gentlemen had better sit down. Uh, just arrived in town, Mr. Hoxie? Never mind. You got that lost continent map, and we want it. I rather expected you after I saw your beautiful daughter slip into the Western Union office. If you happen to think it's strange that a lawyer should have his office over a livery stable, that's the reason. Wonderful view of the entire street. If you're a smart lawyer, Remington, you'll dig up the map. Quick. So many people seem to want this map. It should be worth a great deal more than $5,000. Oh, so that's your play, huh? Think you're going to hold us up and gouge a bankroll out of us? Well, since I didn't take the other things Marie offered me, it seems I'm entitled to a higher fee. After all, this was riskier than I thought. I, someone shot at me, didn't you, Marie? Chad, you mean to sit there and say you think that Got beautiful... a flannel mouth. Remington, I'm not planning on being here in town very long. Maybe two more minutes. You got one to hand over that map. Oh, it's too bad you're leaving so soon, but I can't say I blame you. If your partner, Pharaoh Jack Folsom, happens to see you in Dos Rios, there's apt to be a little shooting affair. Maybe you are smart. Folsom was my partner, but that map belongs to me. To me? Not to us, you and your enchanting daughter? <laughs> you're pretty smart yourself, Hoxie, if that is your name. Hiring Marie to pose as your daughter and come down here to get that map because Folsom had never seen her. She's not his daughter? Why of all the cheap chicanery? All right, now look. Now that you know that I know where you stand, and since this is just a business deal, why don't you let your money do the talking for you? Any talk from now on, this 45's gonna do. Oh, too bad Marie didn't have a 45. What, what do you... you... Who... That little handgun you let her carry gave me my first tip. Right from the time I saw those holes she shot through the dashboard just to make me think she was in trouble. And then when she threw that shot at me from the hotel... Terrible... Remington, I mean it. I'm going to kill you to get back that map. You see, Marie, he'll kill me just to double-cross Jack Folsom, and then I wouldn't be surprised if he killed you. Are you turning over that map? I guess I'll have to. Won't I, Pharaoh? Drop that gun and uh, Remington. Uh, where did you... And drop it. You folks, kind folks, don't mind. This office is getting so crowded, I think I'll leave. You take one more step, Cherokee, and you will leave. Later on, I shut up. That's what I said. I'm staying. You know, Pharaoh, I just had a hunch if this double deal and vulture you're in partners with ever arrived in Dos Rios, you'd pick up his scent faster than a bird dog. Never mind him. I want my map back. Oh, this is getting more confusing than ever. It's a matter of pure and simple justice. I don't know who to give the map to now. Well, maybe this will make your mind up for you. Here, I've got the money I promised you in my bag. Nobody's buying that map, do you understand me? Why not? Chad can use this money just as well as... All right, Folsom, drop that gun. Why, the little filly's turned into a ferocious firebrand. Don't doggone it, Marie. Don't you know that little pop gun's going to get you into trouble sooner or later? Folsom, drop that gun. Why, sure. I guess I know when I... Will... Oh, you dirty double-crosser, let go of my wrist. Chad, Oxy's gun. It's on your desk. Uh, That's enough, Folsom. I've given you a better chance than you gave her. I didn't have to miss. Cherokee, get his gun and cover them both. My pleasure, Chad. Here, give me that. Oh, Marie, don't you know you should always take your attorney's advice? What? I told you that gun was going to get you into trouble. D Chad, it hurts. I... Yeah, I'm going to take you to the doctor's now. Here, here, let me lift you up. You remember what, what I told you? What was that? Uh, this is doing the hard way. 
But I knew I'd end up with you holding me in your arms. What's wrong with you today, Cherokee? The air's wonderful, the birds are singing, the fish are all jumping in El Toro Creek, and you just haven't opened your mouth for a half hour. My cold-blooded counselor, you grieve me and fill me with bitter disappointment. <laughs> How's that again? Here we are, perched on the backs of these high-priced equines, riding along El Toro Creek Road in the very same place where just a week ago your roving eye spotted Marie Hoxie. Uh-huh. You sat there supinely in the saddle, making casual comments about the climate and the flora and the fauna. Have you no heart? No red blood in your veins? Never mind, I'll tell you. What you probably need is a double dose of Dr. O'Bannon's famous Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil. At least you don't need it. The memory of Miss Hoxie's perfume seems to act on you like a tonic. That reminds me, Chad. Hmm? Did you ever find out if Farrell Jack Folsom ever did have a brother in prison over in Leadville? Well, Judge Fillmore found out for me. He hadn't even got a brother. Dan Peacock, alias Dan Hoxie, gave that Lost Continent map to Pharaoh Jack after he'd won it in a stud game in lieu of cash. You mean he didn't realize how valuable it was, the fool? Oh, he didn't even know it was a Lost Continent mine until later. Then when he found out, he tried to get it back from Pharaoh and couldn't. Then's when he decided to double-cross him and hire Marie to pose as his daughter. What do you think's going to happen to the curvaceous charmer? Oh, Marie? Well, from what the judge tells me, whenever they release her from the hospital, she's due for about five years at the state's expense. Five years? Well, by that time, she will have reached the full bloom of beautiful maturity. No doubt. And if you lay off the libations of that rattlesnake oil, you may still be around to greet her, you old fake. <laughs> <laughs> well, my boy, even in me, hope springs eternal. <laughs> Frontier Town starring Tex Chandler is a Bruce Ells production. Supervision by Joel Murcott. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again this time one week from today for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town!
Ever hear of a cow town called Dos Rios? Well, don't feel bad if you haven't. It's just one of those frontier towns, roistering and noisy, perched in one of the lushest and richest valleys below the Continental Divide. Me, I'm Chad Remington, the town's only lawyer. But like everyone else, I've got my own ranch with the typical well-fed, slab-sided herd of cattle for which our valley is so famous. And just because these cattle are valuable, well, it gives some men ideas. And that makes plenty of business and trouble for a saddle stop lawyer. It wasn't too long ago that I was riding in toward Dos Rios from my spread. Cherokee O'Bannon, he runs a town livery stable now that we've talked him out of peddling his genuine Indian rattlesnake oil. Cherokee was riding with me as we cut across some open range trying to get to Dos Rios before sundown. Hey, hey, look at those Herefords, will you, Cherokee? Someday with a few more head, I might even be able to burn up my law books and retire. And? And I use the term at the twinge of conscience? You must have bats in your belfry. Look at it, a bunch of cows like that. For shame. <laughs> what have I done now to offend your artistic integrity? What has he done now, he says? My boy, you've been casting sultry, longing looks at a bunch of blank-faced cows. When half that emotion spent on a proper female woman would return to you tenfold, nay, a hundredfold. Oh, don't you go biblical on me, you old reprobate. And something else. Unless a man has a few head of good beef, he can't afford to cast long, lingering looks at a woman. Chad, my boy, your total lack of sophistication and experience hurts me deeply. A man who has some money in his jeans doesn't need to bother with the distaff side. He can go out and woo old John Barleycorn. Cherokee, the older you get, the more unregenerate you become. Your total lack of appreciation for a herd of cattle is something that I... Hey, Cherokee, rein up. Slow there, girl. Oh, boy. Oh, what in Billy Blue Blazers happened to you, Chad? Oh, you see that water hole just ahead of us? Yes, sir. Isn't that a tin can lying next to it, lying on its side? Yeah, unless my optics deceive me. That's an empty five-gallon can. But what about it? It's a lead pipe cinch. It didn't contain, contain old spiritus fumenti. That's drinking liquor to you. No, it's a lead pipe cinch. It didn't contain anything that pleasant. But I got an awful feeling it did contain five gallons of enough stuff to poison every steer that drank out of that water hole. Why, if I ever catch the pussyfooting pole cat that did that, I'll darn well destroy him. Come on, girl, get up! like to get my hands on the bucket who did this. Putting poison in a water hole. I must admit it's incomprehensible even to me. Why would someone want to poison a lot of dumb, defenseless cows? I don't know, but with their stock poisoned off, how many ranchers around here could pay their debts? You mean to say someone deliberately? By the great god Pan, Chad, this is the most nefarious bit of chicanery I've ever heard of. It certainly is. Now, just a minute. I heard you say just the other day that not over half a dozen ranchers in this whole valley owe a mortgage to the bank. That old sourball Ripley who owns the bank forced most of them to pay up a year ago last spring. So what debts could they have? Plenty. Ever since Ripley shut off most of the credit, which absorbed most of the cash folks had on hand, everyone's been buying at Parker's store because Lysha Parker's been willing to let his bills run. Lysha Parker? If you mean to insinuate Lysha Parker's mixed up in this cattle poisoning... You and I are coming to fisticuffs. Why, that old gentleman is so honest, it makes me blush. Yes, it does. Oh, calm down, Cherokee. Calm down. This has nothing to do with Lysha. But legally, if the ranchers can't pay their debts, he could go to court, get judgment, and take them all over lock, stock, and barrel in liquidation of his claims. But if you say Lysha is mixed up in it, shucks, Chad, I think you're putting your money on the nose of the wrong horse. Yeah, I'm not making any bets on this race. Because I got a notion it's been fixed. I'm blame well going to find out if I can before the sun sets today. If I sounded like a boastful kid, well, that's just the way it turned out. Because after talking to Lysha and Sarah Parker, not only didn't I find anything before sundown, but I didn't find out anything for the best part of a week. Water holes continued to be poisoned. Strangers drifted in and out of town... Even the sheriff couldn't find out a thing that had helped. And then, best I can piece it together, another stranger arrived in town. The stranger. The stranger who wasn't too strange to the handful of gun slicks who'd been hanging around town. They got together in a silver boot saloon. Hey, bartender. Let's have another bottle. Hi there, 
Lefty. The boy said you were over here. Ah, pull up a chair and rest your frame, crew. If you got your work done, <laughs> you must be tired. Bring another glass with that bottle. I got my work done all right. You know me, boss. Yeah, I sure do. That's why I shipped you up here ahead of me. Any, uh, any trouble? Oh, shucks, no. Well, there's been a Jasper in town snooping around. A lawyer named uh, Chad Remington. But he ain't found out a thing, Lefty, believe me. Yeah, he'd better not find out anything if he wants to go on practicing law. Because I'll get him just the way I'm going to get Parker's store. Now, look, Lefty, you ain't ever been here in Dos Rios before. Me and the boys have been here for more than a week. And I'm telling you, that there Lysha Parker is a stubborn old goat. He'll never sell. No? Well, let's just suppose that Parker won't. Don't you think his widow will? Widow? That's what I said, widow. And if Parker is as crusty an old goat as you say he is, it shouldn't be too hard. Shouldn't be a lefty. I'm sorry, I just don't get you. Well, just like you said, Parker's got a nasty temper, hasn't he? Well, yeah. I... Now, you're going over to that store and talk Parker into an argument. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> Poor Parker, with that temper of his, gets sore and grabs for his gun. <laughs> That's all, mister. He grabs for his gun, only you outdraw him. Hey, you really got something there. Don't let nobody tell me lefty slaughter ain't got brains. Yeah. Well, uh, instead of wasting your time trying to butter me up, you better be getting over to Parker's store, because once he's out of the way, it's still going to take time before I'm the owner of all the choicest ranches in the Dos Rios Valley. Now go on. I'm getting so anxious, my tongue's hanging out. Lasha? Oh, Lasha. Yes, sir? Oh, want me to put that bold calico up on the shelf for you? Would you please, Lasha? You're a dear. <laughs> After 42 years of what we've been through together, sir, certainly doesn't take a... Well, looks like we got a new customer coming in. Howdy. Howdy. I'd like a pound of sugar. Pound of sugar. Yes, sir. Right here. I said I wanted a pound. Well, sure, I heard you. This is a pound sack. You aiming on calling me a liar? Now, look here, mister. I didn't ask you to come into my store. But I come in, and I'm not going to have some thieving crook like you give me a half pound and claim it's a pound. You get out of here, doggone you. Turn around and clear out of my place before I black you. Lash, you do it. you bald-headed old goat. Nobody's putting me out of no place. I'll show you who to put you out in it. Hold it, you. Get away from that door. Watch him, Cherokee. Did he do the shooting, Mrs. Parker? He, he killed my husband. Yeah? Well, I, I only shot in self-defense. Is that the truth, Mrs. Parker? Yes. I tried to stop him, but Lasha did draw first. Well, now are you satisfied? I can't say that I'm satisfied, but... I guess the sheriff won't hold you in the face of that evidence. Lash. Oh, Lash, why did you do it? I can't tell you how sorry I am. I didn't get here two seconds earlier. Oh, that's all right, Chad. Oh, Lash. Lash. Just saying how sorry I am. I know I'm going to bring your husband back, but there's still an account to be squared up, and I'm hoping you'll let me square it. Come on, Cherokee. I'm going to escort this buzzer down to the sheriff. It was a foregone conclusion that the sheriff had released Krug, but not before we found out that he had something to do with the stranger who'd arrived in town, Lefty Slaughter. Not knowing Slaughter, I decided to go down to the saloon where he was hanging out and size him up just in case. Come on, honey, one more drink. Then I'll give you some more folding money to lose at Pharaoh. Excuse me, but the bartender pointed you out to me as Lefty Slaughter. Yeah. Something I can do for you, my friend? If I didn't have something else on my mind, Slaughter, I'd ask you to apologize for calling me a friend. Asking for an apology and getting one are two different things. Well, maybe I've been lucky, but I generally get what I ask for. And maybe that's because you make it your business to ask the wrong people. Yeah, maybe. But I didn't come here to ask you anything. I came here to tell you something. You don't see Lysha Parker was just shot down in cold blood. I thought you'd want to know I'm making it my business to find out why. Oh? 
Well, I never had the pleasure of meeting this Mr. Parker. But if he was a friend of yours, I can't say that I'm exactly sorry. Well, you may be sorry. Next time you or any of your gun hands try to finish off what you've started. And now if you're through, I'm sure you'll excuse me so I can start enjoying myself. Why, sure, Mr. Slaughter. Enjoy everything while you can. Because if you keep up like I think you've started... Legally or otherwise, I'm going to help see that you enjoy the next 50 years of your life rotting away in jail. (laughs) We'll return to the exciting second act of our Frontier Town adventure in just about one minute. And now, Frontier Town. Yes, I sounded like a boastful kid all over again. I mean, going in and deliberately rubbing Lefty Slaughter the wrong way. But I've found until you've rubbed the fur, you can't tell if the animal you've got is a house cat or a pole cat. Sometimes they're both dangerous, but you trap them different ways. Well, I found out in short order that Slaughter was as cold and cocky as they come. Knowing that, there was nothing more I could find out until such time as he chose to make his next move. So Cherokee and I sat for four more days in my office up above Cherokee's livery stable, looking out the window and watching the entire street. Then late the afternoon of the fifth day, Cherokee turned away from the window suddenly. Chad, look there! Hmm? That double-dyed, dirty gunslinger who terminated Lysa Parker's mortal existence... He's walking down the street with Lefty Slaughter. He was walking with him. Now Krug's turned off into the saloon and... Hey, hey, you see what Slaughter's doing? He's heading straight for Mrs. Parker's store. Well, if that's the case, and it certainly seems to be, then what are we doing loitering about this legal logia? You're right, Cherokee. So grab your hat or your gun or both, and let's be finding out what business Slaughter might have with Mrs. Parker. Some of the boys over at the, um... Hotel told me about the misfortune you had, Mrs. Parker. I mean about your husband. Well, certainly mighty kind of a stranger to come over and pay his sympathies. And believe me, sympathy is just what made me drop in today. You see, I got to thinking about how difficult it might be for a woman like you to try and run a store alone. Yes. I'm afraid it really takes a man's mind to run a business right. Oh, isn't that the truth? And since I came to Dos Rios looking for a business to go into myself, and with you now probably wanting to sell... Oh, I wasn't thinking of selling out, Mr. Slaughter. Well, I know this may sound kind of sudden, but I'm willing to pay you a fair price. All cash. Say, $2,000. $2,000? Why, we've got more than $20,000 just owing us on the books. Sure, books... (laughs) With their cattle dying off like flies, that 20000 isn't worth ink it took to write it. Well, I, I don't aim to argue with a woman, but I'm a fair man. And once I make up my mind, I don't let anyone change it. Well, now, isn't that too bad? Now, you just listen to Mrs. me. Mr. Parker, then. you'd better do the listening. I've got 3000 here in cash, so... Suppose you sit down and start writing out that bill of sale. Why? <sighs> If I were a man, I'd take that shotgun off the wall. I... Mrs. Parker. Hello, Slaughter. What are you doing here? Button in again? Nope. But since you're determined to stay in Dos Rios, I'm just being neighborly. And seeing as you want to spend your money, I thought I'd suggest to Mrs. Parker that she accommodate you. Accommodate him? Why, what do you mean, Chad? Well, since you haven't done much cash business this year, I thought maybe I could help Mr. Slaughter spend some of that cash he's got on him right here. Since he's so all fired anxious to buy something. Chad, I don't want any of his money, not any of it. (laughs) Now, who said it was his money? I'd hate to think where it came from. If you could think at all, you'd keep your nose out of this. What do you mean, think? 
If he could just smell, he'd keep his nose out of your business. Reach to the high heaven. Why, you loud mouth. Dad, stop it. You wrecked my whole store. Don't worry about your store, Mrs. Parker. Uh, you able to get up, Cherokee? Uh, uh, once I get some of these picks and shovels out of my hair. Slaughter, that was a mistake hitting Cherokee. Bad mistake for you. But at that, I guess you wouldn't have hit him if he hadn't been 20 years older than you are. Yeah? Who says so? I say so. I'm about your age. Why didn't you hit me? Oh, I'm not too gentlemanly to hit you. That's it, Chad. Beat the brains out of the blighter. Not much satisfaction to that, Cherokee. He won't hit back while I'm facing him. Well, if I had my way, I'd christen his thick skull with a few bottles of my Indian rattlesnake oil. Applied with vigor. I'll see both of you again. I'm sure you will, but you're not leaving yet. Remember I was going to help you spend some of your hard-earned money here with Mrs. Parker? Cherokee, load some of those picks and shovels you knocked over into Mr. Slaughter's arms. <laughs> My boy, you've got a most imaginative idea. Well, what does he want with picks and shovels, Chad? <laughs> From what I've heard, he's fixing to dig his own grave. There you are. Three picks, four shovels. Mm -hmm. Hold out your arms, you insult the human race. <laughs> gonna pay for this. Oh, no. Wrong again, Slaughter. You're gonna pay for this. Three picks and four shovels will be, well, in round numbers, let's say, uh, fifty dollars. Now, Cherokee, since we always aim to help the customer, just peel one of those bills off Mr. Slaughter's bankroll. Just one? Uh, just one. You're never gonna live a life of ease like that, Chad. Now, let's see. You can carry a little more. Just about room for a bolt of that calico. And it's just the right color for Slaughter, too. Yellow. Yellow. Well, it'll make a nice yellow shroud for that grave he's digging for himself. Yeah, with all the money he's got left, it's too bad we can't sell him a headstone. He's going to be needing that soon, I think. You're going to be laughing on the other side of your face before I'm through with you. <laughs> for the time being, you're through with me now. So, uh, adios, Slaughter. And in consideration of your $100 purchase this morning, Mr. O'Bannon will be glad to open the door for you as you go out. Goodbye, thank you. And be sure not to come in again. Ted, I, I just can't thank you enough. Yeah, I'm afraid your thanks are a little premature. Why, what do you mean? Chad thinks he knows what that crook is up to. Seems to me Lefty Slaughter found out that almost every rancher in the valley owes you money. He's decided to cripple them, force you to sell out to him, and then take over what ranchers he's wanted for the money they owe the store. How terrible. But why did you let him walk out of here? Why didn't you have him arrested? Well, because so far he's been too smart to involve himself. He has his hired gun thugs do his dirty work. Until we get them, Slaughter's still in the clear. Oh, I see. But isn't there anything you can do to stop them before they... they murder someone else like... like Lasher? What I'd like to do is create a situation which may force Slaughter into doing something he hadn't planned on. Some crime he hadn't figured in advance. And then catch him red-handed. I think we can, Mrs. Parker, if you'll give me your permission to call a meeting of all the ranchers who owe you money right here at your store. Uh, quiet. Quiet, please. Suppose you stop acting as if you're running this whole show, Remington, and let Sarah Parker do her own talking. Now, there's no talking for me to do. I've sold this store and all of its assets to Chad Remington, and from now on, you'll have to do business with him. Go on and grumble if you want, but it isn't going to do any good. You owe this store money, and I want cash on the barrel head. Or if I don't get it, I'm going to court and take judgments against every one of you. Remington, your poor father must be turning over in his grave. How do you expect us to raise money now? You can raise money. All you got to do is drive your cattle to market and sell it off. Why, it's almost two months till shipping time. Instead of standing around here arguing, I'm advising you to get together and start a drive with your herds up to the nearest railhead. I'm only giving you five days to be back with cash. So if you know what's good for you, you'll be on your way by sunrise tomorrow morning. <laughs> Remington buying out Mrs. Parker's store? Boss, I was there myself with the whole crowd. And he told them to get out and drive their cattle to market and be back with the money in five days, or else he was taking over every ranch in the valley. <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> There's nothing crooked than a crooked lawyer. 
The funny part is, what he's doing is playing right into our hands. Hmm? Playing into our... Sure, what happens? Those ranchers start driving their cattle to market. You and me and the rest of the boys are laying for them. <laughs> we get the cattle. Remington don't get the money, and the ranches he takes over are worth nothing. Well, I'll be... That smart <laughs> monkey is playing into our hands. <laughs> what good are them ranches without cattle on them? No good. <laughs> Krug. You go round up the boys. A thing like this calls for a real celebration. Lefty thought I was dumb, all right. The Dos Rios ranchers knew I was a crook. All I was sure of was I was taking a long, wild chance and hoping it would pay off. Next morning, just as I told them to, the ranchers joined up in one big trail drive and started for San Jacinto. From where we were perched, Cherokee, the sheriff, the posse, and I... We could see the cattle spread out along the trail almost as far as the eye could reach. I guess we waited more than an hour. Every man Jack's eyes shaded from the morning sun, scanning the pass below us, waiting, praying for some sign of trouble. And finally it came. A single shot. And then in the next instant it sounded like it must have that day at Gettysburg. We waited for a moment to make sure we were right. And then the sheriff unholstered his gun and turned to me. You sure were right, Shed. Look at them rustlers pour out of that canyon. There must be a million of them. Two million, maybe. Yeah. All right, you posse men. Unholster those forty fives and let's get to riding. Cut down through that arroyo. That way we can get between them and the cattle. And right in front of those rustlers' bullets. Say, Chad, haven't I got time for a little drink of my rattlesnake oil or something? All you got time to do is squeeze the trigger. Come on, let's go. <laughs> is turning around and heading for the woods. Oh, it's that yellow spine skunk, Slaughter. Hey, Sheriff, you keep after the rest of them. Slaughter's trying to sneak away. I'm going to get him. All right, Chet. All right, come on, men. And don't waste lead shooting over their head. All right, get around there, fella. Slaughter's got a quarter of a mile head start. Slaughter, the further away you ride, the further you're going to bounce on the way back to town. I'm not warning you again. If I bulldog you off that horse of yours, you're apt to break your neck. All right. Here's your lead back with interest. Get up there, boy. Come on. Get alongside up. In there now where I can get my arm around that. I don't go on you, Slaughter. Am I going to have to break your arm? Stop, Remington. Don't hold me. You got me. I quit. There. I quit. All right, then. Come on. Get up. Yeah. And start walking. It's a long trip back to Dos Rios and to jail. God blame you, Chad. Here you had us thinking you were a bigger crook than Slaughter. <laughs> and all the time you were doing it for our own good. Yes, sir. Just like a father with an unreasonable kid. Yes, yeah, spare the rod and spoil the child. That's Chad's motto. <laughs> What's your motto, Cherokee? Well, I guess you might say it is spare the flask and spoil the dream. <laughs> By the way, isn't it about time for a little libation right now? <laughs> From the way I look after Bulldog and Slaughter off his horse, it's about time for me to take a bath and put on some clean clothes. Well... It's not premature to thank you now, Chad. Except I don't know how I ever can. Enough. <laughs> you go talking to that young sprat like that, sir, and he'll go getting a swell head. <laughs> and not that he don't deserve one, though. That little idea of his of making the boys trail their cattle and certainly squeeze slaughter into pulling one crime he hadn't figured on. <laughs> You're so right, Sheriff. And in honor of my dear friend's talents... I suggest someone buy me a little shot of something good so I can propose a toast to it. Besides, my knees have to stop shaking yet. <laughs> well, my knee isn't shaking, Cherokee, and it's strong enough to turn you over it and beat a little genuine Indian tune on your tom-tom. Go, Chad! If you turned me over your knee, not only would you break my spirit, but you'd bust a flask full of the finest dirt key Indian rattlesnake oil that ever whetted a man's whistle. <laughs> I'm going home!
Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler, is a Bruce Ells production. Supervision by Joel Murcott. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. This is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and live to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! Sprawling boisterously across a rawhide tough frontier is a little town at Dos Rios. Not much of a town, to be sure. A few stores, a church, start of what someday will be a school, nine saloons, and one so-called lawyer. The lawyer's name is Chad Remington. Well, that's me. Of course, there's not enough law business in the whole county to keep me busy, but I do own a ranch left to me by my dad when he died. Naturally, there wouldn't be a lawyer in Dos Rios if we didn't have a court. And with the court, it goes without saying, we have a judge. Judge Fillmore, whose daughter Libby happens to be a most special favorite of mine. Well, with the lack of law business one day not so long ago, the judge and I decided to see what we could do about getting ourselves some wild turkeys. So we saddled up a couple of my horses, took two of my best rifles, and started scouting. <laughs> Nice shooting, Chad. You got yourself two gobblers. You'd call that nice shooting, Judge? Shot four times and only got two birds. <laughs> well, that's what a fella gets for spending too much time practicing law and not enough time practicing with a Winchester. <laughs> two out of four. Well, if you can keep as good an average hitting the bullseye for your clients, they should have no complaints. Clients? I haven't seen one in a month. <laughs> you don't mind my representing you, Chad. Never admit to a man who might be your future father-in-law that you can't keep his daughter in the style to which she hopes to become accustomed. <laughs> <laughs> That's good advice, Judge. And I'll be happy to pay your fee if my future father-in-law gives his consent someday. <laughs> right. Well, I better be picking up those two toms before the buzzards get to... Ah, who's this coming? I see someone coming, all right, but without my glasses... Well, it's no wonder you only bagged one turkey. That's Tim Brackett. You know, the young puncher who works over at the J. Lazy L. Oh, yeah. Hey, Tim. Howdy, Chad. Judge. Well, hey. Oh, Tim. Riding all over Patty's half acre looking for you. Cherokee told me you're probably out here on a turkey hunt. You looking for us? Well, I guess either one of you alone would have been all right. Got a legal question I'd like answered. Well, see, Judge, business <laughs> is picking up. What's on your mind, son? Well, it's just... Just something I... Well, I made a bet with a fella. No one can legally force you to pay a bet, Tim. No, that isn't what I mean, Judge. Let's suppose a fella, some fella, borrowed $10,000 on his ranch. Uh-huh. Uh, some fella, huh? Yeah. 
Yeah, some fella. Well, suppose this fella paid all of it but $2,000 and then couldn't pay the $2,000 right off. Could the man with the mortgage take the ranch away from him? It might sound inequitable, but legally, until every last cent is paid, interest and all, the lender can foreclose and take possession of the property. That's a fine thing. Lose your bet? Yeah, sure did lose my bet. Well, if you didn't bet your month's wages, there's no reason to commit suicide. Look, I just hate myself for doing this, but could one of you lend me a little money? Well, I don't know. Uh, How much money is a little money, Tim? Oh, twenty, twenty-five dollars. As long as you're going to have to owe somebody, why not owe the man you lost the bet to? Well, it's not for him. It, it's for my sister. For your sister, huh? I never heard you talk about a sister before. Yeah, matter of fact, neither did I. You mean you ain't going to let me have it? Not at all. If you give me a word that what you need the money for is strictly legitimate, I, I guess I can scrape it up. Chad, word of honor. I need $25 to help out my sister. Well, that's good enough for me, Tim. <coughs> Here you are. Don't go losing it riding back to town. You bet. See? I'll wrap it up and put it right here in this buckskin pouch in my pocket. Good. And don't forget, there's no particular hurry about paying it back. Hey, uh, I'm sure not much at speech making, but thanks, Chad. Thanks from the bottom of my heart. Get up there, boy. Let's go. Hey, boy. Chad, do you think you should have given that boy the money without finding out exactly what he needed it for? Well, he said he needed it for his sister, and it certainly was good enough for... And wait a minute. He must have dropped something when he pulled out that pouch. You see it there? What is it, Chad? What is that piece of paper? This piece of paper is a letter. From the return address on the envelope, a boy has got a sister. Lives over in the next county in Dry Wells. Well, I'll be darned. I didn't believe that story about his sister being in trouble, but apparently it's true. You think maybe under the circumstances that we ought to open that letter and see what the trouble is? Well, if the girl's in real trouble, certainly $25 isn't going to cure it. All right, Judge, what do you say we read the letter and find out? Certainly. If she needs more money, maybe we can do something to be of real help. Well, here goes. Hmm. Fine lot of good that 25 can do his sister. And it was his sister he was talking about, Chad? Yep. When her father was alive, he borrowed 10000 on their ranch. It's paid down to 2000 now, and she can't meet that. Hmm. Judge, I, I've got a notion we'd better hightail it over to the Jay Lazy Yell and find Tim. The rest of this story may be interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> Nobody at the Jay Lazy Yell knew where Tim was. He'd taken the day off. So the judge and I headed back toward town. When we got to Dos Rios, the judge went home. I went up to the offices I keep, located over at Cherokee O'Bannon's livery stable. Cherokee, not only my landlord and sidekick, but also a former medicine man, was gnashing his teeth over my letting $25 slip through my fingers so easily. Of all the impoverished, impecunious imbecility, you take the cake, Chad. Well, I've got a sweet tooth. I like cake. Well, if you would direct your elementary instincts in the proper direction... One-fifth of that amount would have set him up for everybody down at my favorite hostelry, the Lady Luck Bar and Grill. Instead of ranting that way, Cherokee, and worrying about your constantly unquenched thirst, you might give some thought to where we could find Tim. First, you give him legal advice. Then, instead of charging him for it, you... What did you stop for, Cherokee? What are you staring at out the window? Unless this is an optical illusion, the most ravishing and pulchritudinous bit of femininity... Is about to come up the stairs to visit you, you bucolic Blackstone. Absolutely stunning, Chad. What an eye. What a girl. Uh, come in. Which one of you gentlemen is Mr. Remington? Why, I am. Uh, Cherokee, get the young lady a chair. Just what I was about to do. Here, won't you please sit down? Thanks. Thanks so much. Mr. Remington, my name is Emily Brackett. Brackett? Well, like I always say, it's a small world after all. We were just talking about another bracket. A young cowboy over here, Tim Brackett. A fine, upstanding lad. Tim's my brother. Well, it is a small world, isn't it? They told me out at the J. Lazy L that you'd been out there a while ago looking for Tim, and I thought you might know where I could find him. At the moment, I don't, Miss Brackett. 
But while you're here, I have a confession to make. Yes? I read a letter you wrote to Tim about, well, about the money owing on your ranch. Well, he probably showed it to you because he wanted some legal advice. Well, that wasn't actually the reason. But now that I think about it, I have an idea your brother's headed for something which might bring a bit of trouble. Trouble? Uh, Cherokee, you're a man of the world. Indeed I am, my boy. Pride myself on it. If you needed $2,000 and didn't know how to raise it, and providing, of course, someone would lend you $25, what would you do with the money you'd borrowed? Well, since it wouldn't take $25 to drown my sorrows, I might be inclined to risk it in the game of stud poker to see if I could run a double eagle up into some of the long green folding type money. You mean that my brother borrowed $25 to gamble? I don't mean anything yet, Miss Emily. But if you'll sit right here, there are only nine places in town where he could gamble. And Cherokee and I are going out and see if we can find that young man. Staying in the plot, Tim? You're blame right I am, Duke. Staying in and raising you another 20. Hey, you must have another king in the hole, huh? What do you mean by that, Duke? What do you mean, what do I mean? Anybody with the cards showing that you have and betting the way you are must have a king buried. I always kind of suspected you could read the backs of the cards, Duke. Are you insinuating that I'm running a crooked game? I ain't insinuating, I'm saying so. How else could you know I got a king in a hole? Tim, I've been operating in Dos Rios for six years now. No one's ever talked to me that way before. So I'm asking you to pick up your money and get out. Who are you trying to bluff? I'm not bluffing, Tim. I'm telling you to clear out of the game. Yeah? Yeah. Well, if I leave the game, I'm taking a pot with me. In a square game, I don't want it. Duke, take your hands off that money. Tim, don't act loco. You go reaching for your gun and... Duke, who plugged Tim? I did, Chad. Why, you low down, double down. Now, just a minute before you both go shooting off your mouths. Why don't you ask someone who was here what happened? It was Tim's fault, Chad. He called Duke a cheat and a liar and then went for his gun. And that's gospel. I tried to stop him, but when he threw down on me, there was only one thing I could do. I guess I did it. Yeah, I guess you did. All right, some of you men, pick Tim up and take him over to the... to the undertaker's. Chad, if only you'd gotten there just a little earlier. Believe me, Miss Brackett, you've got to try to get hold of yourself. Unfortunately, all the grief in the world isn't going to bring your brother back. You just say the word, miss, and I'll fill that thieving gambler so full of lead that he'll bust right through the floor and bury himself right there. You can save yourself all that trouble, Cherokee. Because after I've had a chance to talk to a few men who were in there and I find out what actually happened, I may take care of Duke. I'll give him a chance to take care of me. Oh, no. You've done all you should already. Don't go back down there. I've got to, Miss Emily. That's got to be finished before we worry about your ranch. If there's anything I can do, you're not going to lose your place to a money-grubbing loan shark for 20 cents on the dollar. We'll return to the exciting second act of our Frontier Town adventure in just about one minute. Now, Frontier Town. From all I've noticed, death, sudden and brutal death, is as shocking in a frontier town as any place else in the country. But somehow on the frontier, folks seem better able to pull themselves together and go on with the things that have to be done. And so it was that Emily Brackett, over her first shock at her brother Tim's killing, had regained some of her composure and was able to answer a few questions. 
Well, that's about all there is to it, Chad. Everybody around our part of the country had always borrowed from old Sam Tennyson and never had any trouble. It wasn't until Mr. Tennyson died that the man who took over all of his loans began to foreclose in wholesale lots. When you say took over all his loans, what do you mean by that? I mean, he... well, I don't know exactly, but this Mr. Sturgis bought the mortgages from Sam Tennyson's estate, I guess. Eh, uh, sounds crooked to me. Estate? Did Tennyson have any heirs, sons or daughters? He had a son. But he died a few weeks later in an accident. A, a bridge he was riding over collapsed. Convenient, wasn't it? For Sturgis, I mean. What? Uh, how many ranches has his Sturgis foreclosed on already? Oh, goodness, I don't know, but I guess there isn't a part of the valley he doesn't own some acreage in. Well, I think we've imposed on you enough, Miss Emily. Right now, we still have a little unfinished business to take care of. Business with Duke Rafferty. <laughs> Leaving the judge, Libby, and Cherokee to take care of Emily Brackett, I started out to see that Duke Rafferty, the gambler, paid for the wanton killing of Tim Brackett. So, like any lawyer, I began asking questions to get the proof which would support my case. When I'd asked about half a dozen people who'd been in the so-called cafe, I wasted little time going over and paying a call on Mr. Rafferty in person. What do you want to see me about, Remington? You'll find out, Duke. Yeah, you got to stick your nose in everybody's business, huh? At the moment, all I'd like to do is see you alone. Yeah, you lawyers. Come on. Let's go into my private office. Thanks. Okay. Now, what do you want? Duke, I've made it my business to talk to half a dozen men who witnessed Tim's killing. But it... Didn't take long to learn that Tim threatened you, and even though you tried to stop him, it was the kid who cleared his holster first. Well, <laughs> you had me worried for a minute. You know, you got a reputation and a pair of eyes that throw a cold chill into a man. Well, you can relax. Now, they, they tell me Tim Brackett accused you of using a marked deck. I think you know better than that, Chad. Check. Now, how about doing me a favor? Name your own game, Chad. Running a place like this, I imagine you've met a lot of the fly-by-night gents in this part of the country. I was wondering if you could give me a line on a character over in Dry Wells in the next county, a big money man by the name of Sturgis. K.C. Sturgis? Oh, K.C.? I, I don't know. All I know is uh, the name Sturgis. What does K.C. mean? Well, if it is the same maverick, I know the K.C.'s a nickname. Stands for Kansas City. That's where he came from originally, before he started to work the small towns along the Pecos... The mining camps through Colorado. Work the mining camps, eh? Well, what is he, a gambler? Well, he gambles, but he doesn't make his living at it. Well, what does he do to make a living? Casey? <laughs> does anything and anybody. All he is, Chad's a confidence man. Confidence man, is he? That's very interesting, Duke. How in the name of Hannah did you ever get mixed up with a gent like that? I'm not mixed up with him yet. But now that you've given me this little rundown on him, I got a notion it won't be very long before I am mixed up with him. Plenty. Great gilded glory, Chad. What conceivable difference can it make if Sturgis is a confidence man? It may make the difference between being able to save Miss Emily's ranch or having Sturgis take it over for the few thousand dollars still owing on it. Chad, as far as I'm concerned, you haven't answered Cherokee's question. Uh, I guess you're right, Judge. But if Cherokee is willing to ride over to Dry Wells with us and indulge in a little acting, I've got what might be a bright idea. Now I'm more confused. Confidence man and acting? Well, all right, then. Here it is in a nutshell. If Mr. Casey Sturgis is a confidence man, and if you introduce Cherokee to him as your wealthy uncle from the East who's come out to visit you, I think Sturgis will forego your ranch temporarily and make a play for the larger stakes. Chad, I'm afraid you'd make an unsuccessful impresario. Me, a multimillionaire? Why, even with my astounding amount of histrionic ability, I'm afraid that's a characterization at this late date too far beyond my impecunious experience. <laughs> Cherokee, with a little expert coaching, we'll have you lighting your cigars with $20 bills. And I must say, Chad, although your proposal is slightly extra legal, it sounds as if it might work. On a confidence man. Well, there's an old saying, Judge, takes a crook to catch a crook. <laughs> Sir, am I to infer that you're branding me a crook? Oh, not on your life, Cherokee. I convict no man till he's proven guilty. Why, until I see you in action in dry wells, I'm not even calling you an actor. <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
we got to Dry Wells the next day and moved bag and baggage into the spare room in Emily Brackett's little ranch house. And then she sent word to Sturgis that she wanted to see him. When we saw Sturgis arriving, I suddenly remembered something I hadn't thought of before. That's Sturgis. Just riding in through the gate now, Chad. Oh, good. Then in that case, the judge and I had better go into the kitchen while Cherokee demonstrates his histrionic ab... Oh, good gosh. So one thing we hadn't thought of. What's that, Chad? Cherokee's name. Emily can't introduce him to Sturgis as her uncle Cherokee. Uh, what is your right name, Cherokee? My, uh... My... Uh... Come on, come on. Sturgis uh... is almost on the porch now. Surely your parents gave you a name when you were born. Uh, yes, they did. And I still hate my revered painter for it. My name, my cognomen, my handle is Aloysius. So you see, Mr. Sturgis, when Uncle Al got my letter asking for the $2,000 I still owe you, he simply packed up and came right out here. It was 2000 but it's more than that now with the interest and default charges. My good fellow, what difference can that make? What difference can a few thousand make one way or another? No nephew, I mean whatever a she-male nephew is called. Uh, niece, uh, I'm your niece. Thank you, Emily. No relative of mine is going to lose a ranch for a few paltry dollars. When I've got so much, I've got to keep it in three banks. Uh, in three banks? Three banks and a private vault. What? Well, having been in the furniture business all my life, nose to the grindstone and all that, it's always been my dream to come out west. Out west for bitter men and gold is where you find it. Well, I've known people before to come out from the east looking for gold and lose everything they had, but... Mr. Sturgis, if you're meaning to discourage me, you're not succeeding. Because if I can find a suitable piece of gold-bearing land, I'm prepared to pay upwards of $50,000 for it. Oh, Uncle, really, you should Now, just a minute, Miss Brackett. Your uncle's a successful businessman. I'm sure he knows what he's doing. And if you're real serious about wanting a piece of gold-bearing property, sir, I know of one that's got a fortune on it. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if I couldn't get it for, well, for a little more than the figure you have in mind. Buy on figures? Take me to the property. And if I like it, I'll give you a draft on my bank. At least on one of them. Well, look, I'd better check up on this land first and see if it's still available. And if it is, I'll show you the most valuable piece of gold-bearing property since the mother load was discovered. Well, if it doesn't take a crook to catch a crook, it certainly took an actor to bait the trap to catch the crook that time. Sturgis practically ran for his horse and headed for town with the judge and myself trailing him cautiously. And there, after a while, we saw him come out of a mining claim office and head out toward the desert. About seven miles out of town, with nothing around but rocks, cactus, and Joshua trees, the judge and I saw Sturgis dismount, kneel down, and burrow under some of the rocks. We didn't wait for him to mount up again, but we circled the location and came back afterwards. Late that afternoon, we saw him again approaching the spot in the buckboard, carrying Emily and Cherokee with him. Well, Al, my boy, here's the prop. Here's where we get off. Well, this is certainly picturesque, Sturgis. But there's nothing here but desert. That's the beauty of it. That's why you can pick it up for eighty or 90000 Why, nobody even thinks there's gold out here. And just to show you the fortune that's here, suppose you just stoop down and look under any of these rocks. Do you think I should, Emily? Go on, Al, go on. It won't bite you. Well, all right. Al, there's nothing under this rock but a lot of crawling worms. What? Well, let me see. Oh, that's funny. Well, let's look over here. There's surely a few nuggets under this rock. They aren't even crawling worms under that one. Mr. Sturgis, I have a feeling you brought me out here on a fool's errand. Why, there's no more gold here than a... Oh, look, Uncle Al. Isn't this Chad coming? Chad? Who's he? He's a friend of my brother's over in Dos Rios. Looking for us, Chad? Oh, fella. Hold it, boy. They told me it's your place you'd ridden out this way, so we trailed you. I'm glad to say I've got just about enough for you to pay off your loan. Well, this is really a coincidence. This is Mr. Sturgis, the man who holds the mortgage. Oh, howdy, Sturgis. I don't suppose you mind if I haven't got it in cash, but if you want to go back to town, the bank will give you money for these gold nuggets. Gold nuggets? Let me see them. Oh, sure. Here you are. 
Why, you low-down crooked, you... Where'd you get these nuggets? What difference can that make? I told you the bank would take them. You double-dealing buzzard, you stole them. Stole them right from here. Oh, how come you know where I got them? How do I know? Because I put them here, but... I... Well... Well, you know because you put them here yourself. You salted this little piece of land and were ready to sell it as a gold mine. What? Trying to bilk me by cheap chicanery? That's nothing but a uh, but a lie. You can't prove that. Oh, no. Can we prove that, Judge, or can't we? In any court in the land. Because both of us saw this confidence man right out here and plant the nuggets right before our eyes. Oh, you double-crossing stick. Don't close both his eyes, Chad. He's got to have yeah. one good one when he signs that release. Camp, don't worry, Cherokee. I'm only going to dot one eye and one chin. And now, now, Mr. Sturgis, you can either get up yourself or I'll help you up. Because we're all going back to the Brackett Ranch where you'll sign a receipt for payment in full for the balance of that mortgage. What are you talking about? You just admitted those nuggets were mine? They were, but there's a law that says finders keepers. <laughs> and another law in anyone's courtroom which says a confidence man can be sentenced to from 15 to 20 years in jail. Well, how about it, Sturgis? You coming back with us and signing that release? Yeah. All right, all right. I know when I'm licked. Give me a chance to get my breath, will you? Listen, you faker. I'm going to give you a better chance than you would have given me. It so happens that in my hip pocket, I have a bottle of my genuine Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil. One mouthful of that for you and one for me, and we'll all be able to ride back. Now, just a minute, Cherokee. We've agreed on the punishment for this crime. And we're not forcing Sturgis to drink that alcoholic loco juice of yours unless we catch him on ten counts of attempted murder. Chad! That's the most unfair cut <laughs> you're going to <laughs> on. <laughs> Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler, is a Bruce Ells production. Supervision by Joel Murcutt. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. And now this is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and live to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town!
Howdy. I'm Chad Remington. A cow town lawyer, I guess you'd call me. Although a lot of the folks in Dos Rios, where I come from, look at me with respect and address me as counselor. Of course, Dos Rios is just a sprawling, boisterous frontier town buried away just down below the Continental Divide. But, well, things do happen in our neck of the woods, which not alone make exciting telling, but make exciting living. For instance, not too long ago, something happened in a hotel room of a metropolitan city which affected me. (laughs) Affected me? It darn near killed me. It seems that the hotel room was being occupied by the right honorable Quade Dunstan, perhaps the most influential of all our state senators. With a bottle and some glasses handy, the senator was entertaining a so-called constituent, a rancher by the name of King Carson, who runs some 6,000 head of cattle not too far from Dos Rios, in an isolated and lawless area we call the Seminole Strip. Like a lot of political constituents, King Carson had an axe to grind. Senator, I certainly don't mean to threaten you, but if a Seminole strip is taken into the state as a duly constituted county, you're going to have to look elsewhere for campaign funds next year. <clears throat> Here, let me light that cigar for you, King. There you are. Now, let's look at this thing sensibly. That's what I thought I was doing. Don't you see the way it stands now with no duly constituted law in this strip? The man with the most uh, influence not only runs but practically owns the entire territory? And since King Carson employs close to a hundred punchers at his various establishments, King Carson is the most influential man in the Seminole Strip today. Yeah, that's just about the size of it. And I'm not aiming on seeing it changed by having you boys vote favorably on the petition to take the strip in as part of the state. King, I realize what it would mean if the petition was passed, state militia brought in and all that. But on the other hand, the Seminole Strip is wealthy and would mean a great deal in taxes to the state. Taxes? Who cares about taxes? I pay for what I want, and I want that bill defeated. Well, I certainly can't defeat it single-handed. However, With a little cooperation from you, we might accomplish our ends to the satisfaction of everyone. Huh? What do you mean, cooperation from me? I figure I can create suspicion in the minds of my fellow senators about the advisability of taking in the strip as a county of the state. Suspicion based on uh, the uh, unbridled lawlessness down there. (laughs) And then the committee would come down to Seminole for a... Personal inspection. (laughs) Unbridled lawlessness is the part in which you cooperate. You mean uh, stir up so much trouble in Seminole that they wouldn't want it in the state as a gift? Precisely, Mr. Carson. Precisely. Can I depend on you to blast the strip wide open with gunplay and everything else which will reflect on its citizenry? (laughs) Senator, not only can you count on me... But when you bring that committee down to inspect Seminole, they'll hear so much shooting, it'll sound like a battle of Bull Run. Well, if you'd like to know what that little conversation had to do with Chad Remington, I can only say it came about because of a quite normal cause. A girl. Now, I guess I better make that the girl. Because although Libby is Judge Fillmore's daughter today... I'm kind of looking forward to the time when her name will be Libby Remington. Libby got into this by going down to Seminole to spend a week or two with her mother's brother, Uncle Ruth Tomlinson. And not two days after, I received a telegram saying that if it was at all possible, Libby would like me to come down at once. Business. Well, I got hold of Cherokee O'Bannon, former medicine man and now owner of the Dos Rios livery stable... And on the promise of a good time in Seminole, Cherokee not only loaned me a horse, but rode along with me. And just what the business was Libby referred to in her telegram, we found out hardly had we crossed the state boundary into the Seminole Strip. Chad, now that we're here in Seminole, I don't want you to forget your promise to me. I'm looking forward with great anticipation to, uh, shall I say, a merry old time while over here. Oh, <laughs> Mr. O'Bannon, I... I want to remind you that my word is as good as my bond. Ah, yes, bond. (laughs) What a beautiful word that is, bond. Bottled in bond. 
Precisely what I have in mind. Now, you listen to me. You've already had five swigs out of that bottle of so-called genuine Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil, and as far as I... Marionated milk's mackerel, Chad. Did you see that? I sure did. That feed barn blew up practically in front of our eyes. Now, who'd want to blow up a feed barn? Don't ask me, but I got a feeling this is no place for us to loiter. We better knock on these horses and get over to Roof Tomlinson's ranch. Ralph, I don't mean to doubt the veracity of a man like you, but what you're saying is totally unbelievable. Well, I don't blame you for not believing it, Cherokee, but every word of what Uncle Rufus told you and Chad is the absolute truth. Gospel. I'm sure it is, Libby, but it, it just doesn't make sense. Suddenly, with no reason, trouble should hit Seminole like a tidal wave. Shootings, killings, fires. Shucks, if we could make head or tail out of it, I wouldn't have let my niece go sending that telegram. Yeah. Just like that feed barn you saw blown up. That make sense? Yeah, it makes a little sense if you're as bat-brained as I am. Now, Chad, honestly, this is no time for joking. Now, Libby, you know you've both been a little too close to the picture to get an honest perspective on it, but hasn't it ever occurred to you that just perhaps someone is stirring up all this lawlessness because there's a petition up at the Capitol now to, to take Seminole in as a county? But why, Chad? Just tell me why someone would want to keep the Seminole strip out of the state. What would they have to gain? Well, might have a lot to gain at that, Libby. Right now, this here strip is sort of a governmental orphan. No real law down here. And if the strip isn't voted into the state, there may never be any law down here, except gun law. Uh, tell me, Ruth, how do the ranchers and other folks in Seminole feel about this crime wave? Our men I've talked to are so blame upset they're ready to grab every gun and rifle they can lay a hand to. Just start blasting. Uh-huh. Once they start doing that, Roof, you're going to be in the middle of the darndest range war you ever saw. Yes, sir, Bob. And if you start shooting each other, I'll bet you one whole case of my rattlesnake oil to a gopher hole. Those senators and politicians won't ever give you a county charter. Oh, Chad, that would be terrible. Well, what do you think Uncle Roof and the rest should do? How can they fight back against someone they don't even know? Libby, I'll tell you. The first thing is to get the decent citizens of Seminole together and talk sense into them. Make them realize they're only hurting themselves if they fly off the handle and try to fight back right now. But gosh almighty, Chad, how are you going to talk to a lot of wild men? Then they got plenty of cause for being wild and acting like sensible human beings. Well, I'm not guaranteeing anything, mind you, but if you can round up 20 or 30 men you can depend on and get them to attend a meeting, I'll promise you this much. I'll make the darndest speech any lawyer has since the defense of Benedict Arnold. <laughs> Ruth Tomlinson did just what I asked him. And the next morning, shortly before noon, 27 angry-faced ranchers filed into the little town hall to listen to me. <laughs> I guess I wouldn't make too good a criminal lawyer, because all of my impassioned speechifying left them pretty cold. Until a tall, swarthy man got up in the audience and started down toward the platform where I was standing. Now just a minute, men, just a minute. I think Mr. Remington's right. He's absolutely right. Well, thanks. I'm glad to find somebody who thinks I'm not all wrong. Uh, come on up here. Hey, sure thing. Hey, uh... Uh, by the way, Remington, I'm King Carson, oh. cattle broker here. I own the Frying Pan Ranch and two or three smaller spreads. So, you see, I've got a real interest in what you're talking about. Well, fine, Mr. Carson. And now, would you mind telling your neighbors just why you think they should leave their guns alone until such time as the states voted favorably on your petition? Well, all right, Remington. Although I'm not certain that making speeches is going to change the minds of this crowd. <laughs> well, sir, they say they can't rule you off the track for... Chad, what's up? There's a man outside the window. Uh, Chad! Oh, Chad, oh, Chad, oh, Chad oh, you all right? Yeah, I'm all right, Ruth. But come on, all of you. Let's get outside after that bushwhacker. Chad, did you see? I saw him. Hit his horse and ducked into that alley the other side of the hotel. Come on, man. Carson, see you, boys. Grab your horses. Let's get after him. All right, some of you circle the other way. Come on, Remington. Let's head for that alley. I'm with you, Carson. All right, get up there, boy. Come on, boy. Come on, Oh, 
Doggone it, Chad. We're running these horses to death to get no place. Well, Carson said he saw the man head this way. I certainly thought I did. Bring it up, boys. Hold it. Hold it. Well, I'll be blamed. What do you make of this, Chad? Oh, what could anyone make of it? Someone took a shot at me at the meeting and somehow got away. Kind of makes fools out of us, too, doesn't it, Remington? Hmm? After shooting off our mouths, telling the boys not to fly off the handle and start squeezing trigger, we do that very thing ourselves. Well, Carson, now that I've been singled out as a target, I'm starting to feel the way the other men do. What do you mean, singled out? I mean, look here. Here on the side of my neck. What? Chad, your neck's all bloody. That's right. Sixteenth of an inch closer, and those two slugs would have stopped my speech-making permanently. Well, I got an idea there's someone who doesn't want any speech-making here in this strip. But when I find the man, I've got a few oratorical gestures left I'm going to use on him. Ten raw-boned knuckles swung freely to punch home the points I'm going to make. And I don't mean in speeches. <laughs> We'll return to the exciting second act of our Frontier Town adventure in just about one minute. And now, Frontier Town. I imagine if a bullet creased your neck that you'd feel a little bit personal about it, too. I did. Now, freely admit it made me not only more interested, but more than a little bitter. It seemed apparent my first guess was right. And moreover, that someone who knew about my guess could breathe easier if I left the Seminole Strip in a long pine box. Well, after our wild goose chase, Cherokee and I went back to Ruth Tomlinson's ranch and sat around with Ruth and Libby trying to fit this jigsaw together. Chad, I know how you feel, having been shot at. Nearly killed, that's what he was. Nearly killed. And I hope you won't jump down my throat for what I'm about to say. Don't jump down your throat, Libby. Not until I have the legal right. Well, what are you aiming to say, Libby? Just this. Has it occurred to any of you that the only man at the entire meeting who claims he saw which way that gun toter went was King Carson? I don't know what you're driving at. King saw him ride into the alley. King said he saw him ride into the alley. Libby, now I know why I feel like I do about you. I think you hit the nail right on the thumb. King Carson, why not? A man who owns as much land as he does certainly could stand to gain by having the state reject Seminole as a county. You're right, he'd really be a king. The king of the whole Seminole domain. Well, supposing you three are right, and I ain't saying you are, how are you ever going to find out? I don't know for sure, Ruth, but I think if Cherokee and I rode over and paid a call on his lordship, King Carson, at his office, my legal training might give me a few questions to ask him that'd prove just a little embarrassing. Come on, Cherokee. You and I are riding. <laughs> Doggone it, King. Don't go bawling me out. I done exactly what you told me to do. Oh, sure, Toby. You did exactly what I told you to do. The only thing you didn't do was to put one of those two slugs through that rattle-brained lawyer's thick skull. If I hadn't led that posse on through the alley, you'd be dangling from a tree right now. Yeah, you're so smart. Maybe you better do everything yourself. There's one thing I will do myself, Toby, if you don't stop talking back. King, you got no business slapping me. I'm not going to slap you again, because I don't go around slapping corpses. And if you don't get that Chad Remington once and for all before today is over, a corpse is exactly what you're going to... What are you staring at? King, quick. Huh? See who just rode up here? It's Remington, that partner of his. Well, <laughs> that simplifies everything, doesn't it? Simplifies? Yeah. Since I can't trust you to take care of Remington, this gives me a chance to do it for you. Now, you stay here installing. I'm going out the side door and slip around to the rear window. All you have to do is to get him with his back to that window. But you'd better not slip up on that. That's all I've got to say. 
Well, you black-hearted bag of wind. I got a good notion. I'll be right back, Cherokee. This won't take a minute. Oh, howdy, you. King Carson around? Why, uh, uh, King be right back. Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah, right back. Uh, just, uh, just make yourself comfortable. T- take that chair over there by the, by the window. Well, thanks. Don't mind if I do stretch my legs. Uh, good grief. Shot twice through his back. You sneaking bushwhacker? Out of sight already. Every time I turn my back, someone else is... Here, here, here. What's going on in my... What? Kill. Well, now, look here, Carson. Don't look at me like that. I had nothing to do with it. I was just standing here. Oh, you here. didn't, eh? Now, what are you doing just putting your gun back in your holster? Yeah. Oh, good grief. Can't you see the glass in that side window's broken? Someone shot through there. What does that prove? Nothing. And if you think we're going to stand by here and let you get away with a cold-blooded murder, my friend, you've made the biggest mistake of your life. You. We're taking you out to the nearest cottonwood and end your speech making with a rope. Have you men all been smoking local weed? What do you mean? I have Remington shot somebody, then some bullets ought to be missing out of his gun. If he's still got six bullets in it, then he isn't the man you're looking for. Oh, yeah, that's right. Now, now, just a minute, Cherokee. I appreciate what you're trying to do. As for those shots, I... How are you wasting your breath arguing, Chad? Just hand over your gun. Here, I'll get oh, it. This is utterly ridiculous. We heard the shots and came in now, here and found him. Now, there's no use squawking, King. But he... If these slugs are in Remington's gun, he couldn't have done the killing. Blame right. Now, here's his gun. Look for yourself. Thanks. Well, I'll be hanged. There isn't one chamber empty. What? No, sir, not one. I'm mighty glad you spoke up, fella. We might have hung the wrong man. I'm plumb sorry. You're plumb sorry. Oh, friend, this is one of the happiest moments of my life. Of course, I'm sorry to disappoint Mr. Carson, because now he'll have to find someone else to charge with this particular murder. Oh, oh Cherokee, you're wonderful. <laughs> You're telling me, Libby, why before I got my medicine wagon, I worked the Chautauqua route with the shell game. Here it is. Now it's not there. Which shell is it under? <laughs> best man in the business, if I say so myself. Yes, indeed. Well, you, you must have been the best man, Cherokee. Although I, I don't see how, with everybody looking at you, you still managed to palm my gun, which had two shells shot out of it, and... Give them the cold out of the dead man's holster. Neither do I. Well, since it's not considered ethical to give away any professional tricks of prestidigitation, I'll have to refuse to answer. Oh. But I'm mighty glad that for once I was able to help Chad instead of Chad always helping me. <laughs> By the way, wouldn't you say it calls for a little uh, libation about this time, Chad? <laughs> oh, Bannon, you can drink your fool head off. Well, thank you. Uh, just as soon as we've gotten the goods on King Carson and turned him over to the nearest marshal. Uh, I knew there'd be some string attached to that. Talking about getting the goods is a lot different from actually getting the goods, Chad. I'll say amen to that, Libby. Well, let's save our amens for Carson's funeral if we're good and lucky. Because we'll have to be lucky to pin anything on him. We will? Yeah, he's smart. Slick as a jackrabbit in an oil well. Look at what he framed on me. What's that? Well, the way I figure it, the man he killed was a man who worked for him that he wanted to get rid of. So? So he killed him, figuring the mob had killed me, thereby getting rid of both of us and keeping his own hands clean. And again, I say so. So, my dear Miss Persistence, I think that since King Carson considers himself an expert at murder, what we've got to do is plan another one for him. Just pray that we're lucky enough to stop him before it's too late. I didn't mean to sound enigmatic, but there wasn't much more I could tell him at the time. I was still a little shaken up from having escaped hanging, thanks to Cherokee's quick wit and even more nimble fingers. But most of all, I didn't have anything definite worked out. And then when I heard the next day that Senator Quaid Dunstan and his committee had arrived from the state capitol and that the senator was putting up at King Carson's place, everything soon seemed to fit together. Of course, Senator. I can't say things worked out 100%. But I think there's been enough trouble around Seminole for your committee to refuse action on the petition to take it in as a county. Of course. 
And I certainly wish you'd gotten rid of that Chad Remington instead of bungling that up. Yes, well, I... Oh, that's funny. Someone coming here at this time of night. Uh, excuse me, Senator. I'll open the door. Evening, King. Mind if I come in? Why, uh... Why, I, I'm busy at the moment, Roof. Uh, won't tomorrow do? No, I'm afraid this is one thing that won't wait. Senator, this is Roof Tomlinson, a neighbor of mine. Oh, well, how do you do, Mr. Tomlinson? Please to know you, Senator. I, uh, I'm sorry I had to come in like this, but uh, I'd like to talk to Mr. Carson alone. Well, what about, Roof? Well, I uh, happen to know who shot Toby at your place the other day. The what? Oh. Really? Well, how interesting. The senator is here to find out just who it is who's been stirring up all the trouble. So he'll be just as interested as I am in finding out what you know. Now, uh, wait a minute, King. Uh, you sure you want me to tell what I saw? I certainly. We've got to bring that kind of a sneaking buzzard to justice. You know the man's name? Well, uh... Then, uh, maybe you can describe him, huh? Would you say he was about, uh... About my build? Yes, I would. And uh, would you say he looked anything like Mr. Carson? Yeah, I'd say that, too. You see, I was just turning the corner when I saw the whole thing happen. Well, Senator? King, I'm afraid this gentleman is a little too frank to be trusted for too long. That's what I was thinking, too. What did you come here for, Tomlinson? Think you could blackmail me? Why, you smooth-talking vulture. You're the one that's been trying to blow the Seminole strip to bits. You're absolutely right, Senator. He's not a man to be trusted at all. I'm sorry to have to do this to you, Roof. But our game has gone a little too far to allow you to break it up. Carson, for heaven's sake, stop wasting time. Squeeze that trigger and get it over with. Hey, who's that? Drop that gun, Carson. No, no, drop it. What? Beautiful shooting, Chad. Blasted that gun right out of his hand. All right, open the front door, Roof. Let Cherokee in. I'm saving my strength and coming in through this window. Hey, darn right, Chad. And, Senator, you better sit right where you are. Are you... Yeah. Well, we sure got him dead to... Chad! Carson, he's got another... A sleeve gun, huh? Well, Carson... You... <laughs> Senator, my gun is on the floor. Hey, grab him, Cherokee. Yeah. Why, you lily liver, penny-pitching politician, you... Why, you... Oh. Great jumping G-horse, Chad. You doubled Carson up like a jackknife. All right, you. Stand still. Get your hands off of me and keep them off. Why, sure, Senator. We'll be pleased to get our hands off you. But not before a federal marshal gets his hands on you. The three of us heard more than enough out of you and Carson to guarantee the next soapbox you'll campaign from will be in the laundry of the federal penitentiary. <laughs> I'll bet both of you, the good citizens of Seminole, will keep the toxin ringing until well past midnight. I'm sure they will. This is really a celebration for them, finally getting the county charter. You're right about them, Libby, but I'm afraid that isn't what's on Cherokee's mind. He's all in a lather about not being able to participate in the celebration, the uh, libation part of the celebration. Well, after he's practically saved your life by that sleight of hand he performed changing guns, I think he's entitled to a reward. Now, now you're talking. Yes, indeed you are. Well, I fully intend to see that Cherokee gets a reward, his uh, just reward. That sounds more like it. <laughs> you know what your just reward is? Having found out what a great magician you are, uh, hereafter I'm just going to give you an empty glass so you can say hocus pocus <laughs> over it and produce your own libation. Why, of all the nefarious schemes, <laughs> come, on, I... <laughs> come on, we'll never get back to Dos Rios if we listen to Cherokee singing How Dry I Am. And with the election of a new senator coming up, I want to get home for the boat. All right, girl. Let's get stepping. Hey, I can't ride that fast. I've got a bottle in my hip pocket. Well, don't worry about that, Cherokee. If that bottle breaks, the drinks will be on the horse. Oh. <laughs>
Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler, is a Bruce Ells production. Supervision by Joel Murcutt. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmar. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. This is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! about the frontier, maybe you know my hometown, Dos Rios. I'm Chad Remington. Not alone the one practicing lawyer in town, but almost the only lawyer in the county. Our section of the country was settled by the early Spanish. And although that was in the days of the old vaqueros, the Spanish influence still is evident wherever you go. And believe me, it's not at all unusual because of it for a lawyer to get into trouble. Gun trouble. Uh, just a while back, I was riding toward Dos Rios with Cherokee O'Bannon. He owns the town livery stable now that we've convinced him it's safer and more permanent than peddling his genuine Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil from the back of a wagon. Well, Cherokee and I will open along and suddenly... Geronimo's ghost, Chad. Did you hear what I heard? Not only did I hear those gunshots, Cherokee, but now I can see where they came from. Hey, look over there. See that smoke rising just over the roof of that hay barn? Why, that's that widow lady's place. What's her name? Bessie Dryden? Yeah, that sure is Bessie's place, Cherokee. Since this sounds like a pitched battle, maybe it's open to the public. Come on. As we rounded the clump of aspens which shield Bessie's house from the road, we saw a sight which stopped us for a moment. Bessie was standing on her porch, a Winchester in her hands, its barrel aimed at two men who seemed to have stepped out of an illustration from some old Spanish book. And the team of two black horses which pulled the carriage they rode up in wore plumes over their silver encrusted bridles. Well, Cherokee were off our horses and running toward the porch just as Bessie raised the rifle to her shoulder and took aim at the taller of the two strangers. Blessed you to blazes. I'm not telling you to get off of my place again. Bessie! Bessie, put down that gun before someone gets hurt. You keep out of this. Senor, your intervention is most fortuitous. You might even have saved this woman's life. Yeah, well, I'm now, well able Excuse me, to... Bessie, excuse me, but I'm taking that rifle before it goes off again. Now, here, Cherokee, you keep an eye on it. I'll keep an eye on her, too. And we both keep eye on la mujer, eh? Huh? See, amigo? Okay, both watch her. Now, now, would someone mind telling me what this is all about? This overdressed oaf come out here and had the brass-bound gall to tell me I'd have to pay him rent for this place I homesteaded myself. Or he was going to throw me off. And despite your threats, madam, I fully intend to. 
This land, all of it, belongs to the Chavez family. Ah, uh, Chavez family. Perhaps I'd better introduce myself. I am Don Alfredo Chavez Nagel, recently from Santa Fe. And this is my servant, Palmero. And you, sir? Oh, I'm Chad Remington, Mr. Nagel, and I would like to know what you mean by you own all this land. I personally know that Mrs. Dryden and her late husband homesteaded this section more than 20 years ago. I'm not questioning the homestead, but only two weeks ago this came to light. Oh? Grant from the King of Spain to my maternal grandfather, Don Alfredo Sepulveda Chavez y Dominguez. Yeah, expect me to believe that. Oh, wait, you may have to believe it, Bessie. Under the treaty by which we acquired this territory from Spain, we agreed to recognize all crown grants made by the King of Spain previously. Uh, may I see that parchment? I have no reason not to show it to you. Oh, thank you. It looks legitimate enough. Are you implying that it may be illegitimate? Oh, far from it. Not at all. You, you see, Mr. Nagel, I happen to be a lawyer. A by lawyer? Nature. Then perhaps this meeting was more fortuitous than I at first believed. Senor Remington, for three days, Palmero and I have been driving constantly just to come to Dos Rios for the sole purpose of perfecting my title to this land. For that reason, I am in need of an attorney. And since you are one... Chad, I... if you take five cents of that land grabber's money, well, I'll... I haven't ha taken anything yet, Bessie, but... Well, since from the description in this deed, Mr. Nagel may hold title not only to your property, but to most of the ranches in this valley, I think it might be good business for all of us if we did ride into my office and talk this over. Don Alfredo Chavez Nagel rode into town alongside of his overdressed driver, Palmero, and rocked Dos Rios like an earthquake. And then we went up to my office over Cherokee's livery stable. And after Nagel explained how he'd found the deed in an old trunk just a few weeks ago, he went on to tell me of his plans. So you see, Senor Remington, it's not a matter of money with me, it's a matter of pride. Hmm? Family pride. I see. I want this claim recognized, so my sainted mother's family name of Chavez will be perpetuated. I don't want to appear stupid about this, but if it's not a matter of money, why this shooting fray out at Bessie Dryden? Well, that old harridan didn't even ask how much rent I wanted before she grabbed for a gun and started shooting. You see, hers was the first place we came to on our way up from Santa Fe. So I told Palmera to stop in order that we could get acquainted. Well, uh, for how much money do you want for the land, Mr. Nagel? A token of me or nothing. A dollar a year will be more than enough to compensate me financially and at the same time legally make my deed effective. At least I should think it would under the law. Well, legally, you're perfectly right. If all of the people living on ranches covered by your crown grant would pay you nominally a dollar a year, it, it'd certainly be adequate evidence if they recognize your claim. And that, believe me, sir, is all I want. If you had ever known my mother, how beautiful and sweet she was... You would understand why I want to perpetuate her name by calling this the Rancho Chavez. Well, slice me thin and call me jerky. Chad, this man is a real humanitarian. He certainly must be Cherokee because at a dollar a year, the most he can make is something slightly in excess of $30. If you're saying that because you think it's too small an amount for me to pay you a fair fee, yes, Senor Remington... A retainer of $200. Oh, now, just a minute, Mr. Nagel. Uh, not only am I unable to take your retainer, but I'm unable to take your case until such time as we can establish the authenticity and validity of your deed. Oh? And how do you propose to do that? Well, normally it might be a long and tedious process. But it so happens that we have a judge living here in Dos Rios who not only has handled several similar cases, but, uh, well, he happens to be an especially good friend of mine. Especially good, he says. <laughs> Why, he's practically engaged to the judge's daughter, Libby. Well, if that's the case, we should be able to get through with this in just a few days. Oh, we might at that. And this being nearly noon hour, with the judge coming home almost every day for lunch, I think this would be as good a time as any to get his expert opinion. <laughs> Well, Judge, what do you think? Seems to be no question about this deed, Chad. And, Mr. Nagel, 
Everything seems exactly as it should be, even down to the seal and ribbons. Wouldn't those ribbons look lovely on a hat or a new dress? <laughs> You'll have to pardon my daughter, Mr. Nagel. She's just like all women. No matter what it is she sees, she tries to figure out some way of wearing it. <laughs> That's the way of all beautiful women. Well, thank you, Mr. Nagel. Did you hear that, Chad? Oh, I certainly did, Libby. Well, all I can say is, in this case, the client is speaking for his attorney. Oh, excellent, Mr. Remington. Very well put. <laughs> I hope I can do as excellent a job in convincing the ranchers around here to pay you that dollar a year and not combat your claim. But even with Mr. Nagel charging them only a dollar a year for rent? The folks around here, my dear Libby, have hair-trigger tempers, or else they wouldn't need a judge. Or a lawyer. I just got a thought. Most of the men affected by this Spanish grant will be attending the meeting of the Cattlemen's Association tomorrow to discuss driving their herds up to market. So if you'll come along with me and back me up, I, I think we can soon make them realize they're getting off mighty lucky. <laughs> getting off lucky... You'd have thought I was down there with process service trying to throw widows and orphans out of their homes. It took almost five minutes after I broke the news to bring any semblance of order back to the meeting. Folks! Folks! Won't you please quiet down? Chad and I are just trying to tell you facts. And apparently you don't appreciate how fortunate you really are. Fortunate? Is someone else taking our land out from under us? Now, Kirby, no one's taking anything out from under anybody. Matter of fact, the land doesn't even belong to you. Never did. Except that now Mr. Nagel's willing to let you keep the land by paying him a dollar a year. Yeah, but suppose he changes his mind two years from now. He can't, Bodine. I've drawn leases for everybody that guarantees a dollar rental for 49 years. I've seen Mr. Nagel's deed. It grants to his maternal grandfather in perpetuity the 12,800 acres north of Navajo Pass, as well as the 18,000-odd acres to the south of the pass by the Arroyo. And instead of charging you a dollar an acre, which would mean $30,000 a year to him, Nagel's just going to charge 27 of you ranchers a dollar apiece. The good grief, man. My own father settled here before most of you did. The ranch he left me is north of the Navajo Arroyo on Mr. Nagel's property. You're no better off nor any worse off than I am. And I'm tickled to death to sign this lease, just as I'm recommending to you all that you should. Well, I'm not going to spend all week arguing about these leases. If we don't get our cattle up to market, the buyers will have gone back east. And then we won't even have the dollar to pay for the lease. You got the lease with you, Chad? I'll sign. Well, now you're really talking. If you'll step up here, Mr. Nagel, and sign these leases as owner of the land, I'll see that these men execute them as the tenants. <laughs> hey, what's wrong with you, Buck? You'd make a perfect laughing hyena. <laughs> oh, how you put it over on them. Oh, look, my friend. <laughs> These lapses into your native English aren't necessary at all. Not alone had you better stick to that Spanish dialect, but as my driver, Palmero, you better practice it, too. Oh, uh, si, si, I practice it good, I think, huh? <laughs> yeah, you know, when that judge got up and started talking about the north side of Navajo Pass and then the south side, I thought, sure, the game was up. I thought somebody had tumbled to what you were going to pull. <laughs> my dear Buck, uh, I mean Palmero. I've engaged the finest lawyer in the county, and I have the support of the judge. They are reputable citizens. But what their reputations may be after they've found what we've done with Navajo Pass is something I'd rather not contemplate. <laughs> <laughs> We'll return to the exciting second act of our Frontier Town adventure in just about one minute.
And now, Frontier Town. I don't know how much you know about women. The longer I live, the more convinced I become I don't know too much. But there's one thing I've started to learn about, and that's a woman's intuition. Take that night, the night of the meeting of the Dos Rios Cattlemen's Association. I'd gone over to the judge's house for supper, and after a while, when the moon came up, Libby and I wandered outside. With my success in having all the ranchers sign Nagel's leases, I, I was feeling pretty good. Uh, not to mention that it was a soft summer evening, and Libby was there. You know what I was thinking, Libby? You're like a, like a honeysuckle. All alive and lovely during the day. And, well, at night, at least tonight, just as quiet and wrapped up in yourself. I'm worried, Chad. You worried? I am. I wish you hadn't done what you did at that meeting today. Well, no fine future I'd have, we'd have, if I went around turning down cases and fees. Mm, I've got a feeling about this, an awful feeling. What? Chad, I don't trust that man. I don't trust him a bit. Oh, Nagel? Uh, what in the world is there to mistrust about a man who did what he did? Now, I'm afraid you don't understand about those old Spanish families and their pride. Now, I'm afraid that I understand that man. Chad, he's too oily. He's too smooth. Oh, come here. What's the use of wasting our time talking about Nagel when we could be talking about, well, about... The moonlight. Us. Oh, Chad. Oh, Libby. I wonder if you'll ever know how much I... Hey, Chad! Oh. Chad, I've got the horses here and it's time to be riding back to the ranch. What a time for him to show up. All right, Cherokee. Be there in a few minutes. Young fella, me lad, there's a cattle drive starting tomorrow morning. And if you want to be up at Navajo Basin with your herd at sunup, you better be getting some sleep. My master's voice. And I, I guess he's right at that, Libby. Uh, goodbye. I'll see you when we get back from market. Be careful, Chad. Promise me you will. Be careful? What about? I, I don't know. Just be careful, Chad. Be careful about everything. Everything. Be careful, she said. But by then it was too late. However, I slept well, and the next morning, Cherokee and I drove my little bunch of cattle that was ready for market up to Navajo Basin at the foot of Navajo Pass and joined the other ranchers. Chad, I doubt if I'll ever forgive you for taking me off of the back of that medicine wagon. Oh, maybe you'd rather have been lynched for selling that phony medicine. Phony or right. That rattlesnake oil is absolutely guaranteed 90 proof. <laughs> I still think I'd rather have been lynched at the... Play nursemaid to a lot of cows? Yes, indeed. I really believe I would. Oh, Come on, Chad, you're late. One of the boys went up ahead already. Oh, must have been a wide open rush, eh, Kirby? Who was it that couldn't wait and started off by himself? Uh, that was Jim Bodine. Said it'd be slow going through Navajo Pass and we'd catch up with him anyhow. Oh. Everybody else here? Yep, now that you two are. There's Frank Sherman, Ty McCarthy, and uh -huh. your old friend, Bessie Dryden. Hi there, Bessie! You look beautiful even in the early morning hours. <laughs> That's the way you sell Pat medicine. Well, don't you try to sell me none of it. Why should he? I'm paying him more as a cowboy than he made perpetrating that medicine fraud. One thing I don't like about cowboy is these clothes. What's wrong with the clothes? Well, only got pint-sized pockets, and I'm a two-quart man. <laughs> <laughs> what we ought to do is dress you up like a Newfoundland dog and put a keg around you. <laughs> Them shots. Seemed to me they came from up Navajo Pass. Navajo Pass? Well, that's where Jim Bodine just went with his cattle. Oh, for the love of Pete, look, isn't that a horse coming with its rider half off down out of the pass? Hey, look. It's Jim Bodine. It appears like he's shot. Hey, Mike. Hey, I wonder what in blazes happened. Oh, we'll soon be finding out. Here comes that horse, wide open. Hey, Cherokee, come on, lend me a hand. Oh, there. Oh, hold it, you. Slow down. Hey, come on now. Stand still. There. Hey, Jim, what in the world happened to you? Uh, pass. He's barricaded. Won't let no one through. Barricaded? Who barricaded the pass? Your friend, your client, 
Nagel, what? Why, doggone you, Chad Remington, I got a good mind to knock your brains out. Oh, now, if Jim's right, Bessie, and Nagel did barricade the pass, I wouldn't blame you. That is, if I have any brains. Come on, Cherokee, we're going up in the Navajo Pass ourselves. <laughs> Jim Bodine was right, except it wasn't exactly a barricade. It was more like the breastworks at Gettysburg. Wire had been strung up across the pass, and right below it were sandbags, each bag bristling with a rifle. Cherokee and I got within about 30 yards of it when... Oh, hold it, Cherokee. Whoa, whoa. This is far enough. This is too far. Turn them horses and get out of here. Just a minute, Buck. This gentleman I want to talk to. Hey, Chad. That servant of Nagel certainly talks regular English. Yeah, I'm afraid they both know a good deal more about English than we do. I suppose you can explain this, Nagel. It's quite simple, Counselor. Nobody goes through Navajo Pass across my property without my permission. And my permission can be obtained only by buying it. Your property? But Navajo Pass is a public road. Oh, so? You know, if you'd take the time to refer to some of the old maps, Mr. Remington... You'll find that the arroyo here to my left, which is on my property, used to be a riverbed and that the river flowed down through this pass. You trying to be ridiculous? There's no river here now. And what's that got to do with it anyhow? It may have a lot to do with it, Cherokee. I suppose you realize, Nagel, that if you delay these ranches until the cattle buyers have gone back east, that every ranch is going broke. Naturally. And therefore, they should be glad to pay for the privilege of crossing my land. Let's say, five dollars a head. You know something? I'm even starting to doubt that this is your land. You know, your doubts might have been well-founded before you so nicely drew up those leases. Now it's of record that every rancher around here has acknowledged in writing my title to this land. Why, you're a bigger thief than I am. I was. I used to be, that is. Nagel, all I can tell you is this. So far, you've succeeded in sucking me in, making a fool of me. But that cattle's gonna get to market on time. All right, turn that nag around, Cherokee. We're getting out of here. You mean he can do that to us, Chad? Hold us up for five dollars a head? What do you think, Judge? I think he's a blasted crook. I'll bet you even that deed of his is a phony. Well, now that I think of it, I remember a druggist I used to buy stuff from. He had a way of taking a piece of paper and making it look old, like parchment. And I'll wager that's exactly what Nagel did. Well, once we can establish that fact, we'll make short work of him. Chad, I'm going up to the state capitol at once. Yeah, you should, Judge, but well, in the meantime, since possession is nine points of the law and these cattle have got to get to market, Nagel's got us over a barrel. Unless... Unless what? Unless we can break through that barricade. Well, how in the name of Simple Simon are you going to do that? Uh, now, wait a minute. Remember the yarn about the Trojan horse? Uh, listen to me. The Greeks got their soldiers into Troy by hiding them inside a hollow horse. I think we can do the same thing and trample down that barrier and the men behind it by using our cattle. Cherokee, get out there and call in those outriders. we got to get these cattle running. Why, after what I'd let him in for, they even listened to me doesn't make much sense. Because the idea itself was as wild as a coyote that's been feeding on loco weed. But this was a desperate situation, called for desperate means. I knew that 50-odd ranchers and cowpokes wouldn't stand a chance against those rifles that stuck out of the barricade like quills out of a porcupine's back. About the only thing that could blast them out of there would have been cannon. Or, I hope, the surging, irresistible charge of some 3,000 head of cattle. Well, since, as we lawyers say, time is of the essence, we didn't waste time arguing. We lined up the herds about eight abreast, packed close enough to just fill the pass so there'd be no turning back. And then, with one wild whoop and the echo and roar of six guns, we started those cattle toward the barricade at a dead run. <laughs> Kirby, you keep back. Keep back on the cattle. they got to break through first to make an opening for us. 
They're getting through, Tad. They're getting through. Come on, let them get away. Come on. What are you packing left? Hey, the wire's down, Tad. Them gun hands and angles are giving up. Cherokee, you come on with me. Nagel and Palmero are scrambling up those rocks like mountain sheep. Come on, you vagabonds. After Tad, up to those rocks. Nagel, either stand where you are or we're going to run you down. Don't. Don't. I haven't even got a gun. All right, hold it, Cherokee. Hold it. Keep these two buzzards covered. Remington, this is something you're going to pay for personally. This is my land. Every foot of it is my land. Yeah, I guess it is your land to all intents and purposes, Nagel. Because you're going to be living here, right here, for about the next 30 years. But it won't be at the so-called Chavez Rancho. No, it'll be down in town in the county jail. Quiet. Quiet. There'll be silence in this courtroom. While I pronounce sentence on the prisoners. Alfred Nagel, you will rise. This court finds you guilty of forgery, attempted homicide, and of operating a bunco game. And sentences you and Buck Palmer, alias Pomero, to state's prison for from 20 to 50 years at hard labor. Court dismissed. <laughs> Well, Libby, do you think your father was too hard on those crooks? Far from it. Nagel should have gotten an extra ten years for all those beautiful lies he told me the first time he came to the house. <laughs> Say, Chad, I hate huh? to interrupt, but if it's all the same to you, well, I'd like to go back and take off these cowpunchers, Paul's. Mighty uncomfortable, mighty uncomfortable. What do you mean, Cherokee? They're too tight? <laughs> they sure are too tight, aren't they, Cherokee? With those pint-sized pockets, they sure choke a man who has a two-quart thirst. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler, is a Bruce Ells production. Story and supervision by Joel Murcott. Direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. This is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town!
Not too far below the Continental Divide, and nested in the narrow valley between the Red and the White Rivers, lies the boisterous, brawling frontier town called Dos Rios. That's where I come from. And the little shingle hanging outside my office above the livery stable reads Chad Remington, attorney at law. Now that you know who I am, maybe you're thinking a saddle stop lawyer leads a pretty dull and humdrum life. But don't you ever believe it. No, sir, with the few good folks we have and the few bad ones out my way, life is pretty raw most of the time. Well, just take what happened to me about a month ago. Cherokee O'Bannon, who owns the livery stable, now that he's reformed from peddling his rattlesnake oil, came hot-footing up the rickety wooden steps which lead to my office, a copy of our weekly newspaper clutched in his hands. Chad, just wait. Just wait here, my boy. Do you see this? Well, what have you got there, Cherokee? A new formula for a patent medicine that is absolutely guaranteed to cure bad livers, cold shivers, sore withers, and heaves? Nothing of the sort, nothing of the sort. Just read this, right here in this box of the front page. Okay, here, let me have it. Federal government throwing Tioga National Forest Reserve open for homesteading. Well, opening up the Tioga Reserve means turning over about 6,000 square miles for settlement. Absolutely correct. And if you know that territory, you'll be as excited as I am. Why, Chad, I believe that Tioga country is even richer than the Dos Rios Valley. Well, now, maybe I'm thinking a little slow this spring weather, but you're going to have to explain to me how it affects you. Chad, you know me well enough by this time to know that I'm not a mercenary man. Why, a dollar doesn't mean any more to me than... Than Than your good right arm. Than my good right? No, certainly not. The only real use I have for money is not for the real me, but for the other me. The drinking me. <laughs> However, when I think of all the folks who are going to make that run into Tioga and settle there, it makes me realize they're going to need horses. And that a livery stable, getting in on the ground floor, should coin money, extended palm over closed digits. That's hand over fist to you. Well, Cherokee, I'm inclined for once to agree with you. A livery stable there stands a fair chance of making some money, but... Now that you're established here, why take the risk of moving to some new place where you might fail? Uh, Nothing ventured, nothing gained, they say. Mm -hmm. And I'm a venturesome character. How about it, Chad? You haven't taken a trip in months. Why don't we both get down to that land rush and look the Tioga over? Well, if for no other reason, I guess I'd better go just to keep you out of mischief. And anyhow, I must admit I get a real thrill out of seeing something like that. Oh, that's democracy really in action. Chad, you've just warmed the cockles of my heart. (laughs) And now so the other part of me warms up, too. I think I'll repair to the tavern across the street for a a toast to the future. (laughs) Be sure you make that just one toast. Well, if I'm going to make this trip with you, I'm going over to the judge's house and see Libby. Least I can do is tell her I'm going away. Shortly after sunrise, two mornings later, we crested the brow of the hill and looked down on one of the most satisfying sights man's eye has ever been privileged to see. Stretched out in a thin line for more than a mile were horses, mules, wagons, and even a few high-wheeled bicycles. Anything and everything a man or a family could ride in which would take them into the race for a piece of that rich Tioga land. But even Cherokee was impressed. Chad, and this comes from my heart, this is the most inspiring sight I have ever seen. Oh, it certainly is. History's being made right before our eyes this morning. Can you explain to me exactly how this land rush works? Well, as best I understand it, to make sure that everyone has an equal chance, that no one gets in first and stakes out the choicest land, the government's put up a barrier. Yes, I see the barrier down there now. Well, then you can see all the cavalrymen down there policing the barrier. Well, in just about ten minutes, if my watch happens to be right, a bugler's going to come out and blow boots and saddles. Boots and saddles, eh? Yep, to warn everybody to get ready to start. And then a few seconds later, an officer will trigger a rifle. And that shot will be the start of the greatest land rush in history. I never saw this many people all together at once, even when I was making a high pitch from the back of my medicine wagon. Men, women, children, dogs. Look at them all. (laughs) Instead of looking at them, let's get down there with them before we miss the starting gun. Up there, fella. Come on. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, darling, you excited? Oh, Kent, this is a sight I'll never forget as long as I live. Never. Well, then you're not sorry we left Atlanta? No, I'll have my moments. But I guess I'm just a farm girl at heart. 320 beautiful acres to work with our own hands to build into something that'll... Oh, Sue Ellen, are you going to start that all over again? Well, there's plenty of time for ranching when I got the newspaper on a paying basis. Just think, the Tioga Weekly Sun. Kent Ramsey, if you're so much in love with printer's ink, we might just well as stay there. Oh, Sue Ellen, this is no time to start an argument. Hey, look at that, will you? That big burly-looking man in the frock coat trying to push his way to the front of the line ahead of everybody else. Why, look at him, Kent. He's got two bruisers with him. Probably his bodyguards. Well, he better not try to push his way in front of us. Take it easy, take it easy. There's plenty of land to go around. Come on, Fritz, Whitey, let's get through here. Kent, he come is going to try to get ahead of us. All right, come on, come on, make a little room, Bill. Hey, look out. It's all right, brother. Just let us through. Just a minute, friend. Where do you think you're going? Oh, hold it. Oh. You there. Oh, that you just said? I said if you think you're going to crowd in ahead of us after we've been waiting up here in line for more than 14 hours, you've got another thing coming. Can't, darling, be careful. He looks meaner than a cornered possum. Oh, I beg your pardon, ma'am. Did you say something? Yes, I did. I said you looked meaner than a cornered possum. And it wouldn't surprise me if you were even meaner than that. Why, are you, if you don't... don't. We're polite to ladies, or at least we try to be. Are you going to get to the back of the line where you belong? Or am I going to have to... Are you going to have to what, my friend? Oh, you mean that. Well, if you're fool enough to want to drag your pop gun, go on. They say experience is the best teacher. Can't, don't. Now leave that gun right where it is. Let go of me, Sue Ellen. Can't. All right, all of you, keep your hands up where I can see you. Uh What? All right, Cherokee, watch my horse. And who do you think you are butting in here? I'm the man who's been following you for the last five minutes, watching you almost run down people to get up to the front of the line. And I'm the man who's advising you to turn around and go back where you belong, at the rear of the line. You give a lot of cheap orders with that six-gun in your fist. I don't need a six-gun in my fist to see that those orders are carried out. Huh? Here, mister. You hold my gun. Why, uh, sure, sure. Now there's nothing in my fist but fingers. And I'm still telling you to move on. Come on, Fritz. You too, Whitey. But Laredo, you... I'm taking your advice this time, mister. But I'm going to give you some advice in exchange. The whole of Tayuga isn't so big that I won't be running into all of you again. Get around there, boy. Come on. got words to thank you enough for what you did? Most of the doing you did, ma'am. When you grabbed your husband's hand and stopped him from drawing his gun, one of those bodyguards of the man they call Laredo had time to get his out just in case his boss was too slow a draw. That's when I thought it was time for me to interfere. Well, if you're rushing into Tioga with the rest of us, you stay Chad, right up here. get back on your horse. Here comes the bugler. Oh, here yeah. he comes, honey. Get ready. Come on, now, get all ready. Oh, look, folks, I've got to get mounted. Riding horses, we'll have a better chance than you folks with your wagon. So Cherokee and I'll go ahead and you follow us. I'd feel better about Mr. Laredo if we were all together for a while. complaining. I just had a flash of two or three riders cutting up through those trees to our right. Maybe a shortcut. Through those trees? 
Yeah. And from here, it looks as if one of those men is wearing a frock. Chad! Merciful providence! Whoa there! Whoa! Chad, are you all right? Chad, where did that slug hit you? Great gilded gilhooly! What am I going to do now? Here I am in the middle of no place, and Chad Remington's been shot clean off his horse. We'll return to the exciting second act of our Frontier Town adventure in just about one minute. And now, Frontier Town. Well, for a change, Cherokee had been right. I most certainly had been shot off my horse. A soft-nosed slug from a carbine hit my shoulder and spun me out of the saddle like a pinwheel. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on which end of the rifle you might have been, the wound is a little gory, but not too serious. After washing it and tying it up, we were able to continue. The greeting we'd gotten in the new territory thoroughly convinced Mr. O'Bannon that he didn't want to make his fortune in Tioga. But it was the man in the frock coat who answered to the name of Laredo that made me decide that I was going into Tioga Falls, the little settlement which had sprung up as a metropolis of the new region. So we sort of limped into town... Not finding anyone in the marshal's office, I decided the best place to look for my man was by checking at the office of the newspaper, the Tioga Weekly Sun. Madam, would you be good enough to give us some information? Oh, why, certainly. I... Well, it's you two again. Camp, my husband and I followed you for several miles, but... Oh, dear, what happened to you? Being in a newspaper office, let's just say it was uh, a little accident. Oh, uh, Kent! Oh, Kent, darling, who do you think's here? Uh, my husband's back in the press room setting up part of this week's edition. Are you calling me, Sue Ellen? I thought I heard you... Hello! Am I glad to see you two again? Well, I don't say this from politeness. We're glad to see you and your wife alive. Huh? After what happened to Chad, we didn't know if they'd gotten you too. If who all had gotten us? That gent we tangled with the other morning at the starting line. The one in the frock coat. Oh, you mean Loretta Jake Ellison. Loretta Jake Ellison, huh? How come you know his name? Oh, why, didn't you know? He's opened a bar, a hotel, and a gambling hall, and he's practically running this town already. Did you say a bar? Oh, now, Cherokee, you're incorrigible. Uh, Tell me... How'd you happen to open a newspaper office? From the looks of what you had in your wagon, I'd have thought you were going to get yourself a ranch. Now, you see, Kent, you even look out of place in a newspaper office. (laughs) Well, gentlemen, it's a long story. But if you're really interested, sit down and I'll tell you. Well, with a little friendly bickering between Sue Ellen and Kent Ramsey, we learned their story. I must say I didn't wholly disagree with Kent. The young fella had real ambition, and a newspaper can be a very influential voice in guiding the destinies of a frontier country. I also learned that Laredo Jake, even in this short time, had almost everyone in and around Tioga Falls either bulldozed or buffaloed, was starting to run the new town very much his own way. It was a wild little town, and I talked to a lot of people and found out nothing. Until about the third day when we were chewing the fat with Sue Ellen and Kent in their newspaper office. Well, Chad, what do you think Lorraine Jake's going to think of this editorial? Well, I don't think he's going to like it very much, Kent. But if I were you, and I'm not talking just as a lawyer, I'd take it a bit easy. After all, Chad's got more of an axe to grind as far as that crook's concerned. 
And he's just biding his time. Oh, you all argue with the man. Husband of mine or not, I seem to have no influence on him. <laughs> well, she's afraid she'll be a widow before she's really a bride. It's no laughing matter, Kent. When you're baiting a man like Laredo Jake Ellison, you're not out angling for catfish. You're going for shark. If you don't mind, Cherokee and I will sort of hang around your office tomorrow after the paper comes out and the gentleman in question has had the chance to read what you think of him. What Kent Ramsey would printed in the Tioga Sun would have raised the hackles on a more self-possessed person than Mr. Ellison. Well, we waited most of the day, and then late in the afternoon we saw him coming. Cherokee and I shifted our holsters just in case and waited for Laredo to say so. Boys, I'll tell you why I dropped in. I come by to congratulate the Ramseys on getting out a fine fight in the newspaper. <laughs> I believe that about as much as I believe that my rattlesnake oil cures lead poisoning. You're wrong, my friend. Because in this last week, I've had my eyes open. You're lucky someone didn't close them. Yes, sir, I've had my eyes open. I never knew before what an enormous influence a newspaper can have in a town. Mr. Ellison, we'd appreciate it if you'd stop beating around the bush. All right, Mrs. Ramsey. Since finding out how important a newspaper is, I've decided to make you an offer to buy you out. An offer I don't think you'll refuse. And suppose I do refuse. What then? What then? I don't know. I can't make you sell out. But I don't think you're going to turn down an offer of $10,000. Ellis and I wouldn't sell out to you for $30,000. You know, I've always heard that literary men didn't have good business heads, but I never believed it before. Well, there's no use wasting any more time. I'll just be bidding you a very pleasant good day. Well, how do you like that? Here I was, sitting with my both fists cocked, all ready to go, and he talked so sweet butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. I'll bet you he's got something up his sleeve. So will I. Why, he's so persnickety mean, I wouldn't even throw him in a swamp to alligators. My word. At this rate, Chad, we could spend six months down here trying to find something on that galoot. Trying to find something on him? Well, I guess we might as well confess it. At... Little accident which put a bandage on my shoulder when I rode into town, I'm afraid, was no accident at all. But it had been planned by Tioga's leading citizen, the right dishonorable Jake Ellison. Chad hadn't been turned halfway around his saddle, he wouldn't be here to tell the story. Why, that vicious sneaking no good. Imagine, Kent. You know what I got a good mind to do, Chad? I got a mind to run that story of yours about Loretta right smack on the front page of my next edition. Uh-uh. Nothing doing, Kent. Even as poor a lawyer as I am, I know we haven't got a case built against him yet. Case? Why, well, y'all just said he tried to kill you. We all just told you a little story. A story no one can prove. Well, then how are you going to prove anything against a contemptible crook like that? By exercising a little patience. Now, for example... He wouldn't be so sure of himself that he'd come in here and offer to buy your paper if he didn't feel he had this town and this whole country right where he wanted it. So? So I'm expecting that life around Tioga isn't going to be as peaceful even as it has been. Now, there are too many gunslingers hanging around his cafe to be just waiting for Sunday to go to church, if we had a church. I'll make book on that and give you six, two, and even. <laughs> Not bad odds, either. Suppose you're right, Chad. Well, then, I think we can take a leaf out of Laredo's book and play it smart ourselves. <laughs> when you've got a newspaper, mister, plus a little patience, it shouldn't be too hard to prove that the pen is mightier than the sword. Now, I don't want to sound like an I told you so, but it wasn't very long before the Wells Fargo safe was blown and 24 hours later, the stagecoach coming in from the north was held up. And then the very same night, two men who'd won at Pharaoh <laughs> never got home. Well, the next afternoon, Cherokee got himself a little Dutch courage at one saloon and then walked over to the place that Laredo Jake ran. Well, Laredo... Here's to you. <laughs> Here's to all of us, Fitz. Drink hearty. Yeah, yeah. I cut up the Wells Fargo money today. 
Twelve hundred apiece. You stick with Laredo, Jake, Ellison, Fritz, and you'll be wearing... <laughs> no, I wonder what this monkey wants. You looking for me, my friend? No, sir. I was looking for a fella called Fred. Mr. Ramsey down at the newspaper office asked me to find him. Oh. Well, Fritz ain't here just now, but I'm expecting him soon. Tell Ramsey I'll give him his message and send him down. Thanks. Thanks very much. Sure to do it. What the blazes do you think they want of me at the newspaper office? What do you think? Probably figuring to pull a double cross on me. On you. Why, he's loco. You go down there, Fritz. See what he wants. Huh? If he gets too hard to handle, well, you know what to do. Oh, sure, Laredo. Only... You heard me. Now get going. I can't wait to find out what this is all about. Ellison, uh, got a minute? Huh? Oh, you still hanging around Tioga Falls? You should have found out by this time that a loyal starved to death in this town. Oh, I don't know. Looks now as if you might be needing one. What would I want with a dead lawyer? Dead lawyer? After the way you missed me that first day into Tioga? Well, maybe you're a bum shot, but I think our local editor has hit the bullseye plum center. Huh? Here. Yeah, I thought you'd like to get a look at tomorrow morning's paper. Why, that good for nothing lying Looks pretty bad in print, doesn't it? Confederate's confession implicates cafe owner in robberies. <laughs> Man, looks like you're all done, doesn't it, Laredo? Why do you think Ramsey sent for your friend, Fritz? What are you trying to do? Scare me? Well, if you're not scared, why don't you walk down to the newspaper office and face Fritz? Deny these things right in front of him. Why, sure. Sure, I'll go with you double-dealing liar. Hey, Fritz! Fritz, come over here. And you, Mr. Lawyer, you stay right where you are. That big galoo that came in here and said they wanted me at the newspaper office must have been crazy. I waited more than an hour, and that editor wasn't even... Did you tell Ramsey I engineered those raids? You out of your head. Why should I give you away? Oh, uh-huh. yes, Fritz. Why should you? If I were you, Ramsey, then I'd shut up. But fortunately, you're not me, and I'm not you. Because that gun toter of yours said just enough in front of a few dozen people to put you in the calaboose. Hey, Marshal! Marshal! Are you sneaking low down? Drop that gun, Ellison! Miss me again, Laredo. And I'll see if I can make my aim a little better. Now, Fritz, you don't want to end up worse off than your boss. Just take it easy. Because you and I are going down to the newspaper office and get a real confession. Should have seen Chad. His arms like two windmills. His fists like two pile drivers. Why, I tell you, the man was magnificent. A perfect example of American manhood. Oh, good night. With that kind of flowery prose, Kent, well, you ought to keep Cherokee here in Tioga and put him to work on your newspaper. <laughs> of course, not as a reporter. He got his facts a little wrong. Oh, but he makes it sound so beautiful. Well, what facts has he got wrong? Oh, just a few essential ones. For example, uh, I had only one fist flying. My other hand was well occupied wrestling that buzzard for his gun. Now, just one fist. You can't blame that entirely on me. That saloon you sent me to for my Dutch courage... Treated me so well, I was seeing double. (laughs) And moreover, Mr. Remington, I was not wrong when I say that your brilliance, your sheer and unmatched genius, gave birth to the idea which caught that crook. Cherokee's right about that, Chad. It was you who had the idea to print up a single copy of the paper with that phony headline to trick Ellison. Maybe it was phony, but now you can run 3,000 copies of the paper with the same headline because it's true. And Cherokee, how about you and me starting back to Dos Rios? Right now, Chad? Right now. With all the ill fortune. While you were demolishing Ellison's saloon, I saved one full bottle from falling off a table and hid it under a chair. Can I go back down there for just a minute? Nothing doing. I told you we'd stay just long enough to get our proof, and Cherokee, I certainly didn't mean hundred proof. <laughs> <laughs>
Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler as a Bruce Ells production. Story and supervision by Joel Murcott. Direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmar. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. This is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! Ever hear of Dos Rios? Well, it's a saddle stop cow town smack dab south and east of Denver and sprawls boisterously across the frontier. I live in Dos Rios. I'm the one and only lawyer there. Name? Chad Remington. Well, lawyer or no, in that frontier country, there's always something going on, something mighty interesting and doggone near always dangerous. Oh, not just rustlings and bank holdups, stagecoach and mail car robberies. Part of the time, our troubles come from what we lawyers might call our duly elected officers. Now, just a few weeks back, over in another little frontier town called... (laughs) Here I am getting ahead of myself, and I guess I better be starting from the beginning. Well, after all that had been happening, I decided to take a day off get the judge's daughter, Libby, to pack some sandwiches and ride out to the painted Rimrock country with me. Well, we'd had a nice ride, good lunch, and Libby and I were... We were talking things over. I don't know about June, Chad. It's... What so soon? Well, doggone it, Libby. With me, it's the sooner the better. It isn't as if this is going to come as a surprise to your father, and I... Uh-oh. Now, look who's coming. Wait. Who is that, Chad? Is it Cherokee? It's the O'Bannon himself in the flesh. Uh, and it's just gold pieces to go for holes. He's not out riding just to exercise one of those horses from his livery stable. Now, wait a minute. Hey, Cherokee, over here. He he sees us. What do you think he wants? Mm, I sure don't know. I paid him two months in advance for that office I rent from him up <laughs> over his stable. Easy there, Gladys. Whoa! Oh! I knew I'd find you two lolling in some romantic dell. Hold it, girl. Well, if you knew it, did you have to come out to prove it? Having two people the right to commune with nature? My dear Miss Libby, you can continue communing with nature. Because if I say so myself, I am one of nature's noblemen. Yes, indeed. Oh, go on. Mother Nature probably ran you out of the house years ago for peddling that rattlesnake oil of yours. Oh, what's up, Cherokee? Why'd you come out here heels over leather? Because, my cherubic counselor, a telegram arrived for you. Huh? And since old Hank at the Western Union office said it was important, I thought I'd hit the saddle and try to find you here. Oh, thank you. Excuse me, Louis. Hmm. Well, this doesn't sound so good. What doesn't sound so good? What does the telegram say? Oh, I don't know if you remember Bill McCarty over at Medicine Creek. Uh, I'm sure your father does. McCarty? 
Isn't he the tax collector over in Comanche County? Yeah, but he's not the county collector. He's a local tax collector for Medicine Creek. The telegram's from Bill. From the little he says here, it looks as if he might need some legal advice. <laughs> legal advice, I'll bet. Anytime anyone sends you a telegram, they don't want legal advice. They're looking for two-fisted help. <laughs> Listen to the man. Chad, would you mind telling me what it's all about? Why should the tax collector in another town in an entirely different county suddenly telegraph to you? I can't tell much from what he's wired. Having filed a telegram at the Medicine Creek office, apparently Mr. McCarty was a little more than a wee bit cautious. But if I can read between the lines, Bill's mixed up in some sort of political shenanigans that involve the mayor of Medicine Creek. Politicians. Those I've met, not counting the sheriffs, rangers, and marshals, have been even more deceitful than the third-rate medicine man. Well, you should know, Cherokee. Uh, as a first-rate medicine man, Cherokee, and the owner of a second-rate livery staple, would you be inclined to lend me a horse and ride over to Medicine Creek with me? That I would. That I would. But Chad... We were talking about, well, you know, now you want to pick up and... I guess I just don't understand men. Well, Libby, I guess you understand one man a little too well. And he thinks the sooner we get started, the sooner I'll get back to have that little heart-to-heart -heart talk with your father. So I'm all for packing up and getting started today. <laughs> Well, sir, as it turned out, it was a good thing I didn't postpone my trip. The truth of the matter is, as it turned out, it was too darn bad I couldn't have gotten started a day earlier. Because while Cherokee O'Bannon and I were leaving streamers of red dust behind our pounding horses, the stage was being set in Medicine Creek for the big blow-off. As we feasted together later, the mayor of Medicine Creek, the Honorable Richard E. Dalegood, had sent for his tax collector, Bill McCarty, and exploded his bombshell. Now, is that clear, Bill? Mayor, do you realize what you're doing? You're actually raising taxes to three times what they were last year. McCarty, I had you appointed as tax collector because I felt you were one man interested in seeing Medicine Creek grow. Man alive, that takes money. Of course it takes money. But tripling the taxes isn't going to raise money. All it'll raise is trouble, maybe killings. You know what a bad season the cattlemen have had. McCarty, either you collect those taxes or I'll have you impeached for malfeasance in office. Impeach and be hanged. Go on, haul me into court. Then I think when you realize what I'll tell that jury, it'll be you they'll impeach and not me. There are a few other things I could tell a jury... Uh, things like who killed Ralph Osborne. Huh? You know blame well I didn't kill Ralph. Do I? Well, I'm afraid any story I'd tell a jury would be, uh, thoroughly convincing. <laughs> You'd better be leaving, McCarty. And if you come back without the tax money, the mystery of who gunned down Ralph Osborne will be finally cleared up. Why, you... You... <sighs> Good morning, Mr. Mayor, and goodbye. Well, well, well. I wonder who I can appoint tax collector after your funeral, McCarty. Somebody who'd at least appreciate the way we'd... Crone, what are you doing in my office? Well, Mr. Mayor, you handled our tax collector very nicely. Confounded, Crone, I don't like you sneaking in my office through the back door. Well, I'll tell you, Your Honor, I, I saw McCarty go into the Western Union office this morning and send a telegram. Then when I saw him heading for your office, I just thought I'd come in through the back and listen to what he had to say. Well, I told you what would happen. You heard McCarty. He refuses to go through with it. Yeah, I heard him. And I heard you, too. Heard me? What do you mean? How far do you think we'd get accusing McCarty of bushwhacking Ralph Osborne? <sighs> I'm afraid, Mr. Mayor, that you're foolish enough to have faith in human nature. Huh? If a jury really started to investigate Ralph's death, it might be me they'd build a scaffold for. And if they build it for me, my friend, they'd build another alongside of it. For you. I knew I should never let you jockey me into a spot. Now if McCarty talks to the ranchers and advises them not to pay the new taxes, 
everything I've spent two and a half years working for will be blown away like so much tumbleweed. Your Honor, you're absolutely right. But I have a feeling that Medicine Creek is badly in need of a municipal reorganization. And to start with, you'd better appoint a man to replace our tax collector. For Pete's sake, Crone, don't you even think... If I throw McCarthy out now, it's a cinch every landowner around here would believe his story. Oh? <laughs> but how can they believe his story, Mayor? <laughs> I mean, did you ever hear of a dead man talking? <laughs> Now, don't you go to any trouble, Mrs. McCarty. Cherokee and I can wait until Bill gets home. We're not that hungry. Well, then, Mr. Remington, can I fix you something to drink? Mrs. McCarty, you are a woman of rare and little found perspicacity. <laughs> what would you like? Tea? Uh, well, Cherokee, aren't you going to answer the perspicacious lady? Uh, tea? <laughs> On reflecting, my dear Miss McCarty, I've decided that perhaps Chad is right. I think it might be best if we wait until Mr. McCarty returns home. Yes, I do. Well, you're not going to have long to wait, you see. Comes Bill now, just riding over the ridge of that hill. Hey, he certainly looks well, doesn't he? Yeah, he looks well enough, considering. But all this grief the mayor's been giving Bill has certainly done him... Billy Blue Blazers, Chad. Did you hear those shots? I sure did, Cherokee. Come on, Bill McCarty's been blasted plumb out of his saddle. All right, Cherokee, help Mrs. McCarty off her horse. Chad, is Bill... Uh, he was gone before he hit the ground. Those filthy killers. Those dirty, sneaking coyotes. They didn't even give him a chance to fight back. Well, I'll fix them. I'm going down and blast that no-good, crooked gambler myself. Gambler? That's what I said, gambler. That... Even crook Carl Crone. He's the one who's behind the mayor. No, no, just a minute. No situation like this is ever cured by another killer. What's more, you have no way of knowing if it was his Crone or anyone else in Medicine Creek who dry ghosts your husband. Don't say that. Who else could it have been? Must have been that gambler. Cherokee, I think you'd better help Mrs. McCarty no. back onto her horse. Anything you say, Chad? Come on, Mrs. McCarty. Let go. You take your hands off Go of ahead, me. Cherokee, I'll give you a hand. Look, if you're right about this gambler, Mrs. McCarty, we'll find out soon enough. When we do, I've got an idea I'm going to deal myself into his game. Except I'll be using my own deck. Every card marked with a cross we can put on his grave up on Boot Hill. <laughs> We'll return to the exciting second act of our Frontier Town adventure in just about one minute. Frontier Town. Well, you can see now what I meant when I said it was too blame bad Cherokee and I didn't get to Medicine Creek a day earlier. Bill McCarty gunned down in cold blood almost at the doorway to his ranch. And Bella McCarty, Bill's widow, hysterically furious, and despite everything Cherokee and I could say, vowing she'd avenge her husband's brutal murder. However, while the O'Bannon and I were doing everything we could to quiet and soothe Bella McCarty, down at the mayor's office, an entirely different kind of scene was taking place. A fine lot of good you did getting rid of McCarty. Now, believe me, Crone, there isn't a landowner in the whole district who isn't seeing red. My, my, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, a man of your perception is worthy of real political ambitions. How skillfully you keep your finger on the public pulse. That's enough, you cheap tin horn. <laughs> Well, I must acknowledge that since Tinhorn is a synonym for gambler, you may be right. But 
But you listen to me, you overweight mutton head. Well, you keep on like you're going, and this whole town is going to have an election. We'll not only elect us a new tax collector, we'll elect a new mayor. Uh, no, 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 look here, Carl. <laughs> There's no reason to go losing your temper at me. <laughs> All right. I suppose you just listen. Don't you think I know the ranchers are up in arms? Well, that's exactly what I want. What you want? You bet. Don't you realize what a cinch it would be for us if they get mad enough to try shooting it out with the uh, uh, duly elected legal authorities? Why, they wouldn't dare. We could throw every one of them in jail. And by the time they got out again, they wouldn't have any more ranches left than a uh, porcupine has feathers. Well, well, well. So you're finally getting some sense through your thick head. So I'm finally getting some sense. But don't you think some of those ranches are going to get some sense, too? What of it? All you have to do is sit here in this office that taxpayers furnished so nicely for you and keep your eyes glued on that safe I loaned you. Because, Mr. Mayor, with the help of a few of my friends, it isn't going to be very long before that safe's so crowded with greenbacks it'll take a 20-mule team to move it. <laughs> Certainly, Crone knew what he was talking about. He had several friends in Medicine Creek, notably one gunslammer known as Baldy and another disreputable maverick who, for the time being, was using the name of Quirt. Well, despite everything Cherokee and I could do, McCarty's widow called a meeting of most of the taxpayers in and around Medicine Creek, and that's when Baldy and Quirt started sowing the seeds Mr. Crone wanted planted so badly. Yeah, sure I'm right. There ain't no law, no place that says we gotta let that mayor bleed us to death. Folks, Baldy's telling the truth. We're the citizens. We're the taxpayers. When all's said and done, it's us who makes the laws. So I say if we gotta have some new laws around Medicine Creek, let's make them. With Winchesters and six guns. That's right. Bella, Bella, Mrs. McCarty, don't you realize what you're doing? You'll never get any place with mob law. You don't have to pay taxes around here, Chad, so why don't you just keep out of this? That's what I say. Well, how about it, neighbors? Are we going to organize the Taxpayers Protective League? That's it. Now you're talking. By the beard of St. Patrick, if he had one. Have you folks all been out in the pasture eating local weed? Be sensible. Listen to Chad Remington. Uh, do you think I'm enjoying this? Bill McCarty telegraphed me to come over and lend a hand. And now, more than ever, that's what I intend to do. Uh, if there's something wrong with the tax rates, you've got courts Look, over here to... Mr. Big Brain, you keep out of this. Yeah, keep out of this. And maybe you'd better keep out of Medicine Creek altogether. If you consider that an order, Baldy, I'm not in the habit of taking orders. Particularly from someone who'd incite a group of people to break the law. A man who'd do that probably is a lawbreaker at heart. Why, you big mouth bag of wind. I'll show you if I can give orders and make them stick. It's a solar plexus, Chad. The solar plexus. Oh, that's it, man. That's the one. That's the one. All right, now, now, won't you folks quiet down? Well, won't you listen to some sense, please? There. Now, I've got just one thing to say. I'll grant the taxes have been assessed, but you still have ten days in which to pay them. I believe this whole matter can be settled legally. And with ten days left, will you give me just two days to see what I can do before you all run the risk of committing suicide? Okay. That's all I want, just a chance. Chance to save the other women in Medicine Creek from joining Mrs. McCarty in wearing mourning. Crone, I'm telling you the truth. Me and Quirt had the whole meeting sewed up until it, until this lawyer got up in the soapbox and butted in. So the ranchers aren't going to fight back, eh? It sure don't look that way. They agreed to give Remington time to do something or other legally. Yeah. Well, in that case, we're not going to waste any more time. Huh? You know what he's talking about, Quirt? I sure don't. If Remington talked to me into not fighting back, we're fixing it so they will. So get the rest of the boys and oil up your guns. Medicine Creek's going to have a range war. And we're starting it ourselves. <laughs> Knock on 
them horses, boys. Don't let them critters get away. That's the lazy G boys coming now. Rain up. Okay. Now, let them have it. Got the powder set, Baldy? All set, boss. And the fuse is lit. Okay, then. Let's get out of here. All right. Cherokee, he's your friend. Can't you do something to make Chad stop? He's been pacing up and down like a caged catamount for the last hour. Done all I could, Bella. He would offer him a drink of genuine it in rattlesnake oil to soothe his nerves. Well, the only thing that'll soothe my nerves is some way out of this. If I hadn't talked the ranchers around here into not organizing, some of those men hurt and killed last night might still be here. Well, now, there's no use crying over spilled milk. It's not milk. It's spilled blood. Well, if I could only figure some way of proving what we all know and then putting those weasels in jail where they'd be safe. Chad, my boy, even jails aren't safe. Matter of fact, a lot of safes aren't safe. Yes, indeed. Learned that many years ago. Well, that safe in the mayor's office seems to be burglar-proof. But, of course, being a burglar himself, maybe the mayor knows... Wait, wait, wait a minute, Bella. What safe in the mayor's office? Well, the city safe. Safe he keeps all the tax money in. Tax money? Since when does the mayor keep the tax money? The tax collector's supposed to keep that. Really? Well... Bill always paid the tax money over to the mayor who took charge of it. Well, now, maybe the knob on that safe has the combination to a jail cell in addition to this safe. Jail cell? Now, what earthly connection has a jail cell got to do with the combination to the safe? i got a hunch it has plenty to do with it. And look, if you and Bill will string along with me and pay a call on his honor, the mayor... There's a little bug I'd like you to put in his ear. Chad, I'll do anything to help, but this doesn't even make sense. Bug in his ear. Yeah, and what's more, if Mrs. McCarty and I go pay a call of the mayor, why can't you come with us and place the insect in the proper orifice yourself? Because I'm going down to make a call of my own. I'm going to call Crone's gambling house. You mean you're going to go down there and risk some of your hard-earned capital? Play pharaoh or something? (laughs) Well, I... I am going to make a bet, a mythical bet. And after I make it, then I'll be able to find out if Crone's number comes up or mine. Yeah, I've heard all about you, Remington. I've heard all about you, Mr. Crone. In fact, that's why I paid you this call. Do tell. Uh Uh-huh. I thought you'd like to know that your friend, the mayor, suddenly packed up and took the stagecoach out of town. Why? Well, why should I care if the mayor left town? You know the answer to that better than I. But he, uh, he was carrying two very heavy carpet bags. Remington, I've been at this game too long not to know the only card you've got in the hole is a deuce. You're bluffing. Well, then why not call my bluff by going over to the mayor's office with me and finding out? Okay. I'll just take that bet. And if you have got a deuce in the hole, Remington, you're going to find yourself dead broke. Or just plain dead. isn't here, is he? Maybe he's home. And maybe he's halfway to the border now with all the money you two kept in that little tin safe. You budge from there, Remington, and you're a goner. I'm going to call your bluff by opening that safe myself. You know, Crone, I'm wondering how you happen to know the combination to the mayor's safe. Keep on wondering, Remington. Why, you double-crossing liar. Every penny's in here. It didn't work, mister. 
But even if it had, it wouldn't have made any difference. You're through. So long, lawyer. You'll find your corpse at the bottom of the rapids. Well, Crone, you can't say I didn't back my little bluff with a... But you haven't pulled that trigger yet. You'll never live to say that again. For a moment, Crone, I thought my last chip was down. Hey, Cherokee, Bella, get in here. Here we are, Chad. We've got the mayor with us. All right, Mr. Mayor. Get over there. Why, this, this is an outrage. Kidnapping the mayor. I, I'll have you all jailed for this. You will, Your Honor? When are you going to do that? 30 years from now when you get out yourself? Because that's just about what the jury will give you when they find out that the most notorious gambler in town knew the combination to your safe and what was in it. I hope I don't sound repetitious. But I want to compliment you again for that lovely little trick you pulled on the mayor and Carl Crone. Oh, it's just a little everyday psychology. A man who makes his living by chicanery generally is easy prey for chicanery. <laughs> well, for instance, take you. You made your living peddling that rattlesnake oil, and now you spend most every nickel you make buying some other kind of liquid poison. Oh, is that so? Well, my barnyard Blackstone, I want you to know that I didn't always make my living bending patent medicines. Oh, no? How oh, serene. In my younger days, I was a stagecoach driver. You don't say. In fact, I was the best-known stagecoach driver in all Wyoming. I drove a stagecoach with only two wheels. What? Only two wheels? What held it up? Bandits! <laughs> oh, <laughs> Cherokee, just for that, you're going to eat my dust. Come on, get up there, boy. Get running. Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler as a Bruce Ells production. Story and supervision by Joel Murcott. Direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmar. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. This is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town!
Welcome to your town. Yeah, I guess that's what you'd call Dos Rios. The only reason I mentioned Dos Rios is that I live there. Or to be more accurate, it seems to be the base of my operations. Because you see, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm a lawyer. And out in the frontier country, although lawyers aren't too well regarded, they sure are necessary. <laughs> if you're ever in Dos Rios and want to look me up, the office is over Cherokee O'Bannon's livery stable, and the shingle says, my name is Chad Remington. Well, as you can imagine, the frontier has attracted all kinds of people, and that brings me all kinds of clients. One of the rarest birds I've yet to run across I met just a few weeks ago. <laughs> Rare? Believe me, he's even more of a character than that ex-medicine man, Cherokee O'Bannon. Bright and early one morning when I picked up my mail, I found a letter postmarked from a town about 200 miles away, sort of a new town they'd called Roaring River. I'd heard about Roaring River because it was becoming famous as the bailiwick of a self-appointed justice of the peace, a former mule skinner, and folks say he skinned a lot of other things besides mules. A salty old character whose name is Pegleg Cooper. Well, the letter wasn't from Pegleg, but from a rancher down there who signed himself Jim Charlton and urged me to come down and offered me a sizable fee if I could help him. Charlton didn't say exactly what the nature of his trouble was, but the fee was tempting to a man who has a few thoughts of getting married. Besides, I had a hankering to at least have a look-see at Judge Pegleg Cooper. Well, while Cherokee and I were riding over to Roaring River, Jim Charlton's trouble suddenly came to a head. One of the older and larger cattlemen, Tulsa Blaggett, paid an unwelcome call on Charlton and his daughter Betsy. Charlton, I'm giving you a better-than-even break by coming here and talking to you, and if you know it's good for you, you'll quit talking back. Tulsa, I didn't ask you here, I don't want you here, and most of all, anything you have to tell me goes in one ear and out the other. Yeah? Well, I'm not surprised. Apparently, there's nothing between them ears to stop it. Daddy, don't let him talk to you like that. Kid, if I were you, I'd remember the old saying, brat should be seen and not heard. Doggone it, Tulsa. I've heard enough out of you. Now go on, clear out of my house. In other words, Charlton, you want to end up like the other nesters did around here. I'll huh? take my chances. You and your kind never scared me none. And for one, I'm not selling this homestead to you for ten cents on the dollar. You know something, Charlton? I got a feeling in my bones that you're going to have a fire here. And after that, your place won't be worth two cents on the dollar. What? You dirty crook! Don't you try to threaten us! Oh, you little loudmouth. Who do you think you are calling me a crook? <laughs> oh, shut up! Slap my daughter, will you? You. you, you <laughs> oh. Good for you, Daddy. You gave him his comeuppance, all right? Uh, I'm not fooling, Blanket. If you're not out of here in 30 seconds, I'm going to pick you up and throw you out. Throw you out through the window. All right. All right, Charlton. But I'm coming back. And when I do come back, which won't be long, I'm coming back to move in. Well, Tulsa Blaggett did come back. He came back about four hours later. Came back with six of his hired gunslingers, set fire to the cow barn, and then, surrounding the house, laid siege to it. As Cherokee and I were approaching the homestead, we suddenly became aware that something was wrong. Dad, my boy, have you, uh... Well, have you made any plans as to what you'll do with that fee Mr. Charles was supposed to pay you? <laughs> Mr. O'Bannon, sir... Any plans that I might have have to do with solids, not liquids. Uh, too bad. Although I once knew of a man carrying a hip blast through the Rockies. When it froze, making the liquid a solid, he assured me it had its advantages. Huh? Didn't need a chaser. <laughs> well, you need a chaser, Cherokee. You need someone to chase around after you and see that you behave like a... Hey. Billy Blue Blazes, Chad. Sounds like shooting. Yeah, and if we're going in the right direction, the shooting's coming from the Charlton place. Unhook that 45, Cherokee. You may be needing it. Come on, you sound old shuffle gussy. Get up there. Cherokee, look. There's a whole gang down there pumping lead into the Charlton house. The foul skunks? Let's see if they can take it as well as throw it. Nice shooting, O'Bannon. 
Look, they're starting to run. Now let's get down there and really pour it on. to it, Mr. Remington. I have to thank you again and again and again for running them off. Think nothing of it, Miss Betsy. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Now, I'm no coward, Mr. Remington. Oh, look, but... let's just make that plain Chad. Shall we, Jim? <laughs> you bet, Chad. As I was saying, I'm not afraid of Tulsa Blaggett or anybody else. But if there's a peaceable, legal way of settling a thing like this, that's what I want to do. That's why I wrote to you. Well, the legal way of doing it is to prove that Blaggett is trying to drive you out of here by force. Well, which, of course, I can't do, because all the men who attacked the house were wearing handkerchiefs over their faces. And besides, even though Daddy won't admit it, everybody in the whole Roaring River country knows that Tulsa Blaggett and the judge are playing it hand in hand. You mean Judge Pegleg Cooper? Oh, don't listen to to Bessie, Chad. She's just repeating gossip. I am not! Everybody says old Pegleg's just using that job he gave himself to feather his own nest. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, I will admit Judge Cooper drags everyone he can get into that court of his and finds them every penny they got. But he's as tough as nails and trying to do an honest job, according to his own lights. According to his own lights. Cattlemen elected him and he's backing them up. Well, now, that's something that remains to be proved, Betsy. Before I make up my own mind, I'd like to meet Pegleg Cooper and size him up. Well, there's nothing hard to that. He owns a saloon and holds his court right there in the saloon. Very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Come, Chad. Let us remount our horses and meander down to Peg Lake Cooper's saloon. Uh, uh, court. <laughs> I'm gonna need to shut up and clear out of the courtroom. Yes, sir. Well, then, Injun, did you or didn't you take the saddle off and build them to us? Me no take them. Just borrow them. Oh, <laughs> oh you just borrowed the saddle. All right, Injun. Then we'll drop the charges of larceny again, you. Mm. You good judge. We'll just drop the charge of larceny and we'll charge your rent for the use of the saddle. How much money wampum you got on you? Mm. Got them $21. $21, huh? All right. Court finds you guilty of not paying rent for the sale and fines you $21. Now pay up and clear out of here. Yes, hey, Pony! Yes. Pony, get the engine's yes. money. Yes, sir. And then open the bar again. Yes. Court's adjourned. Yes, Never in all my days have I seen justice of that kind, this time. Well, peculiar, but mighty effective. Yeah, effective for the judge's pocketbook. I tell you that he never gives. What's up, Jim? What are you staring at? Hey, see that barrel-chested buzzer who just walked in? Yeah. That's Tulsa Blaggett. Oh. Jim, you get over in the corner with the crowd where Blaggett can't see you. I came down here to watch the judge at work, but this is going to give me the opportunity of observing the other member of the team at one and the same time. Watch it, Chad. Here he comes. Hiya, boys. Hiya, Judge. Hey, Tulsa. <laughs> what brings you down to the blind judge's cafe so early in the day? They just closed a little deal, Judge. A little cattle deal, and I feel like celebrating. Yeah. Come on, boys. Everybody up to the bar. The drinks are on me. Come on, boys. Honey, yeah. better bust the bung into a brand new barrel of beverage. Right, Judge. Yeah, judge. Come on, boys. Step up and sing out your orders. Hey, you there. You, with a fancy shirt. Didn't you hear me? I said I'm buying the drinks. Everybody up to the bar. Oh, thanks just the same, mister, but I'll take a rain check on that. I said you're drinking with me. I said I'm not. All right, then. I'll drag you to the bar. That's it, Sam. Hang it on him. Stop it, stop it, you hear? You're breaking up my cafe. Sorry, Judge, but I'd rather break up your cafe than have him break my jaw. See? No! Chad, even if he comes to, I'm sorry to say he won't buy drinks for a long while. Come here, you. Barney! Yeah, Judge? Close up the bar. We're holding court. Right, Chad, yeah, Judge. Bar's closed and court's in session. Judge Cooper presiding. And now, young man... 
We're going to get on with your trial. All right, Judge, but I'd like to know what the charges are against me. Oh, they ain't very much. Assault and battery, mayhem, inciting a riot, and destruction and demolition of personal property. You pleading guilty or not guilty? That depends. What'll it cost if I plead guilty? Well, maybe $40. Uh Uh-huh. What'll the fine be if I plead not guilty? Not guilty will cost you $100. How do you plead? Guilty as charged, Your Honor. Here's your 40. Thanks, son. And just a minute. You must have about $70 left. Or 68, to be exact. Now, that is strange, because I'm just about to fine you $68 in addition to that 40. Oh, now, wait a minute. What's that fine for? Well, I'll tell you. Mr. Blaggett came in and invited everybody to have a drink on him. I reckon he'd have spent about $68 in my cafe. But now that you laid him out cold, I'm deprived of that business, and so you are in restraint of trade. That's all. Barney, yes, yes. put this money in the drawer and escort the defendant outside. Why, <laughs> that good for nothing, sneaking, soap headed, snake in the grass. Let it go, Cherokee. Judge may have my money now, but he isn't going to keep it long. Believe me, he isn't. <laughs> must we take in today? I'll tell you in a second, Judge. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Uh-huh. Mm. $419. Pretty good day. Yes. Pretty good day. <laughs> well, put out that lamp. Let's be getting on bed. Right you are, Judge. Yeah. <clears throat> I got a candle here and Don't I... Don't move, huh? gentlemen. Stand right where you are. What are you doing? I know you can't see, but I've got you both nicely covered. I've been outside in the dark for a while my eyes have gotten used to it. Why, you pussy footin' polecat, who are you? Why, Judge, I'm the man who came in to relieve you of that $419. Yeah? Well, I've heard your voice somewhere before, and it won't take me long to recollect your name. Well, you can save yourself all that mental energy, Judge. My name is, well, it's the Texas Kid. Texas Kid. And now, Pony, I'll yeah. just take that little sack, and then I'll be bidding you two high binders good night. So long, gents, and uh, unpleasant dreams. We'll return to the exciting second act of Six Gun Justice, our frontier town adventure, in just a few moments. Now, Frontier Town. Well, sir, even from the little I've told you about Peg Leg Cooper, I'll bet you can imagine exactly how he felt with me and in that ridiculous disguise coming in and depriving him of his, well, shall I say, hard-earned money. <laughs> I was hardly sun up next morning when the judge started rounding up every last soul in the county, and by ten o'clock his so-called courtroom was jammed to the rafters and rocking. Yeah. Keep quiet! Shut up! Shut up! Quiet! Quiet! Your lips. Quiet! 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 Now, quiet. now, yeah. now we'll get on with the question. Some foul crook calling himself to tick this kid stole four hundred and nineteen dollars from me. By the great horn spoon, we're finding out who it is if we have to stay here till judgment day. Uh, Your Honor, may I ask one question? Huh? What do you got to do with this? Well, Judge, I don't know anything about the Texas kid. Uh, and as you proved so conclusively yesterday, I probably know very little about the law. Well? Uh, just this. Uh, you've accused everybody of stealing your money, but so far you haven't proved that you lost it. Are you look or do you think I am? Certainly, I don't think you are, but uh, as a fair-minded judge, I know that you demand proof, so why shouldn't we? Now, have you double-checked? 
Have you looked in the cash drawer? Why, you puddle hit a door grown pony! Yes, yes. Pull out the cash drawer and show this concerned imbecile what's in it. Right over, boss. We'll hurry up. Here it is. Cash. Yeah. Cash. The drawer ain't empty. Look, there's money in it. Oh. Oh. You flannel boss going to shut up? Shut up. Where am I going to have to find a lot of you? Uh, 250, yeah. 3, 20, 40, 50, 351. Well, what do you know? I would have sweared he took the whole thing. Of course he took the whole thing. Must have snuck in during the night and put part of it back. Yeah. $68 missing. You wouldn't know nothing about that, would you, son? Well, $68 is what you find me for being in restraint of trade yesterday. Mm-hmm. And naturally, you don't know nothing about the Texas kid. First time I ever heard of him was right in here, Judge. Why don't you appoint me as special deputy to your court? Deputy? What in corn chowder fur? Well, I think if you gave me a few days riding around the country, I might be able to find the Texas kid for you. Or if not that, I might be some help in rounding up the rascals who've been causing the real trouble around here. Mm-hmm. You know, mister, I just got a sneaking notion that if anybody could locate that there Texas kid... You're the Renahan could do it. Yes, sir. I hereby appoint you special deputy to this here now court. Now go on, go on. Clear out of here and get busy. I tell you, Your Honor. Just a minute, young fella. Inside of 48 hours, if you don't get results, I'm hailing you into court and fining you $500 for wasting time being a smart aleck and making a dog-eared donkey out of a respectable judge. Now go on, go on, go on. Beat it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing now, but believe you me, when it happened, I was laughing on the other side of my face. All my life, I'd heard of smart lawyers, but if there'd been a mirror handy and I'd looked into it, I'd have been face to face with a lawyer who was too smart. Well, knowing that the judge meant business this time, and being faced with a fine and probably a jail sentence, I took the bull by the horns and started out to make good on my promise. Not knowing the whereabouts of Tulsa Blaggett's ranch, I gathered up Jim and Betsy Charlton and had them ride with Cherokee and me to show us the way. And despite their cross-questioning, this time I tried my best to keep my big mouth shut. Chad, you've got something up your sleeve. Now, I can see it all over your face. Won't you please tell us what this is all about? Yes, Mr. Remington, why have you got us all racing out to Tulsa's ranch as if our lives depended on it? Patience, my friends, patience. As a special deputy of his honor's court, I'm going to be mighty sure of my evidence before I make any allegations. But since we're practically at the door to Blaggett's Ranch, rain up. I have a feeling you'll soon find out. Well, girl. Oh, oh. All right, come on. I think I'm about to make an arrest. Well, the four of us walked thither and yon around the Blaggett Ranch looking just looking for something, anything. And as the time was getting shorter and my chance was even slimmer, suddenly Cherokee found something. Sweet strawberry blondes, Chad. Look at this. Hi. That's nothing but a little piece of steer hide. It sure is a piece of steer hide, Betsy, but don't you see what it is? It's a piece of steer hide with our brand on it. And how our brand got over here on Blaggett's Ranch will take a bit of explaining. Yeah, we're lucky, that's all, but it certainly explains itself. Even though the men were masked who raided your place the other day, this piece of steer hide will be marked Exhibit A in my case against Tulsa Blaggett for cattle rustling. Come on, we're going inside. Well, Tulsa, you coming with me? Oh, Remington, you're crazier than a loon, that's what you are. Why should I go down to that old coot's court? Well, a good reason might be because I'm telling you to. As a deputy of the court, I've got a bench warrant for you. Look, you're starting to annoy me now more than you did yesterday. If you had a brain in your stupid head, you wouldn't stand there just begging Chad to annoy you the same way again. Yeah. Well, did you ever hear of a thing called false arrest? Yeah, I think I have. Well, you just heard Charlton say he couldn't identify me as the man who raided his ranch. Well, that's the truth. I can't. Well, then, what do you think you're going to gain dragging me down to court? Because the judge can't find me guilty without no evidence. And if he doesn't, I'm going to have you locked up for false arrest. Blackett, I'm just quaking in my boots. 
Now, come on. You can say it all you want. I'm not leaving here. Well, I happen to think you are. Yeah, well, I don't think I am. Sam, he's got hold of his gun. I saw him, Cherokee. He's welcome to clear his holster. And that's just what I'm going to do. Suffering starlight. That kind of shooting I never seen before, Chad. Cherokee, pick up a gentleman's gun for him and bring it down to court. We'll label that Exhibit B on another charge of resisting an officer. Well, Judge, where's that big talking deputy you appointed yourself? Oh, I reckon he'll be coming in, Pawnee. How come you reckon that? If he don't find you the Texas kid... Think he's going to come back and face the $500 you're threatening him with? <laughs> yes, yeah, you would. You do? And I reckon I wouldn't keep the 500 long if I got it. <laughs> Remember the other night when... Yeah. Well, here he comes now and he's got Tulsa blanket and tow. Well, Your Honor, can you convene your court for a few minutes? Judge, I'm warning you. Shut up, blanket. Honey, close the bar and tell him to keep quiet. Yeah, quiet, 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 quiet. This court is here and now saying... What are the charges, Dippity? Well, over in my part of the country, we might call it something else. You mean down in Texas? I've never been in Texas, Judge. Honest engine. Hmm. But uh, to get on with the charges, I think you'd probably call them grand larceny, conversion of stolen property, and attempted homicide. Uh-huh. What does that mean in English? Cattle rustling, Your Honor. Twenty-three head. Well, of all the cooked-up ridiculous lies, shut up! And... Here are the brands off two of Jim Charlton's steers, which Mr. O'Bannon here found in Blaggett's corral. That's ended as Exhibit A on the rustling charge. You mean you got another charge against him? Yes, sir. Resisting an officer. And as Exhibit B, here's the gun he pulled on me. Well, this is nothing but a frame-up. And you ain't gonna get... Look out, look out. Tulsa's grabbed his gun off the table. Yeah, and I'm gonna use it. Oh, oh, oh. Knock him over this way, son. I'll bust him with the gavel. No, thanks, Judge. But watch those glasses, because here he comes. No. Oh, woe is us, Chad. You busted up the judge's saloon again. Yeah, looks like Cherokee's right, Judge. How much is the fine going to be this time? Well, I ain't going to let you off lightly for a second offense. No, sir. For assault and battery, quid pro quo. <clears throat> That's Latin. And for catching a double dyed ding busted, dead ratted, sneaking rustler I couldn't get the goods on, my fine is you got to attend the best gosh darn party ever held in the Blind Justice Cafe for the best two fisted fighter ever to hit this part of the country. <laughs> still there, you broken down hay burner? Mr. Remington, I'll never, never forget how you outslicked that crook. He did a fine job, didn't he, Judge? Oh, good enough. What about me? Ain't I letting him go home without catching the Texas kid for me? <laughs> you young vermin. Someday you ought to get down to Texas and look for the car. You never can tell what Chad might do for $68, John. <laughs> <laughs> Nor me neither. <laughs> Am I to read between the lines, Your Honor, and infer that because the way this case turned out, you might do what Blaggett is going to do the other day. Set him up at the house. Well, now, just a minute, Cherokee. What's the matter? I'll admit I'm in favor of you having some suds. Good boy. But you're not going to get the suds till you get back home. Good night. And the kind of suds you're going to get won't do your insides much good, but they'll be a big help to your outside. I'm talking about soap suds. Good boy. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, goodbye is right. Adios, Judge. Adios. So long, Charlton. Bye. Uh, when you get your cattle sold, Jim, that's plenty of time to be sending me my fee. All right, get started, boy. Bye. Bye. Suds he offers me after I found that steer hide. Well, Cherokee, if you hadn't found it, there wouldn't have been any suds either. Because with the judge looking for me, there would have been no soap. <laughs> <laughs>
Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler as a Bruce Ells production. Supervision by Joel Murcott. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. And now this is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! I'm Chad Remington, lawyer. The only lawyer in the little frontier town I live in, Dos Rios. It's not much of a town as towns go, but situated between the Red River and the White River, our part of the country is mighty rich. Now, if that sounds good to you, just stop and think about it. Because out on the frontier, a country that's rich means a country with money. Or at least it presents the opportunity of making money. And easy money means trouble. Take a case I handled just a short while back. Now, I rent my office from an ex-medicine man, Cherokee O'Bannon, who runs the Dos Rios livery stable. And this particular day, Cherokee and I were riding back toward Dos Rios after having made an offer on some horses the O'Bannon wanted for his livery stable. Well, we were indulging in our favorite pastime, chin-flapping, and not paying too much attention to anything around us. Dad, my boy, how do you feel about that filly? Hmm? Uh, What's that, Cherokee? Said, how do you feel about that filly? How do you think? I'm aiming on marrying her. You're aiming on... My dear counselor, I will admit that fillies get hitched to buckboards, stagecoaches, and rigs. What? But yours will be the first instance where a filly got hitched to a lawyer. <laughs> hey, now, wait a minute. What filly are you talking about? Well, that chestnut filly. We just saw over Jed Rogers' place. Who were you talking about? Uh, I guess I got nobody to blame but myself. I thought you were referring to Libby. Libby! Why, for shame! I would never refer to that handsome young woman in anything but the most dignified terms. <laughs> I'll be... Hey, Cherokee, look, is that a posse riding toward us from town? Well, well, I do believe it is. That's certainly the marshal, Ed Bingham, riding up front. That's funny. I wonder who they could be coming after out this way. Yes. The only place around here belongs to that sheep herder. That Mexican fellow. What's his name? Felipe something or other? Yeah, Felipe Gomez. Wonder what's up. Hey, Marshal. Hey, Ed, rein up. Oh, hold it, boy. Oh. Howdy, Ed. Howdy, boy. Howdy, Howdy man. Hi. Howdy. Uh, what are you doing out here, Marshal? Uh, come to make an arrest, Chad. Uh, Herman Sims, the banker, was found shot to death this morning. Four holes plumbed through his back. 
Well, if you've come out to make an arrest, apparently you know who you're looking for. Who is it? That sheep herder down the road, Gomez. Uh, what? Uh, what's the matter? Don't you believe me? Frankly, I can't say that I do. From a little I've seen of Felipe, he's so mild he wouldn't even slap a mosquito if it were bothering him. That's what I say. Uh, well, wait, now, what makes you suspect, Gomez, Ed? He was in the bank yesterday trying to borrow some money from Herman Sims. And when Sims wouldn't lend it to him, Gomez threatened him. Threatened him right in front of witnesses. Well, that's evidence, all right, but circumstantial. Scarcely enough to justify a charge of murder. Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's plenty to hold a man on for questioning. Come on, boys, let's... Well, now, wait a minute. Just a minute, Marshal. If Gomez will permit me, I'd like to handle his case. Is it all right with you if I go on ahead and talk to him? Well, I didn't come out here for any chin fest. By the sacred horns of Satan, how long can it take? And besides, it may mean the life of an innocent man. Oh, okay, Chad. Make it short. And don't try any tricks. We'll be outside watching the house. A frontier town lawyer gets pretty case-hardened. But standing in that little cabin looking at Felipe and Manuela, his wife, and their five little ones... Well, I, I don't mind telling you I had trouble talking for the lump in my throat. Poor little fella. Never seen a man actually shake before. Senor Remington, how else can I say? I make oath on a holy Bible. I never see Senor Sims after I leave the bank. Senor, it is the very truth of God. Last night when you say killing happened, Felipe is not working. Ah, and if he was working... And he has an alibi. Well, he sure has an alibi. Now, tell me, Felipe, what work were you doing? Where were you? I was working for a neighbor of mine, Senor Babson. Root Babson? Si. Uh, si. Senor Babson, he come here yesterday afternoon and tell Felipe, coyotes come down from the hills and kill flock. Tell Felipe, he pay him to go out last night with him and try for kill coyotes. Si. Why, man alive? If you were with Root Babson all that time... This thing's a lead pipe cinch. Oh, senor, I am not with senor Babson all the time. He ride one way and I ride the other. Oh, certainly that's not going to make any difference. Now, what I want to know is... Hey, Remington, we can't wait out here all day. You going to turn our prisoner over to us or do we have to come in and take him? No, no, Felipe, no. No, no, look, we'll have to let the marshal take him, Mrs. Gomez, but don't you worry any. Cherokee and I'll ride right over and see Ruth Babson and get this thing squared away. Felipe, Felipe. Precious. Your beautiful face is only half so beautiful when you cry, mamacita. You don't make the worry. Senor Remington, have me back home in time for your good supper. <laughs> don't try to stand up through waiting. All right, Eddie's coming. Come on, Cherokee. We got a bit of real riding to do. <laughs> We left the Gomez's cabin and headed straight for Root Babson's place. I didn't know Babson any too well, except that he'd settled in our valley a few years earlier and had been successful with a small herd of cattle and a good-sized flock of sheep. The fact that he was successful was attested to by his liberal contributions to almost every worthy cause in the county. And as we rode up toward his ranch for the first time, we could see from that other signs of his success. Everything about the place was well tended. This man must have money, eh, Chad? Who paint every place? That fence alone must have set him back at least a couple of thousand dollars. Whoa! Hey, boy. Not wanting to waste time, we walked up to the porch, knocked on the door, and pretty soon I was explaining our visit to Root Babson. Remington, as much as I'd like to help out you and your client, Gomez's story is the most flagrant piece of exaggeration I've ever heard of. Why, anybody that knows me would tell you I never hire Mexicans for anything. The whole kit and caboodle of them is too shiftless and lazy. Well, fortunately, Babson, my experiences with him have been quite the opposite. But are you repudiating Mrs. Gomez's story that you went over to their place yesterday and talked to her husband? Why should I? Well, it's true. But I didn't go there to hire him. I went there because he owed me some money. Loaned it to him over a year ago. Chad, maybe that explains why... Philippi went to that bank yesterday. In light of what Babson says, it's quite possible. If Babson pressed him for the money, he might have gone to the bank to see if he could raise it there. Well, uh, I must say, Gomez's chances look very dim, but thanks anyway, Babson. Oh, not at all, Chad. 
I'm sorry, there wasn't more I could do. But, uh, oh, you know how emotional these Mexicans are. Gomez probably took it all out in poor Herman Sims. Yeah, I do know how those Mexicans are. Come on, Cherokee, I'm going down to jail and tell Felipe I'm resigning his case. What is happening, Marshal? You letting me out? Yeah, I'm letting you out for five minutes to talk to Remington. Come on. Thanks, Ed. Okay, Chad. Felipe, I, I talked to Root Babson. Oh, see, si, see. Si. Then you know the truth? Yeah. I'm sorry to tell you that now that I know the truth, I've decided not to defend you. Oh, senor, I'm so glad to hear that. What did you say? I said after talking to Babson, I'm not going to defend you. He said you weren't with him last night. When he came to your house yesterday, he came to collect some money you owe him. Madre de Dios, absolutamente. El señor Babs, he lied right in your face. Oh, I don't know, Felipe. It all ties together. He came to you in the morning to ask for the money you owe him, and in the afternoon you went down to the bank to try to get it. But, senor, that is not so. He come to my house in, in the afternoon after I have been to the bank, and he do not ask me for money because I do not owe him money. Well... I'll tell you what, Felipe. Some place between your story and Babson's story, the truth must lie. I'm going to talk to a few people before I tell you definitely that I have refused your case. Gracias, senor. Mil gracias. Mil gracias. Oh, by the way, Mrs. Gomez, what time yesterday morning did Mr. Babson come over to talk to your husband? Oh, he did not come in the morning, Senor Remington. He came late yesterday afternoon, maybe around five o'clock. Thanks, Mrs. Gomez. Now you go back to your children and don't worry. Any worrying done about Felipe from now on, I'm afraid I'm going to have to do. Remington, are you in your right senses? How can a man of your reputation possibly defend a murdering Mexican who lies right and left? There's nothing particular in the Bible, Babson, about Mexicans. But it does say something about the truth shall set them free. And believe me, I'm going to get the truth. Well, Cherokee, who'd you talk to? What did you find out? Well, even though all I know about police work is from the receiving end, I found out something quite interesting, Chad. But, uh, well, uh, it took a bit of doing, and... Uh, it cost, it cost a little money. All right, all right. I'll give you back the money. Well, fine, fine. Hey, well, uh, come uh, on. What did you spend the money on? Well, that is, I, I spent it at the tavern across the street you... for some uh, excellent Maryland rye. You mean to say you've been wasting your time drinking? Wasting my time, nothing. I was entertaining Dan Symes, the teller at the bank. And not only did I pump him, but I even out Detective Alan Pinkerton. I got some real information. Well, what? Dan told me that most of the money Root Babson has deposited doesn't come from the packing houses at all. It's in cash, and a lot of it brand new folding money. Well, now, that is interesting. What little money other folks around here deposit are checks they get for the sale of their livestock. Mr. Babson must have another source of income, apparently. Apparently. That information's worth the price of the drinks now, isn't it? Yes, Cherokee, it certainly is. I apologize. And you know what? We're going to get some horses and ride around to a few other towns and ask a few more questions. Questions that may put Ruth Babson behind bars. Uh, did I understand you to say bars? Iron bars. Uh, iron bars like in a pokey, eh? Iron bars like in a state penitentiary, Cherokee. And if we're lucky enough, maybe Babson will stay there for life. <laughs> return to the second act of Return of the Bad Men, our exciting frontier town adventure in just a few moments.
And now, Frontier Town. Well, with the news Cherokee had pumped out of the Dos Rios bank teller, creating more than a little curiosity about the sources of Root Babson's income, the O'Bannon and I were soon on the trail heading out of town, optimistically hoping that someplace, somewhere, we'd run across someone else who might possibly throw some light on Root Babson's outside connections. Sure, it was like looking for the conventional needle, but in the unconventional haystack. And certainly no way for a young lawyer thinking of marriage to go about making a living. Matter of fact, you may think it was a waste of time, because this was just a routine frontier killing. And the only excitement connected with it was poor Manuela's tears. And even if I had agreed with you, when we were a scant ten miles outside of Dos Rios, I would have been forced to change my mind. Cherokee and I were riding about as fast as we dared for such a long trip, and for a change, we weren't flapping our jaws about Root Babson's part in this mystery. We were just riding along and looking, and I realize now it's a good thing I was looking. Hey, Chad, what's gotten through you? What are you staring at? Slow down a little, mister. We're about to have some visitors. Visitors? Are you out of here? Stop that horse. Hold, hold, hold it. Chad. Who are those four men? I don't know. They've been following us ever since we crossed the pass. Just a bit ago, they scampered up over that rim rock so they could cut us off. Uh, slip your six-gun under your coat and keep it handy. Hey, you gentlemen want something? Hey, sure do, Remington. Slow down, boys. I saw you, you know, trailing us. You really ought to be more careful. You're the one who should be careful, Remington. And if I were you, I'd take a nice friendly hint and change my mind about leaving Dos Rios. Well, now, good thing you aren't me. Because being a lawyer, when I give advice, I'd charge for it. Yes, indeed he does. And speaking for myself, I've found the kind of advice you get for nothing is worth just that much. Well, the advice I just give you is worth almost nothing, not much more. Because all it's really worth is your life. You change your mind about going to Corte Vista? Corte Vista? Yeah, we'll go where we like. <clears throat> you see, there may be only two of us, but if I can, I'm hauling you out of that saddle and showing you what I think of your so-called advice. <laughs> you mealy mouth. <laughs> if that doesn't make my answer clear to him, maybe you three can explain it to him when he wakes up. I'd right, keep him covered, Cherokee, while I get mounted again. Because we're going wherever we want to, come ebb tide or high water. As risky as the spot was that those four gun-handy gents put us in, certainly it made a lot of our work easy. For some reason, they didn't want us to go to Corte Vista. Now, Corte Vista being more than 400 miles away was one town I had no intention of visiting originally... But seeing as it was important to them, it became important to us. And Cherokee and I knocked on our horses to make time. Those high binders must work for Ruth Babson, Chad. Except for Libby and Mrs. Gomez. Only Babson knew what we were up to. You see the way Cherokee, I... quick, behind those rocks. Chad, what's going on? They've decided to make sure we don't get to Curta Vista. Come on, get that carbine out of your saddle boot and use it. Look out, Cherokee. One of them's trying to get behind you. Ted, I knocked him smack out of his saddle. Nice shooting, Cherokee. It slowed him up. Now let's rush him. Get up there, boy. Come up. We got him on the run, Ted. Surprise him. All right, hold it, Cherokee. Hold it. There's the mayor of Maverick, you wounded, lying on the ground. I got an idea if we can get him to talk, we might save ourselves a long trip. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> oh, we won't learn anything from this gent. You mean, you mean he's shuffled off this mortal coil? Yeah, for good. I, I feel sick. I've never killed a man in all my dishonorable life. This is terrible. Oh, you didn't kill him. Look, your slug just went through his arm. When he fell off the horse, he must have hit his head on that log. That did it. Well, I feel better. 
But he isn't going to be much help to us, is he? Not unless we can find something on him. Come on, if you're not too squeamish, help me look him over. Well, we found something. It was a label in his shirt, that's all. But it was a label of a furnishing store in Curta Vista. Even though we could read the jigsaw, we couldn't see the picture. All the pieces were there, but as yet they didn't fit together. We wasted no time getting to Curta Vista and went directly to the sheriff's office. That's about all we know, Sheriff. Well, from the description you give me of this here route, Babson, it's hard to say if I ever know him or not. Clean shaven, you say? Yes, he is, but uh, why do you ask? Mm, well, sir, just sort of putting two and two together. That uh, fellow you killed on your way here now, uh, he used to be tied up with a bank bandit down this part of the country. Yeah? And except that he had blonde hair and wore a mustache, this here Root Babson might be Andy Sly. Well, for goodness sakes, I can make you a hair dye in five minutes and change blonde hair to black. Changing his name from Sly to Babson takes no time at all. Yeah, it could be, couldn't it? But how are you going to prove from that slim evidence that Babson murdered Herman Sims? Did you say Herman Sims? Yes, did you know Herman? Oh, my gosh almighty, Herman used to run a bank down here. It was Herman himself who identified Andy Sly as having robbed his bank. That's when Sly escaped. Plum vanished from these parts. Well, well, well. It is a small world after all. Huh? You mean this fits together? Up to a point, almost up to the exact point. Now, if Sly and Babson are one and the same, then I'm guessing that Herman Sims finally recognized him up in Dos Rios, even with his mustache off and his hair dyed, and that's why Babson put him out of the way. Well, it's a mighty slick theory you got there, son. But how are you going to prove it? Well, I, I don't know yet, Sheriff. But I sure can do a heap of thinking on the way back to Dos Rios. That's exactly what I'm proposing to do. All right, Cherokee, come on. Let's go. Wild chance? You bet it was. And being a wild chance, it called for a wild idea. It was a sense that with Herman Sims dead, nobody in our state could identify Babson if he was Andy Sly. But all this about going to Corte Vista made me think he must be. So it was up to me to figure out some devious way of getting Babson to admit himself that he was the missing bandit and had killed Sims, taking advantage of the row poor Felipe Gomez had had with Sims to blame it on him. Well, it, it took a bit of talking on my part, but finally Ed Bingham, the Dos Rios Marshal, threw in with me. And carefully surrounding the place with a hand-picked posse, I went up and called Babson outside of his house. Remington... All I can tell you is you're talking through your hat. Oh? Well, uh, let me put it to you this way. Now, if I give up Gomez's defense, he'll be found guilty and hanged. Yeah? If they hang him, the case will be closed. and Nobody will do any further investigating about Herman Sims' death. So? So, since it just might be embarrassing to you if the investigation were prolonged, and since I'm getting no fee at all from Gomez... Why don't you pay me a fee to drop his case? How much do you want, Remington? $2,000 now and $500 a year as retainer. <laughs> You're crazy. Am I? You know, it wouldn't be too hard to have that sheriff in Corte Vista come up here and identify Andy Sly. What are you talking about? This is an entirely different state. Sure. But even though Sly might legally stop his own extradition, it wouldn't be too hard a job to have that Cota Vista sheriff come up here voluntarily as a witness. You're pretty slick, Flemington. Slick enough. You really think I'm Andy Sly, don't you? Right now, yeah. But if you were my client, I'd be convinced you were Root Babson. Oh, and uh, I don't want to check. <laughs> You're real slick. <laughs> All right, here. Here's 500 in account. Oh, thanks. And all brand new bills, too, aren't they? Just as if they'd come fresh out of a bank. They did. Might even have been the bank that was stuck up over at Comanche Springs a few months ago. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, it sure might. Well, that's what I thought. <laughs> hey, Marshal, did you hear that? Marshal? Why, you double demon! <laughs> Knocked head down. All right, now. The first man that takes a step is going to get plugged. Now, I mean it. I'll kill anybody that moves. Come on, Marshal. Let's get him. Chad. Chad, are 
Are you all right? Buzzard can punch you all right. Where'd he go? He run for the barn, locked himself in. Huh? Only way to get him out of there is to starve him. Well, I'm going in after him. Chad, Chad, you won't have a chance. I will if you stand here out front. It'll keep his attention this way while I go around through the back. All right, now, look alive and keep your eyes open. Marshal, that's pure suicide. Well, I certainly don't... Hey, look, Chad must have got in. Billy Blue blazes those shots. Babs, must have seen Chad. Don't gun it, I wish Chad hadn't... Wait a minute. The barn doors are open. They sure are. Who's coming out? Hey, flatten out, men. On, if it's Babson, we'll have to... Look! It is Babson, but Chad's behind him with a gun stuck right in his back. Yeah. Ah, that's the one that's in. That's the way to Senor Remington, never, never we will be able to repay you. No, no, Manuela. We pay Senor Remington's lawyer fee, even if we pay him a little bit every month. Oh, no, you don't, Felipe. If you hadn't needed money, you wouldn't have been in that scrape in the first place. Then I tell you what we do. We kill sheep and give you a big fiesta. Barbecue. Si, si. Well, Mrs. Gomez, that I might accept. Hey, Cherokee? Might accept? Man, haven't you ever attended a fiesta? Besides food, they have the two most wonderful things in the world. Oh, see? And what are those things, Senor O'Bannon? The two most wonderful things in the world. They have weak senoritas and strong liquor. And that's for me. Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler, is a Bruce Ells production. Story and supervision by Joel Murcott. Direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. And now this is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town!
They say the frontier is pretty tough, but I live smack dab in the middle of the frontier in a rough and ready cow town known as Dos Rios. And I don't think it's half as tough as folks say. Who am I? Well, I'm about the only lawyer in the county, and my handle is Chad Remington. Of course, I'm not trying to tell you that we don't have our fair share of trouble and sudden death, but well, what I am aiming to say is, frontier or not, the troubles we have, we know how to handle. Well, now, I guess it's up to me to back up what I said by giving you a case in point. It was just a few weeks ago that Cherokee O'Bannon, the ex-medicine man, was with me riding back from El Dorado, the county seat, where I'd just tried a case and lost it. Now, I was feeling pretty blue about it, and Cherokee, in his haughtiest manner, was trying to buck me up. Chad, my downcast and Dolores friend, I wish to recall to you that famous old motto. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Well, I'm sure your advice is well meant, Cherokee, but this is one case I can't try, try again. I'm afraid that the jury was right that my client actually was guilty. Yes, I guess that's the difference between us. Any case I get, I keep working on. <laughs> You're sure right about that. The cases you get, you work on until there isn't one bottle left. Ah, yes. Yes, indeed. That's one of the... Say, look at that. Huh? Looks like the days of 49 with those lumbering big wagons coming down the pass up ahead. Yeah, except those aren't Conestogo wagons. From here, they look like freighters. Now, it wouldn't surprise me any if they were hauling supplies up to where they're building the new railroad that's going to come into El Dorado. Yes, you're probably right about that, Chad. And incidentally... I think it's a rotten shame that they don't make Dos Rios Railroad Junction Point instead of El Dorado. Oh, mister, I can't agree with you there. In the first place, El Dorado's a larger town. It's a county seat. They do three times the business there compared to what we do in our little one-horse town. Yes, I... Say, Chad, what do you think happened to those wagons? I can't see them now. Well, the road through that pass winds down through the little canyon on the other side of the Saddle Rock and... Hey. Billy Blue Blazes, Chad. Where are those shots coming from? From the canyon those wagons went into. You see the little puffs of gun smoke? Indeed I do. Indeed I do. Oh, it's a long haul and we may not get there in time to do any good, but come on, the least we can do is try. By the time we got there, there was nothing to see. That is, there was nothing to see but signs of what had happened. Now, born on a ranch and owning a small one, the signs were fairly unmistakable. This Cherokee and I dismounted and poked around. Well, Chad, maybe you know what the shooting was all about. I don't. Well, I'm not saying it's as plain as the nose on your face. You'd better not. But it's just about as red. Sir, I resent that insult. Well, no insult intended, Cherokee. Look here, you see these? These feathers on the ground? If I'm not mistaken, those feathers came out of some Indian's war dress. You mean to stand there with your eagle eyes squinted up and tell me Indians ambushed those wagons? I mean to tell you that there were Indians here. And judging from the feathers, Comanches. The thing that baffles me, though, is first, apparently the wagoners didn't fight back. And second, after the Indians rode off, the wagons apparently proceeded as usual. Uh, somehow or other, this attack looks like it might have been prearranged. Well, it beats me. Those wagons were freighters hauling railroad supplies. What would Indians want with stuff like that? Beats me too, Cherokee. But since it's coming to sundown, I'm not going to waste any more time standing out here speculating. Nope, I'm climbing back on that broken-down Mustang I rented from your livery stable and heading home for Dos Rios. <laughs> to do in Dos Rios after a five-day absence, I must admit I didn't give the unexplained wagon attack much more thought. In fact, nobody in Dos Rios was particularly interested, because everyone was talking about the new man who'd moved to town, a chap from Kansas, or so he said, by the name of Doc Stonebender. Not only had he moved to Dos Rios, but he'd leased a store building with a large storeroom and immediately started to option property all over our valley, except for a few pieces that he bought up. 
Well, I hadn't been back in town more than 24 hours when Doc Stonebender came to call on me. Uh, to make a long story short, Remington, if we can get together on a price, I'm prepared to take an option on your ranch and pay you $300 for it. Well, now, Stonebender, this is sheer curiosity on my part, but you must have a mighty good reason for wanting to tie up all the property I've heard you've optioned here in Dos Rios Valley. <laughs> I sure have. You see, when I operate, I operate big. That's how I've made my money. And that's how I happen to operate on the scale I do. Yeah, I see. But what's your reason? Like from the wagon loads of that stuff I've seen being unloaded and taken into your store, you've got a heavy investment already in this valley. I'll tell you my reason. I've done a lot of looking around. I've decided Dos Rios Valley is going to boom. If it does, well, it's going to make me a rich man, a very rich man. However, you haven't given me your answer yet about your own place. Well, I'm afraid the answer is no. Uh, perhaps I'm a little sentimental about it. My father homesteaded the ranch and I was born there. But on the other hand, looking to get married someday, if there's any easy money to be made here, I'd like to make it too. <laughs> Certainly a lawyer doesn't have to make his money out of a few acres of land. When the boom comes, you'll make plenty out of your profession. That's right. If the boom comes... Now, matter of fact, in my opinion, any land boom in these parts ought to hit El Dorado with the railroad coming in there, not Dos Rios. Oh, I think they'll have a quick spurt at El Dorado, but... Well, I'm a busy man, Remington. I'll raise my offer to 500 for the option, if that'll interest you. No thanks, Mr. Stonebender. If you're going to get rich out of Dos Rios, so am I. <laughs> you came down here to the stable, Chad. I saw that stranger, what's his name, Stonebender, go upstairs to your office. Did you get him as a client? Oh, no such luck. <laughs> he wanted to take an option to buy my ranch. Offered me $500 for the option. Would probably have paid me a fortune for the ranch, if he ever bought it. $500 just for an option? Why, that man must be made of money. Which, as I think of it, is a lovely thing to be made of. Oh, well, he may be made of money, but I don't think too much of his brains. My dear young man, any man with the money he must have must have brains to spare. The business acumen sticking out of his ears. Why, a man like that doesn't have to drink whiskey. He can drink champagne. Well, if my ranch is ever worth what Doc Stonebender thinks it's going to be, you can have all the champagne you want to drink at my wedding. Yeah, which reminds me, Libby and the judge are good enough to invite me for supper. It's just about time I was getting over there. You lucky young devil, having a beauteous damsel like Libby interested in you. Be sure to convey to her and her father my sincerest regards. And if you can, set a date for that wedding party soon. I must admit I'm getting pretty thirsty for champagne. <laughs> A cigar, Chad. Oh, no, thanks, Judge. I'm afraid your daughter really doesn't approve. Well, I most certainly don't. They're not so bad when Daddy smokes them outside like he's doing tonight, but I'm sick and tired of sweeping up ashes off the parlor rug ten times a day. Young lady, don't forget who paid for that parlor rug. Now, don't let the judge scare you, Libby, by all that talk about paying for rugs. When I get married, I'm not going to have a rug in the house. Probably can't afford it. <laughs> well... That's a fine way to make an impression on your perspective. Oh, excuse me, Libby. I think I see someone coming. If I'm not mistaken, it's Cherokee O'Bannon. Hey, Cherokee, is that you? Yes, it is, Chad. Certainly glad you're still in town. Something wrong, Cherokee? Even, Judge. Even, Miss Libby. And to answer your question, I don't know if something's wrong or if it's just my imagination. But if you'll excuse, Chad... I'd like him to come with me. Well, good night, Cherokee. We just finished supper. Don't you know it's not polite to eat and run? Well, I haven't eaten. And I run all the way here. Because I think I found something that ties right into what happened to those freight wagons the other day on the way home from El Dorado. Freight wagons, Chad? I'll tell you about it later, Judge. But if Cherokee is right, I better be leaving now. <laughs> Cherokee grabbed me by the arm and practically ran me three blocks back to town. Then, turning down the alley behind his livery stable, walked me another few hundred feet until we were right behind the back door to the storeroom of the big building Doc Stonebender had rented, two doors away from Dos Rios' biggest and noisiest saloon. 
a chat. Wait till I strike a match. See? See those wheel tracks there in the dirt? Yeah, I can make them out all right. Notice those nail marks? The shoes were fastened onto the wheels? Mm-hmm. Those aren't the same wheel marks we saw in that canyon the other afternoon. Where you found the Indian feathers? I'll drink a quart of milk. The very thought repulses me. Cherokee, I'll be doggone if I don't think you're right. Why should those freight wagons we heard being shut up the other day suddenly appear here in the alley behind Stonebender's store? If I knew, I wouldn't have gone and gotten you. You got any answers? No, not really answers. It's certainly something to think about. Hey, come on, I'd hate to be found snooping in this alley. Let's take a walk while I think this over. Well, Chad, got any answers yet? Now, we thought those wagons were hauling railroad supplies. But if Stonebender's interested in the railroad over at El Dorado, why should he be optioning all the... Hey, hey, Cherokee, you see that buckboard coming toward us lickety-split? Yes, I do. If I know anything about horses, that team's running away. Good grief, Cherokee, with the crowd that's in town tonight and all the horses at the hitch rack, that runaway can start a stampede. Silly blue blazers, Chad. We've got to stop that buckboard and quick. Yeah, come on. Whoa! Oh. Oh, I... Easy, easy. There. Easy. Cherokee, there's a man on the seat. Looks like he's fainted. Oh, here. Help me turn his head around. Uh, what happened, mister? Are you all right? Railroad uh, to get help. Railroad work crew wiped out. Railroad work crew? You mean at El Dorado? Yeah. Yeah, El Dorado. Indians, hundreds of them... Wiped us out. Oh, Cherokee, this thing's starting to fit together. Look, were the Indians Comanches? Yeah, Comanches. Hundreds of them crazy with liquor and shooting like the, like they were. Chad, is he, is he gone? Yeah, I'm afraid so, Cherokee. He's gone, but what he told us is certainly going to cost somebody something. Wouldn't surprise me if it cost that somebody his life. We'll return to the second act of the Valley of Lawless Men, our exciting frontier town adventure in just a few minutes. Now, Frontier Town. Well, with that fellow riding in from El Dorado with the news that Comanches had attacked the railroad work party and wiped them out, not only did Doc Stonebender's part in this mosaic of mystery become more obscure, but with the nearest cavalry post located much too far away to be any help... I roused out the judge, and with Cherokee's help, we soon organized a meeting. Neighbors, with everyone trying to talk at once, no one can say anything. Now you know what the facts are. There's been an Indian uprising which wiped out the railroad work party. And we are here to find out what we can do about it. Judge, judge, I got a question I want to ask you. All right, Abe. Although I don't see that this is the time to ask questions. That's what I say. We call this meeting to get some action, not to answer a lot of questions. Yeah? Well, when Abe Cannon gets through with his questions, I've got some questions of my own. All right, Marlene. You too, Abe. Let's get to the questions and get them over with. With this here now railroad work party being wiped out, can anybody tell me if the railroad's still going to go ahead with their plans of running their rails into El Dorado? I'd like to know about the railroad. How can anyone over here answer a question like that? And besides, what difference does it make 
with the Comanches on the warpath again. I'll tell you what difference it can make, Judge. So happens I own a lot of land over here in Dos Rios, and so do some of the other folk here. I'll be darned if I want to see us go out and get shot up fighting them Comanches just to help the railroad build into some other town. Are you all in your right senses? Do you really mean that? People have been killed, and probably more people will be killed. And you want to sit so finally by and do nothing about it just to line your own pockets? Chad! Chad! You know gull blame well engine fighting is risky. It costs time, it costs money. And I'll be blamed if I want to not only take a chance on getting shot, but spend my money when all I'm going to get out of it is seeing that El Dorado gets a railroad. You don't go on that blamed highfalutin' right. Why, it's not even our business. Let the cavalry go fight the engines. And we don't get stampeded into action like a lot of ninnies. Maybe we'll get the railroad and end up with some money in the bank instead of some men up in boot hill. Hey, Dad, I've always thought I was on the lookout for easy money, but I've never heard the likes of this in all my born days. Uh, you know what it says in the Bible about worshiping men. Now, uh, friends, friends, I just can't believe folks who are as decent as I know you are could even feel this way. You leave your doors open, you'll feed grubline riders... You'll boast about how neighborly Westerners are, and still, on the slim chance of making a dollar for yourselves, you'll let those Comanches go on slaughtering decent people without lifting a finger. Well, you know that ain't our job. Molly was right. What's the cavalry for? Oh, good heavens, by the time the cavalry could get up here, we might all be slaughtered. Remington, I haven't heard anybody here say they wouldn't fight to protect their own homes. So why keep threatening everybody by trying to make it appear that the Indians are right at our own doors? Well, Judge, you've got the gavel. You might as well use it. The only thing we're getting out of this meeting is complete disgust of the human race. All right, folks. This meeting stands adjourned. like I always knew when I used to sell my genuine Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil. Yeah, what's that, Cherokee? The genus Hobo Sapiens is out for every last penny he can make. Think I could have sold any of my uh, oil for two bits if I didn't tell him it was worth ten dollars? No, sir. That's why I always said, you say five dollars is too much? You say you want more for your money? Very well, then. As a special advertising inducement, I'm going to offer this miraculous remedy today... For just 25 cents, suckers. I suppose Cherokee's right, Chad. But if those Comanches ever come over to Dos Rios... No, they wouldn't dare, Judge. They're safe around El Dorado because all the mountains and hills to hide in. Oh, this valley's too flat. Oh, it certainly would be a... Hey, wait a minute. I think I've got an idea. Idea? What, Chad? An idea to teach the folks around Dos Rios a lesson. You know Chief Graybear, don't you, Judge, the chief of the Onawanda tribe? Yes. Well, a few years back, I got him out of some trouble. Since I wouldn't take a fee for it, he made me promise that someday I'd let him return the favor. Well, what have the Onawanda's got to do with this situation? Nothing right now. But if you'll ride out and pay a call on Chief Graybear with me, Cherokee, I think we could teach our friends and neighbors a lesson they'll never forget. <laughs> Do you understand, Chief? Mm. Do you know what I want you to do? Uh, me understand, Remington. All you gotta do is get your bucks to put on war paint, the kind the Comanches wear, and pretend you're raiding Dos Rios. <laughs> that doesn't make good Christians out of them, nothing well. Mm. Will do. But today, Comanche have many white men's rifles. Also got plenty fire water. Fire water? Uh. Say, Chad, maybe I could dress up like a Comanche. Well, mister, you hold your horses, and I mean your livery stable horses. Greybeard, do you know where the Comanches got that fire water and those rifles? Uh, do not know for sure. 
But here talk white man give them whiskey and gun. I the great horn spoon, Chad. Maybe that's what they stole out of those wagons the other day. Well, maybe it's what they got out of the wagons, but they never stole them. Well, if they'd stolen them, why would the wagons have driven off before we got there? No, sir, I think it was prearranged that they stopped those wagons so it'd look good. Chad, I'm starting to think you're right. And what's more, I think your friend Doc Stonebender is the culprit behind it all. Now you're cooking with spring water. I'll bet that's why Stonebender's optioned all that land in Dos Rios, hoping the railroad would build there. If you say truth, this be plenty bad, white man. Plenty bad, chief. But we're not going to convince our neighbors of that while they still think they can make some money out of it themselves. What a vile commentary on the disgusting weakness of mortal man. Yeah, you're right. Now, Chief Graybear, I have your promise of help, haven't I? Uh, me give word. Me do. Good enough. There's a late moon tonight, and if you hit those Rios just about ten o'clock, we'll teach those people a lesson they won't forget for the rest of their lives. <laughs> If nothing else, that visit to Chief Graybear and the Onawanda suddenly showed up big-hearted Doc Stonebender for the miserable sneaking vulture he really was. But knowing he'd still have the town's support, we didn't do a thing until Chief Graybear engineered his Comanche attack. Just about ten o'clock, when half the town was in bed and the other half in the saloons, the redskin tidal wave suddenly swept down the main street. <laughs> attack didn't take much more than a minute. And with the judge, Cherokee, and me trying to help by blocking exits and getting in the way, no one was hurt. That is, not physically. But there was a mighty shaken crowd of neighbors gathered in the street when the Indians had finally vanished. Well, I ain't ashamed to admit that I was wrong. Uh, me neither. I mean, neither. I say let's arm up and get after them during the Yes, out. sir. I'm now, good. just a minute, folks. Just a minute. I'm positive those were not Comanches. Oh? And uh, what makes you so positive, Mr. Stonebender? I, I guess I know a Comanche when I see one. Yeah, I guess you do at that. But from what you told me, you've only been out in this country a short time. How come you're able to identify Comanches better than, than we are? Why, I... I I'll well, tell you why. Because you've been dealing with the Comanches. Why, you... Because you're the low-down maverick who's been furnishing them rifles and feeding them liquor. You got them to attack the railroad work party just to force the railroad to build here and make money for you. Don't, don't listen to him. He's either crazy or he's deliberately lying. I don't like that code of liar, Stonebender. In fact, I don't like it so much it makes me fighting mad. <laughs> Again, Chad. I can use those gold teeth. Anything to oblige a friend. And now, now if you all want to see if I was lying, come on. We're busting the lock off Stonebender's storeroom and finding out just what it is he's got stored in there. Enough rifles for an army. Well, I'll be dead. And enough of that cheap red eye to steam up ten tribes of Indians. You know what I think? We ought to smash those liquor barrels and pour them out in the street. Holly Seward, for shame. I'm aggrieved at your wanton wastefulness. <laughs> uh, what would you like to do with that firewater, Mr. O'Bannon? Why, what would any thinking man want to do with it? Put on a fire. <laughs> well, uh, why should we give it to you? <laughs> Certainly you don't think you're the hottest man in town. Maybe not. But if you deny me that supply of free libations, there'll be nobody in Dos Rios as burned up as I am.
Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler, is a Bruce Ells production. Story and supervision by Joel Murcott. Direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. And now this is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! You know, down in Dos Rios, that's a little frontier town I come from, and where I'm the only lawyer, the law business certainly takes many a peculiar turn. Folks seem to come to a cow town lawyer like Chad Remington, (laughs) that's me, for almost any kind of advice, and for help in almost any kind of trouble. And trouble, believe me, we have a plenty out on the roaring, roistering frontier. Of course, a lot of our troubles aren't brought to me. They they just happen. Like the trouble we had just a few weeks ago. Mister, that was bad trouble. Real bad trouble. Cherokee O'Bannon, the ex-medicine man who runs the Dos Rios livery stable, now that he's reformed, uh, somewhat, had gone with me to the judges for supper. To Cherokee, the principal attraction was the supper. For me, it was the judge's daughter, Libby. Well, we were finishing off one of Libby's lemon sponge pies when... Is something wrong, Cherokee? Now, come on, Cherokee, there is something wrong. You're staring at your cup as if you'd never seen coffee before. Yes. Oh, come on, O'Bannon. The judge and Libby have caught you with your jaw down. What's wrong? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, I was just reflecting on what a spot of brandy might do to enhance the flavor of this mocha and java. (laughs) Well, Cherokee, I haven't got any brandy, but I have got a bit of wine. Wine? (laughs) My dear judge... Chad, it sounds as if there's trouble down in town. It sure does, Libby. And from the little I can see here through the window, I, I'd say someone's raiding the Wells Fargo office. Wells Fargo? Libby, you stay here. Cherokee, get the judge's rifle off the wall. Let's get going fast. time we got our horses and back into town, a posse had already mounted up and was streaking out of Dos Rios, following the bandits who headed for the hills over the rickety wooden bridge across the White River. There was no moon, and under the somber awning of blackness, there was little to follow but the receding sound of the hoofbeats which led further and further up a gradually narrowing trail into the far rocky regions of the hills. By this time, we were sure we'd lost him. The marshal called a halt to hold a council of war. Well, marshal, 
What do we do now? I can't say right off, Judge. And I got a pretty good notion that the leader of that bunch was Ab Cleaver. He's been pulling raids not too far from here lately. Well, even though I've heard this Cleaver gent is as smart as a rattlesnake backed into his hole, I think he's making a mistake this time. What do you mean, Cherokee? Well, Marshal, I think Cherokee means they've ridden in a sort of a cul-de-sac, a bottleneck. Because except for Lars Peterson's ranch, there's nothing back up in those hills but rim rock that runs straight up and the headwaters of the White River. That's right. Chad, I do believe you're right. Once they ride past Peterson's ranch, they literally have their backs to the wall and we can starve them out. Well, I'll be doggone. Durned if you're all not right. Mac, you take four men and crawl up to the rim behind them two creeks up there that flow into the river. Half a dozen you other fellas go with my chief deputy Andy Thomas and form a half circle down here. The rest of us will go back to town, get some more ammunition and rifles. We'll be back up here by sunup to give you some relief and close in on them blasted crooks. Watch it, Cherokee. Riding around this rim the way you're silhouetted to you make a perfect target if any of you... Billy Blue Blazers, Chad. That drilled a hole right through my Stetson. Yeah, well, it proves one thing. We're not going to catch them napping. Can you see any of our boys around here? Yeah, let me see now. Yes. Isn't that the chief deputy, Andy Thomas, squatting down behind that... Come on, Mr. O'Bannon. Your hats are full of holes now. It's starting to look like a beehive. Then believe me, I'm no honey. Or, or am I? Get up there! Oh, boy. Hold it. Oh. Yeah. Anything happen, Andy? Uh, nothing but that sniping. Can you see them down there? Nope. Just a puff of smoke when they throw a shot up here. Well, the marshal said he'd be up with some lunch for you around noontime. But meantime, here are two extra rifles, 300 rounds of shells, and a spyglass that Judge's father used at Gettysburg. Oh, thanks, Chad. And uh, tell the marshal not to forget a plug of my charm tobacco. All up here for gosh knows how. Chad, ain't you listening to me? Oh, oh I'm sorry, Andy. Uh, I was looking down to where they've got Cleaver and his gang sewed up. Without ladders, they'll never be able to get up here, but they could move off to the east a few hundred yards and come up behind the Peterson place. If they did, with what supplies they could get from there, this siege might last for months. I'd like to see them try it. Lars Peterson and Helga are about the two most stubborn Swedes I ever encountered. Wouldn't be a wouldn't buy a bottle of my rattlesnake oil for two bits. Why well, they'd fight Cleaver and his whole gang to a fairly well. well. Just the same, I think the thing to do is to go back to town and call a little strategy meeting. What we've got to do is figure every possible move Cleaver might make and have some counter tactics ready. Well, you can't lose nothing by getting your heads together. <laughs> Just a few heads. Uh, there isn't a person in this entire valley who has the time to spare two months until Cleaver's starved out, if he does manage to get some supplies. Found, found that nefarious, no good nitwit. When I get back to town, I'm going to write Mr. Stetson a letter. What we need out here is a hat that's bulletproof. Not only did we need hats that were bulletproof, but we found we needed a lot of help. Cleaver wasn't just shrewd as a catamount. He was a man who was willing to take a chance. However, as we had figured it out, Cleaver had made a mistake. Apparently, when he laid his plans for the Wells Fargo raid, he'd counted on crossing the river and getting away. But instead of crossing the Red River, which had Meadowland on its opposite bank, he crossed the White found himself with his back to the rocks on one side and the headwaters on the other. And that was about the only joyful note I could sound in the whole meeting was the judge and the marshal called for early that evening. Friends, friends, won't you please quiet down? As much as we want your help and ideas, we can't hear anything if you all try talking at the same time. All right, Chad, would you go on with what you were saying? Well, there's not much more, Judge. I just think with no moon tonight, it'd be a good idea if we could sneak about a dozen men up to Lars Peterson's place just in case Cleaver gets the same idea that I got. Well, I think that's a good idea. I think it's a good idea. And just to start the ball rolling, I'll volunteer to be one of those men myself. The way the canyon lays, if Cleaver ever gets wise, he can pick us off one by one and we'll never get anybody to Peterson's. What's more, if we do get men up to Peterson's, 
What happens if they try to break out some other way? Please, please, folks. Not all at once. After all, the marshal's in charge. What do you think, Marshal? Well, if we could get some of her men into Peterson's, it'd certainly stop Cleaver from... Oh, Marshal, Marshal, wait a minute. Look who just came in. Uh-huh. Helga Peterson. It's good you're all here for the meeting because I come here with bad news. Bad news, Helga? Blazing blue, blue blisters. Bad news? Now what? Oh, come on, Helga. You better come up here on the platform so we can all hear you. Oh, this is the most awful thing. Nothing so bad ever happened to me, never. Yes, but what is it, Helga? What happened? Those bad men, those crooks, they break into our house. Oh, no. We're oh, inside, Winders. Now we are in for it. Oh, what happened to your husband? What happened to Lars? Oh, Lars fight. He fight all he could. He fight like wild men, but those outlaws beat him on the head and take him prisoner. How does it happen you got away, Olga? He didn't get away. They let me go and tell me to come down here and give you a message and buy Yump and Yemeni is the worst job I ever had to do. That crook Abe Cleaver, he say, unless you get him and his men out of Kenyon and ride away, they dam up headwaters of White River and then blow up them and flood out whole town. Oh, no, 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 don't go getting excited. They can't flood the town. It's impossible. Oh, no. I'm afraid it's not impossible, Marshal. Well, Where they're located, they could dam up that water in no time. Already they got men damming up water. And with the water dammed up, even a child could divert it and let it come roaring down on the town. Just I yeah, but I say do it. Let them crooks loose. Yeah. Well, you can't be serious. I can't, can't I? You think we're going to lose our ranches and our stores and everything we own just to catch some sidewinding crooks who haven't done us any harm? That's right, right now. Right. 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 Folks, sure. friends, are you a lot of sheep? Are you going to let a low-down, double-dyed common murderer stampede you into cowardice? Why, and take it from a man who knows, if you accede to this nefarious demand, you will never be able to live with yourselves. For shame! Oh, yeah, I should say the same. Neighbors... Neighbors, maybe I haven't always been right, but I think everyone here will grant that I've never consciously worked against the interest of my friends in my town. What are you doing, Chad? Running for congressman? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, This is no matter for laughing. This is serious. And even though Abe Cleaver is holding me, their husband is, uh, what you call it? Uh, is hostage? Yeah, hostage. I tell you, we must not do what Crook said. We must fight. We must fight back. I say keep Helga here to start with. No sense sending her back to suffer along with Lars. When Helga doesn't come back, that'll be Cleaver's answer. By the time he realizes that is his answer, we ought to be able to figure something out. And come ebb tide or high water, we'll fight for this valley like men. Not like the yellow-spined cowards those owl hoots really are. Hey! We'll return to the second act of Guns of Wrath, our exciting frontier town adventure, in just a few moments. And now, Frontier Town. Like I said before, this was trouble. Real trouble. And even though I did pull a politician's spellbinding trick assuring everyone that we'd fight back successfully, I honestly didn't think Ab Cleaver would do any more than dam up the water to frighten us. And that was because I didn't know Ab Cleaver. As I learned later from Lars Peterson, Cleaver didn't wait very long. Scarcely an hour after the time he figured Helga ought to be back with our word of acquiescence, Cleaver walked out to where his men were gathered around the Willowbrush Dam they'd built. Well, Ab, you old lady get back? No, we ain't gonna wait. I'm gonna show him that when Ab Cleaver says something, he means it. Yeah, 
It's okay with me, boss. Me and the boys already got the powder planted under the dam. All we gotta do is light the fuse and ten million gallons of water will come rushing down on Dos Rios like it was judgment day. <laughs> well, what are you waiting for? You got matches, ain't you? Light the fuse. <laughs> you know something, Ab? <laughs> this is gonna be more fun than the 4th of July. <laughs> She's lit, boys. Now stay. All right, come on. crossed me up, and Dos Rios was underwater. But the strange thing was, and, and we could see it from our vantage point up in the rocks of Crow's Nest, the town wasn't wiped out. Far from it, it, it was just as if the river had swollen in a flash spring flood, flowed over its banks, and covered the streets of the town with about three feet of silt-filled, muddy water. Now, the judge, Libby, Cherokee, and I pondered this... Tried to figure it out as we looked down on the sodden town. Why, this is no worse than that spring flood we had when I was a little girl. Maybe not even as bad. No question about it, Libby. And I, for one, can't make it out. You think Cleaver figures that with only a few feet of water, we'll go back into town? And then he let the rest of it loose and really drown us? Well, with a man like that, I suppose anything's possible. Well, not this time. Because if he had wanted to drown us, he could have done it in the first place. Hi, George, you're right. What do you make of it, Chad? I don't know exactly, Judge, but I'm sure there must have been some reason for it. Just trying to put myself in Ab Cleaver's place and figure out what he could possibly have had and... Doggone it, I think I got it. Got it? Got what? You see? See way down there, just kind of picking their way into town? Yeah. You can just barely make them out. There's eight horses, and I reckon they got eight men on their backs. I see them, Chad. But who are they? What do you think they're up to? Well, unless I miss my guess. And you miss plenty this trip. Now, those men are Ab Cleaver and his gang. If they wanted to get away, they wouldn't be heading back again toward town. Is that right? Yes. I guess so. But what do you... I think they let loose a portion of that water to clear the town. And now that the town's cleared, they're going back in, completely unmolested, to help themselves to anything and everything they can find. Of all the obnoxious, audacious, dastardly things... Here we are, way up here, and if we start down toward town, they'll be able to pick us off like flies. Having house flies, of course, not the horse fly, who is quite sagacious and wary. Chad, can't we do something? You bet we can. Now, look, we're up here on the high ground, just as they were, except that we're up on the headwaters of the Red River. Yes. So what's to stop us from pulling the same trick they pulled and threatening to let the whole Red River down on them unless they give up? After the unfortunate advice you gave everybody, Chad, already, do you think that you have any influence left with them? Well, maybe not, but I never yet ruled a man off a trying. So what do you say? Let's get down off these rocks and over to the mesa where the rest of the folks are gathered. <laughs> Doggone it, Chad. Two wrongs don't make a right. And if we dammed up the Red River, we might finish Dos Rios for fair. By yours, that's what I say. Enough is enough. Let them crooks get away. Let's get back to our home. Yes, that's that's what I say. You can't. You can't quit when you've gone this far. 
Now, uh, look, don't you see? If you men will get back up in the hills and start building the dam, I can circle down with the marshal and a posse and we'll have them cut off. Yeah, don't think, don't think. Caught between the flood, we can let loose on them. And enough lead to make a lot of them look like lace curtains. It's just a trick, a trap. Tad just wants to threaten them. And if Cleaver won't give up and you don't want to let the water down on him, you don't have to. Folks, this time, Chad's right. I'm blamed if I don't think so. If you folks are willing to help, me and my men will risk our lives. Won't we, boys? Uh, uh, what are you looking at me for, Marshal? Well, if we ride, you'll ride with us, won't you, Cherokee? Well, when you put it that way, Chad, uh, yes. And what about the rest of you? All right, then. Let's knock on these horses. Rain up, men. This is as far as we go. Uh, Chad, I'll be blamed you were right. See? Those men are ransacking the stores and loading everything they can onto their horses. Well, how are you going to powwow with Cleaver from here? You just watch, Cherokee. Hey, Cleaver! Cleaver, can you hear us? Yeah, we're up here, over your heads. To the east, up by the Quakies. He sees you, Chad. See? They're looking up here. Uh huh. Cleaver! You've ridden yourself into a trap by coming back into Dos Rios. I'm here with the Marshal and a 20 man posse. The rest of the town is back up in the hills. They're all set to let the Red River roar down behind you. Now, if you've got any brains at all, you'll quit. This is the Marshal, Cleaver. And we're giving you just one minute to make up your mind. Well, I'll be hanged. I'll take that back. I'll be uh, blamed. You see them? They've all got their heads together talking it over. Chad, I believe this is going to work. It looks like they've made their minds up. All right, Marshal! You win! <laughs> Cleaver, tell your men to throw your guns into the street. We're coming down. All right, boys. Let's get going. Well, we sure were feeling good. Me, in particular, as we threaded our way through the Aspens, came out in the lane on the back of High Baxter's ranch and headed through the water and mud into town. A few seconds after the marshal told the boys to spread out... Split up, boys! Cover both ends of the street! Cherokee suddenly nudged me and pointed to something. Chad, isn't that someone trying to get away through the alley? You're doggone right it is, and if I'm not mistaken, it's Ab Cleaver. Come on, Cherokee. I'm sure going to need your help. Cleaver, the farther you run now, the farther you're going to bounce later when I drag you back to town. Oh, so that's the way you want to play, huh? Ted, you're wearing your gun. What's the matter with you? Perforate that prodigious pole through. Nothing doing, Cherokee. I got plans for that buzzard. Jumped off his horse and ran behind that piece of down timber. Doggone it, this time we got him. Oh, boy. <laughs> down, Cherokee, flatten. Now, look, you old fake. This time I'm going to trust my life to you, and you doggone well better be careful with it. What do you mean? What are you going to do? While you stay behind this rock and cover me, I'm going to belly crawl across this clearing. Pull him out from behind that log and beat his brains out. If he has any. Chad, for goodness sake, be careful. 
I'll be cautious. You be careful. Careful where you shoot covering me. All right, now. Here goes. And that makes six. All right, Cleaver, your gun's empty, I reckon, and my fists are loaded. Now, come here. Are you, you loudmouth? Sneak it You out. won't be loudmouth. You're not going to even be able to talk. Don't, don't. All right, Cherokee. I bruised my knuckles on this polecat's chin. You grab him and sling him over your horse. They're going back to town loaded with skunk. Well, Miss Libby, after all that exertion, how about another piece of your lemon sponge pie? Why, certainly, Cherokee. More coffee? <laughs> I guess Cherokee will take a second cup of coffee if you, uh... Well, uh, if you give him something to, uh, put in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... I still have that wine in the cupboard. Hell no, Judge, I really... Oh, no, no, wait, wait just a minute. Uh, uh, what kind of wine is it, Judge? It's a very wonderful, rare old port. Uh, I rather think... Oh, no, Cherokee, Cherokee. Now, now, don't say you're going to turn down a, a libation. You, a little port wine? Indeed, sir, I am not. Because with a man of my character... It's any port in a storm. Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler as a Bruce Ells production. Story and supervision by Joel Murcott. Direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmar. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. And now this is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town!
Howdy. Would you like to spend a few minutes listening to a frontier town lawyer? Because that's what I am. And Chad Remington is who I am. Attorney and sort of all-around general troubleshooter for Dos Rios and our surrounding territory. <laughs> now, when I say troubleshooter, I, I guess I mean it in more ways than the term is generally used. Because down our way, and with the kind of people we have, the term troubleshooter gets the emphasis on both words. Yep, there's a heap of trouble out on the frontier and a lot of shooting, too. Now, let's take last winter, for example. It had been an especially severe winter, colder than usual, with almost constant snows. Snows so deep and heavy that even the winter range was useless. Cattle froze, starved, and died right and left. Well, it was late in February up in the little mountain town appropriately named Headstone. The principal business building in Headstone is a long, narrow room operated as a cafe or saloon and run by a strange, hard-faced woman called Bourbon Kate. Her real name, or the rest of it, I guess no one ever knew. Well, this particular night was a blustery one. Kate's saloon was empty for change, and Kate stood behind the bar cleaning up and polishing glasses. And suddenly the door opened and... Well, Sheriff, evening. Uh, evening, Kate, evening. <clears throat> Guess this is about the worst night of the whole winter. <clears throat> it will surprise me none if there won't be a head of cattle left up here after this storm is over. I get you something? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Uh, the usual. Uh, oh, and Kate. Uh, yeah, Sheriff? Uh, make it four fingers this time. You bet. Man needs something to keep his insides from freezing. Here. Ah, listen to that. Don't know what's going to come of the cattleman now. A blade of grass for feed is worth more than a porterhouse steak. Well, Kate, here's to you. Drink hearty, Sheriff. Ah. <clears throat> Worst part of it is, there ain't a man among a lot of them that's got money enough to buy even a hat full of feed. Another one, Sheriff? Yeah, thanks, Kate. Don't mind if I do. Yes, sir. Rate we're going up here, Headstone's like to become a ghost town now. With the bank shaky like it is, where can the ranchers get help? Wouldn't surprise me none if the bank closed its doors before the month's over. Sheriff, I tell you, well, we ought to... Uh, hey, looks like you got one customer, Kate. <sighs> hey, what a night. Yeah, snow's clear up the treetops some places. Yeah, bad one for sure. Yeah. Uh, Kate, if you don't mind, I'm going to sit down over there by the stove. Not at all. Make yourself to home. Now, mister, something I can do for you? Yeah. You're Bourbon Kate, ain't you? That's my name. I'm Ben Madigan. Got a quarter section up in the Rimrock country up high. This storm just about ruined me. Well, you ain't alone, Madigan, believe me. I did manage to round up some of the yearlings and herd them into the barn, but... Well, I ain't got no feed left. Not a stick of straw or a single green. Well, you can always buy a little feed. They tell me Josh Winterstore's got some left. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I went to the bank to borrow a few dollars, but that cheap old Jasper turned me down cold. Um, well... Yeah? Well, uh, that's why I come to you. To me? You mean you want to make a touch? Yeah, I sure do, and I'll pay it back, believe me. Uh, come summer, every last red cent. Well, I'm sorry, Madigan. I ain't in the lending business. Well, from all I've ever heard, you're loaded. Made it all right here, too, out of the folks around Headstone. Folks like me. No, sir, I got a rule about... Yeah. How much you need, Madigan? Oh, shucks. I guess I'd get by on a hundred. Yeah, a hundred would be fine. Well? You look honest. I am honest. Yeah. I said you did. Well, here. Here's five $20 gold pieces. Well, doggone. Well, I'll I... tell you what I'm going to do with you. Yeah? I'll cut your high card, double or nothing. High card? You mean if I lose, I'll owe you 200 If you win, you won't owe me a thing. Yeah, uh, you don't have to run a bank. Uh, 100% interest. You mean you won't cut high card? Oh, no. I'll cut. Okay. Well, here's the deck. You cut first. <laughs> well, what do you know? The Red Queen. Queen of Hearts. <laughs> well, let's see you beat that, Kate. Oh, you sure ain't making it easy on me. 
I might as well not cut and just give you the money. Oh, go on, go on, cut him. It was your idea. Okay, okay, if you say so. Well, I'll be jiggered. <laughs> An ace. The ace of clubs, Madigan. Yeah. Yeah, where'd you get it? Off the bottom of the deck? Madigan, I guess you don't need the money so bad after all, making a remark like that. I just think I'll put them gold pieces back. Oh, no, you don't. I always heard a man didn't stand a chance in a game with you, and now I know why. Madigan, keep your hands off that money. Yeah, well, I'm taking it, and you're not going to stop me. You understand? Why, you loco brain idiot? Put that gun away, or I'll... Kate, look out! <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Kate. I wouldn't have done that if he hadn't pulled his gun first. And... Kate, what's that red on your shirt waist? Uh, couldn't you see I was just trying to make him a present of that money? And... Why, that bomb and plugged you after all. Here, here, I'll... Uh, I'll... Sheriff, don't waste your time. You leave me here and go fetch the, the doctor. Ben Madigan was killed, all right. The sheriff's bullet hit its mark plumb center. But poor old Kate, she got a slug, too. Two days later, when the storm died down, I received a telegram from Kate asking me to come up to Headstone because she wanted some legal help. It turned out it was her will that was bothering her. We didn't know that till we got there. That is, by we, I mean my landlord and sidekick, Cherokee O'Bannon... The former medicine man who now runs a livery stable over which I have my shabby little legal offices. Well, we wasted no time going to Kate's and seeing her. She looked tired, awful tired, and mighty old as she lay there, her face gray as ashes against the clean white pillowcase. Fellas, it was mighty nice of you to come, particularly in this kind of weather. Ma'am, I'd like you to know that we have weather down in our part of the country, too. But for a woman whose name is Bourbon Kate, I'd walk halfway around the world and snow up to my eyebrows. <laughs> Cherokee sure talks a tough game of two-fisted drinking, doesn't he, Kate? Yeah. I've known the old fraud since he peddled his genuine Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil. And even when I was giving him drinks on the house, he'd never take more than one. Well, let's talk about you for a while, Kate. The doctor says you're going to be all right. Yeah, that's what the doctor says. He's a good man. Once saved me from nasty snake bite, without the use of the uh, usual remedy. Well, a doctor who can do that with you, Cherokee, must be a miracle man. Well, we'll see if the doctor's right this spring. If I'm still kicking around this spring. Oh, you'll be here longer than I will. Now, now, what's on your mind? <sighs> Chad, I ain't been no angel, you know. I danced in Rio and worked saloons in Sydney in the girly girly chorus and shows out of New York. Now that's nothing to be ashamed of, ma'am. Besides, you've accumulated a lot of the lovely green folding stuff. I've made money, and I've spent money. But my life ain't never amounted to very much. Never done anything folks call constructive. Hey, what are you talking about? It wasn't too long ago you practically nursed a whole Indian village through an epidemic of diphtheria single-handed. Oh, anybody had done that, Chad. It just happened that I was there at the time they'd come down sick, but... Well, like Cherokee says, I... I have got a little money tucked away, and... Well, I... I ain't got nobody to leave it to. Well, now, if you're looking for someone to leave it to... Uh, or... Kate, uh, don't I remember hearing my dad tell me that you used to be married? Sure, sure. And in 20 years, I... I ain't even had so much as a Christmas greeting from a kid. Married by this time, I reckon... His father was a no-good sort. Yeah. Well, about this money, Chad, when the storm was over, the ranchers are going to need money bad, and I kind of thought I might help them out a little. Well, that's a wonderful idea, Kate, but you don't need me for that. Yeah, I do, Chad. I, I want you to handle it. Most folks I've ever known don't like taking money from a woman, and... After that Ben Madigan being shot in my place the other night... Oh, for goodness sakes, Kate... It wasn't your fault. No, but try to convince folks. Oh, come on in. Who are you? My name's Madigan. Cleve Madigan. There's no call for coming into a woman's room with a chip on your shoulder. Yeah? 
My father was killed in her place the other night because she tried to fleece him out of some money. Oh, young fella, that remark calls for an apology. Don't, oh, Chad, let him be. Now, don't go try to help me, too. I'm fully able to take care of myself, even though my pa wasn't. Mister, you're either going to have to stop yelling around here or get out. And fast. I'll get out when I've had my say. And I'm telling you this, you old harridan. The folks around this part of the country are mighty sick of you and your kind. And if you know what's good for you, you'll move along. Get out. Doggone you, anyhow. Now I do want that apology, and this time I'm not going to wait for it. Let me along. Take your hands off me. Now, look, are you going to apologize to Kate? You're darn tootin' right I'm not. You're not getting no apology out of me, but you are getting this. You lame brain, young idiot. Chad, you put that young pup to sleep for the rest of the winter. Chad. Chad, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. After the way he talked to you and about you? The boy was upset. He's upset right now after what Chad just did to him. Chad. Chad, that money I was talking about. Yeah? Because that Madigan boy's father was killed in my place. I want to see that the Madigan family gets help. Every bit of help. And with every last penny I got. Oh, but Kate, don't you're you... my lawyer, Chad, and as my lawyer, I'm giving you my orders. That Madigan family is going to get all the help money can buy. We'll return to the exciting second act of our Frontier Town adventure in just about one minute. And now, Frontier Town. Well, her name might have been Bourbon Kate, but in my reckoning, she wasn't just a hundred proof. She was 100% guilt-edged woman. With a heart truly as big as a proverbial hole outdoors. Well, being the kind of woman she is, one you don't talk back to for long, Cherokee and I started to see what we could do with her money to help the ranchers. We talked it over with the sheriff and decided to order several carloads of feed shipped off to Headstone. And it was while the three of us were talking it over that we got our first bad news. The barber ran into the sheriff's office to tell us that a mob had descended on Kate's saloon and was busting the place to pieces. Well, leaving the sheriff to round up some deputies, Cherokee and I raced down the street to the scene of the battle. Come on, men! Smash this place into kindling! You local coyote! Now that's Bourbon Kate's bodyguard. Don't listen to him. Go on, let's finish the job. Madigan, unless you want to go to jail, you'll stop inciting these men to riot. Now look who's talking. Come on, let's throw him out. Okay, anybody who thinks he can, step right up. Uh, I'm stepping up, mister. Oh, good. And you're stepping right in. Right into this. <laughs> Time, Chad. Here comes the sheriff and his deputy. Oh, That's right. yeah. Sheriff, yeah. Every yeah. Oh, darn one of you. You're under arrest. Uh-huh. If you know what's good for you, you'll come along peaceable. My men have got orders to shoot, to kill. Yeah. The sheriff didn't hold anybody very long, but his prompt appearance did break up the riot. The next day, Cherokee and I rode out to the Madigan place to pay a call on young Cleve Madigan. 
Whoa there, boy. Well, I hope the young man's at home. But last night's little experience has calmed him down. Of course, I don't blame him for not... And what do you want? Cleve, we rode all the way out here to talk to you. Yeah, I'll bet. I really want to find out how I enjoyed being locked up. If Kate wasn't the kind of woman she is, you'd still be locked up. You come out here to talk to me about that old witch, you're sure wasting your time. What? Well, nice plight, young fella, isn't he? But I certainly don't like him calling Kate an old witch. Yeah, Cherokee, the sad part of it is that someday, pretty soon, he's going to swallow those words. I just hope he doesn't choke on them. Come on, best place for us is back at the sheriff's office. <laughs> Well, I guess you'll be pleased to know that the freight cars got through with the feed. Pulled in while you were gone this afternoon. They're down to the siding. Well, that's certainly a relief. Oh, by the way, how's Kate? Have you heard, Sheriff? Well, I talked with the old Sawbones a while back. Uh -huh. He says the wound don't amount to nothing no more, but uh, she ain't getting no better. Says he just can't understand it. Hmm. You ask me, and you may if you wish, I think Kate's lost her spirit. Her fighting spirit. Well, no wonder. From all she's been through, and that... Say, I almost forgot. No? Yeah. The ranchers called a meeting this afternoon to try to get some help from the state. Oh, that's great. By the time the state could vote on it and send the ranchers some help, the snow would be flying again next winter. Well, all you've got to do is go to the meeting and tell them about the feet the Kate's bought for them. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's the thing to do. With all the ranchers together, I'll just go to that meeting and tell them the good news. Folks, quiet down now. Uh, neighbors, neighbors, I telegraphed a fellow I know in the state senate. He says the state will be glad to help, but they can't appropriate no money until the next regular session. Excuse me, but uh, may I say a word? Why, sure you. Say, you got a nerve coming to our meeting after what you pulled the other night. Now, look, you're, you're in trouble, all of you. I think a mighty good slogan for this meeting might be, let bygones be bygones. Let him talk, Rod. He's so full of hot air, if he talks long enough, he may melt off all the snow and we'll get some grass around here again. <laughs> Cleve, that isn't a bad joke. I'm going to accept it as a joke. But I came to this meeting to tell you that at the junction siding, outside of town, there are five cars of feed. Oh, sure, there are five cars of feed. And from what I hear, the feed was bought by Bourbon Kate and brought up here. And she's going to try to charge you $70 a ton. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Cleve. Or you're talking like a wild man. Are you trying to tell me that Bourbon Kate doesn't own that feed? Well, no, I'm not, but you... If she thinks she's going to squeeze blood money out of us, she's better off dead. And for one, I'm in favor of going down to the siding and putting a torch to those cars just to show her what we think of. Great day in the morning. What's got through you, men? Haven't you got any of Come on, men. At least we'll be warm around here for a while. Get some pitch torches and let's be getting down to the railroad track. <laughs> Ever try to reason with a mob? I'm here to tell you it just can't be done. Neither the sheriff nor Cherokee nor I had any influence with them. Nor would even one of them stay to hear the truth about those cars of feed. Well, as soon as the hall had cleared, the three of us decided to go down to the siding and not wanting any bloodshed to see what we could do about straightening them out. The wind had started again. Going was tougher than ever. <sighs> Doggone it, Chad. This wind's just going to make it worse. Uh, at the rate you're running, I could use a little wind myself. <sighs> if we can uncouple just two of the cars and save them, we'll have done some good. Hey, hey look. Look, they've done it. Huh? The fire's already starting. Uh, oh, what fools these mortals be. They're sloping to the south. If we can just unhook two cars, they'll roll down that ravine and be safe. Chad, huh? I don't think we're going to get there in time. If we do, it'll be because someone has carried me. 
Great jumping Jupiter, Chad. Hey, ain't that somebody climbing on the ladder in the side of that burning car? Sure is, Sheriff. He's climbing up there to release the brake. Release the brake? Then once that car starts rolling, he won't be able to get down without jumping. Hey, hold it, hold it. Uh, no use running now. It's too late. seeing things, or did you see what I saw? No, Cherokee. We saw it, all right. Uh, That sure was a close one. You boys cut that car loose just in time. We didn't cut it loose. We didn't get here in time. Well, well, then who was it? That was Bourbon Kate who done it, Broderick. Yeah. There she goes, riding that boxcar, probably to her death. Look at her roll. Not a good looking at that car does, because it ain't never going to make that curve. Mercy for Providence. The car's tipping. It's going over now. That's... That's the end of her. Yeah. What an awful way to end. Smashed up in the wreck of a flaming freight car. Son... Come on back to town with me. You and I have a bit of talking to do. All the fight was gone out of Cleve Madigan. So he came along quietly and chased him. I thought the best place to talk to him would be in the room where Bourbon Kate had lived. So the four of us headed for there. I don't mind going with you, but... What's the idea of taking me up up to her place? Cleve, there's a letter here that I want to turn over to you. Wait. I'll open the door. Yeah. See, as sick as she was, I'll, I'll never know how she managed to get out of the bed and down to... Chad! It just can't be. Am I crazy or something? I know I saw her riding on top of that freight car. We, we all saw her, Cleve, but still there she is. Right in her bed. Is she... Is she... Well, you know, is she... Yeah. Reckon she's been dead more than two hours. But... but that... I don't understand it. Well, there are a lot of things in this life we live that none of us understand, Cleve. A good deal of it has to do with the spirit inside of us. I'll say amen to that. You mean you think this was a, a miracle? I'd be a pretty poor mortal to judge miracles, Cleve. Maybe after you read this letter... You... Letter? A letter from who? It's a letter f- for you. It was written by you. It was written by the woman we knew as Bourbon Kate. Uh... Cherokee, I think you and the sheriff and I had better be on our way. Goodness knows we don't want to be around if there's another miracle performed tonight. For the life of me, Chad, I still can't understand it. Shouldn't even try to, Cherokee. The important thing is that we were there to see that Kate's desires... And her will were carried out. Plenty of feed for everybody now. And I imagine Cleve Madigan won't judge folks quite so harshly again. Every time I think of her, I get a lump in my throat. <laughs> that might be a good thing for you, Cherokee. It may stop you from pouring things down your throat that you'd be better off not having. And look, uh, if you don't mind now, I don't feel much like talking. Let's just rattle up these ponies and get on home. Come on. Come on there, you. Start moving.
Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler as a Bruce Ells production. Supervision by Joel Murcutt. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. And now this is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat. These are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! I imagine everyone's heard of the Texas Rangers, but I wonder how many of you folks ever heard the story of the Jailbird Rangers, the very start of what became the Rangers in my state. I come from Dos Rios, just north and west of Texas, and I'm the town's only lawyer. My handle? Chad Remington. And if you want to know why I feel qualified to tell you about the Jailbird Rangers... Well, I guess it's because on two occasions they almost cost me my life. You see, not too long ago, our entire state suddenly burst wide open with every kind of thievery and knavery in the book. Rustling, bank robberies, coach holdups, and just plain and simple murder. First, the big bank in Alamo City was raided. <laughs> Then, only two days later, way up in the Rockies, a Wells Fargo wagon was stopped and robbed. Not eight hours after that, down in the Rimrock country in the south part of the state, a trail herd of almost 2,000 head of fine cattle was raided and successfully rustled. So it went for the next five, six weeks. A crime in one county, and then as the sheriff and his deputies went into action, the gang struck again, maybe 400 miles and five counties away. Well, mighty discouraging business. And in our own county, almost every able-bodied man was deputized for the search, even me, our local judge and the owner of the livery stable, Cherokee O'Bannon. Well, after a particularly hot and dusty wild goose chase, we returned to town with our tail feathers dragging, and the judge, Cherokee, and I went back to my office. You asked me, and I know nobody did. I think the young man's got bats in his belfry, don't you, Judge? Never mind what you think, Cherokee. Right now, I'm only interested in finding out if the judge thinks enough of my suggestion to go up to the state capitol with us and... Introduce me to the governor. Well, I'd be glad to introduce you to the governor, Chad, but I don't think it's going to do you any good. Well, I'm willing to take that chance. 
With every sheriff's authority ending at the borders of his own county, we've got to have state rangers if we hope to break up this crime wave. Chad, my boy, I wish you wouldn't refer to them as rangers. Very name is abhorrent to me. Chase me clean across the state and out of Texas just because my Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil failed to grow luxuriant tresses and a bald-headed sergeant. Well, as long as you just drink your rattlesnake oil and don't try to peddle it, you haven't got any worries. Now, how about it, Judge? Stagecoach for the state capitol leaves in less than an hour. It's a futile cause, Chad, but I'll do whatever I can. I'll go with you. If Cherokee and I had gone alone, we never would have gotten in to see the governor. The judge being along made the difference, and the governor received us just about as he was to leave for dinner. In fact, the young lady he was escorting, a willowy and lovely brunette by the name of Dolores Donovan, was there with him. I uh, watched the governor while I pleaded my case and realized the judge was right. It was a hopeless cause. Mr. Remington, this is a total and absolute waste of my time. With the state treasury on the verge of bankruptcy, you come here asking me to authorize further expenses? But we need a state police force, Your Excellency. If you'll pardon me putting in my two cents worth, with elections just two months away, the governor needs votes. Thank you, my dear. <clears throat> Gentlemen, and you particularly, Judge, do you realize how many votes I'd lose if I did authorize additional expenditures at a crucial time like this? Of course, by election, we may have nothing of value left in the entire state, let alone the treasury. Do you realize that more than a million dollars has been pilfered or sacked already, and each day that goes by Governor, just... Governor, we were expected at dinner ten minutes ago, and it's still a 30-minute drive before we get there. Sorry, Miss Donovan. I had no idea I was delaying you. That's quite all right, Mr. Remington. Delighted to have met you. I do hope we meet again sometime, under less hurried circumstances. <laughs> Pushed out verbally, that's what we were. Pushed right out. Oh, forget it, Cherokee. We tried. I had no idea Miss Donovan had such an influence with the governor. Uh, she seems to have. Uh, no need to apologize, Judge. You see, his wife died three, four years ago. And as I get the story, Miss Donovan, who was quite wealthy in her own right, moved up here from Texas. And they met. But I didn't think for a minute that, uh, well, that... Uh, Did you see that carriage he drove her off in? The state is paying for that. No wonder the Treasury's almost bankrupt. Judge, you've done all you could so far, but would you go even further? Well, I, I don't know, Chad. What do you mean? I mean help me to organize my own state rangers at no expense to the state. Your own? Where could you get the men and the authority? And the authority? Well, I'll assume that. Huh? The men, the men I want, you'd have to help me get. What men, Chad? Convicts. Men who are now in the state penitentiary. Convicts? Oh, now, now, look. Don't jump down my throat till I'm through. Remember first who most of the law officers suspect of, of heading up this gang of criminals we're after. You mean Bix Freibeck? I sure do mean Bix Freibeck. Because I think we inherited him from Texas, where the rangers down there ran him and his gang out a short while ago. But what in the name of Tom Katz has Frybeck got to do with these convicts you're talking about, Chad? Well, three or four of them came from Texas. Undoubtedly no Frybeck, or at worst, are uh, known to him. Yes? Now, most men serving time in prison would give anything to get out. And if you could get a hand-picked few paroled to me, I think they could lead us to Frybeck in short order. And since they say it takes a crook to catch a crook, everyone would profit. You realize, of course, what would happen if the governor learned of it. He'd throw you into jail along with him. If he finds out before we catch Fryback. After? Well, I think you'll be taking bows all over the place for cleaning up the state. Chad, my friend, all this is just dreaming. How can you get a dozen men out of prison? It's not a dozen. At most, I'll need six. And uh, since the warden happens to be the judge's former law partner... Chad, I... Oh, what's the use of arguing with you? You'll just keep on until I do it anyway. Give me the names of the men you want. If Warden Stripling is the same man I started with in law school, I think you'll have your jailbird rangers before long. Jail 
real bird rangers is what the judge called them, and the name stuck. The rest of what the judge said stuck, too. For hardly 48 hours later, I had the toughest and orneriest bunch of cutthroats a state had ever seen seated around a campfire and learning what I had in mind. And there was John O. Johnson, Waco Bank Bandit, Black Mike Curtis, West Texas Cattle Thief, and Red Dooley, who shot up the panhandle much to his profit. You gentlemen would close your oral orifices and let Remington finish. Maybe we could get some sleep tonight. Boys, boys, I could talk from now till sunup trying to explain every little detail of this to you, but the important thing is to get action. Since three of you, John O., Mike, and Red, all know Frybeck and can probably get in to see him without having daylight let through you... What I want to do now is have the three of you draw straws to see who goes up there. All right, now look. Look, you knew what this job was before the warden let you out of prison. Anybody who doesn't like it isn't too late to have you sent back now. I think it'd take more than you to send any of us back. Yeah? Get a pinch of Maybe you're not used to being talked to. Maybe you're used to something more like this. <laughs> Who do you think you're slapping? John O. Johnson, the Waco bank bandit. Now get this through your head. Next time I won't just slap you. I'll knock your teeth back down your throat. I got three straws here in my hand. The man who pulls a short one leaves here and walks up that road toward the place you tell me Frybeck's probably using as a hideout. Here, Cherokee. You pass the straws around. Fighters all mine, all mine. All right, who got the short one? Well, come on, hold him up. Johnson, did you hear what I said? Look, if I go up there, Frybeck will probably kill me. You're going up there. Up in the pen, you always talk mighty tough, Jano. What's wrong, gun yeller? Yeah, sure, sure. You two don't have to go. Well, I'm not going either. Oh, yes, you are. Uh, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> You lily limit cold jack. He's down like a steer to rodeo. I never mind the cheering section, Cherokee. Hit Johnson to his feet and started up toward Frybeck. Remington, Remington, I, I know Frybeck. If he finds out what you're up to, he'll he'll cut my tongue out. Just stay here and I'll knock it out. Now get going. Get going. Johnson disappeared into the shadows. Just as the night swallowed him up, I saw him stop and look back, hoping no one was watching, hoping he could get away. I reached for my rifle and raised it to my shoulder. Johnson turned and shuffled ahead. Then the waiting started. There wasn't a sound, a human sound. Even Cherokee couldn't bring himself to talk. The minutes ticked off, and then the hours started to vanish into the place where time and good intentions go. Mike Curtis and Dooley, as hardened and as black-hearted as they were, sat almost motionless, their backs to two trees. I still don't know how much time it dragged by, but sooner or later we heard the unmistakable sounds of a horse approaching I motioned to Cherokee and the two others. They got up and crowded around me. The only thought that made any sense was that it was John O. Johnson on his way back with a horse he'd either borrowed or stolen from Dick's Frybeck. There's no question that it was just one horse, nothing to be afraid of. We just stood there, almost motionless, as the horse and rider came closer. And suddenly the horse was almost on top of us, and as the rider could make us out in the dark, he swerved and before raking his horse again, dropped something large and heavy at our feet. Billy Blue Blazers, Chad, what is that? That's what I'd like to know. That is John O. Johnson. Or what's left of him after Freibeck got through riddling him with bullets. We'll 
return to the second act of Jailbird Rangers, our exciting frontier town adventure, in just a few moments. <laughs> And now, Frontier Town. It wasn't too hard to figure out what had happened. Johnson had taken slugs from every gun in Freibeck's gang. But why it had happened and how it had happened, how Freibeck had even found out that we were there and where we were seemed to have no answer. And I even hate to think of it now, now that it's all over. I'd never been in a spot like that before, and believe me, I never will again. There was nothing left for me to do except to face it out with the two men left to me, Dooley and Curtis. I knew this idea was loco all the time, Remington. And I'm telling you right now, I'm getting out of here while I still can. Yes, you are getting out, Mike, but do you know where you're going? Huh? What do you mean? Johnson's body's got to be taken back to the warden. And so do you two. Wait a minute. You think you're taking me back to that jail? You got another thing coming. Don't be idiotic. Chad's right. Besides, it's for your own protection. I got all the protection I want. I'm out and I'm free. Well, you won't be out long if Freibeck finds you. Oh, Mike, don't you see? With Johnson dead, everybody and his brother will soon find out you and Dooley are out of the pen, and then... Chad, well... he's grabbing for your rifle. What? Yeah. You hog-brained him. So let him go with that Cherokee, the other one. Don't let him get away. Ruby, shut away. Ever get away. Found you, you unintelligent rowdy. Do I have to just bust you into pieces? Well, for a moment there, O'Bannon, I thought our numbers had come up. Hey, you did a nice job on Dooley. You know something, Chad? Now I really need a... Uh, well, a, a drink, to be frank about it. Yeah, but right now you're not getting one. Because we've got to tie up these two and start hauling them back to jail before we're caught with two escaped convicts. Take a little advice from a Cowtown lawyer. Never get mixed up like I did. Oh, not that the idea wasn't essentially a good one, but when you're dealing with convicts, you've paroled yourself against the strict orders of the chief executive of the state. Well... A Cherokee and I bundled up Curtis and Dooley and started back for the penitentiary as fast as his four horses had carried us. All the while, I thought of nothing except how I could explain John O'Johnson's death outside the prison walls. The four of us were not over a half day's ride from the penitentiary, and except for the problem still having no answer, everything seemed to be going smoothly. Chad, after this day is over, if you don't give me two bits to spend over the gleaming mahogany of the nearest tavern, I'm going to drink a pint of that snake oil myself. The very thought of it makes me shudder. <laughs> it's too bad you've got a remedy for snake poisoning instead of lead poisoning. Because before this day is over, we may be ne- Uh-oh. And what's this coming? Seems to be a party of horse. About ten of them. Yeah, it sure does. One of them seems to... It, Cherokee duck. <laughs> Hey, what's the idea? Who do you think you're shooting at? You make one move and you'll never know. Slow down, boys. Yeah, that's them all right. Tom, go get their guns. Just a minute. There must be some mistake. Who do you think we are? Well, I'm not too sure about you two, but the two with you, with their hands tied up, are known as numbers 23476 and 35108, formerly Mike Curtis and Red Dooley. And I've got an idea that starting today, all four of you are going to be wearing numbers. Come on. How anybody knew that Dooley and Curtis were out, except the judge and the warden, I couldn't understand at the moment. But I was to find out, all right. Find out the hard way. Well, with... 
Ten guns pointed at our backs. They had no trouble herding Cherokee and me into those little waiting rooms they call cells. I hate to be derogatory, my boy, but it seems to me that your idea kind of backfired. Backfired right through John O. Johnson to start with. Now we're in it up to our necks. Please! When you're a resident of a calaboose, as we are, it's the height of impropriety to speak about necks. What are we going to do, Chad? I've sent for the judge. You don't think he's going to be able to get us out of this one? Might help. After all, he is the political leader for Dos Rios County, and he does possess a certain amount of influence with the governor. Well, now, if you'd have sent for Dolores Donovan, you'd have picked someone who really has influence with the governor. <laughs> Miss Donovan made quite an impression on you, didn't she, Cherokee? Yeah, indeed she did. Too bad it uh, couldn't have been vice versa. Yeah, she made an impression on me, too, and with the judge... Well, well, looks like the judge's coming now. Chad Remington, have you any idea of the trouble you're in? You certainly don't have to remind us, Judge. When you're outside those bars, we're behind them. <laughs> now, isn't that the kind of answer you'd expect from Cherokee, Judge? He can always manage to drag bars into the conversation. Chad, how in the name of Toffet can you act so lighthearted about a thing like this? Because I think that now I've figured out a way to catch the Freiburg gang. Uh -huh. And all you have to do to help, Judge, is to get the governor's ear privately and arrange another audience for us with him. The governor? Chad, you know it's impossible under the, uh, well, the existing conditions. Well, as Miss Donovan pointed out, the governor is interested in votes, votes to re-elect him. And if you'll point out to him that landing the Freiburg gang in jail will get him more votes than all his election promises put together, well, I, uh, I don't think he'll refuse to at least listen to us. Well, maybe so, Chad. Good. Uh, get your ear over here where I can stop yelling. I'll tell you exactly what the governor will <laughs> Mr. Remington, so far you haven't told the governor anything at all to make him believe you know how to or where to round up the Freiburg gang. You're perfectly right, my dear. And in your present position, Mr. Remington, your promises don't mean a thing. Oh, governor, I can't blame you at all for your attitude, but if I might have a moment with you alone, I'll be only too happy to tell you what I have in mind. My dear Miss Donovan, why not step outside the ante room with me while the governor... Just is... a minute, Dolores. Anything Remington has to say to me, he can certainly say in front of you. If he has anything to say... I should certainly think so. Very well. And I'm forced to admit that I have no actual plan. However, I happen to know that there's a shipment of $70,000 in gold coming into the Dos Rio State Bank tonight by train. And I'm most anxious to be on hand to make sure it gets there. Remington, the only place you're going is back to jail. Hmm. You got more nerve than anyone I've ever encountered. Don't you think so, Dolores? Really, I don't think I should interfere in your business. And as a matter of fact, if you'll pardon me, I believe I'll go back to my hotel. But Dolores... I'll really... talk to you in the morning. Good night, gentlemen. Well, what do you know? You were right, Chad. She actually took the bait. Now do you believe me, Governor? She can't wait to get to Freiburg and tell him about that <laughs> $70,000 gold ship. So that's why she played up to me, just to find out what was... Remington, if you're going to follow her, you'd better get going. Apparently, Freiburg is hiding not too far away from here, and we must take no chance on losing her now. Bix, I know what I heard. Seventy thousand. This will be a real cleanup. <laughs> Biggest we've pulled yet, if it works. Oh, of course it'll work. With that much in our hands, we can be on our way. Just the two of us. Well, I don't have to listen to that stuffed shirt of a governor again. Look, I'll have to get the boys together. You duck out of here. Go back to your room. Pack up. And once you hear we got the goal, check out and meet me at the cabin. Bix, now, be careful. Don't take any chances, honey. <laughs> With you waiting for me at the other end. Come here. Oh, Bix. Bix, darling... All right, baby. On your way now. Papa's got work to do that just ain't going to wait. With all that money in our jeans, you and me are going to do the world of brown. <laughs> see you. Huh? You sure will see her, Freiburg, in jail. Cherokee, come on. Remington of all the low, slimy snakes I've ever... Oh, oh no, you don't. <laughs> Cherokee, keep the girl covered. I'm going to blow you up. <laughs> <laughs> 
still there, you little vixen? You, you. Try back, your number is up right now. You, you filthy sidewinder. You hurt him. You broke his jaw. Sure hope he did, but I'm afraid Mr. Fryerbeck is just out listening to the birdies. <sighs> Dolores, old girl, I, I'm sorry we spoiled you. Well, to be polite, let's call it your elopement. But you may get out about ten years before Frybeck does. If you love him so much, you can just wait for him. You chump. Of course, I'll be glad to call on visiting days and bring you posies, Dolores, my darling. Good idea, Cherokee. Since they missed that bank shipment, maybe you can send her bunches of goldenrod. And from you and me, personally, I think some forget-me-nots. All right, come on, Dolores. Let's be heading for jail. Chad? I think you were very wise in seeing that Miss Donovan's story didn't get to the papers. Well, I, I didn't see where it would serve any public purpose now that the governor's had his eyes open. The warden said that in another few days she'd be shipped back to Texas on extradition papers. Uh, won't someone have to be sent back with Miss Donovan? You know, sort of guard her? Well, yes, of course. Well, and Judge, I'd like to volunteer for the job. I feel it's my duty as a public-spirited citizen. Well, that's a job you'd uh, certainly love, hey, Cherokee? You're walking right into the arms of the sergeant of the Texas Rangers who's been looking for you the last five years? I certainly, as a public-spirited Texas Ranger. time I open my mouth, I put my foot in it. <laughs> Which, I might point out, is a lot healthier for you in the long run than what you generally put in your mouth. The way you talk, the judge might likely imagine I'm... Addicted to liquor. Oh, far from it. Uh, the only time I've known you to take a drink is uh, when you were suffering. See there? <laughs> and uh, what do I suffer from, Chad? Uh, the only thing you've ever suffered from, Cherokee. Thirst. <laughs> <laughs> Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler and featuring Wade Crosby, is a Bruce Ells production. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. And now this is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town!
I've just been wondering, wondering how many people realize the power of the printed word. Of course, maybe you're wondering too. Maybe you're wondering how come a frontier town lawyer like me, Chad Remington, should feel he's entitled to get up on a soapbox about the printed word, uh, newspapers, and the power of public opinion. Well, <laughs> like all lawyers, perhaps I'd better present my brief and see if I can't convince you just how important newspapers can be to a raw, tough territory like the frontier. Not too long ago, I received one of those infrequent telegrams signed by an old friend of my father's, Ike McAuliffe, who prints and publishes the greatest little newspaper in our part of the country, The Independent. Ike told me he was in trouble, intimating bad trouble, trouble that might need the advice of a lawyer, and I gathered a good deal more. So, mustering out that ex-medicine man, Cherokee O'Bannon, who runs the livery stable over which I have my tiny office, we started out for the toughest, most rowdy, and largest town any place west of Abilene, Dobie City, on two of the least spavined horses from Cherokee Stable. Chad, my bat brain barrister, would you be so kind as to answer a question for me? Now, look here, O'Bannon. If it's anything to do with stopping at a barrel house before we get to Dobie City, the answer is a definite no. And you may be an attorney, my boy, but you're certainly not a mind reader. First off, should I choose to titillate my tonsils, I have a small flask of my genuine Cherokee and then rattlesnake oil with me. And second, that was not the question I was about to... Whoa, whoa, rain up, Cherokee. What compounded corruption was that? Well, it wasn't a bee or a blue-tailed fly. And I think if you'll look to your left and see the gentleman who's approaching us with a Winchester in his hands, you'll have your answer. To my... Billy Blue Blazers, Chad. That is what is known in circles I no longer frequent as one tough-looking barman. If you're just out for some target practice, mister, you got two more shots coming. There's three for a nickel. I haven't had to practice with this rifle for 25 years. I can hit any target I aim at any time. Well, then I take it your shot wasn't meant to hit either one of us, but was just a friendly little greeting, huh? Yeah, uh, you might say it was friendly, because I'm here to give you some very friendly advice. Turn them cayuses around and head back where you come from. Have you the audacity to stand there and think that you own this country? Partner, I don't have to think. I know what I'm talking about, and I'm telling you to slope. Well, I... I've found you can argue with a judge and argue with a jury, but you never get very far arguing with a Winchester that's aimed right at you. Dad, you mean to say that you're going to let this barrel-chested behemoth dictate to us? No, Cherokee, I, I mean I'm going to see that that rifle barrel gets pointed some other... Sam, that was his story. You pulled off him like a yearling calf. Friends, you better let go of that rifle before something snaps. Blast it! Don't do now, get up on your feet. Remington, now you are in trouble. Remington? Did you hear that, Cherokee? This wasn't an accident. He was waiting for us. You try going to Dobie City, and you'll find other people waiting for you. The doctor and the undertaker. I'm afraid we won't need either one of them. I carry our embalming fluid right along with me. Who sent you out here? Who put you up to this? Well? Let me sound as dumb as he looks. I'm waiting for an answer. And you got an awful long wait coming. Because I ain't... Chad, look out! You. Hey, excellent, Chad. Just proves the validity of the old saying. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Cherokee, I think we'd all be better off if you lend me a hand and help tie this critter up. I'd like a few hours in Dobie City before he gets back and reports to whoever it is that doesn't want us there. <laughs> It didn't take us long to get to Dobie City after that and to find Ike McAuliffe in the office of the Independent. Ike's story was a strange one. Strange and mostly baffling. Chad, I know it doesn't make any sense, but that's the way it is. This other newspaper, this uh, new one, isn't too far from putting me completely out of business. Call if I can't understand how this other paper... What's his name again? The Dobie Democrat. I can't understand how the owner not only can get these news items that you say are yours exclusively, but after getting them, how he gets them printed and his paper published before you do. If Ike knew the answer to that, Cherokee, I'm sure he wouldn't have telegraphed to me. Now, take the cattle prices that I supply every week. 
I started that several years ago, and it's a costly proposition. However, in cattle country like this, it's a real service to my readers to know what the prices are in Omaha, Kansas City, and the other big markets. Oh, it certainly is. It tells the ranchers where they can drive or ship to get the most money for their stock. How do you get these prices, Mr. McCauley? Well, I have six men, one in each of the six large stockyard centers. And each Thursday night, they telegraph me the prevailing prices at the close of business for the week. And your competitor, this other paper, gets the same information at no expense at all? And gets it published and on the street from six to twelve hours before I do. Chad, I'm telling you, the way my circulation is falling off, I, I can't stay in business another two months. Hmm. Uh, who owns or runs the other paper, I? A fellow by the name of Jason, who moved in here only recently. And at the rate he's going... We'll end up controlling practically everything around here by the simple device of influencing public opinion any way he wants it to go. Well, obviously, he tried to influence us not to come into Dobie City. And it wasn't very public. That was quite personal. <laughs> yeah, there's something very personal about a Winchester that's pointed right at you. Ike, the obvious answer seems to be that this Jason, whoever he is, is either paying for or stealing the information for someone who works for you. And I, I sure doubt that. You do? Why? Well, first, I have only two people working for me, and I trust them implicitly. And second, how could Jason get the information out of my composing room and still get his paper out half a day before mine? Yeah, that does seem to be a stumbling block. Uh, but let's get back to the people who work for you first. Who are they? Well, my printer, Foley, he's been with me almost since I started publishing. And the only other help I have is my brother's daughter, Nellie, my niece. Oh, a niece, uh, young and attractive, no doubt. Yes, Nellie's only 23, and she's real pretty. I brought her in here when my brother died. All he left her was debts. Well, how did that happen, Ike? I mean, you've always been reasonably well-to-do. Matter of fact, don't I remember your brother having been a partner of yours? He was, until he started drinking and gambling. I warned him about it for years. Then, finally, I had to let him go. Bought him out. But when Jim died, I felt the thing to do was to take care of Nellie. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to try a little experiment, Ike? This being Thursday, it's the day you get your telegrams from your stockyard correspondence, isn't it? Yes, the wire should be coming in any time now. Well, then, what I'd like to do after the telegrams get in is to change the prices before you turn them over to Nellie or Foley, or whoever it is that takes charge of them. Change the prices? That's right. And if there is a leak here, Jason will get the wrong information and print it in his paper, which won't do him any good, and will prove to us that the leak is here somewhere in this building. Well, I, I didn't telegraph you not to take your advice, Chad. So if that's what you want to do, I'll string along with you. About an hour later, having hidden the telegrams with the real prices safely, we went back into the composing room and met Foley and Nellie. Now, let's see if we can't get this set up and on the street this time before the Democrat comes out. Uncle Ike... I know you think that Mr. Jason is stealing this cattle price information from you somehow, but I don't think he's the kind of man who'd do it. Oh, really, Nellie? You, uh, you know Mr. Jason? Well, I've met him. He seems nice, real nice. And anyhow, why shouldn't he have his own men send him the prices just the way you're doing it, Uncle Ike? For the pure and simple reason that, well, he wouldn't spend a plug nickel if he could get it for nothing. Hey, that's the way I feel about him. Well, then you know Jason, too, eh, Foley? Well, I, I don't actually know him. I, I mean, I've seen him like everybody else in Dobie City has. <laughs> you can't miss him. Big ten-gallon white hat, checkered vest, boots embroidered with gold threads, smoking big cigars. <laughs> no, sir, any money that one spends, he spends on show. From your description, Foley, Mr. Jason sounds like he'd make a very successful medicine man. Uh, well, if we stand here flapping our jaws, the Independent never will get printed. So what do you say we go about our business and leave the newspaper to those who know about it? As soon as a reasonable time had elapsed, I left Cherokee at the hotel and walked down to the office of the Doby City Democrat. I wanted to get my hands on a copy of their paper. I walked in and up to the counter. There was a man seated at the desk with his back toward me, engrossed in what he was writing. From the loud plaid shirt, I gathered it was Jason himself. There was a small stack of newly printed papers on the counter, and 
Long as the man in the office hadn't noticed me, I picked one up. There were the out-of-town cattle market prices in a box on the front page. But not the false prices we'd turned over to Nellie and Foley. The actual prices that had been telegraphed in. This was quite a shock. Only the first shock I got in that few moments. Because just then, the man turned around, got up, and walked over to the counter. Yes, sir. Is there something... Well, Chad. Chad Remington. Chip, what are you doing here? Where would you expect the owner of the paper to be if not in his office? What? You're Jason, the owner of the Democrat? Mm-hmm, one and the same. And if the new name of Jason bothers you, <laughs> a numerologist told me to change it. Said that's why I never made a successful lawyer like you. You never even finished studying law. Yeah, I know, but my clients didn't. Well, what brings you in here, Chad? I came in to have a little talk with the owner of the paper. Now that I know it's you, I realize talking isn't going to do much good. Because as in the old days, Chip, we we're again on the opposite sides of the fence. I got a feeling that before I'm through in Dobie City, I'm going to bust down that fence and wrap the rails right around your stubborn head. Oh, is that so? Oh, well, Chad, if you think you can do it, go right ahead and try. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just try and see where it gets you. <laughs> because I think it'll only get you stretched out right up in Boot Hill. <laughs> We'll return to the second act of Five Gun Final, our exciting frontier town adventure in just a few moments. And now, Frontier Town. I found it pretty difficult to explain the genuine feeling of shock I suffered in finding Chip, the owner of the opposition paper. Not only did it make the job a little distasteful, but, well, knowing Chip, I knew he was slick and smooth and capable. Of course, that was only part of my frustration. The other part was finding the little scheme I'd devised of changing the prices. It meant nothing. And that Chip Jason's paper had the true and accurate cattle prices neatly boxed on page one. My first impulse was to walk out of the office with the half-meant warning I'd given Chip and let it go at that. But I couldn't quite bring myself to it. I hadn't seen him in about ten years. Not only was there a lot I wanted to say to him, but a lot I wanted him to remember. <laughs> You ought to sell your Blackstone and law library and go into the publishing business too, Chad. You can have the men who make the laws. When you're a newspaper publisher, you're the man who makes the men who make the laws. You haven't changed a bit, have you? No, phrases be. That is, I've gotten a little smarter, I think. My philosophy of life is actually just what it was when we were studying law together. Yeah, I remember. That's how you got your nickname, too. Chipper. Nothing ever bothered you, not even your conscience. How could my conscience bother me? I never had one. No, I guess not, or else you couldn't do things like this. Publish these stockyard quotations. Why, those quotations are the backbone of my success. A real public service to my readership. I wouldn't care if you bought the news. Oh, but I do. I pay a good price to get that cattle information. Don't lie to me, Chip. I'm not lying. I don't like to be called a liar. No real man does. You keep that up and you'll find out how real a man I am. You're the last man in the world I'd want to look at over the barrel of this. But if it comes to a showdown, well... You'd be making a mistake, Chad. I'm a pretty influential gent in this community. Too influential to trifle with. But not quite influential enough to make me quit this case. That's up to you. Entirely. Especially if McAuliffe has enough money left to pay your fee. I'm not worried about my fee. Well, if the old man does run out of cash, he's still got that niece left. You know what I mean. <laughs> you better get out of here, Remington. 
Get out, and fast. And you better learn to talk like a gentleman if you remember how. Goodbye, Chad. Let's just make it hostile awake. And in case you don't remember, that means goodbye for now, but I will be seeing you again. For me, Chad, I can't understand why you've got me chained to this hotel porch when we could be across the street in one of those places of entertainment. I told you before, O'Bannon, I got some thinking to do. A lot of thinking. She told me that what's his name was no good when you knew him years ago. Well, it isn't that Chip's just no good, but well, he's always felt that a man doesn't have to work for a living. Just work enough to get a little money, and then that money will bring power. I hope you're not going to let this. Uh... Your former friendship with this gentleman deter you from trying to clean this up. You ought to know me better than that. How can you clean something up when you don't know where he's getting the information? I thought surely that changing the figures in the telegrams today would... Well, go on, go ahead. Cherokee, look. Across the street. Across the... Well, well, I'll be blamed. Isn't that Nellie, Ike McAuliffe's niece? Sure is. And the gentleman she's with, who's holding her arm so closely, is Chip Jason. Come on, Cherokee. We're going to follow those two, and after Chip takes her home, we're having a little talk with Miss Nellie. A mighty serious talk. I don't care what you say. Chip Jason's been the only person who's been decent to me ever since I've gone to work in this town. My dear Miss Nellie, do you mean to stand there with your sweet little face looking angry? Tell me you think it's wise to consort with someone like this Chip Jason after all your Uncle Ike has done for you? Uncle Ike. The only thing he's done for me is to make me work for the money which really belonged to my father anyhow. Doggone it, Nellie. You shouldn't even think things like that, let alone say them. What right have you got to tell me what to do? Uncle Ike or not... What I do with my life after I get through working for that $12 a week he so magnanimously pays me is my own business. No one's life is their own business, Nellie, particularly when there's a sharpshooter like Chip Jason involved. Now, if you'll... Leave me alone. Do you hear me? Leave me alone. That girl's got a temper. She certainly didn't want to talk about it, did she? But you, if you were selling your uncle out? Now, look, you old charlatan, there's not one shred of proof that she's selling out anybody. If she happens to be, at least she's admitted a motive... Somehow she seems to be very bitter about Ike being forced to buy out her father. Well, then... If Jason is getting the information from Ike's composing room, it still leaves Mr. Foley to check up on, if we want to be positive. Foley? How do you propose to do that? <laughs> I got a very unintelligent idea. Oh? That, uh, you're gonna like it. Am I? If Mr. Foley's like any of the printers I've ever known, then he's in one of the five saloons in town drinking why didn't I become a printer? So I'm going to advance you $10 and turn you loose to find Foley and buy him some drinks. Hallelujah. Consuls, curb your impatience. Sucker is at hand. I said to buy drinks for Mr. Foley. You've got to abstain yourself so you'll be able to pump Foley for whatever information you can get out of him. <laughs> that, sir, is not only placing Satan behind me, but in front of me and all around me. And hero that I am, I'm no man to fight off eight, Satan. Now, you better do as I tell you, Cherokee, because if you start imbibing, your head will be so big in the morning, I'll have no trouble hitting it with both of these fists. <laughs> now, go on, and don't drink anything but the chasers. <laughs> Bartender, two more the same. Now, what was that you were saying again, Mr. Foley? Huh? Uh, no, I wasn't saying nothing, except he's true, you. Here's mud in your eye. Uh, down the old... <coughs> water. Uh, you, you want some water? Oh, here, we'll take mine. Uh, no, thank you. I have more water. Oh, now that ain't healthy. Water's good for you. Water may be good for the average person, Mr. Foley, but I happen to be a man of iron. Water makes me rust. Now, uh, what was that you were saying again? Something about good old Ike? Here's uh, good old Ike. As fine a man as ever run a newspaper. And the finest man I've ever worked for. Ah. Now, uh, let's have one on me, O'Bannon. Uh, no, I don't think so, Mr. Foley. It's all the same to you. I'll be going over to my hotel and floating to bed. Uh, water. I'm this bed. 
Well, I may be amused now, but I certainly wasn't then. In the first place, it was a little disconcerting to learn that Foley loved Ike like a father and had no motive for selling him out to Chip Jason. And second, after six glasses of water and five drinks of good bourbon slyly spilled in the brass receptacle at the bar, Cherokee was no man to share a hotel room with. You know what they say about a woman spurned? Well, Cherokee had a fury that was much worse. And something else, Mr. Remington. Just for what you made me submit to... Starting the first of the month, I'm raising your rent five dollars. Oh, go on, you old fraud. That sublime sense of self-sacrifice you're enjoying is making you feel so holy that even a teetotaler like me can't stand you around. I should get Satan behind you and help him push. Now, are you sure that's all Foley said? I have never been more cold sober in my life. And I assure you, I've repeated every word he said verbatim. And since my brain is clear as it is, I'll save you a lot of trouble by telling you that there's no doubt Nellie is selling out her uncle. So now, I'm sorry, Cherokee, but while you were wrestling with Satan, I concluded it can't be Nellie. It can't be? Nope. Thirty minutes after we gave Nellie the cattle prices to set up, Chip's paper was printed with the accurate information. There's only one way that could have happened. That Chip had access to the telegrams before I got them. Can this be possible? Well, we'll soon find out. Because in your precarious, sober state, you're taking a horse and riding over to Acacia Springs. Acacia Springs? Acacia Springs. And you're going right to the Western Union office and send a telegram from there stating that there's been a flood which has closed Doskin Pass and that any ranchers wanting to drive their cattle to the railroad had better pick another route. What do you expect to accomplish by that kind of a telegram filled with misinformation? I expect to wind this thing up by tomorrow and get back home where I won't have to occupy a room with you moaning like the ancient mariner. Now, now go on, Cherokee. Get going. Chip Jason couldn't wait for his regular edition. He came out with a special edition with a banner line in 72-point type announcing the flash flood that had closed Doskin Pass. Five minutes after the paper hit the street, the town marshal had arrested the local telegraph operator. And armed only with his confession, I set out to pay one more call on my old friend Chip. Where I give my news is my business, Chad. Chip, you're in for a big disappointment. Because the only real news in Dobie City right now is this headline in the Independent. Here. Publisher Jason arrested for fraud. Are you loco? This is an out-and-out lie. Oh, then I suppose this is, too. This confession from the telegraph operator that he'd been taking money from you to give you all news information that came over the Western Union wires. Why, that's a lot of... (laughs) You were pretty smart, weren't you, Chad? And so were you, playing up to Nellie McAuliffe and taking her out in public to make it appear that she was giving you the information. That was pretty slick, too. I should have known you'd have figured that. But there's only one thing wrong with this headline, Chad. They haven't arrested me yet, and they're not going to. You're right about that. They aren't going to arrest you. I am. And I'm placed... Chip, leave that gun alone. I'm sorry you made me do that, Chip. You went for your gun first. I I know you're aiming to be bad. You said you were going to wrap that fence rail right around my head. The only thing you hit were my stomach and shoulder. (laughs) What made you suspect the Western Union operator, Chad? I was bothered about how Chip got the news so far in advance of the time when Ike got the telegrams. What cinched it in my mind was remembering what happened to us the other day on the way to Dobie City. You mean about that gun toter who tried to warn us to go back home? Exactly. Since Ike sent me a telegram asking me to come over, someone must have had access to the wire. Of course. Why didn't I think of that? (laughs) Because you were too busy wrestling with Satan. Well, now that it's all over, I suppose there's no harm in telling you that I wrestled with him and won the bout. But I did it with a little trick. Oh, so? What trick was that? Well, Satan got me down once and knocked the wind out of me. Knowing I needed some stimulation to win the bout, I took three small slugs of bourbon while he wasn't looking. Then I got up and threw him horns, hoofs over hoofs, and right out of the rain. What? what? The dickens you did. The devil I didn't. <laughs> <laughs>
Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler and featuring Wade Crosby, is a Bruce Ells production. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmar. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. And now this is Bill Foreman to tell you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! Cowtown lawyer like Chad Remington. <laughs> That's me. There's several things you gotta know, and the least of them is law. The most of them is trouble. It was only a few weeks ago that I had a letter from Colonel Winfield, an old friend of my father's who'd settled a hundred or so miles away from my hometown in a place known as Vomit Valley. Colonel Winfield wrote that he needed help. Needed it bad. And to quote the old gentleman, the kind of help he needed might be legal, but probably otherwise. Well, it took Cherokee O'Bannon and myself about a day to get ready and pack up, and another few days to ride up to Vaughan Valley. And it was while Cherokee and I were on the trail that Colonel Winfield's trouble first came to a head. Early one morning, the colonel and his daughter Georgia were paid a call by the colonel's oldest friend and next door neighbor, Henry I'm Trowbridge. I'm going to turn if you just shut that trap of yours. Shut my trap, get... eh? I got a good mind to shut yours for you, Henry Trowbridge, so you won't be able to use it for a month of Sunday. Daddy, now that's no way to talk to Mr. Trowbridge. You keep out of this, Georgia. I'll talk to him or anyone else just the way I want it. And there's no one walking the face of this earth who's going to make me sell my ranch if I don't want it. Yeah, well, you've been trying to sell your ranch for years. But now, just because someone wants to pay a decent price for both our places, you gotta go and act as if I were trying to euchre you out of something. Ah, uh, hogwash. And I've taken all the hogwash from you I'm going to take. Oh, is that so? Yeah, that's so. And if you know what's good for you, Trowbridge, you'll clear out of here. Father, how can you talk that way to your oldest friend? He's no friend of mine. Anymore, Georgia. Who wants to be a friend of yours anyhow? Uh, Trying to talk me into selling my ranch just because you want to sell yours. <laughs> All right, I'm through talking, but I'll promise you one thing, you bull-headed old gopher. You're going to regret what you're doing. Regret it mighty soon. Daddy, I'm just... Well, all I can say is that I'm just thoroughly ashamed of you. It's too blessed bad. And so you don't get contaminated staying in the same room with me. Go out and find that shiftless foreman of ours and tell him I want to see him. Root? What do you want to see Root for? Because I want Root to start rounding up the cattle. Henry Trowbridge or not, I'm driving my herd to market, so I don't have to stay around here and listen to all that cattle wallowing about selling our ranches. But what about Chad Remington? I thought you wrote him to come up here. Well, what about Chad? You get here when he gets here. 
And if we're gone, maybe he can take a few days to find out what's going on behind the scenes. Well, fortunately, Cherokee and I got to the colonel's place before he had a chance to trail his herd to market. And between the colonel, Georgia, and Root, the ranch foreman, we finally dragged out the story of what had been going on. That's about all I can tell you, Chad. This cattle broker, Big John Biggers, claims he represents some packing house that wants to buy both Henry Trowbridge's ranch and mine. And I know blame well the price they're offering for my ranch alone. It's so gold blamed high, it just can't be honest. Pardon my intrusion, Colonel Winfield, but haven't you heard the old expression about not looking a gift horse to teeth? Especially if the teeth are solid gold. There's another old expression you ought to learn, Cherokee. The one about all is not gold that glistens. Chad, the awful thing about this whole business is the fact that it's breaking up a 40-year friendship between Mr. Trowbridge and my father. Yeah, I can imagine since Trowbridge is insisting that he wants to sell. Well, why doesn't this packing house buy Trowbridge's place and let it go with that? For the life of me, I don't understand. Big John just keeps saying it's both places and none. Isn't that so, Ruth? Well, I saw Mr. Bigger in town last night and tried to argue with him for all the good it did. But it's just like the boss said, Mr. Remington. Either they sell both ranches together as one piece, or there ain't no deal. Mm-hmm. Uh... How do you feel about this thing, Root? Do you think the colonel ought to sell? At that price? You ought to jump at it. Why, if it was me, they was... Yeah, someone at the front door, Georgia. Go let him in. Oh, don't bother, Miss Georgia. I'll let him in. Oh, hello, Mr. Trowbridge. Uh, howdy, Root. Is it all right if I come in? It's Mr. Trowbridge, Dad. Come on in, Mr. Trowbridge, and meet Chad Remington and Mr. O'Bannon. Yeah, uh, how do you do? How do you do? Oh, you glad to know you. Uh, colonel, uh, I just... Couldn't eat my supper after what happened this morning without, uh, well, coming over and apologizing for losing my temper. Well, that's a mighty nice thing for you to do, Mr. Trowbridge. The Colonel and Georgia were just telling us about the little set to you had this morning. Uh, well, uh, Colonel, uh, we, we've been old friends too long to be old fools now. We put her there. Oh, I walk on it, Henry. If there's any apologizing to do, I'm going to do it. Now, don't go starting another fight about who's going to apologize to whom. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Yeah. Trowbridge. Pull up a chair and sit down. Yeah. You see, the colonel asked me up here, thinking perhaps I could help untangle this little mystery. And since both ranches are involved, well, I'm mighty glad you dropped in at the time you did. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Remington, uh, you see... Well, to be perfectly honest, I've been pretty hard-pressed for money lately. And... Money? Why didn't you come over and ask me for what you needed? Well, Colonel, I just couldn't do that. Uh, five years ago, when Emma was so sick, just before she passed on, the doctor and ran so high, I... well, I mortgaged my place to the bank. The loan's been passed due three months now, and they're... Well, they're ready to close me out. Why in thunder didn't you come and tell me, old Billy Gold? Well, I didn't need to when Big John come along with that offer. You see, that's why I was so set on making the deal. But, oh, well, it's, it's all right, Colonel. I'm not going to try to force you into it. And, well, I feel better for having told you the truth. How much do you owe that concern bank? Well, uh, well a little more than 4000 but... Uh, <laughs> Trouble with you, Henry, and always has been. You're as stubborn as a Missouri mule. Georgia, hand me my glasses. Well, what are you up to anyhow, Colonel? I'm opening the safe and giving Henry the money he needs to pay off the bank. Right. No, 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 Colonel. I, I'm going to know. I, I won't take it. Well, no. Dickens, you won't. And if you say one word about thanking me, I will run you out of here. Yeah, but... The... Now, here it is. Just the way I got it from the bank. Four bundles of bills, each a thousand dollars. Dad, try it. Oh, go on, dry up. You'll start blubbering like a kid in a minute. Yeah, but... But this is probably all the money you got. Well, let you know. There's still another 4000 out right there in the safe. And if you know what's good for you, you'll get out of here and go on home. Well, I... I... Well, I... I see you tomorrow. Hey, Ruth, go outside and make sure Mr. Trowbridge finds his horse all right. It's so dark, and with him crying, he may wander around all night. Well, you bet, Colonel. I think I'll just keep on going down to the bunkhouse. Good night. Colonel, after that exhibition, I'm surprised we're not all a little bit teary-eyed. If that's the way you treat your friends, I'm proud to be numbered one of them. Uh, although we haven't met before, Colonel, if you're looking for a friend of need, 
I'm in need, and I could very quickly become a friend of yours. Does the colonel keep any drinking liquor around the house, Chad? <laughs> uh, Mr. O'Bannon, you seem to forget that I come from the south, and I've got some of the rarest, finest, smoothest... And you're going to keep it, colonel. Anything that old and rare and smooth will be so foreign to Cherokee's palate that his tonsils would think he was drinking molasses syrup. <laughs> well, is there anything wrong with molasses syrup? Certainly not. Good. So if you'll follow me out to the kitchen, I'll pour you the biggest glass of molasses syrup a man ever drank. Thank you. Well, while I coerced the O'Bannon into retiring with only the nightcap you tie around your head, we found out later that Colonel Winfield's foreman Root hadn't gone to bed. In fact, he hit his horse and streaked for Big John Bigger's office in town. Well, that's where I come in, John. Here's over elbows. But Trowbridge having enough money now to pay off the bank, even he's not going to want to sell out to us. He hasn't paid off the bank yet, has he? Well, no. You and I are going to be waiting for Mr. Trowbridge and the trail that leads from his place to the bank tomorrow morning. Well, if you mean gun him down, that's risky business. This whole thing is risky business. And we got to get both those ranches... Or we ain't got no deal with that mining company. Uh, I don't, still don't see where that mining company just don't buy one of the ranches. Because when they started to check on that vein of silver you stumbled on up at the back end of Winfield's place, they found that half of it was over on Trowbridge's spread. Yeah, I suppose they know what they're doing. Now that Trowbridge has got that money the colonel's given him, he's never going to sell. Just like the colonel said, he's stubborn as a mule. <laughs> there are two kinds of mules, my friend. Live mules and dead mules. And after Trowbridge leaves his place heading for the bank tomorrow morning, you know the kind of a mule he's going to be, don't you? So you better go home now and get some sleep. When you start shooting tomorrow morning, I want your nerves to be steady. For the life of me, I don't understand why you get up at this ungodly hour in the morning to ride into town. If I've told you once, I've told you ten times. I want to get in and have a little talk with that big-hearted cattle broker, Big John Biggers. Try to find out what packing house is local enough to offer twice it. Oh. Billy Blue Blazers, no matter where we go, bullets fly thicker than mosquitoes over swamp. Come on, Cherokee, knock on that horse. Those shots came from just ahead of us. Thunder and lightning, Chad. That's Colonel Winfield's foreman, Root. I wonder what in blazes he's up to. Oh, rain up. Oh, boy. Easy. What the... Yeah. Oh, it's you, Remington. Merciful Providence, Chad. It's Henry Trowbridge. Shot four times through the back. Poor old cuss. Root, how come you got here so quick? Why, I... I, uh... Now, look here, Remington... Are you aiming to accuse me of anything? Where's Trowbridge's money belt? How in blazes should I know? I can see where it was ripped off his trousers. And since you got here as fast as you did, you ought to know something about it. What are you doing now? Calling me a thief? If I had a mind to call you anything, thief might be just a small part of it. Yeah, well... <laughs> Ah, that was a neat bit of pugilistic perfection, Chad. A left to his fat stomach and then a right to his jaw. All right, Cherokee, come on. Help me get Trowbridge's body to town. There must be a lawman in Vomit Valley. Before we're through, I've got a feeling he's going to need a few dozen two-gun deputies. We'll return to the second act of Valley of the Varmints, our exciting frontier town adventure in just a few moments. And now, Frontier Town. Well, I guess we all find it out sooner or later. 
After a thing is over and everything's explained, it seems quite simple how all the little jigsaw pieces fit together to make the picture. But with poor Henry Trowbridge dead, the $4,000 gone, and the bank about to take over his ranch, Cherokee and I, along with the colonel and his daughter, faced what seemed to be an insuperable problem. There appeared to be no answer whatsoever to supply a reason why some unnamed packing house should want both ranches so badly they'd pay a fantastic price. Our visit to the cattle broker, Big John, having been interrupted by the finding of Trowbridge's body, I asked the colonel's foreman, Root, to ride into town and see if Big John wouldn't come out to call on us. Well, he did, and the conversation was most enlightening. You can talk all you want, Bigger, but I'm not changing my mind. My ranch is not for sale. Oh, but surely, Colonel, there must be some price we could agree on that you'd take for your layout. Oh, I don't mean to butt in, Bigger, but just how high can you go? Well, I, uh, I don't know for sure, Remington, but I might be able to induce my clients to raise their bid, uh, oh, another few thousand dollars. And maybe another few thousand dollars on top of that, huh? Yes, it's possible. It's, it's possible. In other words, your so-called clients want this property at any price. So-called clients, eh? Just what are you hinting at? All right, Bigger, here it is. No people in their right minds are offering a ridiculously high price for a couple of ranches like these two just to supposedly raise cattle for a packing house. In other words, you're just calling me a liar. I don't need you to put words in my mouth, but since the shoe seems to fit you, let's let it go at that. Oh, Dad, look out! Thanks, Cherokee, but I saw him go for his gun. If he wants to clear leather, it's all right with me. Well, Big John, figure you big enough to try it? Remington, I... I'd give you a chance at that. But right now, it just don't happen to be convenient. You mean your insurance policy isn't paid up? Colonel, that offer I made you was good for six more hours. You change your mind if you've got a mind. You know where you can find me. In my office. I'll be there until six o'clock tonight. Well, you certainly made him back down. <laughs> sure did my heart good, Chad, to see him get his comeuppance. That still doesn't explain just why anybody wants to pay the price he offered you for the ranch. It convinced me of one thing, Cherokee. They don't want this place just to raise cattle. Now, tell me something, Colonel. Are there any mines or ore deposits any place around here? See, you don't think they found gold up on the ridge at the back end of my place, do you? Well, I haven't the slightest idea. All I was doing was asking. You know, you just gave me an idea, Chad. And doggone if I don't think it's worth checking up on. Daddy! Where are you going? Never mind about me, Georgia. You stay here and keep our visitors company. <laughs> Chad Remington isn't the only galoot around these parts who can smoke out trouble. I tell you, boss, I think Remington's on to what we're trying to pull. A lot of good it's going to do him, Root. That silver's been back in them hills for a couple of thousand years. No one found it until you just happened to dig a post hole up there. Yeah, I know. But even if they don't find the silver, what good is that going to do us if we... Hey, look. Huh? Here comes the colonel out of the house, and he's heading straight for his horse. Yeah. I wonder where he can be going all by himself. All right, Root, come on. We're hitting our own horses and trailing Colonel Winfield. I don't know where he's going, but we're sure finding out. <laughs> Oh, what, what, what? You see where Winfield's going? Yeah. He's heading right for the ridge where we chipped out the rock, and you can see the silver ore. Yeah. If he ever spots it, our deal's done for. Get that rifle of yours out of the saddle, but Sure, but... Wait till I... the colonel gets right on the top of the ridge, then we'll cut loose. When they find his body, it'll roll on the other side onto Trowbridge's property. Yeah, that's right. All right, come on, come on. Line him up in your sights now. All right, now. Let him have it. That's about all there is to it, Marshal. When the colonel didn't come back, we went out looking for him. Found his body down at the bottom of the drawer, loaded with lead. Yeah, there's not much chance of proving a case from that, no matter who you suspect. Well, I've got the colonel's will here, and if you wouldn't mind my reading it now, it'll save me a long ride out to the ranch sometime later. 
It's all right, Marshal. There's nothing to be gained from putting it off. Well, it uh, runs about four pages, but when it's all through, it just leaves the ranch to you, Georgia, 50-50 with uh, Chad Remington on an equal basis. What? Half of it to me? I can't accept that, Georgia. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to, Chad. Father was afraid something like this would happen. He left you half the ranch to make sure you'd look out for me. He paid for your trouble. Well, I think I may accept it for the time being. If you don't mind, Georgia, let's be heading back for the ranch. I'm mighty curious to see how Ruth feels when he hears he's got me for his new boss. Away. Sure, Miss. Sure. Oh, Root, it uh, may interest you to know that Colonel Winfield left half this ranch to me, and from now on, I'm giving the orders out here. Oh, is that so? Well, I still have something to say about the running of this place. Yeah? Well, I'm one gent who's not going to end up like your father did. I'm selling out and getting out of here. Well, you can't sell without my signature, and I certainly am not selling. That's what you think. Well, come on, let's not air our troubles in front of the help around here. You and I are going into the house and do a lot of talking. All right, I'm through wasting my breath on you. You keep the ranch since you want it so bad. I certainly shall. But I'm taking what money's left in the safe and clearing out of here. Why, you're no better than a low-down crooked... That's enough. Now go on. Get that safe open while you're still able. Ted Remington, you're nothing but a thief. That's what you are. A common, ordinary thief. There. Take the money. Take it and get out. Just a minute, Remington. Ruth. You're not leaving here yet. He threw down on me and made me open the safe. Yeah, I saw the whole thing from outside the window. All right, Remington. I'll take that cash. Hand it over. Well, sure, I'll be glad to. And if you know what's good for you, young lady, you won't try to follow me. Mr. Beggar, I don't blame you for not believing me. But what I'm telling you is still the truth. Chad wants to sell you the Winfield Ranch. That just don't make sense. What's, what's this Maverick doing here? Well, he's been telling me some cock and bull story about Remington wanting to sell the ranch. I'm not surprised after what he'd done. Pulled a gun on the gal, made her open the safe, and then lit out with all the money the colonel left in the safe. What? Certainly did. He's no fool. And he says if you'll get the girl here after dark tonight, he'll promise both of them will sign. I'd like to know what Remington's up to. He's just up to saving his own hide. That Georgia ran screaming to the marshal about Chad taking the money. Now he's wanted for burglary. Uh, what he's got to do now is raise enough money so he can hide out for a couple of years. <laughs> Crime sure doesn't pay, does it? <laughs> All right, tell him it's a deal. Now you're talking. You get the girl and Chad will be here about 10 o'clock tonight. <laughs> uh, something awful funny about this. Oh, what do we care? As soon as the girl in Remington sign the deed, Remington's going to have a little surprise party. <laughs> Since the marshal's out looking for him, I think it's only my duty as a decent citizen to turn him over to the law. Everything worked out just fine. I got to Bigger's office at 10 o'clock, and five minutes later, Georgia reluctantly signed the deed. There. But you'll never get away with this, Remington, believe me. Okay, Remington. Now, uh, you sign it and the deal will be closed. Well, I'll sign it when I get $5,000 laid in my hand. All cash. Cash? Well, what do you think I'd get $5,000 at this time of night? I guess I forgot to tell you that he wanted it in cash. Well, you better find it, my friend. Uh, what's in that cash box of yours there on the desk? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. I forgot about that. Well, I think I might have most of it in cash. 
Ah, here you are. There's 4,000 of it, bundled up just the way it came from the bank. Thank you, Figger. Hmm? All right, Cherokee. Take this package of bills and compare the serial numbers with the money we took out of the colonel's safe today. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. What the devil are you up to? Plenty. If the serial numbers on these bills are in sequence with those that were left in the colonel's safe, then this must be the money that was stolen from Henry Trowbridge's body. And we know who and why it was taken. Chad, you were right. These numbers are all in sequence. Cherokee, don't let Ruth get away. Georgia, get back. Get out of the way. Well, now that we've got the proof that they killed Henry Trowbridge, I don't think we'll have too much trouble finding out what made those ranchers valuable enough to risk a double murder charge. Georgie, you better go call the marshal. Cherokee and I will stay here and get these two crooks bundled up. Don't mind telling you, Chad, that you certainly had me mystified for a while. You and George, you put on that argument, it certainly sounded like the real thing. <laughs> That's one of the nice things about those southern girls. When they put on an act, they put everything they've got into it. I always have admired a southern beauty. Trouble is, none of them ever admired me. Oh, well, now that George is the sole owner of a fairly prosperous silver mine, you might go back and try setting your cap for her. You, you mean marriage? Oh, with a girl like Georgia, marriage should be very interesting. Well, I will admit, the young lady has her good points. Oh, now, you can speak more clearly than that, Cherokee. Huh? What do you mean? Well, now, uh, knowing that the Winfields come from your favorite state, Kentucky, what you really meant to say was that you were interested in the young lady because she has her good pints. <laughs> yes, he certainly has her good pints. And now with that silver mine she's got, she's got plenty of quartz, too. Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler and featuring Wade Crosby, is a Bruce Ells production. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. And now this is Bill Foreman to tell you that Frontier Town comes to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town!
I'm Chad Remington, frontier lawyer. Now, a cowtown lawyer doesn't get too many cases, and those he does get usually pay slowly, if at all. And that's one reason why I have my so-called offices up over the Dos Rios livery stables, which are owned by an ex-medicine man in Cherokee O'Bannon. Well, what I'm getting at is this. After the run of broken down and non-paying clients I've had, it was a real pleasure when Dave Buckley and his mother from over in the painted horse country came to see me along with Lieutenant Colonel Harvey, supply officer for all the United States troops in our territory. <laughs> Even Cherokee was impressed. Colonel, do you mind if I ask you a question? A very personal question? Uh, no, not at all, O'Bannon. What is it? Is all that braid on your sleeve genuine gold? Oh, no, no, I'm afraid not. <laughs> Even if it were, Cherokee, you couldn't snip enough off it to buy a bottle of Kentucky's uh, best. How disappointing. How very disappointing. And uh, now, what do you say if we get down to business, hmm? I, uh, I gather you have a contract you want me to look over. Is that right, Dave? Well, yeah, Chad, though maybe Mark could tell you more about it. Now, why in tarnation thunder should I do it? Spent the last 20-odd years bringing you up to learn something. <laughs> From what I can see, you've done a pretty good job, Ma. In fact, that's what anyone would expect out here from a member of Ma Buckley's family. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. When I first met Ma, and Dave here wasn't more knee-high to a grasshopper. She was selling a gallon jug of something she made herself for six bits. Five cents back when you returned the empty bottle. Yeah, and I'm not ashamed of it. With four children to raise, a woman's got to do anything. Well, you certainly have done well, Mrs. Buckley, or else we wouldn't be here now. <laughs> not meaning to seem inquisitive, but would someone be good enough to tell me just what the nature of this contract is you want me to look over? Well, the long and short of it's just this, Chad. We're entering into a contract with the Army to supply him with beef. And the contract runs three years. Well... I'd say that's a great deal, providing the price is all right. Well, the price is more than fair, Remington. Yeah, Chad, we got no complaint at all on the price. Well, the only catch no old blasted contract is the money we lose if we don't deliver the cattle. Oh, that's normal, Ma. The government usually puts some forfeiture clause in any contract to cover non-delivery. Is there a schedule in the contract? Or how many head are you supposed to deliver and at what times? They're supposed to deliver a thousand head at once and then 50 head every two weeks for the remainder of the three years. Say, this is big business. Where are you hoping to get all that cattle, Ma? Oh, that's Dave's job. Starting him out in business for himself here with the first thousand head. Yeah, uh, we'll get the cattle, Chad. I got that pretty well arranged now. <laughs> with Ma's help, of course. All right. I guess you better let me have the contract. Yes, uh, here you are, Remington. Thank you. It's in duplicate. Well, Chad, pursuing that legal document, Ma... Tell me one thing. You still got that recipe for that wild panther juice you used to make? Oh, you old reprobate, you. I'll tell you what I'll do with you, old Ben. What's that, Ma? I'll trade you my recipe for drinking liquor if you give me your recipe for that rattlesnake oil you used to peddle. Ma'am, you're asking the impossible. I got that recipe from an old Indian. On my sacred pledge never to reveal it. An old Indian? <laughs> what old Indian? Why, sitting bull, of course. Because that formula is 95% bull, and if you have the misfortune to drink any of it, you'll spend the next week sitting down. <laughs> That's just what I thought. You old fake. What about that contract, Chad? Is it all right? Yeah, it certainly seems to be, Dave. Except I, I must warn you that if you fail to meet any of these delivery dates, not only does the contract expire, but you forfeit $10,000. And $10,000 is a whale of a lot of money. Well, now, we're really worrying about that, Chad. If we can't raise it, then that'll be something for Uncle Sam to worry about. It's a funny thing. As much as a lawyer will do to protect his client, there are so many factors which, not written on paper, can blow a contract higher than a cut. And in the case of Ma and Dave Buckley, I soon learned there was one fact that nobody could have thought of. Not more than a week after the contract with the Army had been signed in my office, Dave Buckley, who was out rounding up cattle, suddenly saw something which caused him to rake his spurs over his pony's flanks and come racing home. Pull that! Pull what? Pull that! Ma? Ma, where are you? No, get out. Happened to you, David. Pack rat, get down your boot top. Ma, this is awful. Awful. I was just riding up over Bald Hill, and what do you think I saw coming through that pass down below? Now, how in blazes should I know what you saw? Sheep. 
That's what I saw. Sheep. Thousands of the filthy gray critters. Sheep? Are coming here? They must be coming in here. They're heading right this way. They ain't coming in here, baby boy. They got no right to trail their sheep through cattle country. What can we do? It is open range. Yeah, well, it's going to be closed range then. We're going to close it with every shotgun, rifle, and six-gun we can lay hand to. Ma, ma, we can't. We can't take the law into our own hands. We can't, eh? Well, we got the law on our hands right now. We got that dead blasted contract we signed with the army, and that's law, too. Them sheep come through here and eat off our feed, we'll lose everything we've got. Everything I've worked more than 30 years for. Well, you do what you want. For me, I'm sending a telegram to Chad Remington. I'm not going to be shot down or see my neighbor shot down just because of a lot of no-good, double-dealing sheep herders. Hey, Harold. Harold, come here. See, boy. You call me. Doggone right I called you. Now, look, Perro, I'm taking my horse and riding up over that hill. I want to have a look at Painted Horse Valley that's on the other side of it. Well, Senor Brawlings, I have seen Painted Horse Valley many times. And I tell you, there is much grass there. Some places, grass almost shoulder high. Sure, sure, I know. But now that we're this close, I want to see it myself. Now, you and the boys keep them sheep moving. Understand? Si, si, senor. But you know... I think it is much better if you do not show yourself yet. This cattle ranch hombres, they, don't know, they can smell cheap. I know my rights. Look her up, too. At their land's government land. And we don't have to take nothing from any cattle ranchers. See, si, senor, see, si, but maybe you make the trouble. Well, ain't that too bad. Now, look, Harold. My sheep are going to feed in Painted Horse Valley... Even if we have to turn that green grass red with blood before they get to it. If anything happens while I'm gone, don't ask no questions. Just blast away. Get up! Exactly, Matty. Hmm. Maybe this grass do turn red with blood. <laughs> The way you're talking, you'll have Painted Horse Valley up in arms and a range war started before sunup. You doggone dad blame right I will. No moth-eating mangy sheep herders are driving sheep across my land. Don't you see, Chad? If they just ate the grass, it would be bad enough. But sheep have sharp hooves that dig up the roots and it'll take years before it grows again. Chad, isn't there something we can do without going for our guns? If your neighbors feel like your mother does, Dave, I'm afraid not. But if you'll give me a chance to go out and talk to the man who owns the sheep... Well, there's just the possibility we, we might be able to come to terms. Terms? Huh. A lot of good talking's going to do. Ma, Ma, you've worked 30 years, you said, to get to the point you're at today. Now you're almost on easy street with a contract with the government. If you start flying off the handle and throwing lead, well... Well, you know what I mean, Ma. The only reason I worked at all is so I could leave you something when I'm not here no more. Now, all you'll leave, Davy, if you try shooting it out, probably is a memory of his mother. Doggone it, Ma... Let me go out and talk to this man. Well, but just once. I'm not going to have no going back and forth. Going back and forth. What's the man's name? This sheep herder fellow, I mean. Well, we hear his name is Brawling. Wooly Brawling, they call him. And they say he's got a flock of 4,000 sheep he's driven clear from Arkansas. Well, come on, Cherokee. Let's go out and see if we can chew the fat with Mr. Brawling. Maybe pull the Buckley's fat out of the fire at the same time. <laughs> When I want your advice about my sheep, Remington, I'll ask you for it. I've been trailing sheep since long before the time you was just wet behind the ears. You don't say. Well, if you try driving these sheep you've got here into Painted Horse Valley, you won't do much more driving, believe you me. I guess I know my rights. No one be hanged. Ain't a lot of good your rights are going to do, do you when, when the cattlemen start blasting their guns in your faces. You wouldn't be trying to threaten me now, would you? I don't have to threaten you. You got a brain in your head, you'll know I'm right. If I got a brain in my head, huh? Why, you long legged loud That's it, Chad. Now, rusty one for me. If you want any more, Brawling, 
Just get back up on your feet. Now, 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 wait a minute. Uh, I'm not looking for no more trouble. Now, you should have thought of that before you threw that sneak punch. Now, look, Brawley. I came out here to try to help you, not to make trouble. Yeah. I got an oil paint, and are you trying to help me? If you can risk losing 4,000 sheep, that's your business. I'd like to save you the loss, save the cattlemen from getting hurt, and actually save the sheep. Because anybody with even one brain in their head knows that a few sheep are good for range country. Of course. If you'd split your flock into small bunches and feed them through the country lightly, nobody would be hurt. Well, you could send some of your sheep into Painted Horse Valley, a, a few more through Valhalla Pass, and so on. If you did, I don't think even the ornery as cattleman would bother you. Yeah. You think they'd really be willing to let my sheep through that way? The cowmen don't want any trouble. They'll cooperate with you. Okay, I'll do it. I'll split them up. Yeah, now you're making sense, my friend. And if you don't mind, O'Bannon and I are going to go back and tell the ranchers the good news. Come on, Cherokee, let's be getting up steam. Mr. Brawling, congratulations. You're a gentleman of rare intelligence. Get up there, boy. Harold! Hey, Harold! Say, bossy. What do you want now? I want you and the other boys to keep an eye on the flock. I'm riding up to flag and hire on every gun hand I can find. And if I can't get enough there, I'm going to Gallup and Santa Fe and Albuquerque till I get all I need. But well, why do you do that? Because I'm driving my 4,000 sheep through Painted Horse Valley. Even if I have to leave a dead cowboy to mark every blasted foot. If they want war, they're going to get war until this valley is black with gun smoke. We'll return to the second act of All Trails Lead to Trouble, our exciting frontier town adventure, in just a few moments. And now, Frontier Town. Well, not knowing then what Wooly Brawling planned, I went back to the Buckleys and asked Ma and Dave to see if they could arrange a meeting of all the ranches in the vicinity. Figuring that if I could get them all together at once, I'd have a fair to middling chance of convincing them of what I thought I'd convince the sheep man of. Ma, of course, was reluctant to waste any time palavering, as she termed it, but she finally gave in, and a meeting was arranged for the following afternoon. The meeting was chaired by Amos Churchill, the president of the local Cattlemen's Association. All right, boys, quiet down, quiet down. I'll be blasted if I'm going to quiet down, Amos. I admit that I asked Grimman to come up here, or at least my son did. But enough's enough. He ain't making no bargains with no sheep herders for me. Well, then, what was the idea of calling this here meeting? Because I ain't no sheep herder. I ain't no lawyer. Now, don't say things behind folks' back. <laughs> now, Chad said he wanted to put his proposition up to all of you. Well, I give him the chance. Now that you've heard him, I'm telling you how I feel. Ma, you got no right to do this. I got an interest in that contract just like you have. Sure, you got plenty of rights, Davy. And as your mother, I got the right to turn you over my knee and warp the daylights out of you for talking about things you don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> Neighbors! Neighbors! This is our range. It's up to us to keep it. If anyone tries to run any sheep across it, we doggone well better be out there proving it's our range. In other words, Ma, you're insisting that the public lands are yours exclusively? How can you be so short-sighted? Don't you see if you persist in this ridiculous and selfish notion, you'll live to regret it if you live at all? Remington, Remington! You're out of order. Now you get off the platform and sit down. Oh, I've seen selfish men like you precipitate range wars before. But this time, by glory, it's going to be stopped. That's all I've got to say. Somehow or other, this has got to be stopped before you all commit suicide. Come on, Cherokee, let's get out of here. 
Ah. Uh, yeah, Amos? It was you who brought Remington up here. Now, by golly, it's you who's going to have to get rid of him. Yeah. Uh, no one's going to interfere with us. Let them sheep trail over on our land. And since you and Dave brought Remington up here, the two of you better get your heads together quick. Get rid of him. Well, I don't know about that, Amos. Well, you darn well better know about that, Ma Buckley, or we'll run you and your son out of this valley right along with them sheep. <laughs> all right, boys, that's all. This meeting stands adjourned. <laughs> I certainly talk tough and positive, but you can take it from me, it was sheer bluff. How anyone could stop those stockmen from waging their age-old battle with the sheep herders is something even a cowtown lawyer didn't know. However, my pessimism changed to optimism later that afternoon when young Dave Buckley rousted me out and told me Ma wanted to see me out at their place that evening. It certainly sounded as if the old matriarch was either going to capitulate or compromise somehow or other. But knowing that no case is won until the jury's back in the courtroom, I sent Cherokee heels over leather on an errand. And like a doomed man, I had the proverbial big meal at the Merchants and Drovers Hotel before riding out for my somewhat mysterious meeting with Ma Buckley. And the moon was a thin golden scimitar in the sky as I pulled up at the ranch house. It was a perfect evening, except for the faint smell of sheep on the wind. Oh, boy. Oh, no. Oh. Oh, it's you, Chad. Well, what's wrong with you, Dave? You act as if I'm not welcome. You're not, what? particularly. Come on. Come on in. I didn't expect you to freeze up on me, Dave. Now, your mother, well, that's a different story. I don't mean it that way, Chad. Come on. Ma's back in the parlor. Hey, Ma, Chad's here. Well, don't stand there. Come on in. Well, Ma, did you change your mind? Sit down, Chad. The Chad chair, Dave. Here you are, Chad. Thank you. It's awful dark in here. Why don't you light a lamp or something? We, uh, we got our reasons, ain't we, Ma? Yeah, we got our reasons right enough. And the principal reason is this. Jeepers, Ma, the way you hit him, you could have hurt him, hurt him real bad. I didn't do him no good. The piece of stove wood never done any more to a head than raise a lump on it. What are we going to do with him now? Time up, that's what. He's sure going to be sore when he comes to. What are you, anyhow, a man or a puling baby? Painted Horse Valley is our home, Dave. Whether Chad Remington likes it or not, we're going to protect it. <laughs> nice people, my clients. But knowing Ma Buckley, how hard she'd worked all her days, how much she wanted to leave something to Dave so he wouldn't have to go through the agony and grief which had marked her life, I can't be too bitter. Although at the time I was bitter almost to the point of hatred. Maybe, as Ma said, a piece of stove wood never did any permanent harm, but it laid me out cold for hours. While I was still vaguely drifting around on some distant cloud... Cherokee returned from the errand I'd sent him on. Unable to locate me, he headed from town out to the Buckley's place, pounding up dust along the track. Dad certainly must be talking his fool head off. He's out at the Buckley's this long. More than three hours. Get up there. Keep moving. Wait a minute. Slow down. Whoa. There's someone coming. Hello there, mind if I... Well, it's Ma and Dave Buckley. Who's that? Who's that? Me, Cherokee O'Bannon. What are you doing out this time of night, O'Bannon? Well, I might ask you two the same question. But at the same time, I'm out looking for Chad. Where is he now? Chad? Why? How I... should we know where he is? Well, he had an appointment out at your place at 10 o'clock, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, sure. But he didn't stay more than 10 minutes, did he, Ma? That was 10 minutes too long. It's a good thing we run into you, old Bannon. Saved you a long ride. You can go back to town now. Yes, if he's not out at your place, we might as well. 
What have you got there, whole arsenal? You're both armed to the teeth. If I was you, O'Bannon, I wouldn't ask so many questions. My blazes, I wager I know what you're up to. Despite all Chad's done to try to save you, you're up trying to start a fight with them sheep men, aren't you? You're too smart for your own good, O'Bannon. <laughs> Come on. You coming along with us. Now, just a minute, madam. Dave, take his gun. Sure, Ma, I'll get it. Get up there, you! Ma! Ma, he's getting away! You won't get far. I'll knock that poor flesh and medicine man right off. Ma, don't! You, you, don't let go of that rifle barrel, Dave. It's all blasted. Ma, it's bad enough going after <sighs> shoot sheep uh, herders without shooting a friend behind his uh, back. There. There. That's better. Yeah. I guess you're right at that. Just afraid he'd find Chad. Out in the barn? Find Chance tied up and all covered with hay. Come on, Ma. Mr. Churchill and the others will be waiting for us. We're gonna catch them sheep men napping. We're gonna have to do it before sunup. While all this was happening, I finally came back to life, trussed like a turkey and covered with hay in the Buckley's barn. I couldn't figure out any way of getting loose until, wriggling around, I found I, I could make my fingers reach some matches in my pocket. <laughs> I guess I got the idea from something I'd read, but I figured if I could strike a match or two and hold the flame under my ropes, I could burn them loose. And I managed to get hold of three matches. I struck one, held it just under my left wrist, and the next thing I knew, the hay was on fire. Smart lawyer, hey? Trussed up like a suckling pig on a barbecue and just about as hot. I thrashed around, tried everything I could, but the only thing I succeeded in doing was spreading the flames. Oh, my goose was cooking, so was I when the barn door opened and Cherokee rushed in. Dad! Dad, you in here? Cherokee, get out that boy knife of yours. Come on, I'm tied up. You're almost burned up. Come on, young fella. We've got to get out of here. <laughs> Cherokee, if you're sure of what you think you saw, we're in for it. Well, then we're in for it, because those cow-headed ranchers have cut down trees, barricaded the pass, made a blasted fortress out of this valley. Good grief, Cherokee. They've started. From the number of gun flashes I see, those sheep men have got them outnumbered five to one. Keep going there, boy. Keep going. Hey, Cherokee, look. Look, there's someone coming, riding away from here. Slow, fella. Oh, oh, boy. Hold it! Rain up! Who's that? Is that, is that you, Remington? Billy Blue Blazes, Chad. This is Mr. Churchill, the man who ran you out of the meeting. Uh, it's awful down there. Huh? Five men shot already, and I was going to see if I'd get some help. They must outnumber us ten to one. Hey, hey, that bugle. What's that? Chad, the colonel was as good as his word. They got here, they got here. Uh, who got here? The United States Army, that's who. I sent Cherokee over to see the colonel early, early this afternoon. Since they bought all this beef, they've got an interest in this valley, too. Come on, boys, we can still get in for the wind-up. Chad, I guess there's no way you're rightly telling me how I feel of it. What we've done to you after all you've done for us. Oh, you don't have to apologize, Ma. Just so long as you've learned your lesson that the West and the open range doesn't all belong to you. <laughs> I think most of Ma's honorness leaked out through the hole that sheep herder's bullet put through her arm, huh, Ma? Yeah, I'm sure ain't got my back up now. Now then, madam, may Dr. O'Bannon prescribe a dose of his genuine Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil taken just before meals? It so happens that I have a bottle with me. Yeah, I'll be very happy to sell you the reduced price, a genuine bargain. Pay cash for that hogwash? No, but I'll tell you what I'll do. So happens that I just have one bottle of that stuff I used to make, and I'll trade you. Trade for that stuff? Not in your tin time. <laughs> What's happened to you, Cherokee, turning down a deal like that? Well, I'll tell you, Chad. I once saw an Indian who drank Ma's stuff and bleached him out like an albino. <laughs> you don't expect us to believe that one, do you, Cherokee? Well, well, that's impossible. Impossible? What's impossible about a red skin and vibing and some red eye and turning pale? Why, even a school kid knows the answer to that one. It's an old copybook maxim. 
Two reds don't make a white. <laughs> <laughs> Starring Tex Chandler and featuring Wade Crosby is a Bruce Ells production. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. And now this is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! Howdy there. This is yours truly, Chad Remington, frontier lawyer from a little frontier town called Dos Rios. Well, I guess I've probably said this before, but, well, maybe it won't hurt if I say it again. The raw bone frontier has attracted all kinds and classes of people, rough and tough, humble and God-fearing. Somehow or other, it seems that the best in folks and the worst in folks is brought out in the day-to-day -day battle for just raw existence out in our country. And this brings our frontier doctors, a few undertakers, and a frontier lawyer, the stuff out of which a lifetime's made. Well, I guess you've all heard that old expression, it takes fire to fight fire, but something happened to me recently which makes me want to rewrite that old adage. You see, it wasn't too long ago that my partner, an ex-medicine man, Cherokee O'Bannon, was with me riding up through the blue spruce and jack pines, taking a shortcut from the county seat back to our little hometown, Dos Rios. Counselor, you'll pardon my saying so. You've got an expression on your face that makes you look like a squirrel. <laughs> Maybe I am a squirrel. Oh? Well, I'm fond of nuts, else I wouldn't be riding around with you. Sir, that is a vicious and underhanded canard. There's nothing <laughs> nutty about me. <laughs> I don't know. You've always been interested in the shell game, haven't you? And as I recall, you said your grandfather was a colonel. <laughs> I guess that's right. <laughs> My mother had an uncle whose name was Philbert. <laughs> and he was a hard-shell Baptist. <laughs> 
The only actual difference is that real nuts get their nourishment from the soil, while you get most of yours from the free lunch counter at a bar. Uh, naturally. Being a man of fiery disposition, I require certain quantities of fire water to keep my... Tad, there you go again, sniffing like a squirrel. What are you wrinkling up your nose about? Unless I'm mistaken, I smell smoke. Wood smoke. Hmm. I do believe you're right. There's certainly a smell of wood smoke in the air. Oh, boy. Oh. Is that someone shooting at us? I don't know, but I'm sure going to find out. Well, I'll be a sinner. Tad, do you see now where those shots came from? Yeah, I sure do, Cherokee. Dear hunters. Hey, you! You fellas in there with those rifles. Hold that fire. You almost winged us. Hold up, boys! Come on, Cherokee. Might as well meet them halfway and see what this is all about. Uh, now I see why we both smelled smoke. Look over there. Campfire. Uh, I wonder who the lame brains could be who'd build a campfire up here in the woods where everything is as dry as tinder. What was that you called us? Now, if you built that fire, I called you a lame brain. And if you had any brains at all, you won't say that again. I'm not going to take time to say it again. What are you looking to do, burn out this whole valley? Now, either build a trench around this fire and leave someone here to watch it or put it out. Yeah? Well, for your information, if we do dig a trench, we're going to make it big enough to bury both of you in, if you don't beat it. I don't suppose you've got brains enough to realize it, but you're so full of hot air that if you even open your mouth, you're apt to start a forest fire. Well, just for that, I think I'll close you. Yeah. Now, if there's anyone else who wants to try his luck. Yeah. All right, then. Put those hunting rifles down and start stomping out that fire. And if you're not quick about it, the smoke around this place isn't coming from a campfire, but out of the muzzle of a pair of forty fives. <laughs> With the wood so dry that if you rub two sticks together, an acre would burst into flame. When Cherokee and I got back to Dos Rios, we headed straight for the marshal's office to tell him what we'd encountered on Mount Blanco. And I can tell you this much, I was as hot under the collar as I'd ever been. Chad, you'd better calm down. After all, this is hunting season, and those men have got to cook to eat. Well, eating is a vulgar habit. Besides, in this weather, no one should build a fire and leave it unattended, Marshal. Uh, perhaps not. But there's nothing the Marshal can do about that. Oh, I thought you issued the hunting licenses. Chad, you ought to know there's nothing in the hunting license law that says anything about building campfires. All I can do is... Say, Chad, look who just rode up outside. Bill Crane. Hmm? Crane? Well, then, that's who those hunters were you didn't recognize, Chad. Bill Crane come in just yesterday and got six hunting licenses. Howdy, Marshal. I thought it... Well, well, this is going to save me a heap of trouble with you here, Remington. What are you trying to do? Get the Marshal to appoint you game warden or something? Crane, I have no interest in how many deer your men slaughter. But I'm not going to sit by while they light campfires up there, which might burn out this whole country. Oh, that's so. Why, man alive, Crane, if a fire were to start on Mont Blanco... The first ranch to be burned out would be yours. Look, I know this will be a lot of trouble for both of you, but uh, why don't you just for once try minding your own business? This is our business, Crane. And it's yours and the business of everyone whose home is within a hundred miles of here. Forest fire can be a terrible thing. That's why I came down to see the marshal. I'm afraid if they're big enough fools to start a fire, there's nothing in the law that says we've got the right to stop them. Well, there's a law of common sense. Well, Chad, since we make the laws, why not call a meeting and see what we can do about passing a new law? Ah, Cherokee, that's a blame good idea. This is a situation that affects all the people. They all ought to have a say-so in the common defense of their homes. You'd better come to the meeting, too, Crane. Maybe you can explain to everybody just why you think you're the one man around here with the right to burn us out. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
Why don't you folks listen instead of yelling? That's better. I know we can't pass a law that'll do any good this season, but well, that's no reason why a law shouldn't be drafted and passed to protect us from now on. Well, what are we going to do now? As long as it's legal to build a fire up in the timberland, it's your job, every last one of you, to volunteer to help guard against a conflagration should one break out. I suppose you'd like me to shut up my store just so I could sit around some campfire and watch it. (laughs) Mr. Kenny, I don't want you to do anything you don't feel you should do. But if you don't help, maybe you won't have a store left to shut. When you're fighting fire, you're fighting an enemy a thousand times stronger than... Crane! Oh, Crane! Everybody! What's happened? What's the matter? The blasted wind shifted. While my hunters weren't looking, the sparks spread to the timber. Good grief! What are we going to do now? Maybe Chad was right. Chad, Chad, I I know this is an awful time to apologize, but you got to do something. You men have got to help me. If we don't stop that fire... In another hour, there'll be nothing left in my ranch but, but ashes. Well, don't worry about apologizing, Billy. If we can yeah. all get together and work like friends and neighbors, we, we ought to be able to put that fire out. Yeah, yeah. Kenny, if you'll open up your store and get out what dynamite you have in stock, we should be able to blast a path and build a backfire. Well, now, no, I ain't got much dynamite in stock, and when this is gone, I'm not too sure I can buy any more. Well, for the love of Pete, we'll pay you for the dynamite. Let's not haggle over it here. Let's get it and get up in those mountains while there's still something left worth saving. <laughs> With all our good intentions, it was almost two hours before we were organized and up to where the blaze was at its worst. It was bad. Real bad. Mike! Luke! You got that dynamite bundled up yet? Well, I've got six sticks here, Chad. No, it's great, Cherokee. Now, in a pinch, you're really a help. Huh? Chad, Chad, can't you do something? What's the matter? Look at that fire. It's right down to my stable. Phil, I, I'm afraid we're too late to save your place. Oh. What little dynamite we have to work with, well, we'd be better off using it to blast out the timber east uh-huh. of the ranch. Just because I didn't happen to agree with you this morning, you're going to take it out on me, huh? Crane, isn't it better to sacrifice your place and save a hundred families? Are you hypocritical? Here, give me that dynamite. You're not going to burn me out. Crane, stop acting like a fool. I tell you, I'm going to save my place. Stop it. Chad, that rascal knocked you down and ran off with the dynamite. He must be loco. The wind shifts an inch. He'll never live to reach his ranch with those explosives. How can a man be that selfish? Hey, look. Look, the wind is shifting. The flames are right in it. Is that the end of the crane? With that much dynamite blown up and wasted, that may mean the end of everything in this valley. We'll return to the second act of Forest Fire, our thrill-packed frontier town adventure in just a few moments. Frontier Town. Well, despite the pitiful end that Bill Crane's selfishness brought him to, the shock of his death and the dwindling supply of blasting powder did seem to bring everyone closer to their senses. We soon realized it was foolhardy for all of us to stay up on the mountain fighting against flames which wouldn't be pushed back, so we divided into three groups, one to actually fight the fire, one which should rest when they came back from the front line, 
and the third to handle organizational and supply work in town. With danger and death lurking outside our very doors, it wasn't too hard to organize another meet back in Dos Rios. My neighbors, my neighbors, will, will you quiet down and listen to me, please? All right. Hold it now. I know how you feel, but we all can't be up there actually fighting the flames. We'd get very little accomplished if all of us were up on the mountain. However, there's a chance of beating this fire, and it lies in providing the shifts of firefighters with the tools they need to fight with and the food they need to fight on. You can have every blasted thing I got, Chad. Freight wagons, mules, and feeding the team. All right, now you're talking, Bertha. And we'll need everything you have got to haul equipment up to the mountain. Now, wait a minute, Remington. What's the sense of getting the women folks all alarmed and mixed up in this? I've tried to explain to all of you that this fight doesn't concern any one man or any single group of us. This is everyone's battle, man, woman, and child alike. Yeah, you're doggone right. I reckon I'm speaking for every woman in Dos Rios. We've all got a battle on our hands. Well, what about the rest of us? What can we do? All right, I'll tell you. Those of us who went up originally had better get some rest. The others can start out by getting together buckets, sand, fixing pails of coffee and sandwiches, getting blankets, anything and everything that we'll need and, and that'll help. Well, how about money? I'll be glad to write a check for a hundred to help pay expenses. And I'll match that offer and give you the use of every horse in my livery stable. That's more like it, yeah. All right, put it back. Uh, now you're talking. All right, friends. Friends, I realize that all of this should have been done at the meeting we had yesterday, but now that we've got the spirit, let's see if we can't win the fight. Chad? Oh, I'm going into Abe Kenny's store to see about buying some more buckets with the money you and the others put up. Now, what are you doing here, Remington? I thought you were taking charge of fighting the fire. I am, Kenny. That's why I come in. Let's see, we... Well, we need every bucket and pail you've got in your store. Oh, no. Look here, Chad. First you clean me out of dynamite and... Now you want buckets. Oh, good grief, man. How do you expect me to stay in business? Well, if that fire ever gets down in town, you won't have any business left to worry about. Yeah, Cherokee's right. Now, we intend to pay for the buckets. All we have to find out is how many you've got. Well, uh, let me see. Uh, the last time the drummer from the wholesale hardware house was through here, he, uh, he said buckets was going up. What? So, uh, I reckon I'll have to get four bits apiece for them. Four bits? Well, yeah, I guess I got a right to charge whatever I want. And I say the price, four bits. Hey, but... Look, I'm not questioning your normal right to charge whatever you can get, but look, this is a disaster. You have no right You can right blab to... all you want, Remington. But you're not going to spook me into losing my shirt when there are other stores in this town. Ah, uh, Fitzpatrick and Levy didn't wait to find out if there was enough money to pay for what they had. They sent everything from their stores up to the mountain last well, night. Bye, Hickory. They're my buckets, and if you want them, you'll, you'll just pay my price. You'll be paid a fair price when, as, and if this fire is ever lit. But we're taking the buckets now. Cherokee, go back into the Blast store. Blast you. You stand right where you are. I've got something to say about this. Kenny, you better put that gun back in its holster. And put it back fast. Now, 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 Remington. Now, now, now. Now, you come any closer to me. You scatterbrained idiot. Now, come on. Now, let's let go of that gun. All right. Wasted enough time already. Now, you get every shovel, pick, and bucket in the place and help Cherokee and me get them over to Bertha's freighting office. These tools aren't going to do any of us a bit of good here in Dos Rios. Or if they are needed here, then we're just too doggone late. Strange, isn't it? How, even at the price of a neighbor's misfortune, some folks will become so ornery that 
All they can see is the opportunity not to serve, but to feather their own nests, no matter what the cost. Well, we got the buckets and everything else we needed from Abe Kenny, and then we proceeded to haul them down to the loading dock at Bertha O'Melveny's freight line, where a high-wheeled freighter stood ready to carry the tools that were so necessary up to the men on the firefighting line. But like so many other people in town, Bertha's mule skinners couldn't see the forest for the trees. I'd sure like to know what's gotten through you, mule skinners. With a fire like we got raging up in the mountains, how can you even dare to stop and argue about higher wages? Well, what are you talking about anyhow, Mrs. O'Melveny? Look here, when we hired on for these jobs, all you told us was that we were supposed to drive freight wagons. Well, going up in them mountains into forest fires is taking extra risks. And if we're going to take them, you can bet your boots someone's going to pay us. Why, you knot-headed bunch of low-code idiots. You think someone's paying me to send my wagons up there? I'll say they ain't. Yeah. Yeah, well, how about how about the money everybody chipped in at that meeting? That was for fighting the fire. Now yeah, you can pay us out of that. Now, just a minute, Boots. What? Would you rather drive those wagons up there with the supplies we need, or... Or would you rather have the sheriff draft the lot of you and send you up there to fight the fire? Well, the sheriff's got the power to do that, too. What are you talking about? You've got enough men up there right now, without us. Admit it. But what good are the men if you don't see that they get the tools they need? I've got a good mind to thrash the lot of you. Oh, you have, have you? Well, maybe I can save you the trouble. <laughs> Stop it, would you? Come on, now. cut it out, cut it out. Can't we stop fighting amongst ourselves long enough to get the one job done that has to be done? Oh, you're just wasting your breath on this bunch of saddle stiffs. A lot of them ain't worth a potter to blow them up. All right, now let me tell you something, Boots. I'm getting sick and tired of some of the folks around here who feel this fire was started for their personal benefits. Hey, let me tell you something else. That fire's going to be whipped if it takes every man, woman, and... Hello, who's that coming? Well, it looks like Stern. Thought he was supposed to be up fighting the fire. Yeah. yeah. Fire's burned right down to the edge of Jack Pine Canyon. Oh, no. Half the families in the valley are cut off. If we don't get more men and equipment up there, we all burned out complete by nightfall. Well, what happened? Did the wind shift? No, no. We just ain't got enough shovels and buckets and blankets to do any real good. Well, there you are, friend. All the time you were standing around here arguing about what you were going to sacrifice, you didn't realize you're probably sacrificing your homes and stores and everything you've got. Say, see, I just heard that. And you've got to do something. My whole family's pinned in there next to Jack Pine Tent. There. Now are you convinced? Now am I going to have to ask you again? Or are you going to act like real men and haul everything you can lay hands to up that mountain before it's too late? Doggone it, Chad, that their fire's hotter than a blast Hmm? Bertha, what in the name of all get-outs come over you going in there? That fire's no place for a woman. Uh, no place for a man, another, if you ask me. Well, we didn't ask you. But if we had, I'm afraid it wouldn't have made any difference. Chad, what are we going to do? This fire's getting worse every minute. Five more hurt, too. Two of them hurt bad. Yeah, I know, I know. We can't stop to worry about it now. Hey, Kenny. Kenny, you got that dynamite set yet? It's all set, Chad. Ready to blow. All right, everybody. Now watch it. Stand back now. Well, that's the last of the dynamite, is it, Chad? Sure is, Cherokee. If this doesn't do any good, I'm... Well, I'm afraid nothing will. To Betsy, if the blast doesn't do any good, isn't there something else we can do? Nothing I know of, Bertha. Well, at least we're doing all we can. Yeah, I guess that's right. You know, man, woman, their child in the whole valley who isn't helping to fight that part. I watch it now, Bertha. Yeah. Watch out, here goes the last charge. Look at that, Chad. That blast made as much a dent on that fire as a Jersey mosquito on a boulder. Oh, why doesn't the good Lord make it rain? That's the only way this fire can be stopped. Chad, 
Chad, I, I've done a lot of ornery things in my day, but Chad, my wife, my, my two babies are trapped behind that canyon. And... I know it, Abe. But like Bertha says, only providence can stop it. Been to church in many a year, but well, I don't mean it. I don't believe in providence. Now, Mister, this is one time you've got to believe. I know, I know. Holy Father, Thy blessed Son, who died for the sins of man, have mercy on us now. It's purgatory of our own making. Help us, About. The only time I've used God's name lately is in cussing. Well, I'm getting down on my knees, too. Well, I haven't prayed since I was a boy. I guess I can manage. Yeah, nothing else as far has purified our hearts. Jack, yeah. what's that? Will that possibly be thunder? Sure sounds like a storm coming up, Bertha, but none of us had better stop praying. Dear God. Dear God. Beloved Father, don't stop now. Make that rain come. Amen. saw the doctor coming out of the church. And he says Amelia and the kids are going to be all right. Oh, yes, God. sir, Chad. Folks around Dos Rios can't thank you enough for all you've done. What Chad's done, right? He didn't do a thing. Oh. Why, I just started something which everyone in Dos Rios finished. <laughs> for a change, Cherokee's right. If nothing else was accomplished, no, just, just look at the crowd that's been to church today. First time I come to church since my old man died. And I suspect it's the first time Cherokee ever attended church. How oh, that isn't so. That's a contemptible canard. I attended church in my boyhood. Once? Oh, only once? What happened? Well, in the callousness of my youth, church was a big disappointment to me. I went to be baptized, but I guess it was a mighty impecunious congregation. Well, now, now, what has a poverty-stricken congregation got to do with your disappointment, Cherokee? Ah, they were so poor that when they baptized me, they couldn't afford wine. <laughs> They had to douse me with a chaser. Water. <laughs> <laughs> with an iron man like you, water is quite suitable for a religious ceremony. That way they can always inscribe your headstone, Rust in Peace. <laughs> <laughs> Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler and featuring Wade Crosby, is a Bruce Ells production. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. And now this is Bill Foreman to tell you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. 
El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! Chad Remington's the name. Frontier lawyer is the occupation. And it all boils down to one fact. Trouble is my business. Living as I do in the cow town called Dos Rios, smack dab on the middle of the rawhide tough frontier, I get and I handle troubles of all kinds from people of all kinds. And strangely enough, the troubles that are sometimes dropped in my lap have nothing to do with Dos Rios. Although, somehow or other, they have a good deal to do with the development of the West. And it wasn't too long ago I received a long letter, a desperate cry for help from people I'd never seen, from a part of the country I'd never been to and hardly heard of. I remember sitting in my office upstairs over the Dos Rios livery stable and discussing the letter with the man who owns the livery stable, an ex-medicine man, twice reformed by the name of Cherokee O'Bannon. So you've never heard of this Mr. Knudsen, Chad? Cherokee, not only have I never heard of Mr. Foreman Knudsen, but I don't think I've ever heard of the town of Faust more than once. And if memory serves me, the town is well named. Now, does this Mr. Knudsen say anything about, uh, about paying you a fee? No, he doesn't. Nor does that influence me one way or the other. Now, there must be some other lawyer around closer to him who can help them straighten out their difficulties. Just what are their difficulties? From what I can gather from the letter, dust storms. Dust storms that have completely ruined the land around Faust and made Mr. Newton's farm and his neighbor's farm worthless. Billy Blue Blazes, Chad. What does the man think you are, a magician? <laughs> a magician might very well fit into a community that got its name from the legend of Faust. However, apparently that's not what they want. They want some legal advice about how to obtain new lands from the government. You mean you'd have to get down to Washington? Well, that alone would be enough to make me refuse the case, all that red tape. But the worst part of it is it, it just sounds plain, ordinary dull. You mean to, that you're going to turn down, Mr. Knudsen? Well, I haven't quite decided, but... Look, since it's supper time, let's go get a bite to eat while I think it over. Hmm? Bite to eat? <laughs> well, I'm not exactly hungry yet, Chad. That is, I might be able to do justice to a good dinner if some kind gentleman provided me with the proper... Appetizer, if you know what I mean, and I'm sure you do. Oh, you old reprobate. You know, you could save yourself and everybody else a lot of time by ordering the proper combinations of food. Combinations? Sure, why not? A perfect meal for you would be two sandwiches. Gin on white bread and bourbon on plain rye. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Well, during supper, I decided conclusively that I'd write Mr. Newton my sympathies at his plight and at the same time expressed my regret that at the moment other matters occupied me so that I could not come down to Faust and discuss his problems. It was dark as Cherokee and I started back to the office and for a change, Dos Rios' little main street was suddenly quiet. You gonna go upstairs and write that letter to Mr. Newton now, Chad? Yeah, I see no reason why not. If I write it tonight, I can get it in the mail on the 8 o'clock eastbound coach in the... Hey, hey, Cherokee, is that a light flickering upstairs in my office? A light up... My Godfrey, Chad, it is a light. Looks like someone moving around in your office with a candle. We'll soon see about that. Come on. Cherokee, 
You throw the door open and back out of the way. Sure will. Watch it now, Chad. So that's the way you want it, eh? Come on, Cherokee. Let's give him a dose of his own. Chad, what in blazes was that? He ran across the office and dived through the window. Well, let's get after him. Well, a lot of good that'll do. By the time we get downstairs again and around to the back, he'll be a quarter mile out of town. Oh, well, I'm going in and see if I can find not who the gentleman is, but what he was looking for. <laughs> found what he was looking for, all right. And it was no trouble. My desk had been ransacked, but there in plain sight was a letter from Mr. Newton, which I had so carefully stowed away in a pigeonhole an hour before. It was out of its envelope, unfolded and open. Suddenly I realized that perhaps this letter from Newton might not be as innocent as it appeared. By 10 o'clock next morning, Cherokee and I were aboard two of his best livery stable horses, beating up the dust for the little town of Faust. Late that same afternoon, we were still moving along at a lively clip, approaching a river bottom, dry and dusty, hemmed in by painted rocks and filled with a jungle of cottonwoods and junipers. I just have to think, Chad, this name Newton. That's an uncommon moniker. Sounds kind of foreign to my ears. That is kind of foreign, Cherokee. From the little I know, I'd judge that Fulmer Newton is a Dane. Probably like many of the Danes in this country, operates a dairy farm. Dane, eh? Must relate him to, uh, what was that fellow's name? Hamlet? <laughs> yeah, if you insist on being literary. And in this case, as Shakespeare pointed out in Hamlet, there's probably something rotten in Denmark. Or at least... <laughs> Billy Blue Blazes, Chad. That's the end of my new white Stetson. And it's likely to be the end of both of us if we don't look sharp. Where did that shot come from? Up yonder there from those cottonwoods. Right where those two came from. Who could be shooting at us? Well, this is only a guess, but apparently someone would be happier if we never got to Faust and saw Mr. Newton. From the appearance of the terrain around here, they've got their battle more than half won. Blast it, Chad. This is like being a clay pigeon in a shooting gallery. We'll never be able to ride through those cottonwoods. Now, look, Cherokee, I'm going to throw some lead into those cottonwoods myself, which ought to send them back a little, ducking for cover. When I do, I want you to knock on that horse of yours and cut up through that dry wash wide open. But what'll happen to you if I do? Well, that's something we'll both find out later. Now, go on, O'Bannon. If we both get through, I'll meet you at Newton's house tomorrow morning. But look here, Chad, I just can't... I guess I can at that. Get up, you. Get up there. Well, Mr. Newton, the only thing I can possibly suggest is to forget making any direct appeal to Washington, but, but taking advantage of some new land the government's just thrown open for settlement over in Sunbeam Valley. That would save much time, you think? What do you think, Mama? Uh, this uh, Sunbeam Valley, it is green and fertile, no? Madam, Sunbeam Valley is greener than the shamrocks in Ireland. Oh, we must have green land because cows do not make milk from dust. We are here, Mr. Remington, 22 Danish families, all of us in dairy business. Danish people understand how to raise cows to make milk, rich milk. And rich milk makes healthy babies, and healthy babies, they grow up into fine, healthy men and women to make strong this whole country. Oh, believe me, I understand your problem perfectly. However... Although the answer to it seems obvious, filing on lands in Sunbeam Valley, I have a feeling that the big ranchers who've used Sunbeam Valley as open range for years and years aren't going to want dairy farms and fences. Why should we not be welcome? Ranchers have children, too, and children need milk and butter and cheese we make. Uh, if my memory serves me, there are other things you Danes make that aren't exactly dairy products. I remember drinking a delightful brandy made from cherries, which was supposed to be a Danish drink. Cherokee, I've got a good notion to quench your thirst right now with my two hands. Look, i tell you what I think, Mr. Newton. You gather up all of your neighbors and all their belongings and start heading for Sunbeam Valley just as soon as you can. Then you change your mind? 
You are not going to help us get the land? Not at all, Mrs. Newton. But to help save time before your cows are completely dried up, Cherokee and I'll go ahead and see the land agent the government just sent out from Washington to handle the claims and file the maps. Good idea, Chad. That way, by the time the Newtons and their families get to Sunbeam Valley, we ought to have their homesteads all ready for them to move in on. It was a good idea, but like so many good ideas, didn't work the way we'd planned it. Principally because at that time, although we knew someone was interested in the exodus of the dairy farmers, we didn't know about the principal rancher in Sunbeam Valley, Doc Slavin, and his pet trained gunslinger whose handle was Cinco. Now, they had plans, too. Plans they very quickly put into effect. Okay, Cinco, hold it. Here's the new land off. All right, boss. Oh, you, ho, ho. If you knotheads had done what I told you to and kept that lawyer out of this, we wouldn't have to be doing this now. But, Doc, I told you how Reming... Shut up and stay shut up. Howdy. You the land agent? Yes, sir, I am. Something I can do for you? It sure is. Mm -hmm. I'm Doc Slavin. own the biggest spread around here, the Lazy J.D. I also represent all the other ranchers in this section. Yes, Mr. Slavin. We don't want no farmers in here, and what's more, we ain't letting none in. Oh, is that so? Well, you listen to me, You're I... doing the listening, my friend. I said we ain't letting no dairy men nor no farmers in here with our blasted fences. But just to make this thing look legal, we're filing for all them homesteads ourselves, using dummies' names. Mr. Slavin, no one is filing without my consent. And as far as you're concerned... I'm going to report this little conversation to the United States Marshal in El Paso. Oh, you are, eh? I most assuredly am. That gun you're fingering doesn't scare me one bit. My friend, you've got just about five seconds to change your mind. And if you don't, there's going to be a new land agent here starting right now. Well, you can't bluff me, Slavin. So you think this is bluffing, eh? All right, Cinco. And when you're through with our friend, there is going to be a new land agent, and it's going to be me. Why, you foul mouth! Oh. Now, take him out to the Arroyo and cover him up good, Cinco. I'm staying here and waiting for Remington. If he wants to talk to the land agent, <laughs> I sure ain't going to disappoint him. <laughs> We'll return to the second act of Thunder Over Texas, our exciting frontier town adventure in just a few moments. And now, Frontier Town. Well, as you found out, and we found out later, Doc Slavin and his bodyguard, Cinco, were a couple of upstanding citizens, all right. They should have been upstanding on a scaffold. But the murder which they'd perpetrated so cold-bloodedly was only half of the meanness and corruption in Doc Slavin's system. The very idea that he and a few of the cattle barons like him owned the West was a feeling that was shared by others. One which would have to be... <laughs> I don't mean to get on this soapbox about this, so... Well, before I start overflowing again, let's get back to where we left off. When Cherokee and I left the Knutsons, they were well on their way to rounding up their neighbors, packing their wagons, and heading up the trail which Cherokee and I took several hours before. The trail to Sunbeam Valley. Chad, I don't want to have to quibble with you, but this whole thing seems to me to be much ado about nothing. Hmm? Oh, oh well, 
Maybe it is. Why any people would be benighted enough to send for a lawyer to tell them what to do when the only path open to them is to move is beyond me. Yeah, probably because they're foreign-born Cherokee, and their respect for the laws in this country and their lack of understanding of them makes them feel helpless. Ah, fiddlesticks. Why every one of us in this country comes from a foreign-born family... That is everyone but the Apaches, the Navajos, the Utes, the Osage. Okay, the... Cherokee. There's no question that you have an encyclopedic knowledge of the names of all our Indian tribes, but if you'd set your brain to more practical problems, we may get out of this alive. Huh? Alive, you say? Alive, I hope. That rifle in my office the other day, those shots from the cottonwoods on the road, all those happenings indicate one thing. Some of the big cattlemen around here figured out what the dairy farmers are going to do and are trying to stop it before it happens. And you think we're riding into trouble? Plenty of trouble. Then by gilded glory, why don't you let me promote some of that Danish brandy? Man needs something stimulating in a time like this. Oh, I'm afraid you're going to get your stimulation, but not from bottles. No, I got an awful hunch that this time the stimulation is going to come out of a holster and be served in small doses of lead. My boy, I just remember that I have an engagement back in Dos Rios. If I get through in time, I'll be happy to return here and see what I can do to help. Oh, no, you don't. Hey, you see that little American flag on the frame building right ahead? That's the federal land office for the district. All you're going to do is rein up your horse, climb off, and go with me. That's what I said. I'm sticking by you through thick and thin. <laughs> oh, there. Oh, boy. All right, Cherokee. And, and see if you can't stop your knees from shaking, huh? If only I had time for a swig of my rattlesnake oil. Howdy, men. Oh, afternoon. You the land agent? Well, you might say that I am. What sort of an answer is that? You either are the land agent or you aren't. Well, I'm the federal agent, but I ain't got no land left. That's what I meant. No land left? There are 130,000 acres here. You ain't meaning to doubt my word, are you? Far be it from me. I'm sorry you rode all this way for nothing. I don't think the time was wasted. Huh? What do you mean? Are you sure you want me to answer that question? Yeah, I'm sure. Now, what do you mean? Well, in words of two syllables, I don't believe you. I don't believe all the land's been deeded out. You're calling me a liar, is that it? Comes to the same thing. Dad, he's filling his hands! Well, you're a pretty fast draw for a land agent, but not fast enough, it seems. Why, you... Nice, clean fight, aren't you? Using a horseshoe nail ring. All right. You're not out that much that you can't hear what I have to say. Twenty families of dairy farmers are moving up here from Faust. If we've got even half a law left in this country, they're going to get homesteads and settle on them. And if you or anyone else like you has any different ideas, you're going to have a fight on your hands that'll make Gettysburg look like a Sunday school picnic. Come on, Cherokee. I want to meet Mr. Newton before they hit Snakeskin Pass. <laughs> And for the life of me, I don't understand what your tactics are. I'll grant you, the man in that office certainly was a rancher. And not anyone who'd be sent out here from Washington. Well, I'm glad you agree with me about one thing. Why, in the name of all outdoors, did you tell him the route the Newtsons were taking? Don't you realize that if he is a rancher, you'll have a hundred gunslingers out at Snakeskin Pass and blast a lot of them and us right off of the map? <laughs> that, my friend, is a general idea. Now, look, suppose we prove this man's an imposter, and somehow or other he's gotten rid of the real land agent. Yeah? Would that stop the other big ranchers and the cowpokes working for them from attacking that wagon train coming in here and, and wiping it off the map? No, I, I guess not, but... I don't mind a fight, and I don't think our Danish-American friends do either. But just to make it slightly equitable, I thought it'd be a good idea to know when they were going to hit and where. But great gilded glory, man, if you think... You might you... as well save it, Cherokee. As I'm saving whatever breath I've got left to talk to Brother Newtson and his friends and to get him to play it my way. Believe me, with people like that, my job isn't going to be easy. All right, get up there, you. Come on. No, please. Please. We 
ask Mr. Remington to give help for us. And if it's only right, we should listen to what he has to yeah. say. Uh, you go ahead, Mr. Remington. I'm sure everyone wants to hear your advice. Well, Mr. Knudsen, let me go on by admitting that what I'm about to suggest you're doing isn't without risk. We have already risked everything we own, everything we work for. A few more risk now. What difference does that make? Well, I suppose that as a lawyer, I, I should suggest settling all of this through the courts, but as a lawyer, I know that by the time we could get any court action, your herds of dairy cattle would be either dry or dead. Already our cows are drying up. If we don't soon do something, we will be worse than the cows. Very well. Now, as I told you, I'm as sure as I can be without proof that the real land agent has been killed. And the man Cherokee and I saw is an imposter, a rancher posing as a land agent. And as contemptible and ornery and nefarious no good as ever I've clapped my eyes on. And since we can't prove the crime, and since to get you into Sunbeam Valley we have to defeat all the opposition, I'm simply proposing that we try to catch them in another crime and jail a lot of them for that or... Bury them where they fall. If it's a fight, you suggest, we are not afraid to fight. No, 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 I'm not suggesting a fight, although it it may turn into one. But since, if I'm right, they're expecting you at Snakeskin Pass, I say let's round up all the fuses and dynamite we can lay hands to and give those buzzards the noisiest welcome a crowd of selfish and contemptible ranchers ever had. Good, good. Then get back on those wagons and don't stop knocking on those horses until we're at Snakeskin Pass. Hey, look, Doc. That must be them dairy farmers coming now. See that long string of wagons just heading up the grade into the pass? Yeah, it's them, all right. But I wonder what's happened to Remington and that partner of his. From the way they talked, I thought they'd be out front like a couple of Kit Carson. Now, who cares where he is? I care. Because I got a little unfinished business with that loudmouth lawyer. Well, man, that ain't getting us no place. If we're going to take care of that wagon train, we better get riding. All right, boys. Get out them six guns and rifles and let's go. Don't spread out, you fools. Keep together so we can pour the lead into them. Hey, boss. Hey, Doc. See what happened? Two blasts went off. One at either end of the pass. And we're bottled in here like goldfish in a bowl. Hey, you. You down there. Can you hear me? What the... Where's that voice coming from? Who is it? I see who it is. It's Remington. Way up on top of the pass on that rock. Yeah, Remington, I hear you. What do you want? I want you and the rest of those dry guts and vultures with you, dead or alive, to hold to the nearest federal jail. We'd rather take you alive, but we haven't got any scruples against taking you dead. Gee, first boss, you know what? We rode into a trap. If you aren't going to take us, Remington, it ain't going to be alive! You're being an awful fool, my friend. The wagons are blocking the pass up ahead of you, and they're bristling with guns like a porcupine. The rest of us are up here behind the rocks, where you can't even nick us, and we've got you just like setting ducks. Your bluff ain't gonna work, Remington. If you want us, come and get us! If you think I'm gonna stand here and make a target of myself, Slavin, you got another thing coming. They start triggering them rifles in earnest, and they got every one of us plum center. All right. It's getting dark. We're not going to wait till we can't see you anymore. You got exactly one minute to drop those guns in a heap down there and start walking toward the wagon single file. Well, ten seconds are gone now. I'm not being carried out of here feet first. Anybody else? You can do what you want, Slavin. I know when I'm licked. And that goes for me, too. Come on, boys. If Slavin wants to stay here, that's his business. All right, Mr. Newton. Here they come. Now get the ropes out. We brought along with us and tie up the lot of them. 
There may be no bounty on polecats in this county, but we're bringing a mess on them in anyhow. Mr. Lemington, if only you come back in a few months, after we've got everything settled, then we give you a good party. Oh, Mama Nutsen, you don't know what a party this one is. Not only have I eaten a whole plate full of your cookies already, but I've had four glasses of milk. Milk? <laughs> if I didn't already know that cows are stupid, all the proof I'd need would be to taste the liquid they produce. After we unpack, maybe I can find you some cherry brandy I bring from old country. That's real Danish drink. Real old-fashioned way of celebrating. Why, I'd be only... Oh, too now, glad... wait a minute, Cherokee. You know you don't like old-fashioned things. Uh, look what happened at that dance you attended. The lady's auxiliary gave in Dos Rios a few months ago. Oh, yes. Well, I met that beautiful flaxen-haired blonde. She wasn't old-fashioned. Oh, I don't know. First you danced an old-fashioned shardish with her, then an old-fashioned polka, and finally an old-fashioned mazurka. Why, that sounds nice. So what happened after that, Cherokee? Yeah, what could happen after that, madam? After three old fashions, they had to carry the young lady home. Oh, oh, no. No. Frontier Town, starring Tex Chandler and featuring Wade Crosby as a Bruce Ells production. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmar. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Tex Chandler. Now this is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town came to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! there. In case you've forgotten or never did know, I'm Chad Remington, frontier lawyer from the cow town known as Dos Rios. 
And as I've said a time or two before, out on the brawling, sprawling frontier, a lawyer gets into all sorts of things, especially trouble. And trouble out our way not only starts with a capital T, but often ends with capital punishment. I guess it was last month and an old friend of my father's, Harvey Burnside, wrote and asked me if I had time to come down to where he lives, a town which he had built himself from practically nothing, a town named Burnside Falls. Harvey has a brother, Milo Burnside, who owns the little bank in Burnside, and between them, I guess Harvey and Milo pretty well control that section of the country. Well, while Cherokee O'Bannon, the former medicine man who now runs the Dos Rios livery stable and bangs around with me, was trying to find two horses from his stable that would take us to Burnside Falls and back, the situation which caused Harvey to write me suddenly started getting worse. So much worse that Harvey paid a call on his brother Milo at the bank. Milo, let's quit mincing words now. Let's go down to Casey's. All right, Harvey, let's. What's on your mind? Well, I've been hearing things about you, Milo. Things I don't like to hear about any man, let alone my brother. Oh, <laughs> You don't, say. I heard you've been over to War Dance last week. And what if I have? War Dance is a mighty nice and bustling little town. Harvey, it's high time you were getting some sense through your head. When the railroad agreed to build its western terminal into whichever town the voters choose as the county seat of Buckshot County, nobody figured a dreamer like you would build a town out here, right in the middle of the prairie. Prairie, my eye. Burnside Falls lies between three trails and two rivers. The best dad blame place in the whole state for a county seat. That's what I thought once. Uh, you mean you changed your mind since old man McCall put some of his jerkwater railroad's money on deposit in your bank? Money. That's all you ever think of. Well, you'd be a lot better off if you did sometimes. Ah, Harvey, stop being blind. That new town of Wardanes is a good 80 miles closer to where the rails now end. And it'd make an ideal county seat. Bar dance. What is it? Nothing but a hideout for a bunch of owl hoots like Cap Kilmore and his gang. Sure, McCall and the railroad would like that. Building in the war dance would save them a couple of hundred thousand dollars because it's closer. But they got their franchise on the strength of connecting up to whatever town the people select. Oh, the people, my neck. Now look, Harvey. It's worth good cold cash to me. And I'll see you won't lose. If you help me convince the people that war dance and not Burnside Falls should be voted the county seat next week. Yeah? They'll vote just how they please. And you, your bank, or that railroad's not going to interfere. Well, you pig-headed old fool. If you weren't my brother, I... I'd tell you to go for your gun. And if you keep trying to interfere, you may still have your chance, brother or no brother. And if you don't lay off, Milo... I may go for my gun first. Well, that was the situation when O'Bannon and I arrived in Burnside Falls. A wide open split between Harvey and Milo Burnside. But being brothers, Harvey was reluctant, more than reluctant, to make a public issue of what he believed and knew. And his wife, Sarah, hoped that somehow I might be able to talk sense into his money-grubbing brother's head. And that's about the whole story, Chad. The railroad can save upwards of $200,000 building in the war dance instead of here. And that's why the railroad can afford to offer my low money to try and throw the election to war dance. Well, I'm reluctant to say this, but your brother sounds to me like an infernious little nickel nurser. Yes, that's the way it looks. And I'd bet Milo would sell the railroad out even now if anyone offered him five dollars more. How does he figure to swing the election? Figure to swing it? Why, he's swinging it right now. People are actually pulling up stakes here and moving to war dance already. Yeah, enough of a move, I suppose they'll have a majority of the votes. <laughs> well, folks, I don't know what good it's going to do, but come on. Let's ride into town and pay a call on Brother Milo. <laughs> Little town of Burnside Falls looks quite prosperous. We've already passed seven stores, two saloons, saloons. <laughs> oh, Ben, and I don't mind your admiring the saloons from the outside. This trip, you're not pouring what they peddle down your insides. 
Well, where's this bank your uh, brother's located, Harvey? Uh, just down at the end of this block, Chad. That gray and white building. Good grief. Do you see what's happening? The bank's being held up. There go the dirty buzzards who held up the bank, hitting the horses and hightailing it out of town. Come on, boys. Even with a head start they've got, we may still be able to overtake them. Get up there, you. Get running. Excitement brought everybody in town out into the street. By the time we'd threaded our way through the crowd, the bank bandits were out of town and into the hills. The trail ended in the rocks. We all turned our horses and piled back into town, back to the bank itself to find out what had actually happened. Boys, 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 now, if you'll only quiet down, maybe we can all hear what Milo has to say. Yeah, all right. Our neighbors, I hate to tell you this, and if you'd have caught the men who rifled the bank, the story would be different. But the way they cleaned me out to keep up my legal cash reserves now, I, I'm forced to declare all loans due and payable immediately. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Now, men, now, men, men, I'm sorry, and as sorry as I am, the law's the law. And to tell the truth, as soon as I've got things straightened out here, I'm closing up. And trying to make back what I've lost by moving my bank over to War Dance. You don't mean there's some connection between the bank robbery and you moving to War Dance, do you, Burnside? That's the kind of idea it would be healthier never to put into words again, Remington. Oh, so? Well, I've heard of men being railroaded to jail before. But this is the first time I've ever heard of a railroad being the cause of moving a whole bank and its president up to the federal penitentiary. Burnside, after all I've been through today, you don't happen to have a little uh, drop in the house, do you? Well, if you're as weak as all that, Cherokee, we'll go to the drugstore and get you some smelling salts. Besides, right now, none of us has got anything to celebrate. Milo's little bank robbery was too successful. You mean to think that Milo arranged the robbery? Oh, I ain't denying that Milo's ornery, Chad. But I can't believe Harvey's brother would frame a robbery on his own bank. Well, maybe not, Sarah. But Harvey did say that this other town, Wardance, is the hideout of a lot of owl hoots. And you blamed right. Fellas like Cap Kilmore moved in there. And the question is, how come and why did Kilmore move down here from his own stamping grounds, the Dakotas? Well, I don't know anything about that, Chad, but Kilmore showed up in these parts about, uh, well, let's see now, about, uh, about three months back. Three months ago, huh? And when did you first hear about this railroad thing and their anxiety to make war dance the county seat? Well, uh, let's see. Well, it seems to me that that was about, uh, uh yeah. Yeah, that was three months ago, too. Well, do you think there's a connection between the railroad and Cap Kilmore, Chad? Well, I don't know for sure. But there certainly could be. The railroad starts working on Milo, deposits money in his bank, and Milo writes a letter and hires himself a handyman like Cap Kilmore. Chad, do you honestly think Milo would go out and hire a crook and drive folks over to war dance? Claimed if I know. But it certainly makes a reasonable supposition. With the election only a few days off, all we can do before we're sure is sit back and wait. Wait for action. If you're still in Burnside this time tomorrow, you and your old family will stay at first. You're not driving me from my home? Yeah. Well, then maybe someone will dig you a new home. They won't move, huh? Well, we'll move them like that fuse. Chad, I know my husband brought you down here to help us. But we just can't go on this way. 
You can't go on just sitting around while these gun toters blow Burnside falls apart. Now, now, Sarah, it ain't Chad's fault, you know. Well, maybe it isn't. But it was Chad who said sit back and see what happened. And look what's happened. Folks shot down, places burned up, and almost half the people over here picking up and moving to war dance to save their lives. My dear Mrs. Burnside, even though I used to sell a medicine which was a miracle... It's going to take more than a miracle to stop this lawlessness as quickly as you'd like. Yes, but you don't understand. Folks are moving away from here a dozen families a day. Just like sheep, that's what they are. And the blackest sheep of the lot is that no good brother of mine, Milo. It isn't all right even saying things like that, Harvey. Even though saying and proving in Milo's case are as far apart as Pikes Peak and Bet Valley. Prove? How can you prove anything on a gang of cutthroats like that? Thousands upon thousands of dollars behind them just to buy votes and bullets. And that's just the frame of mind they want you and other folks around here to stay in, Sarah. They want you scared to death. They want you to give up before you're licked. Don't you see that's winning half the battle for them? Well... They're not only making this a war, they're making this a war of nerves. Well, they've got my nerves so frazzled that I'm even willing to take a drink of my Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil. There's nothing else handy around the house, of course. Cherokee, the only thing around this house is trouble. If War Dance is made the county seat, Harvey and Sarah Burnside will have lost everything they've worked years to build up. And the people of this section will be saddled with a reign of crime and corruption that'll make Custer's last stand look like a Sunday school picnic. Now, that's what I mean, Chad. You've got to do something. And we will do something, Sarah. If we can ever figure out something to do... Believe me, I haven't come down here to console you. I've come down to help. I'm not going to sit by and see this county referred to in the history books later on as another gun trouble valley. We'll return to the second act of Gun Trouble Valley, our exciting frontier town adventure in just a few moments. And now, back to Frontier Town. Well, I might as well admit it. All that high-sounding talk I gave Sarah and Harvey Burnside was really just whistling in the dark. A little pep talk to keep up their confidence. It wasn't until later that afternoon, while Cherokee and I were jogging back toward Burnside Falls, that any idea hit me at all. Billy Blue Blazes, Chad, this whole situation is thoroughly sordid. It sure is, Cherokee. A man not only turning against his own brother, but all of his neighbors and friends. A normal man might suffer from a thirst, like me. Normal thirst. <laughs> of course you mean thirst, as in thirst for knowledge. <laughs> well, knowledge is what gives me my thirst. My brain is so full of knowledge that it requires considerable lubrication. Well, I'm glad to learn that, Cherokee. Because next time your thirst overtakes you, I'll just stake you to three rounds of axle grease. <laughs> well, even axle grease is better than water. However, referring to Milo Burnside's thirst, his is an unnatural thirst. Thirst for gold. And just about as unquenchable as the... Ad Cherokee, whether you know it or not, you've just given me an idea. Well, if it has anything to do with axle grease, I don't want to hear about it. Far from it. This has got something to do with gold. And I hope the solution to making Burnside Falls the county seat at the election. Gold? What has gold got to do with it? Well, if we can get about three ounces of gold dust and tailings, it may have everything to do with it. Come on, Cherokee. You and I are going to the lion's den. We're riding over to war dance. While Cherokee and I were prodding those livery stable nags across the county over to war dance, Milo Burnside apparently reached there ahead of us as the result of a summons from Cap Kilmore. 
If you think because you're the president of a two-bit bank we're inside, you can give me orders. You've got a few things coming. Yes? Now, you might as well understand this. Here now, Kilmore. I hired you, and you're working for me. Yeah? Well, I ain't working for nobody. McCall's Railroad is footing the bill, and you and me, well, we're just partners. And the way I'm starting to feel now, I might be happier if I didn't have any partners at all. You can't threaten me. I promised the railroad we'd move a thousand people away from Burnside and over here to war dance. And if you can't live up to your obligation, I'll get somebody else to do it. Why, you fat-headed buzzard. You're a bigger crook than I am. Double-cross your own brother, rob your own bank, and then move over here like a rat leaving a sinking ship. Why, you cheap murderers! I was just hoping you'd get that. Get my, 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 my throat! You're choking me! Don't, don't tap! Don't! I got a good mind to bang your head to the floor. Uh, you gonna behave? Yes, yes. yes. Now we're in this deal as partners. Yes, yes, Cap. Anything you say. Uh, go on, get up. And remember, next time you think you're giving me orders, you'll find it's me who's doing the order. Ordering you a $10 funeral. Two high-grade gentlemen, those two. Either one of them would happily arrange to murder a man for a silver dollar. But of course it was this love of money that not only was the basis of the whole trouble, but also what I hope would be the solution for Harvey Burnside and Sarah. Cherokee and I were talking it over as our horses slowed up and we hit war dances rutted in dirty Main Street. Suppose you realize you're asking me to risk my life by coming over to a town like this, Chad? Why, war dance is the perfect town for you, Cherokee. It's wide open and lawless. That's what I mean. And being lawless, there's no law here. So there shouldn't be anyone looking for you for peddling that alcohol and water you used to describe as... Genuine Cherokee Indian rattlesnake oil. Yes, I see what you mean. Yes, indeed. <laughs> but with that poke of gold dust stuck in your pocket, somebody's sure to spot it and try to get it away from you. If they do, that means trouble. Well, I hope somebody spots the gold dust. You hope? Confound you anyhow, Chad. Just what are you up to? Well, according to you, I'm up to my neck in trouble. But if you want to know exactly what I plan to do to get the voters back to Burnside... All I can tell you is that I'm only certain of the first move. I'm going to locate Mr. Cap Kilmore and start from there. Locate? Okay. Where do you think you can find him? Well, the first place I'm going to look is uh, down the street there in that saloon. In that saloon? <laughs> Chad, my boy, you're a man of rare perspicacity. Lead the way, my friend, and depend on old Bannon to follow. <laughs> Buck, give me another drink. This time, leave the bottle on the bar. Uh, pardon me, uh, you Mr. Kilmore? Yeah, who are you? My name's Foley, Mr. Kilmore. Fellow over there said you wanted to talk to me. Oh, well. Yeah. Uh, you're one of the folks who moved over here from Burnside Falls, aren't That's you? That's right. That is, I ain't sure I'm staying here. I see. Well, maybe I can convince you that you ought to stay here a while. Uh, at least until tomorrow when we're holding the election for the county seat. I, uh, I don't see what you mean, sir. Well, us folks over here in War Dance have got a lot of pride in our community. Yeah. And uh, if you'll stay here for the election and cast your vote for the best interests of the county, we'd be mighty happy to show you our appreciation. Well, that, uh... Sounds interesting, Mr. Kilmore. You see, the law's funny. It says for a man to vote, he's got to own land. Yeah. So I figured maybe we'd just give you a quarter section of land and... Uh, how's that sound, huh? Well, that ain't much of an attraction. The land I've seen since I got over here is so dry, a man couldn't raise gophers on it. Well, uh, since that's the way you feel about it, we might buy the land back from you for $50 yeah. the day after the election. Oh, uh, oh, oh, I see. <laughs> Fellas got to own land to vote. Then after the election... <laughs> You're a smart one, Cap. You sure are. 
And you'd better make sure you're smart, too, Foley. Because I'm making it my business to get the name of every man who votes, and whether he votes for Burnside Falls or Warden. Yeah. I think you get the idea, Foley. I'll see you later. Sure thing. I'll be looking for you the day after election. If. Hey, bartender, I'll have a beer. Well, Cherokee, this is one time I'm going to buy you a drink. Uh, may we squeeze in here, mister? Yeah, yeah, you bet. Give me two fingers, no chaser. And be careful with those fingers, Cherokee. Don't chew them down past the nails. You, uh, fellas here to vote? Oh, far from it. I'm over here because of that crooked election Kilmore's trying to run on the people. Of course, it ain't none of my business, but, uh, I wouldn't say things like that too loud. Why? Has Kilmore got you bluffed, too? Oh, oh. You're in for it now. Here's Kilmore coming back to the bar right now. No, sir, Kilmore don't scare me. I still think he's running a crooked election. What did you say, mister? What's that again? I said this whole election smells rotten to me. Or maybe you don't think so. The only thing I think is that your mouth needs closing. What's your name? What difference does my name make? Well, we got to put something on the headstone. Chad, take it easy. Now, look, if you think you're threatening me, you're not even getting close to it. Because I think you haven't got enough salt in your whole system to do anything about it. Not while I'm standing in front of you. Chad, you're loco. Remember, I told you your mouth needed closing? Well, Saffron, Tomcat's Kilmore. You darn near knocked his head right off his shoulders, you did. All right, you. Now, get up off there. Uh, Cap. Cap, what's that? That little leather pouch that rolled out of his pocket on the floor. Oh, huh? what pouch? This pouch, right here. And look. Look, it's full of gold dust. Gold dust? Yes, gold dust. Wait a minute. Give me that bag. Huh? That gold dust is mine. Where'd you get this stuff? Well, I'm not waiting. Where'd you get that gold dust? Uh, sure would never tell you if you didn't have me covered. But... Well, I got it out of the bank on Wolf Creek over in Burnside Falls. Oh, 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 oh. Come on, man. If there's gold there, we better be getting back to Burnside Falls. Don't. You fools, come back. Don't you see it's a trick? Come back. Well, you're smarter than I gave you credit for, Gilmore. It was a trick. <laughs> yeah, a trick that was just good enough to spoil your plan for a cooked-up election. And by the time they find it out, the election will be over, Burnside Falls will be the county seat. And you'll be in jail. Why, you dirty double dealer, <laughs> Cherokee duck! Now, let's see what you can do without your gun. Yeah. <laughs> Chad, the way you're hitting him, he's going to fall against the bar and upset those beautiful bottles. Oh. Now, that's the first time I've ever seen a man knocked out the stimulus applied simultaneously. Look at him. He's just bathed in bourbon. Yes. Well, unfortunately, the bourbon's not going to wash away his sins. But I think by the time a few of the people admit on the stand to the bribes Kilmore offered them... That the state will wipe away his sins, although it may take 20 years. Chad, as an attorney at law, you certainly violate more laws than you learned about in school. Oh, I don't know about that, Cherokee. The only law I was dealing with in war dance was the law of human nature. As you pointed out earlier, and gave me the idea, it was just their thirst for gold which dumped Mr. Kilmore's apple cart. Strange you should mention thirst and apple cart in the same breath. Because as a callow youth, one of my dearest delights was imbibing a part cider. An excellent libation, but I no longer like apples. <laughs> you mean you're an apple knocker? Well, not exactly, my boy. <laughs> but a short time ago, I was revolted when I served a... A dish of applesauce. The whole thing was full of hairs. Full of hairs, huh? Well, maybe that was your fault. You didn't order your applesauce made from the right kind of apple. Is there a certain kind of apple for making applesauce without hairs? <laughs> Certainly. Next time you order your applesauce, order it made from Baldwin's. <laughs> Baldwin's? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Frontier Town, starring Reed Hadley and featuring Wade Crosby, is a Bruce Ells production. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmar. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Reed Hadley. And now this is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town comes to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! Chad Remington's the name. Chad Remington from Dos Rios in the Rocky Mountain country. Where I'm sort of... Well, I guess you'd call me a frontier town lawyer. Strange things happen out on the frontier, and as a result, strange things happen to me. Mighty strange things. But the frontier being what it is, always changing and always moving, and with the people who drift into it and across it, we've got just about as much law as... Well, as the law allows. To show you what I mean, let's take what seemed to be a pretty cut and dried case that was brought to me just a matter of a few weeks ago. And I guess the best way to tell you about it is to tell you what happened, or what I suppose happened before they sent for me. Now, it all took place in the town of Rock Springs, oh, about 40, 50 miles from Dos Rios, and concerned a cattle rancher by the name of Oliver Baldwin, and his daughter, Dixie. By criminy, Dixie, you're just wasting your breath arguing with me. I know what I'm doing. And I'm telling you that I'm going down to Del Andy's store and tell him off proper. But, Daddy, maybe you did make a mistake when you wrote that deed out for him. Maybe you just thought you wrote it out for 300 acres. You might have put an extra zero on it without realizing it. The only mistake I made was in dealing with that unprincipled, no-good varmint in the first place. I know what I wrote in that deed, and it was just 300 acres and not 3,000. Well, if you're positive he changed the 300 to 3,000, you still shouldn't take the law into your own hands. Who said anything about taking the law into my own hands? I'm just going down to Della Andy's store and give him 24 hours to change that deed back to 300 acres or suffer the consequences. And while I'm in town, I'm sending a telegram over to Dos Rios to that lawyer over there, Chad Remington. Well, that's a relief. Because if Della Andy's going to try any crooked stuff on me, I'm a getting a lawyer and throwing him and his whole kitten caboodle right smack into jail. Well, Oliver Baldwin was as good as his word. He hitched a team to his buckboard and drove from the two bar S into Rock Springs to call on Cy Delahanty at the little store Delahanty had recently opened in the town. And while he was on the trail to Rock Springs, Oliver Baldwin was the subject of the conversation Delahanty was having with his assistant, Prod Stevens. 
Look, Mr. Delahanty, I know I work for you, but you ain't been in Rock Springs long enough to know about these things. And, and I'm telling you, Oliver Baldwin is a regular catamount when he gets riled. You don't say so, Prod. The old gentleman looks so gentle. You think butter wouldn't melt in his oh, mouth? Oh, 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 talk about the devil. Here comes Baldwin now. Let me handle him. Morning, Oliver. Don't you go, Oliver, and me, Delahanty. Now, now, don't tell me just because you made a perfectly understandable mistake in filling out my deed that you're going to hold it against me. Delahanty, I know you ain't been out west long enough to understand us, folks, but them smooth city ways yours don't go out here. We got our own way of handling crooks. Rod, I think you better show the gentleman to the door. And uh, don't be too polite about it. Yeah, all right. well, come on, Mr. You Boyle. lay a hand on, on me now. and I'll You shoot. numbskull, let you that gun alone. Let you. go of that gun or I... Mr. Baldwin, you pulled a gun, acted like a complete nitwit, and ruined a $200 mirror. Now get out before I lose my temper completely. If that gunslinger of yours didn't have my forty-five, I'd show you. But I'm a getting a lawyer down here, Delahanty, and when he comes, you'll be lucky if you just end up in jail. So, sending for help, is he? The only kind of help he's going to need is the help of six pallbearers. Prod. Yeah, boss? Get that rifle out of the back room. You and I are riding out on the trail, making sure that Mr. Baldwin never gets back home. Well, Oliver Baldwin stopped long enough in Rock Springs before heading home to send me a telegram. So enlisting the company and assistance of Cherokee Bannon... The ex-medicine man who now owns the Dozeria's livery stable, we lost no time in setting out for Rock Springs and plowing up the dust to the two bar S ranch house. This is quite an establishment Mr. Baldwin has over here, Chan. Yep, and from all appearances, Oliver Baldwin seems to be one of the few really prosperous ranches. You suppose he might be able to pay you a sizable fee, counselor? <laughs> what do you call a sizable fee? Ten dollars for me and ten quarts of whiskey for you? <laughs> oh, Sizable fee should be twenty dollars. Oh, quartz. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, I'm Chad Remington, and this is Mr. O'Bannon. Is Mr. Baldwin home? Come in, won't you? I, I'm Dixie Baldwin. My father was was dry gulched last night. Uh, he was dry gulched. Oh. Who was the unprincipled culprit who dared to... Hold it, Cherokee. This is no time to ask questions. If Miss Dixie feels like talking, she'll tell us all it's necessary to know. Oh, what is it to tell you? I knew before my father left for town that he'd never come back. Why do you say that? Because he went in to see Cy Delahanty with blood in his eye. Cy Delahanty? Who's he? A double-crossing, sheep-stealing Jasper who just opened a store in town. Oh, I know I can't prove it, but I'm positive that Delahanty did it. Why do you say that, miss? Had he threatened your father? I don't know. But Daddy threatened him plenty. You see, Delahanty moved to Rock Springs from Springfield a few months ago. He opened a store and then started looking around for some ranch land he could buy. Well, that explains part of your father's telegram about a Ford's deed. He sold Delahanty 300 acres. When the deed was filed, it read 3,000. I see. But you said your father was dry gulched. And if he went into Delahanty's store to threaten him, he... Of course. You didn't think Delahanty would do what he did in his own store, do you? With, with that kind, they just wait. Shall I open the door for you, Miss Dixie? Well, yes, if you... Well... I recognize his rig outside. That must be Delahanty at the door now. now. Wait a minute, Miss Dixie. I think Cherokee and I had better go into the kitchen while he's here. You mean you don't want to meet Delahanty? No, I don't. Not just yet. Well, you're going to be a fine lot of help, you are. Now, wait a minute. I only want to... Uh, you'd better let him in. I'll explain my reasons to you later. All right, come on, Cherokee. That 
afternoon, Miss Baldwin. May I come in? Yes, as long as you're here. I, uh, I heard about your father. Not really. A week ago, I'd have felt sorry for your father and for you. But since he made his attitude very apparent yesterday, I'll just make this a business call. Save myself the trouble of coming to see you again. Save me the trouble of seeing you again. Your father told you he sold me only 300 acres, didn't he? That's all he did sell you. Fortunately, that part is past argument. When he came in to see me yesterday, he asked me to promise that I wouldn't tell you about this. Here. Oh, Bill, I say, for a hundred head of cattle. The bill of sale for a hundred head of cattle. You didn't think I was going to buy 3,000 acres of land and raise jackrabbits on it, did you? I bought a ranch from your father. A ranch with cattle on it. You... You... Mr. Delahanty, I want to tell you something I'm sure you already know. This is nothing but forgery. You copied my father's signature from the original deed. How very, very clever of me. Of course, you can prove that statement. I'm hmm? giving you three to get out of here. No sense in reaching for that rifle, young lady. Now that I've told you the facts, I'm going. But I'll be back Monday to take over my 3,000 acres and the cattle along with it. Good day, Miss Baldwin. And don't expect me at your father's funeral. Mr. Remington! Ah, there's a fine, high-class gentleman. Miss Dixie, do you believe your father did sell him the cattle? For $1,100? I'm forced to agree with the young lady, Chad. So am I, Cherokee. But that doesn't mean a judge and 12 men on a jury would. Now, the first thing for us to do, if Miss Dixie feels up to it, is to ride into town and call on the sheriff. Another to do, Miss Dixie. Guessing's one thing, proving's another. And how are you going to prove a thing like forgery when even you admit you couldn't tell if it's your father's signature or not? Well, if either of you think I'm going to be robbed of my ranch and my stock, you've certainly got another thing coming. Miss Dixie, the law is the law. Isn't that consoling? But if that is the law, then maybe I'd better make a few laws of my own. Now, Dixie... You're not going to get any place acting this way. And as far as you're concerned, Mr. Remington, remember, I didn't ask you to come down here. And if my father had known as much about you as I do now, I don't think he would have either. We'll return to the second act of Branding the Badlands, our exciting frontier town adventure, in just a few moments. And now, Frontier Town. Well, as I said before, a cut-and-dried case doesn't always turn out to be just that. And not only was it a back-breaking job trying to prove anything on Cy Delahanty, but Dixie Baldwin's sudden attitude of bitterness was making my task no easier. After Dixie's display of temper at the sheriff's office, the O'Bannon and I somewhat grimly, I admit, remounted our horses and rode back to the two bar S ranch. When we got there, we found that Dixie, having seen us coming, had gone into her bedroom and bolted the door, leaving us with a bit of egg on our faces. <laughs> not much to do and a good deal to talk about. Chad, you know I'm not a man who likes propriety, but I want to go on record as saying Miss Baldwin is perhaps the most pig-headed filly I've ever seen, and one of the most pulchritudinous, I might add. 
Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah, fine lot of good her poker tooth is doing us while she's locked up in a room. And it has certain advantages at that, Chad. For example, since she is not out here to play hostess, I could look through the kitchen cupboards to see if I could locate any uh, uh, refreshments. Not on your tin type. This is one time you need a clear head. Counselor, my head is clear as a bell. Yes, and probably twice as empty. Of course. Absolutely twice as... What, what was that again? <laughs> Look, O'Bannon, there's only one thing for us to do. We've got to induce Miss Dixie to come out and listen to reason. And there are no two ways about that. If I know women, and I do, she's not coming out. Dixie? Dixie, can you hear me? I want to talk to you. You're just wasting your breath, my boy. A doggone it, Dixie. Will you stop acting like a spoiled child and come out here? I'm certainly not coming out. And if you're even half a gentleman, you'll pack up and clear out of here. Now, your father telegraphed me to come out here and, well, he needed some help. And if you... Fine lot of help, y'all. Unless you mean you want to help Della, Hattie. Why, you ungrateful little vixen. Now you either open that door or someone's going to have to buy you a new one. You try breaking this door down and you're going to get a load of buckshot. All right. Now, Cherokee, that excess beef of yours is good for something. Come on, help me bust this door down. Only too glad to oblige, Counselor. All right. One. <laughs> two. Three. Two big, strong men, eh? Well, do you think you're big enough to swallow lead? Now, you wouldn't dare pull that trigger. Your bluff is just like your temper all on the surface. And for your information, I'm not leaving Rock Springs yet. And for your information, I don't care what you do as long as you get out of my house. Fair enough. That's a bargain. All right, come on, Cherokee. We got a bit of riding to do and fast. We did have a bit of riding to do. We rode back to town. Made tracks for Delahanty's general store, where we called on Mr. Delahanty himself in mighty short order. Yeah, I've heard about you, Remington. And I've heard about you, too, Delahanty. Well, if I were you, I wouldn't believe all I hear. Sorry, but what I heard about you, I've got to believe. A really smart man wouldn't. You talk as if I came here to make trouble for you. I didn't, so I'm putting all my cards on the table. Oliver Baldwin sent for me. When I got here, he was dead. And in my humble opinion, that daughter of Baldwin's is a double-dyed, self-willed little fool. Oh? Is she? Now, after talking to the sheriff, I'm... I'm sure of it. Now, look. Baldwin was supposed to pay me 500 for coming here. And it looks as if I'm not going to get it. So I thought maybe I could get part of it by making a deal with you. A deal, huh? Well, keep talking. Well, the sheriff says there's no question in his mind that you bought and paid for a hundred head of two bar as cattle. And since you're a merchant and not a cattleman, I'd like to make a deal to round up and brand that cattle for you. Wish I could believe you, Remington. <laughs> Why shouldn't you believe me? I own a ranch of my own, and I'm telling you that rounding up and branding takes an expert. Mm -hmm. Besides, if O'Bannon and I could do the job for you and collect a hundred dollars, well... Well, at least have made expenses and not leave Rock Springs total losers. Good grief, man. What have you got to lose? Besides, you can ride along with us and make sure you're getting what you paid for. That's right at that. All right, boys, you can start the roundup and branding tomorrow morning. And, uh, Prod and I will be right on hand to watch you. <laughs> Dixie, won't you even give me a chance to explain? Don't you think you've explained enough? You're going to do exactly what my father wanted you down here for. To help Delahanty take possession of 3,000 acres and 100 head of cattle he never paid for. But my dear lady, Chad's got a good reason for doing it. And if he'd only stop to think of the time of the year it is, you'd get some ideas why if we... If you'd only stop trying to alibi yourselves, maybe we'd all be a lot happier. Let me tell you both this much. I'm going to pay you back someday and show the world what a pair of double-dealing, low-down, back-biting snakes you two really are. Since that's all I have to say to you, 
You can get out of here now and not show your faces again till it's time for your roundup. All right, Cherokee. Dab a loop on that yearling and haul it over here to the fire. We're all ready to brand. Right you are, Jack. Are you sure this brand design will be all right for you, Mr. Delahanty? Sure, if you say so. It's easy to put on those steers. Oh, it's very little trouble. And the design, a triangle cross, is unusual. You won't find it twice within a thousand miles of here. Jeff, this adolescent bovine is not taking too kindly to the idea of branding. Now, who's going to hold and who's going to brand? <laughs> I'd better ear the calf down, Cherokee. You look almost worn out already. Uh, the only reason I look worn out is... I am worn out. Did you ever see a branding before, Mr. Delahanty? No, this is my first. Chad, for mercy's sake, will you stop conversing and toss that calf? The iron is red hot. Okay, Cherokee. And don't forget the instructions I gave you. Yes, sir. Once over lightly. Okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right, Cherokee. Slap on that branding iron. Because once we get this one done... We still got 99 more head that are going to wear the triangle cross. Now, believe me, it was mighty tough work branding a hundred steers. But well worth the money Delahanty was supposed to pay us. It was late and dark by the time we'd finished... So we arranged to have Delahanty come back the next morning to cut out his cattle and drive them over to his own acres. But just before Delahanty was due, Cherokee and I paid another call on Dixie Baldwin. Are you crazy? Why should I go out to the corral while you gloat over delivering a hundred head of stolen cattle to Delahanty? Now look, young lady. You're coming out to witness the delivery whether you want to or not. So make up your mind to that. Who do you think you're talking to that way? I know who I'm talking to, Miss Dixie Baldwin. She's going out to make sure that Della Handy gets only the cattle wearing his own brand. You can talk all you want to. I'm not going out to the corral. How the heck you're not, young lady. Jerky, grab her shoulder. <laughs> Delighted, my boy. <laughs> now, we're carrying Miss Baldwin to the corral ourselves. Here goes. <laughs> put me down. No, you stop there. You put me down. Well, Mr. Delahanty, it's up to you to pick out the cattle wearing your Triangle Cross brand and dry them out of here. Huh? Triangle Cross brand? That's your brand, you know. Why, why not one of these cattle are wearing a Triangle Cross? But they're the same cattle you saw Chad and I brand for you yesterday. What are you talking about? About your cattle. These have got to be your cattle. You left that so-called assistant of yours here, uh... To watch them overnight, didn't you? We're not magicians, Mr. Delahanty. I don't know what's going on. There must be some mistake. <laughs> mistake? No, oh, there can't possibly be. And what's more, you yourself gave Miss Baldwin a receipt for the hundred head of cattle right after the branding. Yeah, but... But these aren't my cattle. Well, I must admit the hundred head penned up in here are wearing the 2 bar S brand. Maybe you moved your cattle during the night while we weren't around. You think I'm crazy or something? I'm sure I don't know. But since you admit these aren't your cattle here, uh, well, you might just as well be on your way. Why, you... I mean, tonight I don't know how you did it. But you tricked me. I did? And let me tell you this much. You're not going to get away with it. But maybe I have gotten away with it, Delandy. It seems to me that you've already signed a receipt for the delivery of your so-called cattle. Yeah? I'm taking the cattle in this corral anyhow. Right. Yeah, boss? Start driving that hundred head out of here. My good man, do you intimate that you're going to rustle Miss Baldwin's cattle? I mean that you're both a couple of thieves. And I'm taking what's rightly mine. Della Handy, you just made a couple of mistakes. The first mistake was calling me a thief. And the second was... Chad, look out! Go 
get him, Counselor. Try to steal cattle, will you? <laughs> You're nothing but a filthy crook, and I'm... That's one sentence you're not going to finish. When you wake up, we've got another sentence you can finish, which will run about 15 years. All right, Sheriff, you can come out of those bushes now. All right, come on, Sheriff. You saw Delahanty try to take a hundred head of cattle that weren't wearing his brand. And I know that you know exactly what to do with cattle rustlers. going to apologize to you for all I said and oh, did. You sure don't have to, Dixie. But will you please explain to me how you got away with that hocus pocus when I saw you brand the cattle with Delahanty's brand myself? <laughs> Miss, all we did was cold brand that stock. <laughs> huh? Cold brand? Now, just what is a cold brand? Well, Dixie, I tried to explain it to you yesterday, but you just wouldn't listen. <laughs> However, a coal brand is a brand which only burns the hair off. doesn't touch the hide. And Della Handy, being an Easterner, didn't know that this time of the year, with the cattle shedding their hair, the burned hair fell out overnight, leaving only the two-bar S to show through. <laughs> and the look on his face when he saw that two-bar S. Yeah, that two-bar is a wonderful brand. Just imagine, two bars in place of one. What do you mean, Cherokee? Well, Cherokee's uh, kind of hinting that now that the job's all over and Della Handy's on his way to jail, he'd like a little uh, liquid refreshment. Oh, well, come on. I've got a bottle of something in the kitchen. Oh, no, not that. Oh, what's the matter, Cherokee? You turn it on a drink. Well, last night I got into the kitchen and brought the bottle out. Started to pour a drink in the parlor, but I very quickly gave it up. Too strong for me. Too strong? Oh, you'll have to explain that one to me. Well, when I poured some in the glass, a few drops of it fell on the maple table in the parlor. Yes. Yeah. And that liquor was so strong, you know what? The bird's eye maple all turned bloodshot. <laughs> <laughs> Frontier Town, starring Reed Hadley and featuring Wade Crosby as a Bruce Ells production. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmars. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Reed Hadley. And now this is Bill Foreman to tell you that Frontier Town comes to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town!
Howdy. I'm Chad Remington. And if you've ever heard of me, which you probably haven't, you've heard me referred to as a Cowtown lawyer. Well, I guess you might say I do practice law in Dos Rios. But even on the boisterous and brawling frontier, there's not enough law business to keep a man going. A part of my time, a good part, is spent raising cattle. And what trouble I don't get into for my law business, I certainly ear down with my cattle. Because it's still so fresh in my mind, let me tell you what happened this shipping season. I guess it all started the day I was out checking my stock and keeping my eye out for down fences with my sidekick, the ex-medicine man, Cherokee O'Banna. Dad, my boy, I don't mind saying that these steers of yours look like you've been feeding them nothing but my genuine Cherokee and then rattlesnake oil. Now, wait a minute, Cherokee. They can't look that bad. Besides, my cows don't touch alcohol. Don't touch alcohol? <laughs> then that must account for the expression, dumb as an ox. By the way, you don't happen to have a weed drop on you, do you? I certainly don't. And even if I did, I... Cherokee, isn't that someone over there riding through the junipers where we just cut out those heifers? Juniper? Must be a man after my own heart. They flavor gin with juniper berries. It is someone, Cherokee. Come on. We're going over and find out just who he is and uh, what he's doing trespassing on my land. Hi, George, you were right, Chad. There is someone there looking over your cattle. Hey, hey, you. Suppose you just hold it. All right, easy there, boy. Slow now. Billy Blue Blazes, Chad. See who it is? That packing house fellow who recently came to town. Deuce Zeideman. Howdy, Remington. Who'd you think it was? A rustler? If I had thought so, Zeideman, you wouldn't have lived long enough to ask that question. And believe you me, the counselor's not fooling. Just what are you doing out there anyhow? I was riding by. Saw your cattle and... Figuring you'd probably be selling to me pretty soon. Thought I'd save myself a trip by checking them over now. You represent that new packing house combine, don't you, Zeideman? Yes, sir. I sure do. United Beef Syndicate. And I'm willing to pay you a mighty good price. And uh, how much would a mighty good price be? Oh, let's say seven cents. Seven cents? What do you think these are? Range-fed longhorns? These are Herefords, mister, and practically fed by hand. I might up that a penny a pound. A uh, fat chance. Chad's always gotten ten cents enough from Ed McComb. Yeah, but Ed McComb's dead. You don't think his wife can stay in business at those prices, do you? Mister, not only is Lizzie McCombs capable of running that packing house, but she's staying in business if I have anything to do with it. Suit yourself, Remington. But don't come to me when you find out she's not able to pay those fancy prices you want. Because I'll have bought all the beef I need to last me a full season. Now, if I were you, I'd think it over. And fast. <laughs> Real fast. There's no question in my mind that Deuce Zeideman had given me a warning. I didn't like it. And most of all, I didn't like Deuce Zeideman. So Cherokee and I wasted no time getting into Dos Rios and paying a call on Lizzie McCombs to find out if Zeideman had been threatening her. Why, that knot-headed lummox threatened me. He wouldn't dare, Chad. He wouldn't dare. Well, I thought I'd ask, Lizzie. After all, now that Ed's dead... Well, with that kind, you never know. Well, Deuce Zeideman and the United Beef Syndicate ain't scaring me out of business, with her or not. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that, Lizzie. Because I thought the way Ed had been found shot so mysteriously, it just might have been Zeideman and his crowd. You shouldn't say things like that, Cherokee. The coroner's inquest, Deuce Zeideman had an airtight alibi. Even if he didn't have an alibi, the McCombs Packing Company is still in business. And he's going to stay in business. If Deuce Zeideman has got any different ideas, he's going to have to have a fight on his hands that the whole county won't forget. Well, Deuce, I guess you were right. What'd you find out, Pinto? Plenty. Easy McCombs has bought more than a trainload of cattle and she's getting ready to ship most of the cattle are down at the railroad yards now in the loading pens. Got them all nicely rounded up for us, huh? What do you mean? 
I just had a hunch something like this was going to happen. So I had a little, uh, heart-to-heart talk with one of her men. You know him, Pino, that big red face fella, the one they call Braid. Braid? Sure. Well, what's he going to do for us? <laughs> you get your boys rounded up and back over here for instructions. Once they do their job, Mr. Braid is taking care of the rest. <laughs> Lucky city folks have been licking their chops over some more prime McComb beef. Yeah. If nothing goes wrong. Yeah. Well, what could go wrong now? Well, that new beef syndicate that new Zyderman's got I ain't too sure. Well, you know what they say. Competition's good for business. Yeah, maybe honest competition's good for business, Braid, but when you're dealing with a weasel face slick talking. Suffering Joe, man. What's that? Why them filthy sidewinders shooting up the street like that? They're panicking our seers. Look out, Mr. McCombs. Come on, get out of here. Here come them local cattle. We'll all be trampled to Although at that time there was no way of proving it, Buse's little scheme to wreck Lizzie McComb's packing company and win a monopoly of the cattle business in our valley certainly was starting to bear fruit. It wasn't bad enough that the cattle had been stampeded all over Patty's half acre, but Brother Zideman still had plenty of aces left up his sleeve. The first ace, the black one, he wasn't long in play. Blast you, the lot of you! Why don't you men button up your lips and let me do the talking? What's the use of talking, Mrs. McComb? The boys are right. It's too bad, but working for you seems to be a sure way of ending up at the doctors. Or at the undertaker's. You not! What about me? If you all quit like you say you're going to do, where am I going to end up? You're not so bad off. You can probably sell out to this syndicated Zyderman. But the way things have been going with us, two men killed in a stampede today and three others hurt. We know when we're well off and we're staying that way. Come on, boys, let's get out of here. Right, right. A couple of times, Lizzie, but I guess you did. Hello, what's going on here? Oh, Braden, the boys are quitting, Chad. Why, you can't quit on Miss McCombs at a time like this? Well, we are quitting. What's she going to have to do? Go out and hire some men? She sure will have to hire some men. If you're any sample. I'm sample enough not to turn yellow like you all have done. Yellow, huh? Well, does this look like I'm your... Come, you galoot! Lend me a hand! Gang up on me, will you? Well, I'll... Well, aren't you proud of yourselves? Seven of you jumping, just two men. Ah, you make me sick. Come on, boys. And if Remington and O'Bannon want some more when they come to, they can fight us. If they can see anything out of them closed eyes. <laughs> <laughs> there's anybody to worry, it's me and Pinto. You're sure right about that, Deuce. Because Remington ain't gonna take this laying down. Ah, uh, what can Remington and O'Bannon do against a lot of us? Well, one thing he can do is keep Lizzie McCombs back one up so she'll fight. To the nail. What Remington needs is a good lesson. Something that'll teach him when he tries to cross us up, he's just playing with fire. Playing with fire, huh? You know... That gives me an idea. <laughs> yeah, it gives me an idea, too. Hey, um, I wonder if we're both thinking about the same thing. I was thinking that a nice little fire, the right kind of fire, 
would put Lizzie McComb so far out of business, Remington or nobody else would be able to do her any good. <laughs> Say, that's an idea. <laughs> and won't a fire burn that two-bit lawyer up? <laughs> <laughs> it sure will burn him up. <laughs> that's a pretty funny. That's what you might call a hot one. <laughs> We'll return to the second act of South of Santa Fe, our exciting frontier town adventure, in just a few moments. Now, Frontier Town. As a lawyer, I make it a practice to pretty well keep my temper under control. But as a rancher, well, I'm afraid that it blows and blows hard. Not only was I sore inside, but I was sore outside as the result of the beating I'd taken at the hands of Braid and his gang. Well... That night, patched up with court plaster and arnica, Cherokee and I were sitting in my law office, located above Cherokee's livery stable. I was fuming, and Cherokee was fuming, but for an entirely different reason. Silly blue blazes, Chad. After the beating I took, it's unfair, inequitable, and downright picky you and of you to make me sit here with you. When I could be over at the Ace of Hearts, the Gold Nugget, or some other worthy tavern, and buying some relaxing fluids. All right. Go ahead, Cherokee. If a drink means that much to you, I guess I can get along without you. Oh, now there's no reason for you to be hasty, Chad. I'll stay here with you for a while if you think it'll do any good. Uh, who knows what'll do any good? Mr. Two Zideman may be too much for me. You don't honestly mean that, do you? Well, I'll admit that stampede engineer down at the railroad yards today wasn't quite as successful as he thought it was going to be. Lizzie said that they got back all but 37 head of the stampeded cattle. Yes, but he did succeed in getting Lizzie's men to quit as a result of the stampede. Cherokee, that varmint is about the crookedest crook I've ever seen. Imagine playing both ends against the middle. Tries to argue us ranchers into breaking our contracts with the McCombs Company at the same time that he's trying to wreck Lizzie and force her into his price-fixing syndicate. He's a rascal, all right, and a clever one. Well, some folks have called me a rascal, Chad. But my whole trouble has been that the only thing I can't resist is temptation. I'll take drinking liquor. I... Chad, what are you staring at out the window? Look, Cherokee. Across the street. See those men heading for the McCombs Packing Company barns? Well, I'll be reformed. A couple of those fellows look familiar. I'll say they're familiar, all right. They were in that gang that beat us up this afternoon. What do you think they're doing, leaving their horses and heading for the... Stockyard holding pan. I don't know, Cherokee, but we're sure going to find out. Keep it quiet. I don't want to make any noise while I'm busting off this lot. Hey, that's it, Pino. That does it. Come on, boys. Come on. Just don't make too much noise with them kerosene cans. Yeah, yeah. Keep it quiet, boys. Keep it quiet. Where's the best place to start this fire, Brave? Uh, right here. In the field. Okay. okay, dump that oil out and get it lit. Yeah, okay, Pinto. Uh, All right, uh, keep it quiet, boys. Yeah, get it going there now. Turned out, 
Scout Cherokee and I got there too late. Too late, that is, to stop the fire. But not too late to run those coyotes out of there with lead. Come on, Cap, there they go. Right, hold it, Cherokee. We've got to let them go and try to put out this fire. Go find some buckets while I try to dig up some blankets. We may be able to put this out before the whole place goes up in smoke. This keeps up, Chad. I won't have any cattle, plant, or business left. This syndicate of Zitamans is a horrible thing. He'll eventually have a monopoly and force people to buy meat at his own prices. Mm. You're sure right about that, Cherokee. In fact, I've been reading that there's some talk in Congress of legislating trusts like that out of business. Oh, well, I ain't got no time to wait for Congress. You know, I think what I'm going to have to do is get hold of 50 or 60 cattle cars and ship every head of stock I own to Kansas City or Chicago and take what I can get from them. Well, Lizzie, that's your business. But personally, I'd rather end up six feet under and knuckle down to a weasel like Deuce Zydeman. And, Miss McComb, the same goes for yours truly, Cherokee O'Bannon. Well, since you can't arrest a bunch of men you can't locate, I had no way of tying up the gang who started the stampede and the fire with my friend Deuce. All Cherokee and I could do was wait. Just wait. Meanwhile, Lizzie McComb sent a telegram requesting 60 cattle cars. And when the answer arrived, she came storming into my office. Talk about monopolies. Read this telegram I just got back from the railroad. Hmm. Every available cattle car reserved for United Beef Syndicate for the next 60 days. Yes. United Beef Syndicate? Isn't that Zitamin's outfit? Your dad blasted right at Zitamin's outfit. Oh, Chad, there's no two ways about it. He's got me licked. Of course you're not licked. You don't have to ship your cattle. You can trail drive them to Abilene. No, not on your tin time. I wouldn't drive a half mile. Life's too short for any more grief than I got now. Oh, Chad. I'm afraid I'm... Just... Wait a minute. Hold it, Lizzie. I seen things, or is that Deuce Zideman coming over here? It certainly is, Zideman. I wonder what he wants. I hope I'm not butting in. But they told me over at her office that Mrs. McCombs was up here. Well, you're in, Zideman. What do you want? Well, I just heard from the railroad that Mrs. McCombs needs some cattle cars for shipping. That's right. What'd you do? Come over here to gloat? Hmm. Certainly not, ma'am. Since I won't be needing the cars I reserve for another week or two, I'll release them to you, if you'd like. Oh, wait a minute. Ducey, are you serious? He's up to something, Lizzie. Leopards don't change their spots, and polecats don't change their stripes. Look, I came here to talk business with Mrs. McComb. All right, Simon. How much do you want to charge me for the cars? Charge you? Why, nothing. You just pay the railroad. All I'm interested in is putting an end to all the talk that's been going around about me trying to put you out of business. It's talk that's going to backfire on you yet. Oh, Adam. now, that's enough, Chad. You just keep out of this. Luce, are you in earnest? I'd be an awful fool to make you the offer if I wasn't on the level. I'd just be cutting my own throat. If that's a suggestion, it's the best one I've heard today. Uh, doggone it, Chad. Enough's enough. I ask you to keep out of this, but you got to keep running off at the mouth. But, Lizzie, I was only... There's just... some folks in town who say anything Chad Remington's ever mixed up in means trouble. The way you're talking now, I can see that they're right. Do you mean that you're really going to accept this phony offer that Zideman's made you about using his cattle cars? I mean, I'm still running my own business. If I can get railroad cars, I certainly don't need your kind of help. Deuce, I still don't get the idea of first tying up all the railroad cars and then turning around and letting the old lady use them. No, Pinto. I'm afraid you wouldn't get the idea. 
But we pulled so much rough stuff on the McComas Packing Company that everybody in town's suspicious. Well, why shouldn't they be? That's right. But now, with me lending her the cars to ship her beef in, <laughs> there ain't nobody, not even a jury, who wouldn't say I'm the best friend she's got in the world. Sure, sure. And the minute she ships the beef and the cars you're lending her, everything we spent a month doing is knocked right into a cock hat. <laughs> Do you think so? Well, wait till Lizzie McCombs takes off that hat and sees what's really inside of it. <laughs> Just wait, Pinto. Just you wait. <laughs> Although I didn't know that Deuce was laughing, I didn't sleep that night. And along about sunup, I roused a Cherokee out of his bed, made him saddle up two of his livery horses, and we went for a ride. I had to think. I had to think hard and mighty fast. I guess you can say it was no accident that I tried to do my thinking riding close by the railroad right away. Dad, I think you were strictly non compass menace if you try to butt into Lizzie McComb's business any further. I'd be loco if I didn't follow this hunch. There's got to be a reason why Deuce let Lizzie borrow those cattle cars. And the only reason I can think of is to put her out of business once and for all. But on the other hand, if you are wrong, the ranchers who have sold to her are going to take you apart. And remember, your luck is wearing mighty thin. Not half as thin as the city folks will be if Zydeman gets control of the beef market. I suppose you're right. But what are you going to do way out here in this ungodly hour of the morning? That cattle train is coming now, Cherokee. It's got to stop for water right down there ahead of us. So? So you and I are waiting until the train stops, sneaking behind the coal car, breaking the coupling, and seeing if we can't let the cattle cars roll back down the hill toward town. By the whiskers of my pet goat, what happens to us if the train crew catches us? By the whiskers of your pet goat, if they catch us, make tracks out of there because that air won't be fit breathing. We'll choke to death on gun smoke. All right, hold it right here. All right, Cherokee, down off that horse and let's go. Cherokee, you cover me while I crawl behind that tender and break that coupling. Okay, Chan. Good luck. Hey, what's going on there? Chan, come on. If you don't want to get ventilated, stop right where you are. We're taking charge of these cattle. Hey, cattle stand. Hey, Brownie, get that engine started again. They can't get the cattle if we move them out of here. Chan, stop them. They're getting back in the engine. Let them go, Cherokee. If they want the engine, let them take it. That's right. That engine will be back here in a half an hour with a possible. You mean if that engine gets any further... That's what Deuce planned to have happen to the whole train. A derailment, an accident which he wouldn't be held responsible for. All right, come on, Cherokee. I'll bet we'll find Deuce around here someplace watching to make sure the whole train was wrecked. But what are we going to do with the cattle? I'm not worried about the cattle now. What we've got to do is get our hands on the hogs. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying your morning constitutional dues. You can't fall off the way Chad's got you tied to the saddle. Why don't you shut up? I guess you don't know Cherokee very well, do you, Deuce? He's one man who always keeps his mouth open, ready for any emergency. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And even though this is the time of the morning I'm generally getting home, I've got my mouth all set now for something slightly stronger than breakfast coffee. And I think that Deuce here is the one who ought to buy you the drink. <laughs> Deuce should? Why do you say that, Chad? Well, wasn't it his gang who closed both your eyes yesterday? Yeah? Well, then, since turnabout is fair play, he's the man who should buy your eye open. <laughs> <laughs>
Frontier Town, starring Reed Hadley and featuring Wade Crosby, is a Bruce Ells production. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmar. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Reed Hadley. And now this is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town comes to you from Hollywood. Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West, the tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat, these are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! ever heard of me, and believe me, there's no reason why you should have, maybe you know that I'm Chad Remington, often referred to as a saddle stop lawyer. Well, I guess Dos Rios, my hometown, is a saddle stop, because there's certainly no railroad within 50 miles of it, just a few stagecoaches that pass through, and most of the time a constant stream of cowponies. As for being a lawyer, I guess I must plead guilty, Your Honor because I make part of the living I do make from the practice of law. However, a small cattle ranch is one of my assets, and a few weeks ago, cited by Cherokee O'Bannon, the reform medicine man who now owns our livery stable, I rode over to another town to buy some breeding stock. And what I'm going to tell you about now hit us like a cannon shot on the way back. We were about, oh, 40 or 50 miles from Dos Rios jogging along at a lively sustained clip, and the O'Bannon was matching the rattle of the pony's hooves with the prattle pouring from his lips. Chad, despite the fact that I own a livery stable, I must admit I still have no true and lasting affection for horse flesh. Oh? Therefore, Counselor, I would esteem it a great favor if you would be good enough to stop for a bit of rest and relaxation overnight at some town between here and Dos Rios. Or, to put it another way, Cherokee, your saddle sore. Sir, it's not my saddle it's sore. It's that portion of me, however, that comes in contact. Well, oh, oh, that's quite enough. You don't have to draw me a physiological blueprint. And as a matter of fact, the same idea had struck me. I'd been thinking of stopping off in Maverick Town, at least for a good meal, and then deciding whether to go on to Dos Rios or not. Well, a good meal would be more than welcome. Is there any place in a bird they would call Maverick Town where one could obtain a good meal? One of the best places in the entire state. A little restaurant run by some Mexicans I know. Luis and Teresa Ibarra. Well, that doesn't sound too appetizing, my boy. No, indeed. But it is, Cherokee. They make the finest pollo con oros and chili rellanos you've ever eaten. Of course, the food is hot. Well, in that case, I'm all for it. Well, uh, you like hot food? <laughs> indeed I do. Indeed I do. Hot food seems to give me a thirst. Give you a thirst? <laughs> oh, Bannon, when the good Lord assembled you, he might have shortchanged you on scruples. But he certainly gave you a triple dose of thirst. 
All right, come on. Your tongue is starting to bulge now. Let's prod up these ponies and get into Maverick Town. And I'll introduce you to Luis and Teresa Ibarra mighty soon. Senor Dallas, why do you all the time make trouble around my little restaurant? I'll trouble you, you half-breed hash slinger, if you and that woman of yours don't go back where you come from. We will not go back. We have just as much right to stay here as anybody else. We Americanos now. The heck you are. We ain't got no room for foreigners like you within 20 miles of Maverick Town, you understand? But, senor... Me, a spouse, and, and me, we citizens, just like anybody else. Ah, why waste time talking to them, Dallas? If they ain't gonna leave, how about making them entertain us? Come on, let's make them dance. Come on, dance. <laughs> don't, don't, that's a good idea, Blinky. All right, you two, let's see you dance. Come on. <laughs> no, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You have no business picking on the Yabars. <laughs> well, you think you can stop us, Bobby? Or maybe you think because your uncle owns the bank, you're running Maverick down. Bobby, now, Bobby, uh, Bobby, do not mix up with his own breath. Come on, I want to see you two dance. Now, come on. <laughs> Who done that? Who's the sidewinder that shot my gun out of my hand? Well, tear him apart. Well, Scott Terran, mister. I'm right here, right in front of you. I'm right behind you, Chad. What business you got, button in? Well, let's put it down as the business of any decent citizen. Because from the little I've seen of you, I hardly think you qualify. Well, you ain't gonna see much more of me because I'm gonna close your eyes. Oh, 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 oh. Look out, Dallas! Look out! Turn them around this way, and I'll give it to Don't do nothing of the kind. I just hold it right where you are. All right, Chad. Thanks, Chucky. And here goes. Give it to Now, you'd better get up and dust yourself off before I decide to do the dusting for you. Come on, Blinky. We got other ways of handling Jaspers like them, too. Gosh, mister, you sure gave Dallas what he had coming to him. Oh, senor Remy. Senor, when I saw you in the crowd, it made me very happy in my heart. Well, it didn't make me very happy when I saw you, Luis. And what that he-devil was pulling on you. Who are those two, anyhow? Senors. You come inside, and while we fix you something to eat, we will tell you all about them. Well, there wasn't much that either Luis or Teresa could tell us about the pair who had been picking on them. Except that suddenly, for no apparent reason... Someone was trying to make Maverick Town so uncomfortable for the Avaras that they'd pick up and move. However, there was a reason. A reason we were to find out soon enough. And while Cherokee was washing down the hot food with glasses of red wine, had we been over at the cafe and dance hall across the street, we might have found out exactly what the reasons were. Come on, Blinky. Lay off that bottle. Come on back into my office. I want to talk to you. Sure, Dallas. Although it don't look like you're going to enjoy talking much with your lips split open. Yeah. Well, before we get through, there's going to be a lot more than split lips around this town. Come on. Come on, come on. Get that office door open. All right. Now take it easy, Dallas. Well... I found out who that big Jasper was who butted in. Yeah? It's Chad Remington, that lawyer from over in Dos Rios. If we let him hang around Maverick Town, we may miss the boat. <laughs> boat? We may miss the train. Ah, uh, never mind the jokes. But that railroad agent will be back in town Friday. And if we can't deliver that corner, the Mexicans have got their restaurant on, along with the acreage behind it for the new freight yard... He'll probably try to do business with them direct himself. Well, I don't see why Bascom don't pay the Mexican something and just buy the place from him. Bascom shell out his own dough? <laughs> why, that one's so tight every time anyone walks inside his bank, he locks the vault. Yeah, that's a banker for you, all right. <laughs> I guess he's got the first penny he ever made. Well, we're getting a few of them pennies once we run them bearers out of town and Bascom takes over their property. But I got a hunch we're not going to get away with it unless we get Remington out of town, too. Yeah? Well, how do you figure to do that? 
You know, from the little I seen of Remington, he's a plenty salty maverick. Hmm. He handles himself all right against one man. Do you think he can against six? Huh? Six? What do you mean? I want you to get some of your boys and lay for Remington. As far as anybody else is concerned, I want it to look like Remington picked a fight with you. Ah, I get you. <laughs> well, don't worry, Dallas. If that's what you want, we'll give Remington the full treatment. You better make sure you do. Because with Bascom ready to pay us $2,000 to get that Mexican's property for him, you may want to live long enough to collect your share. <laughs> With the little Louis and Teresa told Cherokee and me, we decided we'd stay in Maverick Town, at least overnight, and maybe for a few days longer. It was pretty obvious that there was something wrong, some new and unexplained reason for the sudden resentment against the so-called foreigners. And we decided to find out what it was. Well, after the biggest and best meal we'd had in weeks, Cherokee and I left the little Mexican restaurant and started down the street towards the hotel. We hadn't walked very far when suddenly five men came out of no place, and before I realized it, the meanest looking of the bunch had managed it, so I bumped into it. Hey, what's the matter? Ain't got room enough on the street for you? You have to walk all over my feet? I wouldn't if you'd keep your feet where they belong. Oh, one of them smart jaspers, huh? Well, we'll soon... All five of you? Now, unless you're tired of living, keep your hands away from those guns. Why, you... Come on, get them, boys. <laughs> I got this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Keep those two tied up, Cherokee. This one's going for his gun. Oh, I want my to break in my arm. Let's go. All right. I'm going to give you a better chance than you gave us. I'm giving you three to clear off the street. Come on. Come on. Billy Blue Blazes, Chad. Have you ever been punched in the stomach after three portions of enchilada? You know... It must have been the enchiladas that won the fight for us. The garlic on our breath did more damage than our fists. <laughs> Besides, what they shook up inside of you was three bottles of Eno. Golly, mister. Every time I walk down the block, you seem to be having a fight with Dallas or some of his boys. Then you know who those high binders are, son? I don't know them personal, but I know they all hang out at the Lady Luck Saloon. They're all friends of Dallas Vixen. He owns the saloon. Any idea why this Dallas person should suddenly take a dislike to Louise and Tracy Abar and start making trouble for them? Gosh, no. As long as I remember, everybody in Maverick Town is like Mr. and Mrs. Abar. This is a, something entirely new. Well, son, there's only one way to try to get the answer. And that's by going directly to headquarters. What do you say, Cherokee? Let's go into the Lady Luck and see if we can find this Mr. Dallas Vixen. <laughs> Let me tell you something, Remington. You're barking up the wrong tree. I wonder. There are some trees that folks around here might be tempted to use, unless you learn to behave yourself. Yeah. Well, we got some pine trees around here, Remington. They cut down easy, and a couple of men can build a six-foot box out of them awful fast. Well, if they do chop down a pine tree, why not have them build six more pine boxes? Because you and your gun slicks might need them, too. Well, if that's all you got to say, Remington, <laughs> I'd be very much obliged if you'd be on your way. <laughs> Having you around may give my place a bad name. Any bad name this dive might have probably will be cleaned up before this week is over, Dallas. Right along with some of the characters in this town. <laughs> We'll return to the second act of Maverick Town, our exciting frontier town adventure, in just a few moments.
And now, Frontier Town. Well, as you know by now, Cherokee wasn't welcome in Maverick Town. And certainly neither was I. Of course, we had no idea what the reasons were for the sudden animosity exhibited toward us. No more than we knew the real reason behind the attempts to railroad the Ibarras out of town. Notwithstanding the set-tos we'd had with Dallas and his men, this stiffened our backbones and increased our resolve to stay in Maverick Town until we had the matter settled, one way or the other. We found out later that not too long after the affair on the street in which Blinky and his friends ganged up on us, Mr. Bascom, the town banker, paid a call on Dallas Vixen, entering his office through a rear private door. I imagine you men know what I'm doing over here. Sure, Mr. Bascom. We were just talking about it. Eh, uh, talk, talk, talk. I'm sick and tired of all this talk. I want action. And by thunder, I'm going to have it. Well, doggone it, Mr. Bascom. Did this shiner I got and that cut on Dallas's lip look like you wasn't getting action? The only thing I'm interested in is results. And that's just what we're going to get you. Because I've just figured out that we've been playing this game the wrong way. Oh, uh, you have, have you? Yeah, I have. Doing what you told us not only hasn't worked out, but now everybody in town knows we got some reason for wanting to run them Mexicans out of here. Yeah, and they may be running us out of here before we know it. Well, the way I got it figured, Bascom, we can get Luis and Teresa out of this town, take over their property, and none of us will have to lift a finger. You're not even making sense, Dallas. <laughs> I sure am. Because what have the folks in Maverick Town got to thinking that this was no place for a couple of Mexicans? They'd run them out of here in fast order. Oh, yes, and who's going to give them such an idea? All we got to do is call a meeting. You know, our mobs are just like sheep. Let somebody get up on a platform and tell them the bears are foreigners and un-American. <laughs> Don't worry, the mob will do the rest. By Daniel, uh, I think you're right, sir. And the bigger the lies we tell, the easier it'll be to make them swallow them. As a matter of fact, there's the banker in this town. Uh, I can probably get up on the platform and whip them up into such a frenzy that they'll run the abarras out of town, tarred and feathered. <laughs> you bet you can. And by noon tomorrow, you'll be back laying 2,000 bucks right here on my desk. <laughs> Folks, now, please. Yeah, please, folks. Folks, now, please, if you'll... Uh, just let me finish. Now, uh, all I'm saying is, uh, what sort of town are we building? When foreigners can come in here, open businesses, be in daily contact with our wives and children, and then take our hard-earned money and send it back to the country where they came from. <laughs> now, I say, I say... If we don't get rid of the undesirable foreign element, your ranches won't be worth a nickel. <laughs> All the ridiculous hogwash. Now, you remind me of a herd of spooky cows being stampeded. Now, what sort of a man is this banker of yours that he's trying to turn you against Luis and Teresa Ibarra? Because this is one country where every man has the chance to live and to live decently. Regardless of race, creed, or color. All right, all right. You don't have to throw me out. I can get out of here soon enough if that's the way you feel. Come on, Cherokee. Let's get outside and into the fresh air. I can't wait to get the odor of this place out of my clothes. Senor Remington, Luis and I, we have talked the whole thing over. We heard about the meeting. See, si, see. Si. We decide we're going to get out of Maverick Town before we cause shootings and, uh, and trouble. Ah, well, that's ridiculous. Now you're actually talking like a foreigner. Cherokee's right. Good Americans don't run away from trouble. Oh, senor. We like very much for staying in Maverick Town. <laughs> this place, our home, but... Well... They haven't run you out of town yet. And they're not going to if we can ever find out why Bascom, the banker, suddenly pops up spreading dissension and hatred. I cannot say, senor. But anything this banker does always has some connection with money. 
Why, just looking at that thin, hard mouth of his made me feel like I wasn't looking at a man, but I was looking at a shark. Si, si. Except that the shark, uh, you can catch him on a hook. That's only half right, Luis. You can only catch a shark on a hook if you've got the right bait. And I'm willing to wager that by the time we get through, Bascom, Vixen, and their entire crew will be out of water and gasping like fish on dry land. <laughs> Teresa seemed to have the only possible clue to the whole situation. Bascom wanted the Ibarras out of Maverick Town because of some reason that had something to do with money. There seemed to be no way of finding out what his reason was until I got about the wildest idea that ever entered my head. Remembering that we had met his nephew, Bobby, on the street, Cherokee and I took the advantage of the chance acquaintance to ride out to Bascom's house and see Bobby late that afternoon. Gosh, I... Just don't see what you mean, I guess. Bobby, we're trying to tell you that your uncle's in danger. Locked up inside that vault. Locked in the vault? We've he... got every reason to think that he is, and that's why we came to see you. We thought if you had a set of keys that would let us into the bank and knew the combination of the vault, well, we might be able to get your uncle out of there before he suffocates. Whoa. Uncle does keep some papers and things in a little desk in his bedroom. And that's where the keys are, and the vault combination ought to be. Come on, Bobby. We just haven't got a second to waste. <laughs> Left to 14. Right to zero. Right to zero. That should do her, Chad. Try the handle and see if she opens up. Hurry, Mr. Remington, hurry. If my uncle's in there, he may have suffocated already. All right, Bobby. Just stand aside till I swing this door back. Mr. Remington, there's nobody in the vault. No, Bobby, but I've got a hunch there is something in the vault that I'm looking for. You... You mean you talked me into getting you the combination just so you could rob the bank? The only thing I'm going to remove from the vault won't be something that's valuable to the bank. If it's here, the only value it will have will be to all of Maverick Town. Wait. You're nothing but a big crook. Cherokee, grab the youngster and hold him. I... Now hold still, Sonny, because I certainly don't want to hurt you. Get away from me. I wonder Leave me alone. It could be in this drawer. Mark <laughs> private correspondence. Hurry it up, Chad. This youngster is worse than a wild catamount. I'm doing my best, Cherokee, but there are so many papers in here that... Well... Yeah. Looks like all the risk we've taken aren't wasted. Here's a letter from the railroad saying that they're building a freight yard in Maverick Town and that they need the property the Abara's restaurant stands on for their freight depot. I don't believe it. That means my uncle's a crook. You just be grateful it's your uncle and not your father. Uh-oh. That looks like Bascom just pulling up outside in a buckboard. But he'll come in. He'll catch us here. Yeah, I suppose he will. But it's a little doubtful as to whether he's catching us or we're catching him. I can slip out through that window over there, Chad, and do the rest of what you had in mind. All right, Cherokee. I think you'd better. Now get going. Now you watch your step, Counselor. Although this is law business, you've broken the law, and you may be up to your neck in trouble. Now will you stop talking and get out of that window? Bascom's at the door now. You get behind the vault door, Bobby. When your uncle finds me in here, there's apt to be trouble. Gun trouble. Come on in, Mr. Bascom. Hey, what? Hey. I've got a little business here I want to discuss with you, and I don't think you're going to enjoy it. You, I, you... How'd you get in here? Never mind how I got in, but let's discuss why I got in. And to save you worrying about it, I was anxious to get my hands on this letter. Yes, sir. Why, you unmiscuit... Ask him you'd make another mistake clearing your holster. You don't scare me one bit. Besides, I've got you dead to rights. I'm warning you, Bascom, let your gun alone. You must be 20 years older than I am, and I'm trying to give you an even break. The only break you're going to get is... Oh, just go on, drop it. Uh, no, no, let, let go of me. I'll let you go right now. <laughs> Mr. Remington, look. Here comes Dallas and his whole gang. Well, that's exactly what the doctor ordered. I sent Cherokee to tell them that your uncle was absconding with the bank's money. All right, come on, Bascom. You'd better wake up. There's a reception committee coming to call on you. Uh, uh, what'd you say? All right, come on, Bobby. You and I are going to hide behind the vault door and watch the whole show. Well, 
I'll be playing. So this big rum out was telling the truth. Cleaning out the bank, was you, Bascom? All ready to make your getaway. No, 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 no. I, I, I Why don't you to... stop that lion? Yes, we know what we can see. But I, I'm telling you, I wasn't clearing out. I didn't open the vault door. I... Oh, sure not. You're just trying to frame us into doing your dirty work, running them two poor Mexicans out of town, and all you want's to hog all the money. Well, we'll soon see about that. Yes, Dallas, we'll see about that. Fire. 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 Now, drop those guns. Look out, Dallas. I got a beat on him. <laughs> Uh, Cherokee, lend me a hand. I'm going to shove them all into this vault and slam the door. Oh, that's it, Chad. We've got them now. Well, I was glad to help you, Chad, but locking those crooks up inside that vault. Well, until we get the town marshal and some deputies with handcuffs, can you think of any place better for a crooked banker and his gang to be locked up? Senors, please. You let me give you a few more tacos and just maybe a little more chicken, no? Oh, Teresa, as much as I love your food... No, no fooling. I'm up to here. But, senor, after all you do to help Teresa and me make sale of land to railroad, you must have just a little more something. Maybe you, Bobby? Oh, gosh, no thanks. I'm full. <laughs> and, Luis, I've got to pass. But maybe Cherokee will oblige. Ah, amigos, I just couldn't hold any more food. However, if you just happen to have a glass of something to wash the the stone with, oh, here's a new charity. a whole full bottle of very finest tequila. <laughs> tequila? See what is wrong, Senor? You do not like tequila? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, my little pigeon. I once had a sip of that Mexican liquor, and the only thing I'd use it for now would be to give a slug of it to some woman I hated. Give it to some woman you hated, Cherokee. What would you do that for? <laughs> Why, Counselor, for a very obvious reason. The keeler, of course. Frontier Town, starring Reed Hadley and featuring Wade Crosby, is a Bruce Ells production. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmar. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action-adventure story with your favorite young Western star, Reed Hadley. And now this is Bill Foreman to tell you that Frontier Town comes to you from Hollywood. Hollywood.